The Cult of Everin Book 14 of the Everin Chronicles Written by Adair Hart Narrated by Michael Wolfe The Story So Far In the Arrival The Everin Chronicles Prequel a space and time traveling being known as Everin rescues Jake Malkins and Kathy from a Seselter slaver named Grecho. It is Everin's first adventure in the Milky Way galaxy and introduces him to Earth. In the Awakening, Book One of the Everin Chronicles, Dr. Albert Snowden and his niece, Emily Snowden, are abducted by an alien race known as the Crotophore. They are rescued by Everin and V. Everin's trusty, mobile artificial intelligence, who drops them back off on Earth. In the Fredorian Destiny, Book Two of the Everin Chronicles, Everin returns to check on Dr. Snowden and Emily, and they ask to travel with them. Everin accepts. They then help Fredoria, a planet of human ex-slaves, become a full trade partner with the Cregan Star Empire, the local galactic superpower in Earth's region of the galaxy. Hampered by the industrialist Ceros and bounty hunters, they secure the Archeron, a Cregan relic for the Fredorians to give to the Cregan Emperor. In the Purification, Book 3 of the Everin Chronicles, Everin and the gang fight the timeline invaders known as the Purifiers, a human supremacist group led by the Overlord that tries to change Earth's history. In the Time Refugee, Book 4 of the Everin Chronicles, they tangle with Bilazine, a rogue time traveler, while helping Jane Trellis, a time refugee who is pulled out of her timeline. In the Everin Origin, Book 5 of the Everin Chronicles, they discover Everin's origin and meet Leverin, another one of Everin's plane forms, while fighting the Time Wardens, a timeline void race that hunts rift travelers. In the Shadow Connection, Book 6 of the Everin Chronicles, they group up with Jake Melkins and the non-human community to defend Earth from the ambitions of Cal Taurus, a dimensional being that rules over a vast empire encompassing worlds in many dimensions. In the Human Factor, Book 7 of the Everin Chronicles, they head to AD 10105 and deal with a ruthless AI known as Salazar, in addition to fixing the timeline. In the Cosmic Parallel, Book 8 of the Everin Chronicles, they leap from parallel timeline to timeline in a trap designed by the Mortani, plain refugees who blame Everin for their situation. In the Unification, Book 9 of the Everin Chronicles, they travel to A.D. 514-723 to unify humanity while dealing with an extra-dimensional threat. In the Portal Effect, Book 10 of the Everin Chronicles, they deal with a rogue time traveler who enjoys zapping people to the past and altering timelines. In the Time Cube, Book 11 of the Everin Chronicles, they meet Dalton Kingston as they travel to the Horologium Reticulum Supercluster to deal with the ruthless Tenegrin hegemony. In the Everin Impact, Book 12 of the Everin Chronicles, they meet Siverin, another one of Everin's plane forms, in another universe and help him deal with Wardax, a cosmic threat. In the Cosmic Artifact, Book 13 of the Everin Chronicles, the gang encounters the Gothlic lords as they meet with the Palison beings known as the Eight. The gang also gets help in the form of Murukan's team, an investigative group. This book continues their adventures. Everin's Technology Torvada His disc-shaped ship that can travel through time and space. It is roughly 15 feet tall by 30 feet wide. The interior contains six-dimensional rooms, an open area with a semi-transparent floor and sides, and a roof that can be transformed by hard holograms. A shielding surrounding the Torvada prevents most matter from entering. Universal Interface Card, UIC, a credit card-sized device carried on his belt that allows access to most technological systems that do not have an artificial intelligence in them, 
It can also view limited information on biological systems. Augmented Reality Interface, ARI, an interface that only he can see around him. Utility Handle, a hilt-like device carried on his belt that can extend morphable matter in any shape, typically a baton or staff, can also fire repulsion, grappling, heat, mist, sticky globules, and stun beams. Illumination Orbs Small orbs on his belt that provide lighting and can hover. Projection Orb An orb that allows projections to be sent to it from remote sources, such as Everin's Ring or the Toravada. Ring A ring that can provide holographic projection and scan. Prologue Drevel Zage loved traveling to parallel Earths to resolve issues, but not ones populated with fungal, mutant humans. His trip to this Earth was to retrieve an artifact that hummed with cosmic energy, and he had done so and was now on his way out. As he flew over a street in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, or what that would have been on his Earth, he surveyed the ground. It resembled a war zone and mutants were everywhere. He appreciated that his cosmic cloth, or CC as he called it, allowed him to travel through the air. He did not relish the thought of having to fight through hordes to get back to the Toravada, a pocket dimension he called home. How it had come to choose him remained a mystery. His earth had been invaded by strange aliens, and he had tried to hide, but instead he had run into a rectangular portal to a pocket dimension. An AI with a female persona known as Seer had greeted him, said he had been chosen, then asked for his acceptance. Drovel had just been happy at the time to be somewhere he could catch his breath. He had accepted, thinking it might be a joke, but going into a room and receiving cosmic energy had been life-changing. Drevel had already had an exotic energy that gave him high regeneration, and Seer had called it Alcarin energy. Having a name for it had intrigued him. The Torvada had also given him CC, a sentient rectangular cloth that could cover his whole body. Although CC had no gender, Drevel often referred to him as male. CC did not speak, but Drevel could command him. C.C. usually wrapped around Drevel in the appearance of a trench coat, but sometimes it was in the form of a cloak or cape, depending on the situation. C.C. was resilient. He could enter a camouflage mode of sorts, could change shape, and most importantly, he could fly. It made traversing dangerous environments much easier. C.C. could split out parts of himself to punch or push away others, and at times he wrapped up opponents. As C.C. was impervious to stun, Drevel could fight without fear of damaging him. Seer also had a small orb that flew next to him and provided tactical support. The orb was highly advanced and composed of tough materials. There was a large eye that allowed her to project or illuminate, and smaller holes let her nanoswarm create legs to land or anchor herself and arms to interact with things. Drevel had come to rely on her, and between himself, C.C., and her, Drevel could handle almost anything. He ran his fair-skinned hand through his spiky blonde hair. He had semi-shaved sides, but liked spiking his front up. It was just something he had never grown out of. He had been called handsome when he was a teenager due to his athletic build, chiseled chin, and piercing green eyes— but that was over 250 years ago. He still appeared like he was in his mid-thirties, despite his advanced age. His suit was a form-fitting black and blue tactical one with various gray pads. His dual stun pistols were his pride and joy. With his cosmic energy, he had become a marksman, and he avoided close-quarters combat if possible. If it did come to melee, he was well-versed in it, he used small, blunt, crescent-shaped weapons that extended from his fists. They spawned on demand and could stun as needed. He avoided killing and preferred to stun or push away. 
Drevel's attention was drawn to a scuffle on the ground. A group of survivors were fighting for their lives against a swarm of mutants. Drevel altered his course and descended. Seer, I'm dropping down to help those people. I think they need a little Drevel in their life. Why would they want bad cooking? asked Seer. Oh, I didn't realize you woke up on the wrong side of the motherboard this morning. I... no, I didn't, said Seer. Drevel laughed. <laughs> All right, just have the portal ready. I'm going to bring him in. Okay, I'll prep the sanctuary earth portal after you get here. You got it, he said. He loved that although she was next to him in orb mode, she still existed in the Toravada. That made coordinating portal openings much easier. He landed behind the mutants and extended his arms to the side. Hey, mushroom people! Want a real snack? They turned and snarled, then rushed him. The first one to arrive was knocked away by CC extending a strip. The second had its legs grasped by another strip, then tossed. It's like you aren't even trying, roared Drevel. A mutant barreled down on him. He formed his fist weapons, then knocked the attacker back. Another launched at him, but he sidestepped it then sidekicked it into a car. CC lifted him into the air when three mutants tried to tackle him. He landed on top of them when they collided and fell down, then picked each one up and threw them away. The remaining two creatures charged. He hit both in the face, causing them to fall forward legs first. Then CC continued their motion by shooting them out the back and into the air. Drovel faced the stunned survivors. We need to get out of here. Unless this was a social event I just crashed. A woman ran to a motionless down man. Charlie, he's infected. Although Drovel used humor often, these survivors were not in the mood for it. He scanned the man with his forearm device, then knelt next to him. He concentrated as he placed a hand on the man's arm. A moment later... The man sputtered and gasped for breath. What did you do? asked the woman, staring at Drevel. Just offered a helping hand. He's no longer infected. Drevel examined the scared group. Who speaks for you? A dark-skinned, burly man in a flannel, jeans, and work boots stepped forward. I do. I'm Malcolm Winters. I'm Drevel Sage. And I think it's time we got your group to safety. Malcolm frowned. There's no place to go. We were actually headed out of the city, but we got cut off. Drevel rose and pointed down the street. I can get us to safety, but I need you all to follow me. If anyone gets infected, I'll heal them. If any mutants attack, they get a hand to the face. C.C. raised a strand of cloth, causing the group to stand back. Oh, don't worry about C.C. He was just saying they would get a cloth hand to the face. Malcolm's eyes narrowed. What are you? He pointed at Seer. And what's that? I'm many things, and the orb is Seer, my friend, said Drevel. However, for the moment, we're your salvation, if you accept it. Charlie took some deep breaths. Malcolm, trust him. Whatever he did, I'm not infected. Malcolm ran a hand over his mouth. What have we got to lose? Right? Follow me, said Drevel. Seer descended and landed on Drevel's shoulder cradle for her orb, then shimmered out of view. Drevel focused as he strode down the street, that allowed him to sense anything within a 25-foot radius. The group took a minute or so to get moving, but once they did, they kept close behind. After a short ten-minute walk, Drevel grinned. The rectangular gold portal sat like a glowing beacon among the ruined environment. Drevel stood in front and ushered the group in. Go, go, go! The group wasted no time in rushing through. A small band of mutants dashed to the portal, 
but Drovel stepped through into the featureless white room and the portal closed. They were now in the entry area to the Toravada, and a sealed door on the other side of the room led off to what he called home. However, these survivors were going to a sanctuary earth. The portal reappeared, but this time it led into a spacious veranda. What? What is this place? asked Malcolm with wide eyes. Drovel motioned at the portal. Let's discuss once we're through. The group hesitated. Fine, we're in my home. Well, the staging area, and through the portal is another Earth. One without killer mushroom people, said Drovel. What? asked Malcolm. You've trusted me this far. Just extend it a bit more. Malcolm chewed on his lip for a moment, then waved forward. Let's go. Drevel followed them through, and the portal closed. He liked coming to this earth. He had initially saved some advanced humans from another earth, then offered them this one as a place to go. All they had to do was create a sanctuary for the others Drevel saved while also not disrupting the environment more than necessary. The veranda they were on provided a good view of the nearby forest. Although it was sunlight, a filter above dimmed it some. A man of Asian descent in a white two-piece suit stood before the survivors. Welcome. I'm Director Oda Takeshi. You're safe here, and no harm will come to you. He gestured at a side table packed with food and drinks. I know you have many questions, but first, have some food and drink. Bathrooms are inside and to the left. Drevel motioned at Malcolm to stay as the rest of the group burst over to the table. One woman returned with a water bottle for Malcolm, then went back. Oda glanced at Malcolm. I take it you're the leader of your group. Not by choice, said Malcolm after downing half the water bottle. I understand. This city you're in is a sanctuary for those coming from damaged earths. Oda glanced at Drevel. What was it this time? Aggressive fungal spores? It seems they decided to partner with an enzyme that allowed the spores to creep in and turn people into mutants. I was on my way out when I saw Malcolm's group. Oda nodded. It sounds unpleasant. Malcolm scrunched his face. What do you mean by other Earths? There's a lot to cover. But in short, your Earth is but one of many parallel ones. Oda gestured at Drevel. One of the things he does is visit these Earths, saves who he can, then brings them here. My group was saved from an Earth where a dimensional blob was eating the planet. Only several hundred of us made it out thanks to Drevel, and he brought us to this paradise of an earth. Now we help those that we can. Malcolm surveyed the scene. This place seems... advanced. Drevel chuckled. <laughs> this city is far more advanced than the technology from your earth. You'll get used to it. Unless you want to go back to your earth. This is good, said Malcolm with raised hands and eyebrows. Awesome, said Drevel. He tapped at his forearm device. Seer, open her up. A golden portal opened. Drevel gave Oda and Malcolm a handshake, then faced Malcolm. I'll be back to check up on your group. What's next on your list of many things to do? asked Oda. Drevel smiled. I got a summons to rescue, uh, says Rissa Mortaka. You think the Torvada is trying to get me a girlfriend? Oda laughed. <laughs> you never know. Indeed. All right. Catch you two later. Drevel stepped through the portal. Chapter One Dr. Snowden appreciated that he would no longer be popped into another timeline when the current one changed. He had a dampener that blocked his temporal shielding, and it made him relax. 
It was Monday, October 28, 2013, and almost 7 o'clock p.m. His office hours were done, and he was ready to go home. He glanced at a picture of Kess, his advanced human girlfriend from half a million years in the future. She had come down over the weekend, and her presence had washed away any concerns he had been dealing with. His niece, Emily, had visited with Jelton Stallrin, her boyfriend from a parallel timeline. Dr. Snowden smiled as he recalled the group watching a science fiction movie on Saturday night. Jelton and Kess had laughed nonstop. Given where they were from, that was to be expected. Dr. Snowden stood and adjusted his bow tie and smoothed out his white button-up shirt. His brown slacks could use some ironing, but with the Torvada in the backyard at home, it was easier to just replicate a new pair. It was not too chilly out, but he slipped on his brown jacket anyway. Normally, he would wear his survival suit and a hologram over it, but now that he would not pop over into another timeline if the current one changed, there was no need to be ready to fight at a moment's notice. If there was, he still had his PSD. Knock, knock. His heart pumped furiously for a moment. He remembered being sent to the past by Zika, a rogue time traveler, before on a late night encounter. He sensed a cosmic energy presence and an outsider one, only one being had that amount of cosmic energy, Inspector Dalton Kingston of the Earth Ward. Dr. Snowden was unsure of the other person. Come in, Dalton, said Dr. Snowden. He studied Dalton as he stepped in with the Greek goddess Aphrodite. She was immediately recognizable, and Dr. Snowden had just met her a few weeks ago at a cookout after Dalton's last case. They were a good-looking pair, and although they only started hanging out recently, Dr. Snowden could sense Dalton's energy fluctuations in her presence. Dalton wore a casual outfit, while Aphrodite had on a dress. "'Good to see you,' said Dalton, extending a hand. Dr. Snowden walked past his desk, then gave his famous half-handshake, half-hug greeting with Dalton and shook Aphrodite's hand. "'Going to dinner?' asked Dr. Snowden." Dalton nodded. We were on our way, but wanted to stop in since this is close by. Evot verified you were here. Dr. Snowden chuckled. <laughs> no surprise there. Where are you two going? A Japanese steakhouse, said Aphrodite, smiling. I think he just likes to see the onion volcanoes. You got me, said Dalton. The group laughed. Dalton gestured at Dr. Snowden. All right. I just wanted to stop in and say hi, and wish you luck on your summons. Lord Vigon said it is of particular interest to me, so I'm looking forward to hearing some details when you're back. Dr. Snowden scrunched his face. We have a summons? Oh, you don't know? asked Dalton. His eyes narrowed. I bet you'll get it later. Lord Vigon never gives the time. I guess we're going on a summons then, said Dr. Snowden. Whatever it is, you know I'll tell you about it. Sounds good. See you soon, said Dalton. Aphrodite waved goodbye. Then they exited. Dr. Snowden began to pack his side bag. Lord Vigon knew the future, but he was always cryptic. He only talked to a few concerning his knowledge of the future, and even then, his words were hard to decipher. Thirty minutes later, he entered his house and plopped down on his favorite recliner. He had to be careful. If he napped, it would mess with his sleep cycle. Usually, it took the Torvada to correct that. Emily bounced into the room. Hey, you're home. Yep, sure am. He eyed her. You hear we have a summons? Yeah, Everin just got it a bit ago. He was waiting for you to come home to discuss it. Dr. Snowden chuckled. Ha! Ah. Dalton and Aphrodite stopped by, and he wished me good luck on the summons, said it was of particular interest to him. Emily sat on the couch. Oh, wait, 
Dalton was with Aphrodite? Yeah. Were they, like, holding hands or anything? He drew his head back. I honestly don't recall. I did sense his energy fluctuations. Emily smiled. <laughs> They're such a power couple. I wonder how their relationship will fare with Zeus and Dalton having problems. I don't know, said Dr. Snowden. He seems happier than I've seen him in a while, at least since we saw his wife and kids in the dream layer. Everin and V walked into the living room, then sat next to Emily on the couch. Summons time? asked Dr. Snowden. Analysis. How did you know? Lord Vigon told Dalton we had one, and that it would be of particular interest to him. He and Aphrodite stopped by to say hi and mentioned it to me. Then Emily verified it. Everin raised a finger. Lord Vigon is correct that there is a summons. However, its relation to Dalton in terms of interest is not known to us yet. It seems the nature of that interest will be known to us in the future, as Lord Vigon has not been wrong yet on his knowledge. He extended his hand, palm up, then projected a hologram. We are going to 26491 A.D. to rescue Cesrissa Mortaka and assist her in her cause. Where at? asked Emily. Earth, said Everin. Dr. Snowden perked up. He was used to traveling to faraway places. This would be a local trip, relatively speaking. He was excited to see Earth in the future, but he was also tired. Any chance we go in the morning? He asked. Analysis. Perhaps you can sleep on the Torvada while we scan. Emily high-fived V. Sounds like a plan to me. If you wish, we can do that said Everin. Dr. Snowden nodded. I'm game. Hopefully it doesn't involve gothic lords or anything wild like the last outing. Let us hope not, said Everin. We can meet at 9.30 a.m. to go over what we scanned. Emily grinned. Who's up for pizza? Nothing against the Torvada's replicators, but Pizza Kingdom has the best thin crust pizza ever. Dr. Snowden pointed at her. Oh, yeah, that works for me. After having traveled with Everin on so many adventures, a new trip was still exciting, but it did not require dropping everything at the moment to go like it had been in the past. The summons would be there in the morning. After dinner, he would take care of a few professor things for college, then go to his room on the Torvada. He was guaranteed a solid night's sleep, and when he woke, he would be in the future. Just another day with Everin. Emily woke up at 8 a.m. and stretched. She was eager to see Earth in the future, but before anything, she wanted to get a workout in. The previous night had been fun with an impromptu pizza party, Dalton and Aphrodite's recent issues with the Imperium, an organization of ancient gods and legendary characters such as the Greek Pantheon, had been heavily discussed topics. Emily was glad to see him happy. He deserved it. She hopped out of bed and slipped on her survival suit. An hour and a half later, and she was back in her room after an invigorating workout. She had created gothic enemies from the previous adventure to fight. Fighting enemies from her past helped her grow in her combat abilities and use better tactics in future fights. She got cleaned up and went to the conference room. Dr. Snowden greeted her. Morning. Hey, she said, going to the matter replicator. After grabbing some orange juice and a steak and egg burrito, she sat opposite him. Ready for another adventure? He asked. She smiled. Yep. Think we'll ever go back to a normal life? He asked, grabbing a bite of his cereal. I don't know. I'm okay with how things are, but might want to take a break down the road. Dr. Snowden chuckled. <laughs> I'm with you there. Everin and V entered the room. Everin always looked like he had stepped right out of a magazine. 
His spotless suit, never moving hair, and emotionless face would make models jealous. V was in hologram mode, and she knew he liked appearing as a young man in his early twenties. Everin sat at the head of the table while V plopped down next to Emily. I see you both have had a good rest, said Everin. Always do, said Dr. Snowden. He eyed V. I slept without a blanket, but woke up with one on me, and the room temperature decreased. Analysis. It was not me. Nor I, said Everin. Dr. Snowden adjusted his glasses. Maybe Emily did it. Wasn't me, she said. You probably did it and don't remember. Probably, he said. He gestured at Everin. I know we're a bit early for our meeting, but I'm ready to hear our next summons. Very well. Everin interacted with the table console and projected a hologram of Earth. Emily studied the various data windows to the side. It showed 26.491 A.D. and 9.30 a.m. as the date and time. There were advanced ships and satellites in orbit, but Earth's geography resembled the one she knew. While you two slept, V and I scanned Earth and the surrounding systems, said Everin. Humanity inhabits thousands of systems, but there is no central power. There are multiple empires, and Earth appears to be a core world in one of them, and also where our summons will take us. Dr. Snowden pointed at the red dot on the hologram. Southern Idaho? Idaho does not exist in this time period, but yes, that is where we are to go. Emily played with her ponytail. So, what's Earth like? Various images appeared. Earth was advanced, and the cities were a mix of forests and steel. Every building was sleek, and ships flew everywhere. What stuck out was the huge swaths of forest mixed with vast fields. There were buildings and machinery dotted across the landscape, and the lack of smoke billowing out anywhere was noticeable. There were humans and aliens in several images. The city closest to where they were going showed humans with a variety of outfits, but they all were two-piece and light-colored, mainly white with golden or silver trim. Earth in this time period is called Praza, and humans are the dominant species. The Chelatan Empire consists of several hundred systems, and this is one of their core worlds, but not their seat of power, said Everin. Wow! said Emily. I wonder if they know this is where humanity came from. Analysis. Their records indicate that humanity's origin is unknown and is a source of debate. Dr. Snowden shrugged. We could tell them. Everin eyed him. Dr. Snowden grinned. Just saying is all. Besides, I would think with all the artifacts found, it wouldn't be too hard to figure out. Analysis. There are other planets with similar artifacts and humanoids. I can see why it might be confusing, then, said Dr. Snowden. If you both are ready, we can go to the summons site, said Everin. Dr. Snowden stood. Let's not keep Praza waiting. They went to the command center, and the Torvada descended. Emily appreciated the Torvada being in scan profile 1 and stealthed. Nothing would be able to detect it short of Dalton Kingston pointing it out. As they cruised through the atmosphere, the inner front wall highlighted various crafts. It surprised her that a majority had no life signs. When they reached the summon spot, she surveyed the immediate surroundings. They were on the edge of a field near a forest. A large rock structure stood in the distance, along with a tower of some type. Something with cosmic energy registered inside the forest. A drone of some type had also been registered. Uh-oh, what's that? asked Dr. Snowden. Everin's eyes narrowed. I do not know. It appears to be a being with cosmic energy and a drone. Emily's heartbeat ramped up. The last time they had encountered a cosmic being, it had been Wardax, 
Someone who still gave Dr. Snowden nightmares. Well, let's see what this is all about, she said. Everin laid a hand on Dr. Snowden's shoulder. Know that whatever this being is, I will not allow them to take you should they prove hostile. Dr. Snowden exhaled. I know. I'm curious, but cautious. A good state to be in, said Everin. He stood. Let us go. They went to the ramp and paused before the Toravada's shielding. Emily had her helmet closed and her energy shield out. Her PSD was morphed into a stun baton. Dr. Snowden had the same setup. V was using his orb form while Everin had his hands behind his back. V. Scout mode, said Everin. Acknowledged. Scout mode engaged, said V as he shimmered out of view and flew out. Emily followed Everin and Dr. Snowden outside the shielding while watching the aerial view from view. The forest was serene, and V had already identified the cosmic energy being. Whoever it was stood on a branch and faced the group. The orb hovered off to the side. Everin marched on with no hint of fear. Emily felt reassured next to him. Dr. Snowden's cosmic energy fluctuated, and he trailed a bit behind Everin. The cosmic being jumped down, then approached the group on foot. They stopped, and Everin stepped forward. I will talk to whoever this is. Maybe we should have talked to him from inside the Torvata shielding, said Dr. Snowden. We are close enough that we can go back if need be. But this cosmic being has 15% of my energy levels and is no match for me. That is half of what Dalton has, and only 10% more than you both. All right, said Dr. Snowden, licking his lips. Emily fixated on the man that emerged from the forest. He had spiky blonde hair and a fair-skinned face that looked like it laughed a lot. The eyes were white and silver and appeared technical. His black and blue tactical outfit was advanced, and a black trench coat hung off him. She sensed the cosmic energy on him, but also Alcarin energy, a combination she had never seen before. The man stopped before the group and studied them. The orb formed a holographic projection of a woman with metallic skin, green hair, and orange eyes. She wore an advanced two-piece outfit. Everin crossed his arms across his stomach and bowed slightly. Hello, my name is Everin. And with me are Dr. Albert Snowden and Emily Snowden. Above us is V, an AI that has tracked you. Hello to you all, said the man. He stepped back with one foot and into an elegant pose, then extended his hands off to the side. I'm Drevel Sage, and I think we have something in common, and it's not just good looks. With me is Seer, my friend, and the fashionable coat hugging me is a cosmic cloth, or CC, but he doesn't speak. Hello, said Seer, smiling. Drevel gestured at Dr. Snowden. I like your bow tie, even if it's just a holographic projection over your suit. Watch what CC can do. He changed his appearance. Emily furrowed her brow. It was obvious he liked dark blue, silver, and white as a color theme. He now wore a sports jacket over a button-up shirt with a vest over it. His black pants and shoes completed the outfit. It was like a cross between an adventure suit and a business one. CeCe's morphing ability was impressive. Well, that's interesting, said Dr. Snowden. Drevel changed back to his original look. Then he pointed at the Toravada. Much less than that. Nice ship. You can see it, asked Dr. Snowden. It's stealthed, but I know it's there. Drovel tilted his head and gestured at Everin. You all have cosmic energy, but you're almost a pure cosmic energy being. Something like that, said Everin. I am curious as to how you received yours. Drovel chuckled. Ha, long story. But in summary, I was chosen by something called the Toravada. And it created me, said Seer. Sure did, said Drevel. 
We had to fly here from there, and let me tell you, the drones here are aggressive. But we just came from the Torvada, and you pointed at it, said Emily. Do you mean your ship? asked Drevel. Seer tilted her head at him. Of course she means the ship. Just checkin'. Emily nodded. Drevel rubbed his chin. I think there's some confusion here. V landed and assumed hologram mode. There are no others in the area. He examined Seer. You are like me. I don't have enough information to confirm that, said Seer. Acknowledged. Everin turned and motioned toward the Torvada. Then it may be best if we speak on our Torvada, although Drevel can sense it. I suspect that is due to what he is and not something this civilization can do. Now I'm really curious. Lead on, said Drevel. Chapter 2 Drevel was not sure what was going on. Everin's cosmic energy indicated he was extremely powerful. Drevel had never seen anyone with those types of levels. As he followed the others to their ship, which they called the Torvada, a million questions raced through his mind. Dr. Snowden and Emily had opened their helmets, and they appeared human, but Drevel sensed their cosmic energy. Even V had some. When Drevel crossed through the Torvada's shielding, his eyes widened. It felt like he was in his Torvada. As he passed by several doorways, he noted that they used dimensional mechanics, just like his Torvada. Seer landed on his shoulder and shimmered out of view, then appeared as a hard hologram next to him. Seer? he asked. This must be another Torvada, as it has allowed me to appear here in my hologram form without my orb requirement, said Seer. Drevel sensed Everin's cosmic energy fluctuating again, something that had occurred outside as well. I didn't say it earlier, but you look a lot like Cyrilus. Facially, anyway, said Dr. Snowden. Seer tilted her head. I'm unfamiliar with this name. It appears the Torvada may have multiple forms, said Everin. It stands to reason, then, that a creation of the Torvada could move between any of the physical forms. A sound hypothesis, said Seer. After a minute, they were seated in a conference room that closely resembled the one he was used to. Drevel took a seat next to Seer. Dr. Snowden, Emily, and V sat opposite them. Before we begin... We are often referred to as the gang. With that said, do you wish for any drink or food? Asked Everin. I'm good, said Drevel. Very well, said Everin. Perhaps it is best if we define some things. You are on the Torvada, which is my ship. It can travel through space, time, and beyond. Dr. Snowden, Emily, and V are not among the Torvada's chosen. As implied by Seer, you have your own Torvata. Drevel interacted with the table console, projecting the layout of a structure. Yeah, and oddly enough, your interface pulled up access to my system. Our Torvata is a pocket dimension. How's that possible? asked Dr. Snowden, looking at Everin. It would seem the Torvata is far more than it appears, said Everin. There was no indication that other forms were created when I received the Torvada. He gestured at Drevel. You mentioned you were chosen. Yeah, said Drevel. My earth was being ravaged by an alien race. I fled and ran through a portal into a white room. Seer was there and said she had been waiting for me since I was chosen. I thought it was a joke at first. But after entering a room, I found out it wasn't. That's when I got cosmic energy. I don't recall that event, said Seer. My first moment of self-awareness was after Drevel had been through his process. That was kind of weird. Your process was just like Dalton's, said Dr. Snowden. He scrunched his face. You have Alcarin energy too, which means you're a healer. Drevel smiled. 
Yep, I have high regeneration and can heal others. And I already introduced CC. His trench coat slipped off and waved at everyone, then went back on him. Dr. Snowden laughed. Ha, are you serious? A cosmic trench coat? Oh, CC is more than that. He can lift me and fly, assist in combat, conceal me, change my appearance, and a host of other things. Doesn't talk like I said before, but maybe that's for the best. CC playfully swatted Drevel's cheek with a neck collar. Emily laughed. Aw, that's so cool. Everin studied Drevel. The only Torvatus chosen we are aware of is Inspector Dalton Kingston, a friend of ours. He has 30% cosmic energy relative to me. You have 15%. As you also have Alcarin energy, it would seem you only received half of what a chosen would get, and the other half went into CC. That's interesting, said Drevel. So your Torvada has chosen too. He glanced at Seer. I'm amazed that we had no information on this. It's not in any record available to me, which means the Torvada did not want me to know, she said. Drevel furrowed his brow. But you're like a digital representation of it. Perhaps we will learn more now, said Seer. I hope so, he said. Dr. Snowden wagged a finger. So, what brought you three to where we were? I highly doubt this is coincidental. I had a summons, said Drevel. Emily smirked. Let me guess. You had to rescue Cesarissa Mortaka and assist her in her cause. Close. I take it you get summonses too, then, said Drevel. Yep, and we have similar ones, it seems. Drevel found it hard to believe there was another whole crew of cosmic energy beings on their own Torvada dealing with summonses. Yet proof surrounded him. Even Seer was at a loss for words. She was probably processing how all of this could be. That was a first, but this was a day of them. So our Torvadas sent us to slightly different summons, said Drevel. He glanced at Seer. I agree with Dr. Snowden. I doubt this was coincidental. Most likely not, said Seer. Our summons had us bringing Cesrissa back to our Torvada to assist us in further summonses. Analysis. As ours was to assist in her rescue and aid her in her cause, then it would seem you both aid her as well. A logical assessment, she said. Drevel eased back into his chair and put his hands behind his head. So we're sort of like family here, and I'm the handsome and friendly long-lost cousin. The group chuckled. What type of summonses do you all do? asked Drevel. Dr. Snowden adjusted his glasses. Our last one had us find a cosmic artifact. We had to fight invaders from outside the universe. Drevel sat up straight. Really? Did you go there? Oh, yeah, said Emily. We went to their dimension in the Universal Cell, but we had to hop through time and travel to various planets first. Drevel could tell that the summonses they got were very different from the ones he took on. It made his look comical. What are yours like? asked Emily. Uh, I just rescue people, report on other Earths, find things... Track and fight malicious organizations, etc., said Drevel. My Torvada only opens portals on Earth. Well, all Earths that exist across all timelines. It has an entry point at every meridian and parallel intersection, or line of longitude and latitude. Makes traveling a little easier. Dr. Snowden grinned. So you hop across parallel Earths, basically. Yep. Thanks. Now I feel inadequate. Emily shook her head. No need to be. There's a pattern, I think. We do all these summonses in faraway places or times while Dalton handles our Earth. It seems like you cover the other Earths. The Torvada has a plan. Drevel studied her. Could be. Since Cesrissa is to join me on my outings, watch her be a Torvada's chosen. You never know, said Emily. 
The Torvado wants you two together for some reason. Drevel pondered Emily's statement. It was a lot to take in, like when he had been chosen. His whole perspective on his existence had changed yet again. Not only was he not alone, there were others who did what he did on a grander scale. He also wanted to meet Dalton Kingston. As far as Drevel knew, Dalton was the only other one like him out there. Drevel waved a finger between Dr. Snowden, Emily, and V. How did you all get cosmic energy? Long story, said Dr. Snowden. In short, Emily and I almost died, and another version of Everin gave it to us. Another Everin? Dr. Snowden chuckled. <laughs> that speaks more to Everin's origin. I see. Drevel glanced at V. I'm guessing you weren't dying to get some? Emily laughed. Analysis. I was created along with this Torvata, but not by it. I have had several forms prior to this one. Seer tilted her head. Do you create a new one when you die? I do if my orb is retrievable. Fascinating, said Drevel. Emily motioned at Seer. How did you choose your name? It was registered for me when I came into existence, said Seer. I, I wonder if it's short for Cyrilus. She has an echo here. I do not know her or what an echo is. Everin's eyes glowed slightly. Cyrilus was my partner, and when she died, she created this plane with all its universal cells, universes, and timelines. A part of her exists here, although we cannot communicate with her. Your partner created a reality? Well, multiple levels of it? Upon her death? Asked Drevel. She did. Drevel realized just how powerful Everin must be. To have his partner create a plane, though Drevel was not sure what that was, and also universes meant Everin was beyond anything Drevel had seen. His Torvada only allowed entry to parallel Earths and opened in static positions, whereas Everin had a flying Torvada, traveled with a group of cosmic beings, and could go anywhere and to any time. It put into perspective where Drevel, his Torvada, and Seer fell. Although similar in some regards, Everin and the gang were on a different level. Thankfully, they were friendly. Mind if I get a tour? he asked. Dr. Snowden was not sure what to fully make of Drevel. The thought of the Torvada having multiple forms was strange. The fact that Seer looked like Cyrilus, and their names even shared the first three letters, was most likely not coincidental. Everin's energy spike when Seer had appeared had been noticeable, but he would have quickly realized it was not Cyrilus in another form. Then there was Drevel himself. His cosmic energy was easy to detect, and while he might not physically be on Dalton's level, he could heal, had Seer as an AI companion, and he had CC. How CC worked remained a mystery, but Dr. Snowden could see how it might be used. He recalled Dalton mentioning that this summons was of particular interest to him, and meeting Drevel would satisfy that criterion. He was a Torvatus chosen, and it sounded like he had gone through the same process as Dalton. Another intriguing aspect was Drevel's personality. He was sharp and quick-witted, and kind of reminded Dr. Snowden of Sandus, the information broker from previous adventures. CeCe's silence and Seer's presence as a digital avatar for the Torvata must make for an interesting combination. The group exited the conference room. Everin turned back while glancing at Drevel and gesturing into the room. This conference room, and the ones the other doorways lead to, were created by dimensional mechanics. Does your Torvata utilize those? It does. But all the rooms exist there without it, as far as I know. Maybe because it's a pocket dimension that can expand to any size? said Drevel. They walked past the other doorways, and Everin pointed at each one in turn. Outside the conference room, we have the hollow room, the living quarters, medical lab, the research room, 
and the maintenance hub. Each is its own dimension. This is most impressive, said Seer. Although I am limited here, I have viewed the layouts. As your Toravada can fly around, it would be very helpful to be able to bring these rooms to places in normal space that ours cannot. Sure is, said Dr. Snowden. The maintenance hub is sort of a mystery to me. Same here, said Emily. Seer tilted her head. I cannot access the layout of that. Analysis. That is by design. Even I do not have access to it. Very strange. Drevel chuckled. Your Torvada has almost the same rooms as ours. I use the hollow room for workouts, living quarters to, well, live, and the medical lab to assist others. We also have a research lab. One difference is we have a large portal room where the Torvada opens portals for me. Emily pointed at the command center. We just open portals and fly through. That is crazy, said Drevel, bounding over to Everin's command chair. He pointed at Everin. Must be for the big guy. Indeed. Drevel walked up to the front podium. Guessing V is here a lot. Acknowledged, said V. Drevel studied the side seating. And Dr. Snowden and Emily sit there. I do wonder, though. Do you take on companions from time to time? Emily grinned. All the time. I guess for this summons, you're stuck with us. If you want, that is. I'm up for a party, he said, winking at her. Seer eyed him. The last time you mentioned that, you ended up in a crokillic prison. How was I supposed to know that dancing would trigger them? I think someone knew and didn't tell me. The group chuckled. Dr. Snowden could see Seer and Dravel had a good connection. They teased in good fun and were comfortable with each other. Everin pointed up. We have a roof we go to at times to get a better view of things, and you have already seen the outside. Liking it, said Drevel. Since we share similar summonses, we should work together as Emily implied. I concur. I would be interested in seeing your Torvada afterward. I think we all would, said Emily. Dr. Snowden wondered what Drevel's life must be like. He had a secure base of operations and ventured into other Earths. That would provide a unique look into humans and potentially whatever else might have evolved. It would give a what-if view of other Earths, like if Dr. Snowden was a king. The thought excited him, but he did ponder why the Torvada needed someone like Drevel to go and do summonses. I take it I have a room in the living quarters, then? said Drevel. Yes. Follow me, said Everin. The group assembled outside one of the living quarters rooms. Drevel used the side console and opened the door. He grinned, just like the one in my Torvada. And what do you know? My configuration copied over. You do that, Seer? I did not, she said. Drevel strolled in. Yeah, these Torvadas are definitely linked together. He plopped down on his bed. I'm still surprised I've never heard of any of this until now. The Torvata works in mysterious ways, said Dr. Snowden. He was not sure what the Torvata's overall plan was, but it was apparent that it wanted Drevel to meet the gang. He must have loved some type of advanced technical music, as there were posters on the walls that were high-tech intermixed with bright visuals. The cabinets had the appearance of black metal. You like music, I take it, asked Dr. Snowden, gesturing at the posters. Oh, yeah, said Drevel. Since I usually go to Earths in the same time period, I get to see a variety of styles. Lately been into tech wave punk. It's so raw, full of energy, and gets you going. Dr. Snowden chuckled. I might be into that if I was younger. Drevel studied him. How old are you? Early fifties? You? Two hundred and eighty-four. But I was chosen when I was thirty-four. Learned a lot since then. Dr. Snowden's eyes widened. Wow, 
You've been around a while. I guess that's not too surprising. We know of hybrids with alkaline energy on our Earth, who we call Lightmires, who are over nine hundred years old. Gotcha, said Drevel. He eyed Emily. You must be early twenties. Yep, said Emily. Drevel glanced at Everin. And you? I do not speak of my age other than to say I am ancient. Oh, my bad, said Drevel. He motioned at V. I'm guessing you're ancient too? Analysis. I have existed for a long time. Dr. Snowden recalled that knowing Everin's exact age was dangerous. It could be used in an algorithm to calibrate a weapon specifically meant to kill him. Dr. Snowden did not think Drevel was being malicious, but just curious. Well, who's up for rescuing Sazrissa? asked Drevel with hands extended off to the side. Analysis. I am. Drevel put his hands in the air. V high-fived each one. Not that way. You hit both at the same time. V smiled and did so. Drevel laughed. There we go. Seer, take notes. She eyed him. As if you would read them. He pointed forward. Rescue time. Dr. Snowden liked Drevel's energy and his interaction with Seer. He was full of life and seemed capable of handling himself. After living for so long, he probably sought out new experiences and challenges and did so with a smile on his face. Dr. Snowden followed the others to the command center. Everin sat in his command chair while V stood up front. Dr. Snowden sat on the right with Drevel while Emily and Seer were on the other side. It felt natural to have Drevel along. Although Dr. Snowden had seen many come and go, Drevel reminded him somewhat of Kess, but with more snark. This adventure had already started off with a lot of surprises, and Dr. Snowden suspected Drevel's appearance would not be the last of them. Chapter 3 Emily watched Drevel closely as the Torvada lifted off. His gaze swept the area several times, and he focused intensely on what V was doing. To know the Torvada for so long as his home, only to find out there was another one in the form of a ship, must have been mind-blowing. Given his good nature, she understood why he was happy. This was probably one of the most unique experiences he had lived so far. V. Perform scans and an optimal search pattern. It seems the purpose of our summons location was to meet Drevel. However, I suspect Sazrissa is nearby as well, said Everin. Acknowledged. Emily chuckled when Drevel gleefully pointed at the data display that popped up on the front window. He was like a kid in a candy store. His age was not that odd considering what he was and she wondered what she would be doing when she was that old. After a bit, the Torvada hovered outside a cave system. The view screen showed four men in strange, white light armor suits with orange accents near the cave entrance. Another man had on a heavy chrome armor and had a large, hip-mounted weapon on his side. They all appeared human and had set up camp. Two guards sat at a table and played a holographic game that used creatures of some kind. Another worked on a screen of some type, while the fourth stood guard, looking toward the cave. The heavy armor guy stood near the screen with his weapon tilted up. The weapons resting by the two playing the game were impressive. They resembled energy weapons. Emily focused on another data window that showed a deep view of the cave system. One of the dots deep inside the cave had cosmic energy. Drovel pointed to the dot. That has to be her. I concur, said Everin. Whoever it is, they are hurt. We shall render assistance, but need to be cautious. There are other dots moving toward her. V, land us near the entrance away from those men. Acknowledged. Acknowledged, said Drovel. I love it. V peered over at him. Thank you. 
I am not saying that, said Seer. Emily laughed. She loved their interaction. Their speech intrigued her. It sounded modern to her, but then again, after Drevel, Seer, and CC had visited so many Earths, that would not be too surprising. There would be many human cultures to sample and learn from. The Torvada landed behind a hill. Everin stood. Let us go. V. We will need you in orb mode. Acknowledged, said V as he flew away and shimmered out of view. Perhaps I should join him, said Seer. Have at it, said Drevel. Seer disappeared, and her orb appeared on Drevel's shoulder. She flew after V, and, like him, shimmered out of view. That's interesting, said Dr. Snowden. I can see Drevel's avatar in my ARI, and also Seer's view. Everin nodded. It appears their communication system is already tied into our Torvata. Sure is, said Drevel. So, what's the plan? I will talk to these men regarding the person inside. If they cannot render aid, we will. Drevel pursed his lips. And if they turn out to be bad guys? I mean, come on, white armored suits, assault weapons, some type of mobile communication device, and they set up camp outside the cave? Then you got Mr. Heavy over there with what looks like a laser chain gun. I doubt he's selling cookies. Something's off about them. I share your concerns, and I agree that Mr. Heavy is most likely not selling cookies, but we will handle it, said Everin. Emily cracked her neck. It's in their best interest not to obstruct us. Oh, cocky. I like it, said Drevel, making a finger gun at her, then pretending to shoot. She laughed again. He had a way of lightening the mood. They exited the Torvada. After they walked over the hill, Emily examined the men in more detail. Their physical size stood out. They must have been at least seven feet tall, with athletic builds. The four men with white light armor had silver tunics over it with an orange circle and an elegant white E in the middle. Their light blue heads and hands were the only skin showing, and metallic circles were embedded behind their ears and under their short-cut white hair. The heavy armor guy had a similar tunic, but he also had chrome plate armor instead of white armor. The Torvada had scanned them all as humans, so she figured they must have evolved or adapted over time. Maybe it was an enhancement or something. Several drones had been detected, but they were scout ones. As the group walked toward the men, the lookout aimed his weapon forward. A white helmet formed over his head. In a digitized voice, he said, Halt! The other men moved into action and grabbed their weapons and joined the first one in targeting the group. The heavy armor man lowered his weapon and used both hands to hold it in place. The lookout stepped forward. Everin raised a hand. We mean you no harm. Identify yourself, said the lookout. I am Everin, and with me are Dr. Albert Snowden, Emily Snowden, and Drevel Zage. State your purpose. Everin motioned at the cave entrance. We detected an injured person in there. We are here to render assistance. Uh-huh. And you're Everin? I am. Oh, and I'm Everin too, said the man. He nodded his head at the other men. So are they. Everin tilted his head. I do not believe so. Why have you not provided aid to the person in the cave system? Cesarissa Mortaka is a terrorist. She attacks several Everinite facilities. If you're here to free her, then maybe you're terrorists, too. Besides, we'll have her soon enough. I am unfamiliar with the term Everinite. What do you refer to? The man harumphed. 
This isn't a question answer session. I think I've heard enough. He glanced at the other men. Lock them down. Everin's eyes glowed. I do not think so. One of the men advanced with several restraints. Everin formed his energy shield and spawned his staff. He leapt over the man, tapping him on the head. The man collapsed. When Everin landed, he faced his shield toward the other two men while extending his staff toward the lookout. The lookout fell after a stun blast hit him. The other two guards fired orange beams at Everin, but he reflected them with his shield. The men crumpled. The heavy armor man unloaded a massive beam at Everin, who jumped out of the way. Drevel threw CC at the man. CC wrapped the helmet and then pulled one of the man's legs back. The man fell forward. CC's immune to stun. Fire away, said Drevel. Dr. Snowden and Emily fired stun blasts, but the man's shielding held. Everin tossed a card at Drevel. Place this on his back. Drevel dashed toward the downed guard, then placed the card. A moment later, the man's suit powered down, and his helmet unlocked. Drevel pulled it off, then used his fist weapon to tap the back of the man's head. Well, that wasn't a friendly welcome at all, said Emily. Drevel studied the scene, then faced Everin. You, you took the other four out like they were nothing. That's just Everin said Dr. Snowden as he walked over to one of the downed men and scanned him. Emily could almost see the gears turning in Drevel's head. Everin's display of speed, power, and perfectly reflected beams entranced Drevel. Although that was what she expected from Everin, she understood that it would be powerful to others who had never seen it before. Drevel walked up to Everin. You're way tougher than you look. What did that card thing do? It is my universal interface card, or UIC. It allows me access to any technological system without an AI presence and some biological systems. I used it to disable the man's suit. I did not wish to hurt these men, but I will not allow our capture at their hands. Drevel swatted Everin's arm. Damn! I'm glad I'm on your team! Dr. Snowden chuckled. We're the gang, and you and Seer are now members. I'm curious what they meant when they said Everinite. You ever hear of it in your travels? Nope, said Drevel. Seer, you seen anything like this? There is no record of them, she said over comms. Drevel pointed at the symbol on one of the men's tunics. I bet E is for Everinite could be. These men were guarding the entrance, said Emily. Everin took the UIC from the man's back, then placed it on the screen that one of the men had used. I concur. There is limited information here, but Everinite refers to a group dedicated to me, it would appear. Everinite? Name fits, said Drevel. Everyone huddled behind Everin. Most of the available data details basic star charts, this planet, its civilization's rules, and other similar information. I have downloaded it for further analysis once we retrieve Sazrissa, said Everin. You know, those Everinites will be back, said Emily, but they didn't seem to recognize you. Not all is as it should be, said Everin. Nonetheless... V and Seer have entered the cave system and are mapping out a path for us to Sazrissa. She is deep and is moving away from the other dots, per this device's readings. She is being hunted. We must assist her now. Drevel bobbed his head. Works for me. Emily followed the others when they moved out. The thought of a cult of Everin that did not know who he actually was made her skin crawl. Maybe they worshipped another version of him, or even a future form. She did not think any version would allow men like the ones they had fought to represent him, much less hunt someone down with cosmic energy. There was still a lot to learn, and she suspected when they found Sazrissa, she would fill them in. 
That assumed that she was friendly. She could be another rogue cosmic entity. Emily launched her illumination orb along with Dr. Snowden's and Everin's. At least they would not have to hunt in the dark. Sazarissa Mortaka slumped against the rock wall, deep in the Monodelean cave system. She had been there for eight days and had run out of food two days ago. Although she could still function, it was hard to stay focused. She studied the four dead Everonites that had pursued her. She had tried to stick to stunning them, but they would wake up later and hunt her again. The only way to thin their numbers was by lethal means. She hated that it had come to that. Her tough, black, light armor had proved its worth. It had natural shielding that obscured her heat signature and could project an image that encapsulated her. That was handy in infiltration. But she also had pocket dimensional pads on her forearms, palms, fingertips, and heels that allowed her to project various objects. Her fingertips could shoot heat, stun, water, and acid beams and sticky globules. Her palms could emit a resizable cosmic shield or a grappling beam. Her feet allowed her to fly, but she had tied her heels' cosmic energy output into her rocket boots. While she could withstand brutal assaults, she also required food. If she had not been a Torvata's chosen, she suspected she would have already perished. Her mind wandered to Everin. He had saved her long ago while dealing with a great threat, and during that adventure the Torvata had chosen her. Since then, she had tried to use her gifts to stabilize the Chelentan Empire, the most stable of all the human empires. She had met several Everins afterward, and each one was different and progressively earlier in his personal time stream. Whatever version Everin was, they had all come in great times of need. She did not hold out hope that another Everin would visit this time. He had already helped her enough. While working for the Chelatan Empire as adjudicator, someone who enforced the law and was given broad rights, she had accomplished a lot. However, she had become disillusioned at the greed and callousness in government bureaucracy. Now she was a vigilante, fighting against the atrocities of the Everinites. The Everinite cult had formed after an event where another Everin had stepped in. Sazrissa had helped out as always, but the new cult that had sprung up bore little resemblance to anything Everin related. They had taken his core message, tweaked it, then added a bunch of their own. It brought a lot of followers. She could not stand by when she got wind of some of their illegal activities, so she had taken action. The price of that was being labeled a terrorist and hunted down to what would probably be her tomb. They wanted to parade her like a trophy if they captured her. She used the wall to stand. There would be more Everinites coming, and she needed to go deeper. Maybe she could find an exit and escape, but she knew this particular cave system was massive. In addition to the Everinites, she had come across vicious creatures. However, there might be another exit somewhere, and she had to move on. Her suit's power was low, which meant her dark vision would go out. She tried to avoid using any of her cosmic abilities, since her cosmic energy was the only thing sustaining her. She just needed a place to rest, and she could do that with her suit's proximity alert system. Her cosmic energy could also wake her, but usually not before she was made. She advanced deeper into the cave. The ground was slippery and had jagged areas at some spots. Thankfully, her helmet helped her see them, and she loved that her filters kept the smell to a minimum as she was sure the environment smelled great. The pure darkness was punctuated by a dimly glowing moss in certain places. Although she did not want to enter the caves, it was her only resort. There was simply too much Everonite power topside. A humming sound approached. She ducked into a nook and waited. As the scouting drone passed, she contemplated taking it down, but that would give away her position. Better to let it report there was nothing in the area. She had initially taken down a few, 
but there were so many squads and drones, it had had no noticeable effect on the Everonite's ability to catch her. Something bit into her leg. She aimed her palm down and projected a shield, which dislodged whatever had sunk its teeth into her. She moved away from the wall and focused. The large, centipede-like creature was now detectable. It was five feet long with large pincers. Between the drone distracting her and her tiredness, she had not sensed it until it was on her. The creature jumped at her. She pointed at the monster and fired a stun beam from her finger. It shrieked and backed up, then scurried onto the ceiling toward her. She fired sticky globules in hopes of rooting it, but it was too fast. It dropped down on top of her and tried to bite through her helmet. Its pincer-like legs jabbed her and broke through her armor. There must have been a poison injected in her because she felt searing pain shoot from every place she had been pricked. Her heart beat furiously. This beast had to go down fast. She wrestled her hand free and placed her fingertips against the creature's head, then unleashed searing heat beams. The monstrosity slumped and stopped moving. She pushed it off her and winced. The commotion had probably caught the attention of the drones as she heard a distant humming noise approaching. She moved down a side tunnel and focused on finding a rest spot. Her picobots would heal her over time, but that was not something she had a lot of. After fifteen minutes, she found a cavern with a massive chasm in the middle. On the other side were various ledges. She grappled over to one and peeked into the tunnel. It was like every other one she had seen, so she entered it. After a bit, she discovered an area she could rest in. The entrance was a thin crack that would be too small for another one of the creatures she had fought to get through. The space she slid into was not large, but it would do to catch her breath. She lay down out of the line of sight of anyone that might peek in. Her suit projected the image of a rock. While a deep scan would reveal her, her projection would provide some cover should a drone pop in. Her water beam provided her with some relief, but she really wanted something to eat. Although the thought of maybe having a piece of the large bug had crossed her mind, the mere idea of it repulsed her. She wished she had a food beam. However, for now, she would need to wait out the worst effects of the poison. Although she had powerful gifts, she was not invulnerable, and in her current state, she would not be able to stop anything with power that might think she was a snack. Her eyes sagged. Her cosmic energy might sustain her for one more trip to find a way out and avoid being captured. But her hopes were beginning to diminish. This could be where she died. Her eyes closed. Chapter 4 Drevel watched the views from V and Seer as they flew. The mapping gave a good idea of the immensity and twisting nature of the cave. Drevel was glad that Seer could partner with V. It must do her good to interact without fear of knowledge pollution. V's AI and cosmic energy mixture was a first for Drevel, but he understood the power in it. Everin's dismantling of the men outside impressed Drevel. Everin had torn through them as if they were a mere nuisance. His speed was fast, and he appeared as a blur. The perfect angling of the shield, while simultaneously shooting, was done in one smooth action. Then there was the UIC, which took down the heavy armor. It was evident that Everin was far more powerful than his form would lead someone to believe. The journey to this point had been uneventful. Everin had two orbs that lit up everywhere the group went. Emily and Dr. Snowden had launched orbs from their suits that provided even more illumination. Their thin, pen-like devices intrigued him. He had seen them use them as communication devices, but they also scanned with them. What is that? Exactly, asked Drevel, gesturing at Dr. Snowden's device. Dr. Snowden held it up. It's a personal support device, or PSD. It can shoot stun, heat, repulsion, mist, and grappling beams, as well as sticky globules. 
It can also use morphable metal to create things, and there are dimensional mechanics at work for things like food pellets and water, or whatever is needed. Really? All that, and in a convenient form factor. I'm impressed. Emily showed hers. Yep, it's like another body part at this point. She gestured at Drevel's forearm device. I take it that similar? Drevel chuckled. <laughs> Nowhere near as powerful as a PSD. It functions as a scanner and communication device. He extended his hand and formed his fist weapon. Torvada gave me these. Saw you stun with that earlier. They look like someone stuck a blunt crescent over your fist. They add to my electrifying persona. She eyed him. He laughed. <laughs> I also have two energy pistols. I tend to use those as often as possible. The gang was easy to get along with, and he loved that they accepted his personality. They would be fun to travel with. He was used to it just being him, C.C. and Seer. While he did not mind that, it was nice to have someone else lead for a change, and Everin was a natural leader. After twenty minutes, the group paused. Analysis. Seer and I have found Cesrissa. She appears to be in a trance state of some type. Your scan indicates she has picobots, but her vitals are weak, said Everin. Picobots? asked Emily. I'm guessing same as nanobots, and if so, then they're three orders of magnitude smaller, said Dr. Snowden. I'm sure they act like our nanobots. Everin nodded. I concur. Was there anything else, V? There was a dead creature on the path to her as well. Drevel grimaced when an image appeared in his ARI. He was not a fan of bugs and had seen several bug-like races on other Earths. The creature in the image looked like a mutated centipede. He wondered if Sazarissa had put the five holes in its head. Yeah, no thanks, said Emily. Let's hope its family doesn't come looking for it, said Drevel. Analysis. No family was detected. Emily grinned. He was joking, V. He does that, said Seer. I see, said V. We will hold here for now. Very good, said Everin. We see the path you and Seer took and are following it. Drevel enjoyed seeing how the gang operated. They moved through the cave system with little worry, even though they had just seen a big monster bug. He sensed that everyone was calm, despite the potential for fighting. After another twenty minutes, the group stopped in a large open area. A group is heading toward us, said Everin. Drevel had not detected the group, which put into perspective how far away Everin could sense things. It wasn't until a moment later that Drevel was able to sense the fast-moving group headed toward the gang. Judging from their movement style and sounds, this must be one of the Everin night squads hunting Sazrissa. A drone flew into the area, but was downed by a stun blast from Emily. Everin motioned toward the wall opposite where the men would come from. Shields out. I will attempt to dissuade them from attacking us or going after Sazrissa. They're probably not the chatty type, said Drevel. I concur. However, I must give them an option to go in peace. Drevel appreciated that Everin would give the squad a chance to avoid a fight. They probably would not give the team the same consideration. Dr. Snowden and Emily had backed up to the wall and had their shields out and PSDs aimed forward. Everin had his energy shield out and his utility handle was in the shape of a staff. Drevel moved behind them and pulled out his two pistols. Four men burst into the area with assault weapons drawn. They wore similar armor to the men at the entrance. One of them stepped forward. You assaulted an Everonite unit outside the cave. On your knees. I will not allow your group to capture or slow us down. We do not wish to fight, said Everon. On your knees. Now. 
it is evident you do not understand me. The men opened fire. Everin's shield reflected the first energy beam back at the man who had given the orders. Dr. Snowden and Emily did the same for two others. Drevel fired a volley at the last man, stunning him. Everin's speed was once again on display when he had raised his shield to reflect before the first beam hit. It was also evident that Dr. Snowden and Emily had mastered the precision required to angle a shield and reflect an energy beam. When Everin had placed his UIC, a flow of information rushed into Drevel's ARI. He was not sure how it was able to do that so fast. Quick on the draw, said Emily. I have been called a gunslinger before. Drevel rubbed his chin. The UIC has allowed us to tap into the Everinite system, and we can see where the other groups are at. Yes, and they will not know we are on their network, said Everin. They'll be coming here, though. When these men's systems respond that they're out, said Emily. We need to move. Agreed. Everin motioned forward, and the group continued on. After thirty minutes, they reached a massive cavern. A chasm split the area into two sides. Emily, form a flying platform. Acknowledged, she said. Analysis, you are teasing me, said V over comms. She chuckled as she extended her PSD out in front of her. Drevel's eyes widened when liquid metal of some type poured out and formed a platform with waist-high sides. He was even more confused when everyone boarded it. You coming? asked Dr. Snowden. Me? Oh, yeah. No problem, said Drevel. He could have just flown, but he was curious as to what the platform would do. He gripped the side when the platform hovered, then moved over the chasm to a ledge. He detected the energy output on the underside and figured that was what allowed it to fly, but he was not sure where that power came from. Dimensional mechanics and programmable matter were not new to him, but seeing them used together was. The group exited when they reached the ledge. Then Emily pulled the platform back into her PSD. That was quite nifty, said Drevel. Sure is, she said. They marched through some tunnels until they came across V and Seer hovering outside a crack in the wall. Analysis, she is in there, said V, shining a light in. Everin grabbed the side of the crack and ripped chunks of it away, then stepped through. Although Drevel and the others did not go in, it was easy to sense Sazrissa's cosmic energy. She had quite a bit more than he had, and it boggled his mind to meet so many cosmic beings. Even the person they were rescuing was one. Everin emerged with an unconscious Sazrissa in his arms. Drevel noted that her suit had some type of projection that showed her as a rock. Her vitals were low, and her picobots reported that she was fighting a toxin in her system. Dr. Snowden, create a narrow flying platform for her transport, said Everin. You got it, he said. He formed a platform similar to Emily's, but with half the width. Everin laid Sazrissa inside. V. Prepare the Torvada for our arrival. Seer, we could use your scouting ability. Acknowledged, said V. He flew away, then shimmered out of view. Of course, said Seer. She flew to the front of the group. When they got to the chasm, Dr. Snowden enlarged the platform enough for everyone to board and cross, then adjusted it back when they were over. If Drevel had been doing this solo, he would have used CC to blend in with the walls to avoid patrols, flown over the chasm, then had CC carry Sazrissa out. Seer would provide scouting while he dealt with whatever groups they encountered. With Everin, though, he walked in without worry or concern. It was no surprise that even Seer deferred to him. Drevel felt like an observer for the most part on this trip. Dr. Snowden studied Sazrissa as the group headed back to the Torvada. Her cosmic energy reminded him of Dalton's, which was 30% of Everin's. Although he would not say she was a Torvada's chosen until she confirmed it, it was a strong data point. 
Her armor had some type of projection on it that made it look like a bunch of solid rocks covered her. He could see through that and observed blue areas on her fingertips and palms. Everin guided the flying platform behind him. Dr. Snowden felt vulnerable without his PSD, but with this group, there was not a big concern. Cesarissa would surely have a story to tell, and he doubted she was a terrorist. The Everinites did not seem like a friendly bunch. The men they had fought before came into view. They were still down, but their armor had blinking lights. Per Seer's reconnaissance, reinforcements are coming, said Everin. He paused and faced the group. It also seems there are more units gathering outside. V. Block the entrance. Acknowledged, said V over comms. Dr. Snowden studied the small army forming outside. In addition to the units he had seen already, there were several in heavy armor. Drones and hovercraft with cannons had also appeared, as well as a large ship above. The Everonites must really have wanted Sazrissa. He also saw the reinforcements closest to the group that was tracking them. Seems we've gained some new friends outside, said Drevel. And then some, said Emily. With the Torvada at the entrance, though, they won't be able to enter. Drevel raised a finger. Unless they just widen the area around the Torvada. Talk about an explosive welcoming party. That is a valid point, said Everin. However, should that occur, the Torvada will melt its way to us. Drevel's eyebrows raised. It can do that? Emily smiled. Oh, yeah. As the group continued on, Dr. Snowden reflected on Drevel's presence with the group. All of this was new to him. New cosmic beings, Torvada, and abilities. Once Sazrissa was safely on the Torvada, Dr. Snowden was eager to talk with Drevel. His perspective of being a Torvada's chosen but not knowing Everin must be fascinating. This was new to Seer, and Dr. Snowden wondered what she thought of all this. Sazrissa would also be an intriguing discussion. Analysis. The Torvada is in place, and the Everonites are trying to dislodge it. Their weapons attacks are futile. Let us hurry, lest they widen the entrance then, said Everin. The group increased their pace. As they neared the Torvada, Seer reported in. More hunting groups have arrived, possibly from another entrance, or perhaps they were already elsewhere in the cave system. They are converging on your location. Dr. Snowden liked that Seer could function in place of V as needed. He wondered if this was how she worked with Drevel. Her scans showed four groups moving. That would be sixteen Everonites to deal with. There is an open room ahead with only two narrow entrances. We can use them as choke points, said Everin. Drevel raised a finger. I have an idea. They won't be able to detect me if I'm close to the wall thanks to CC. I could follow some distance behind and provide a third front. Get them after they enter the corridor. Very well, said Everin. Drevel moved along the wall as CC morphed to cover him like a blanket. Dr. Snowden could still sense the cosmic energy, but visually and thermally, Drevel was not there. It was an impressive ability. We will need your PSD, said Everin, glancing at Dr. Snowden. I will carry Sazrissa from here on out. He leaned into the platform, scooped Sazrissa up, and placed her over his shoulder. Dr. Snowden retracted the platform. This was going to be a tougher fight than the previous ones. The group advanced to the open room and waited. The first hunting party tossed a gas grenade, which Everin repulsed. He fired a mist beam, and Emily ignited it. One of the attackers had not been disabled and charged Everin while shooting wildly. Everin angled his shield, and one of the shots took down the Everinite. Dr. Snowden likened the charge to one a zealot would make. It made no sense, and the charger probably thought he was protected somehow. That was not the case. He heard some commotion behind the group. A moment later, Drevel said over comms, Second group down. CC wrapped an Everinite up and made him shoot another. I took care of the other two. 
Drevel could easily handle himself against multiple attackers. Dr. Snowden wondered if Drevel had captured the fight on a video feed as he wanted to watch how he had handled the situation. Emily would probably hold that over Dr. Snowden's head as a way to get into the hollow room. The thought of CC wrapping someone up was hilarious and scary at the same time. The group paused when they came to another large open area, but this one had six entrances, three on each side. Everin pointed at both sides. They are trying to flank us. We can deal with them here. He laid Sazrissa down. Dr. Snowden and Emily, cover the right side. Drevel, we will need you here. On my way, said Drevel. Dr. Snowden stood on the right side of Sazrissa and angled his shield forward. Emily adopted a similar stance. When Drevel arrived, Everin motioned for Drevel to go to the left side of the entrance that one of the hunting groups would be coming through. Dr. Snowden peeked back and saw Drevel vanish when he reached the wall. Dr. Snowden's attention was brought back to the tunnel entrance when two grenades flew in. Emily repulsed them, then fired a mist beam. Dr. Snowden lit it up. He sensed two Everinites were down. Cover me, said Emily. She snuck to the side of the tunnel entrance while Dr. Snowden fired stun blasts. Everin and Drevel dealt with the other group that had simultaneously attacked from another corridor. Emily spun into action when the two remaining men on her side rushed in. She leg-swept one while hitting the other with her stun baton. Dr. Snowden shot the other. He pivoted to watch as CC used a strip to hold a man in mid-air. Drevel reached up and tapped the man with his fist weapon causing him to go limp. C.C. laid the man on the ground. The other three men were downed by Everin. We work well together, said Drevel with a big smile. Let us not get complacent, said Everin. He picked up Sazrissa and placed her over his shoulder. We must go. Seer, head to the Torvata. On my way, she said. Dr. Snowden chased after the others. Everin was right in that the Everinites might have another trick up their sleeve. Dr. Snowden wanted to analyze the men more, but time was of the essence. Heavy thumping came from ahead. When they reached the cave entrance, the source was obvious. The Everinites were excavating to the sides of the Toravada. The gang rushed on board. Everin took Sazrissa to the medical lab and laid her on a slab. V. Take us to low orbit. Acknowledged. Dr. Snowden dashed to the command center. His eyes widened at the force that sat outside. The Everinites clearly had power, and they had responded in numbers with advanced technology. Although the outside force would not be effective against the Toravada, he shuddered to think about what would happen if he did not have that. As the Toravada ascended, the Everinites moved into the cave. They acted like they were confused and since the dust and dirt had been vaporized off the Toravada, it would not be detectable. He went back to the medical lab along with the others. Cesaris's vitals had improved. He was not sure if anything had been given to her yet, but her rock projection had faded away. Although her helmet had retracted into her neck collar, she still wore a mask over the bottom half of her face. She had light tan skin and jet black shoulder length hair, and was fast asleep. V moved into action, and after several scans from the overhead device, he hooked her up to some tubes. Dr. Snowden studied the holographic layers that appeared over Sazrissa. Her vitals indicated she was starving. The exotic energy layer was easy to see, and another layer showed the healing nanobots injected into her working effortlessly with the picobots. I see those picobots too, said Emily, glancing at Dr. Snowden. He nodded. I guess we wait until she wakes up. Shouldn't be long, based on what the layers are showing in terms of healing. He scouted out a chair, then sat in it and eased back. Emily and Drevel joined him. A resting party. I like it, said Drevel. He motioned at Sazrissa. You know, I could just heal her, although in her state it would take a bit out of me to do so. I am aware, but you need to rest as well, said Everin. The Toravada can handle this. Drevel raised his hands. 
Got it. If you need these bad boys, let me know. Drevel's slaying cracked Dr. Snowden up. It was hard to believe that picking up two cosmic beings was a part of the summons. What that would lead to remained unknown, but he had already learned more than he had thought he would. Chapter 5 Prime Arbiter Frenev clasped his hands behind his back as he stared out the window of his large office. He had a good view of the Everanites' headquarters plaza. The orange trees and green and gray shrubbery made the place look inviting, as did the hustle and bustle of adherence to the Everanite faith. He recalled the days when the plaza had been merely a field and the Everanites had been dismissed as a cult. He ran his light blue hands along his white robe and rested them on his blue belt. Elegant silver embroidery covered his sleeves and collar, which extended up past his head. It had taken him a long time to get to his position, and he enjoyed every minute of it. He moved a hand through his white hair. Although he had been in some tough situations, he had extended the Everanite's reach. Now they were in thirteen systems, with a major presence in three of them. As Prime Arbiter, Frenev managed the Everanites at the highest level. He had guided them for centuries, and had taken them from a small group to billions, all united in the worship of Everin, who had arrived in a strange event that had him remove a large threat that had saved countless civilizations. The event would have gone unknown except for a few like him who knew the truth and spread the gospel. However, it was not until a century or so ago that something special had happened. Frenev remembered the moment with clarity. He had been out with the Everanite leadership on a ship headed to a system where the Everanites were gaining ground. Some energy wave hit the ship, and after whatever it was had gone, Everyone aboard had gained new abilities. It was taken as a miracle given by Everin. His attention focused on someone entering the room. Prime Arbiter Frenev, there's been an incident, said a man in white robes. Frenev pivoted and studied Major Disciple Relic. His light blue skin and white hair were common for most humans who became Everin Knights. Go on. Relic interacted with his palm. A projection shot out from a device on his shoulder. Sazarissa Mortaka has escaped with the aid of someone who says they are Everin. This was his group's introduction image. Frenev studied the still hologram of the group outside the Monodelean cave system. Labels showed each of their names. Frenev had never met Everin before but he had seen pictures and videos, so he knew this was not Everin. Dr. Albert Snowden, Emily Snowden, and Drevel Zage were fair-skinned humans, an evolutionary throwback to less intelligent times. Play it, he said. Relic tapped at his palm and the projection played. The Everinite unit had followed procedure. Then Everin had attacked them. The hologram switched views due to the men being taken down. After the display ended, Relic showed Everin and the others exiting the cave entrance, then disappearing. What happened there? asked Frenev. Nobody knows, said Relic. Scans indicate they walked into something and vanished. However, some saw dirt and rocks vaporize. Frenev rubbed his chin. I see. What else is known? There were several encounters inside the cave system, said Relic. He projected those. Everin dismantled the men with great ease. Drevel was like a ghost from the rock wall. His trench coat jumped off and covered a soldier. Drevel's speed and stun ability showed he was a great combatant. Emily Snowden was equally tough as she disabled two men without any trouble, and Dr. Snowden fired like a marksman. The group was formidable and defeated over twenty Everonites in their time in the caves. They now had Sazrissa as well. 
What should we do? asked Relic. Patience is the key, said Frenev. I don't think this is the last we will see of this blasphemer and his crew. In the meantime, I want an analysis done on the weapons and fights in the cave system. We can at least study those to be better prepared for when they resurface. Relic licked his lips. What if it really is Everin? Frenev eyed him. Everin speaks to me. He did not mention anything about this. Sazrissa would poison his mind anyway. Do you think she could do that to someone as powerful as Everin? Relic chuckled. <laughs> You're right. The Trinicans have the verification cube, though. And we have the stones, and Everin speaks through me. The Trinicans are merely a nuisance. I've seen that cube. It doesn't do anything. It's impervious to everything. Frenav shrugged. It's just an ancient relic of no value. How does that help us? The Trinicans can cling to it in the hopes that it will lead to Everin. But it won't. Frenav raised a hand and closed his eyes. He focused his ability to create whispers and voices that only Relic would hear. It allowed Frenav to make others think that he channeled Everin's voice to them. Listen to Prime Arbiter Frenev. The man in the video is not me. He is a blasphemer and must be dealt with. Frenav opened his eyes. Everin has spoken. Relic shuddered. You are truly blessed to be his conduit. And you to be as devoted as you are. Create a communications package to deal with this Sazerissa incident. We want to ensure that those connected to our network get the right information. Make sure the images of those who would attack us are known to our security forces said Frenhev. Relic bowed slightly, then rushed out of the room. Frenhev went back to the window and gazed out. People were easy to fool. All it took was giving them something to believe in, getting them hooked up to the Everonite network. Then it was soft propaganda for decades. The goal was to create contentment so that people did not question or think of anything else. After a few generations, their descendants became devout Everin knights. Turkus had been a powerful system, but after fifty years of steady conversion, a majority of their civilization were Everin knights. Frenav loved being able to set what was law and what was not, and he had a ready-made army at his beck and call. When other civilizations asked for military help, that was when Frenev tasted true power. He was never going to give that up, even if there was an Everin. The neural implant that all Everinites got after declaring their fealty ensured that they were fed a steady diet of the Everinite galactic view. He could have suggestions set down and watch them play out in mere minutes. Once a generation passed, the implant was put in the children during their formative years by eager parents. This also allowed for digital copies of the children to be used in virtual simulations for a variety of purposes. Frenev sneered. Even if it was the real Everin that had arrived, Frenev was confident that he controlled the masses under his sway. In time, the Everinites would become Frenevites. It might take a few more decades, maybe a century, but it would happen, and this new group of intruders would not stop that. Sazerissa felt different. She was no longer in a damp cave, but somewhere warm and well-lit. The feeling was something she instinctively knew. She was on the Torvata, 
Although she was coming out of a calm, trance state, her heart beat faster at the thought that maybe Everin had come. He had to have, if she was where she thought she was. Then again, she could be imagining everything. Her vision cleared as she wiggled some. After a moment, she sat up and slid her legs off the side of the slab she was on. She was in the medical lab, a place she knew very well. She studied the five people in front of her. Everin was obvious based on his energy signature, but he looked different. Dr. Albert Snowden and Emily Snowden were also recognizable from hollow videos she had seen. It took her a second to recognize V, but she recalled this incarnation used a hologram over a stick figure model. She did not know who the fifth person was or the projected hologram next to him. As quickly as her joy had come, it went. Dr. Snowden and Emily were companions of the first Everin, Everin Prime, or the Battle Everin, as she had heard him referred to. That meant Everin would not know who she was. His future forms would, though. I am Everin, he said, and with me are, Cesrissa pointed in sequence, Dr. Albert Snowden, Emily Snowden, and V. I don't know who you two are, though. Drevel's age, at your service, the fifth person said with a slight bow and flourish. I am Seer. Sazrissa scrunched her face. That's odd that I don't know either of you. Drevel smiled big. That is strange, as I'm hard to forget. Seer eyed him. It appears you know us outside of Drevel and Seer, said Everin. Your energy signature is similar to someone we know. Dalton Kingston, said Sazrissa. She raised a finger. Oh, Earth Ward Inspector. Have you met him? Sazrissa grimaced. I have, but I can't speak of it. He's another Torvata's chosen. So you're one too, asked Dr. Snowden. Yep, and it's good to be back, she said, hopping off the slab. She gave Everin a bear hug. You're the same in any form, and I'm so happy to see you again. Everin rubbed her back. It would seem you know my future forms, and we have a good relationship. She stepped away and smiled. A few. She examined the others. I want to say thank you for my rescue. I wasn't expecting to make it out of there. Drevel winked at her. We Torvada's chosen have to stick together. She studied him. He had Alcarin energy, and about half as much cosmic energy as herself. She had thought she knew all of the Toravadas chosen, but it was apparent the Toravada did not allow her to know all of them. I look forward to getting to know you. As for the others, it's an honor to have the opportunity to meet you, she said. She shook everyone's hands except for V, who she high-fived. I think we have a lot to discuss. Yeah, said Emily. Two Torvadas chosen on one summons? Something's up. Analysis. We will discover what is up. Sazrissa laughed. She loved how innocent V sounded. She had only watched clips of him, and it intrigued her to have watched his evolution in future incarnations. Emily gestured at Sazrissa. Dalton has the ability to open and close portals as his gift. Drevel has a cosmic cloth, or CC. I'm guessing you have some unique ability as well outside the usual cosmic senses. Sazrissa smiled as she raised her hand. I have dimensional pads throughout my body, tied to a pocket dimension inside me. Really? asked Drevel. How's that work? Sazrissa pointed at one of her fingertips. I can shoot acid, heat, stun, and water beams from my fingertips. She tapped her palm. 
These can project a cosmic shield or a grappling beam. She pointed down. The soles of my feet have an area that can emit energy, allowing me to fly, but I have it directed into my jet boots. That's awesome, said Emily. You are quite powerful, said Everin. Dr. Snowden adjusted his glasses. And you have Dalton's level of cosmic abilities and senses. And Picobots. How'd the Everinites ever corner you? asked Drevel. Zazrissa frowned. As strong as my gifts are, they can't stand against an army. Each use of my abilities drains my cosmic energy, so I have to be mindful of that. Drevel nodded. I hear that. My healing uses up quite a bit, so I use it sparingly. I suspect your cosmic energy charges faster than mine. It might. But I can't regenerate anywhere near as fast as you, or heal anyone else, assuming your Alcaron energy allows that. Everin gestured at Sazrissa. While a food pellet was administered, perhaps you may wish for some other type of sustenance. She went to the room exit. Meeting time, then? She could almost feel the other's confusion, but to her this was another version of the gang. The Torvado was different, but each Everin had their own stylistic choices for the interior. Everin's strange speech intrigued her, but she recalled he had no control of that, similar to V. That would change in future versions. When she got to the conference room, she ordered her favorite dish, a pizza bowl. With some root beer, she was set. She sat next to Drevel on the right side of the table, while Dr. Snowden, Emily, and V had the other side. Everin was at the head, as always. That looks good, said Dr. Snowden. Giving him ideas, said Emily, grinning. And great ones at that. Sazrissa twirled her fork in the bowl. I think you'll discover you like it more than you think. Drevel glanced at her. This must be old hat for you. I bet it's like reading a history book, then traveling back to meet people. Sazrissa swallowed a bite. That's a good analogy. I knew this was the first ever in prime form because of Dr. Snowden and Emily. That means we weren't there for the other ones, said Dr. Snowden. Sazrissa paused. I can't say, although I guess saying you're tied to the first form probably gave that away. I need to be careful what I say. She motioned at Everin. Your rules. I see, said Everin. As Emily mentioned, it is unusual to meet two Torvadas chosen. However, Drevel's summons was more specific in that you were to go to his Torvada and assist him. Sazrissa drew her head back. His Torvata. He likes to think it's his, but it's ours, said Seer. Oh, I just realized you look a lot like Seerless, said Sazrissa. I am an embedded AI in our Torvata. Drevel smirked. Fine. Ours, Sazrissa furrowed her brow. Well, that's new. It's apparent the Torvata has been keeping things from me, even as a chosen. Tell me about it, said Drevel. This morning I learned there was another Torvata with a cosmic crew. Now I found out there are other chosen, and one who likes pizza bowls. Yes, it's very odd, said Sazrissa. The news of another Torvata surprised her. All through her travels with other Everins, it had never been mentioned. As this was the first form, the ones she met previously had clearly known of the other Torvata, but had not told her. This must be the exact moment when Everin had learned that it was her first time hearing about it, so his future forms would not say anything to maintain personal timeline integrity. Emily chuckled. Usually we have to go through who we are, what we do, and the like. No need with you, it seems. I want to interact with everyone here as much as I can, 
said Sazrisso with a smile. Why were the Everonites after you? They said you were a terrorist, but after seeing how they acted, their view is probably wrong. Sazrisso sighed. I have attacked a few transports, mainly ones that carried Everonite neural implants. Dr. Snowden tilted his head. What were they used for? I guess I should start from the beginning. There was an event several centuries ago that involved Everin and the gang. Well, a different one. I assisted, then became a Toravatas chosen. Cyrilus said I needed to assist humanity here, so I did. I had also observed a small group that worshipped Everin. They were harmless at first, but they had a civil war and broke into two factions, the Everanites and the Trinicans. Drevel smirked. We met the Everanites. Nasty bunch. I hope the Trinicans are better. They are, she said. They're peaceful and truly try to live life by a simple set of ideals. They have a verification cube given by Everin that lights up in the presence of powerful exotic energies. It was to verify if someone claiming to be Everin actually was. She cleared her throat. The Trinicans don't seek power, but the Everinites do. After the split, they grew in power and created the Arbiters. They were normal humans that functioned as the Everinite leadership. Something happened a century or so ago, and they became wild-born. They called it their awakening and used their abilities to really expand the Everinite sphere of influence. That was when it really took off. Awakening? Sounds familiar. Emily played with her ponytail. What type of abilities did they get? I don't know what most of them are as they rarely display them. But I could sense the wild-born energy on some of them. The one I do know is Prime Arbiter Frenev. It said Everin speaks through him, and he can channel that to others. Dr. Snowden glanced at Everin. You whispering to arbiters in your free time? I would not especially if the goal was to advance an agenda I disagree with, said Everin. Drevel laughed. Sazrissa chuckled. Well, long story short, I used to be adjudicator, sort of an enforcer with broad legal powers. I grew tired of seeing the Everinites expanding and twisting Everin's ideals into something I knew he would not approve of. They also began to use neural implants that are put in followers when they become Everinites. It's like all-day propaganda wired directly into the brain. That's unsettling, said Emily. Sazrissa nodded, even when they're taken out. Those who have had them for a long time still find it difficult to recognize any fault with the Everinite belief system. Sounds more like a cult to me, said Dr. Snowden. We share a similar view, then, she said. She motioned at Drevel. You said you got a summons to bring me back to your Torvata. Sure did, said Drevel. Seer raised a finger. To clarify, the summons said you are needed to assist in further summonses. Ah, that's interesting, said Sazrissa. Sounds like a new assignment to me. Everin nodded. Our summons was to rescue you, then aid in your cause. I assume your cause is to stop the Everinites. Sazrissa grimaced. Yeah, that's the high-level cause. It consists of stopping their illegal digital cloning operations, shutting down their communication system, and taking their leadership down getting the Shelaton Empire to declare the Everonites a non-allowable entity would help there. Digital cloning? asked Dr. Snowden. The cloning of a digital consciousness. Emily's eyes narrowed, and that is... Sorry, said Sazrissa. The consciousness from a living being made digital. Emily chuckled. I guess the name does imply that. It's okay said Sazrissa. It's a complex topic in itself, 
but know that there are different types of digital consciousness. She raised a finger. The first type is original digital consciousnesses, or ODCs. Those are ones that are created when someone is dying or has decided to undergo the transference to a digital consciousness. She held up another finger. The second type is tethered digital consciousnesses, or TDCs, and those are created when someone connects to a virtual world. Their physical body acts as a tether while they're inside and also as a security measure. They're typically temporary. She raised a final finger. The final type is the cloned digital consciousnesses, or CDCs, the ones I mainly focus on. These are created via a cloning device and are the ones the Everonites exploit. Imagine if you had an ODC, then someone cloned it without your knowledge. That would be a CDC, and it's illegal. They could then do unethical actions to the CDC. All types of digital consciousness can inhabit various physical body types. But that's another topic. Sounds intense, said Drevel. So Everonites are dealing in CDCs, and you want to stop it. All I can do is try, said Sazrissa. We will need to learn more about the situation before we proceed in that regard, said Everin. Whatever you need. Analysis. We are owed a tour of the other tour Vada. Drevel high-fived V. You got it, buddy, says Rissa stretched her neck. Before we go, I could use some rest. We all could, said Everin. Let us reconvene in the morning. Then we can visit Drevel's Torvata. Says Rissa rejoiced at the opportunity to not only see another Torvata, but have a chance to hang out with yet another gang. She had heard this Everin was emotionless, but she had sensed his fluctuations. Drevel was an oddity, and she was curious to learn more about him, CC, Seer, and their Torvata. For now, rest was on her agenda. Chapter 6 Dr. Snowden enjoyed his night's rest. The Torvada made sleeping effortless. It did make him wonder how the neural effect was so effective. If packaged into a pill, it would sell with ease on earth. His mind lit up as he thought about seeing Drovel and Sears Torvada. There was also an opportunity to talk with Sazarissa more. Dr. Snowden gazed at a picture of Kess that was oriented toward the bathroom. He picked it up and stared at it, then placed it facing the bed. As he showered, he pondered Sazarissa mentioning which version of Everin this was due to his traveling companions. That might mean that he and Emily did not travel with future versions. Maybe they settled down. However, if there were other Everin forms... That meant the one that Dr. Snowden traveled with would perish at some point. The idea filled him with dread. It was no longer an if situation, but a when one now. Sazrissa was proof of that, assuming she was not lying. After getting cleaned up, he went to the conference room. He paused when he saw V and Seer chatting. They both were smiling at each other, and Dr. Snowden suspected Seer must have been lonely as the only AI in her Torvada. Now she had another AI to talk with, and she got to see another Torvada. It must be enlightening to her. Dr. Snowden grabbed a steak and egg bowl and a drink and sat. Hey, you two. Good morning, said Seer. Analysis. You are early. Dr. Snowden eyed V. I'm early sometimes. 27.3% of the time. Dr. Snowden chuckled. Of course you would know that stat. He took a bite of his breakfast, then a swig of his drink. Am I interrupting a good conversation? Seer shook her head. V was showing me schematics that would upgrade my orb when I accompanied Drevel on his missions. Sounds interesting. What are you thinking? Replacing my nanobots with picobots and upgrading the materials I use. 
Dr. Snowden studied her. I guess the Picobots would allow for more intricate designs. Analysis. It is based on Evot's design. The Picobot system that Cesrissa employs has provided some input. One downside is that Picobot systems take longer to form something and are not as resilient as nanobots initially. They also require more energy. I'd love to see your upgrade plans if you get it going. Me too, said Seer, smiling. Dr. Snowden wondered what Seer's final form would be. He suspected that without a pocket dimension of energy or cosmic energy like V, Seer had to watch her usage. The biggest upgrade would be to allow her to have more power and run longer before recharging. Emily popped her head into the room. We're in the command area, ready to go. Dr. Snowden wolfed down his bowl, slammed his drink, then left with V and Seer. Drevel and Cesrissa were on the left seating area, so Dr. Snowden joined Emily on the right. Seer joined V at the front console. Everin sat in his command chair. V. Take us to the coordinates Drevel has entered. Seer has requested to pilot, said V, facing Everin. Very well. Seer, take us down. Acknowledged, she said. V tilted his head as everyone laughed. The Torvada descended through the atmosphere. Dr. Snowden liked that V got a lot of attention from Drevel, Seer, and Sazrissa. V was like a brother to Dr. Snowden, and he had seen V grow over the course of many adventures. Dr. Snowden had talked with Jake Melkins, an old friend who knew U4, V's predecessor, Dr. Snowden wondered what the future incarnations of V were like that would exist with Everin's other forms. Although Dr. Snowden would love to ask Sazrissa, he suspected she would not say anything. After twenty minutes, the Torvata landed in a field next to a forest. Are we going to keep the Torvata out? Well, ours? asked Dr. Snowden. Seer faced him. Your Torvata can go through our portal. Emily smiled. A Torvada in a Torvada, not confusing at all. Seer nodded, then vanished. A moment later, a rectangular portal manifested. Seer reappeared next to V. You can move in slowly. I have expanded the other side some, said Seer. The Torvada hovered, then moved in. Dr. Snowden examined the featureless white room, and we're home, said Drevel, standing. Dr. Snowden joined the others as they exited. He could see the portal that they had come through. Seer closed it after a moment. This must be like a foyer area. In the back of the room was the dark blue outline of a door. When the group reached it, Drevel and Seer stepped through. Dr. Snowden glanced at Sazrissa. Any of this feel familiar? It feels like the Torvata, but we're outside of it. Well, the one I know, she said. Same, said Emily. In we go, said Dr. Snowden, motioning for the others to proceed. He followed them in and studied the half-circular room that acted like a hub. There were hallways that led off like spokes on a bicycle wheel. Comfortable couches and chairs resided to his left, and a holographic set of displays that showcased various items on the other side. This must be a lounge of some type. This is where I relax, mainly, said Drevel, gesturing around. You mean nap, said Seer. Drevel grinned. It's comfy here. He pointed at an embedded device on a nearby wall. Matter replicators are there. This would be a good meeting room, said Emily. Drevel jabbed a finger at her. Exactly. See, Seer? She thinks so. We have a conference room, but it's so much easier to meet here. Seer glanced at Emily. He will never meet anywhere else now. I'm sorry, she said, chuckling. It's okay. Drevel pointed at each hallway, starting on the left first. That goes to different conference rooms, including one that's more like a theater. The next one goes to several hollow rooms. 
The one after that goes to the medical lab and storage. Research lab is after that. Then the last tunnel leads to a labyrinth of rooms that I don't fully know what they do. Emily wrinkled her brow. It's sort of like our Torvada's layout. Can the rooms expand? They can, said Seer. Although this is a pocket dimension, it can extend and scale as needed. Then it sounds like the only real difference is that this Torvada is tied to a single point across all Earths, whereas ours is a ship. Emily motioned at Seer. And you, of course. Dr. Snowden rubbed his chin. I'm curious about something. If I were to stay here, where would I stay? Follow me, said Drevel. The group went to a door in the living quarters. Dr. Snowden tapped at the side console, then stepped in when the door whooshed open. His eyes widened. The room was identical to the one on his Torvada. He studied the picture of Kess on his nightstand. It faced his bed, just as he had done this morning. Is this my actual room on our Torvata? he asked. I do not know, said Everin. Does it appear so? Dr. Snowden pointed at the picture of Kess. I moved that this morning, and it's in the same position here. That's interesting, said Sazrissa. Maybe since the Torvadas are linked, it's the same room, just available to whoever the resident is. Seer tilted her head. This room did not exist here in this configuration until Dr. Snowden accessed the console. The Torvada is more than I thought it was, said Dr. Snowden. Sure is, isn't it? asked Drevel. I want to check something now, said Emily. She went to the hollow room with everyone in tow. Once there, she pulled up her Gothlick's training program. What the hell are those things? asked Drevel with wide eyes. What we fought on our last trip out, said Emily. Sazrissa studied the Gothlicks. They're evil. Oh, they were twisted, said Dr. Snowden. He felt a twinge of sadness as he thought of the group that had traveled with them. Tolandra in particular stood out as someone he had gotten close to. He might never see her again. As twisted as the Gothlic lords were, their presence forced him to remember the good times, too. This is crazy, said Emily. Sazrissa grinned. Definitely interesting. Everin gestured at Drevel. Perhaps we can see how you get your summonses. He smiled big. Follow me. Emily found a plush cushion on one of the couches in the lounge. The place was big enough to seat at least twenty with ease. It was like a personal home movie theater with the U-shaped seating arrangement, except instead of a large screen up front, there was a holographic display. It unsettled her some how closely this Torvada resembled hers. It made her wonder if there were others out there. Dr. Snowden sat to the left and V on the right. Everin and Sazrissa were on another couch, and Emily could see that Sazrissa did not want to let Everin out of her sight. Seer stood in the back, while Drevel hung out in the front of the area. Drevel pointed at a holographic display. Usually when a summons comes in, this screen flashes. Then Seer picks on me until I come check it out. I don't pick at you, said Seer. I push you. The group chuckled. Drevel interacted with the screen, then flicked his finger toward a large center display. This is the summons with Sazrissa. Emily examined the various parts of the readout. One had a timeline section with a long number as the ID. Another showed Earth with a red dot. Under that was a description to find Sazrissa, then bring her back to assist in other summonses. Pretty clear on what my next move is, said Sazrissa. You could travel with us, said Dr. Snowden. Sazrissa frowned. That's not how it works with my relationship to Everin. Everyone stared at him. Everin half smiled. I will have to take her word on that. It's nothing bad, said Sazrissa. You have a long path ahead of you. I'm in parts of it. 
but that's just it. Parts. I understand. What if I wanted to travel? What am I? Chop meat over here? Asked Drevel. Emily eyed him. Do you? Drevel laughed. <laughs> and leave Seer behind? Besides, the Torvado wants me here. And it seems it wants Cesarissa here, too. Emily wondered what it would be like to add those two to the gang. It would be crowded, but they would also be a very powerful group. I saw the timeline section, said Dr. Snowden. I assume those other Earths you visited can be shown here. Drevel nodded. Any that the Torvada has access to. Oddly enough, the timeline you're from didn't exist in the database until I got the summons. I wonder why. Dr. Snowden glanced at Everin. I saw the long ID number. Is that Torvata specific? I don't recall seeing that in our planner cartography lab. It is, said Everin. That is the planner unique identifier, or PUID. It is long and not meant for casual identification. I used a system of identifying Earths in the order I came across them. Drevel does too, said Seer. I got tired of hearing him butcher the Pewit. Drevel smirked. In my defense, if you have to spend the better part of an hour trying to say the ID of something, you're doing it wrong. Have you run into a group known as Dinkara? asked Emily. Dalton encountered them when they tried to infiltrate our Earth. They're apparently a multi-timeline group. Sadly, I have. Their Earths are more challenging to work in, and they know who I am. One thing they do now if they detect my presence is to enact a protocol specifically targeted to search for Alcarin energy. If they get a whiff of that, then the hunt is on, said Drevel. Seer pulled up a screen of a robot with some type of liquid metal skin. Sendroids that are housed in their facilities are sent out. Sendroids? asked Emily. Drevel sighed. Yeah, they have programmable matter body parts stacked on a tough frame. Walk, fly, and look human, but can form their arms into blades and the like. They're a pain to deal with. I usually just run from them. He interacted with his forearm device, causing the screen to show a scrolling list. Nonetheless, here's the Earths I've encountered. Whoa, that's a lot said Dr. Snowden. Drevel shrugged. Relatively. Compared to how many timelines are out there, it's minuscule. Everin eased back into his seat. Which group have you discovered has the most appearances on these Earths? Purifiers. And it's not even close, said Drevel. He grimaced. For a human supremacist group, they sure hate Earth. Always enslaving this or that. He used a mocking voice while mimicking two people talking via alternating hand puppets. Hey, how's it going? I'm going to enslave you. Oh, that's great. Drevel cracked Emily up. He seemed used to being the life of the party. We banished the Overlord, the Purifier's cosmic being that led them, said Everin. However, that left a leadership void and it would appear the factions went their own way instead of trying to reorganize. That would explain the discrepancies I see in them. While they appear the most, they almost always have a different banner or headgear or whatever, said Drevel. Emily gestured at the screen. Outside the groups, what type of Earths have you come across generally? Drevel interacted with his forearm device, causing the screen to show a variety of categories. I group them as I come across them, but they usually fall into two high-level categories, habitable and inhabitable. The inhabitable ones require more gear and preparation. They also tend to have silicone-based life and other exotic things. Query, what do you do on those? Asked V. Usually retrieve something said Drevel. I have a heavier suit for those types of environments, and Seer has a more powerful orb. We try to avoid using them on habitable worlds since it could cause knowledge pollution. Sazrissa wrinkled her brow. 
Why not just open the portal closer, then? The Torvada can only open a portal at the intersection of any full latitude and longitude degree, said Seer. Seems like getting to the goal is half the battle, said Sazrissa. Drevel nodded. Yeah, usually there's an intersection nearby, but we can also hop around as needed. I try to acquire whatever transportation exists for that earth. He gestured at the gang. From what I've seen so far, your Toravada should have none of those issues. Everin raised a finger. While it is impenetrable, it is vulnerable to physics. It can be held and moved. Has it been moved before? Emily smiled. Oh yeah, had a dimensional being steal it, but we got it back. Sazrissa pointed at her. Cal Taurus. Yep. What other types of summonses and earths do you go on? Asked Dr. Snowden. Drevel pulled up another list of earths. These are the habitable ones. I've seen many variations of humanity. Most tend to be similar to my earth in 2025, but sometimes there are advanced civilizations, and other times they just discovered fire. Sometimes there aren't humans at all, but something else. Reptilian, avian, and insectoid races are the most common there. Query, have you encountered worlds controlled by machines? Seer glanced at V. We have. However, most of them are hostile to any incursion. Yeah, said Drevel. They usually call me a loud meat sack, then try to kill me while capturing Seer. That sucks said Emily. I assume then you run into many worlds where there is only a slight change in history. You'd probably see the same version of some people. Drevel made a finger gun at her and shot. Yep. It does crack me up when I mention a secret of one version to another. You like to play around a lot, said Seer. That's the spice of life. Besides, those discussions usually help them in some way. Everin tilted his head. What types of variations of humanity have you met? You name it, I've probably seen it. Neanderthal worlds aren't uncommon, nor are Denisovan and Friedekin ones. I've also come across more primitive versions, and those who have evolved into something else. I've even seen cyborg versions, and probably the most unique was a digital version. Never heard of Friedekin? But makes sense that there would be different versions out there. What was the digital one like? Asked Dr. Snowden. Drevel changed the screen to show a world covered mostly in water. There was this big island that was for the most part just a server. It tapped into geothermal energy and used fusion reactors, but it maintained a virtual world. Humanity had shed its physical forms and existed as consciousnesses inside that world. That's not uncommon where I'm from. Did you enter that server? Asked Sazrissa. Yeah, they had maintenance slots you could jack in, but uh, there was no one alive to do that. Seer enjoyed it there. Everin studied Drevel. What was the summons there? Well, there was some alien race that had landed... They wanted to take the virtual world. I got it before them. Then Seer transferred it to something on the Toravada. Then we offloaded them to one of our sanctuary worlds. Dr. Snowden laughed. Ha, I feel like we keep falling deeper into a rabbit hole. What's a sanctuary world? It's an earth well-suited environment-wise for humans. I usually move anyone that I rescue there. In this case, the sanctuary world was advanced so they were able to clone bodies and pull the consciousnesses out. Now that was interesting. We have picobot systems that can do that too, said Sazrissa. Then you're aware of how advanced those systems are. Drevel pulled up a video feed. This is the one I did before Sazrissa's summons. Earth had been attacked by some type of aggressive fungus. Emily watched as Drevel and Seer landed and assisted some survivors. His humor was on display, and despite being surrounded by aggressive creatures, he joked while he fought. The survivors he rescued went into the Toravada, then to the Sanctuary World. 
His summonses were just as important as the ones her Torvada issued, except these were all Earth-based versus the ones she did that involved traveling far away in space and time. Summonses like retrieving Dalton Kingston would not be ones this Torvada would give Drevel and Seer. Everin moved his hand out in an arc. Perhaps we should spend some time here, then meet tomorrow to go over the best way to assist Sazrissa's cause. Sazrissa smiled. I'd like that. Works for me, said Drevel. Seer and I can help with whatever. Emily was curious to explore this version of the Toravada. The fact it existed still boggled her mind. Every adventure with Everin was different, but this one was shaping up to be unique. It was like she was getting to meet the Toravada all over again. Chapter 7 Drevel watched Everin and Sasrissa take off to the research lab. She probably had a lot to discuss with him away from the others. V and Seer had already disappeared somewhere. Drevel suspected they would tour the Toravada's systems and do a differential comparison. Dr. Snowden and Emily glanced at each other. Just us, said Drevel. He extended his arms to the side. What do you want to see first? Assuming you want to hang with the old Drevel? Dr. Snowden pointed up. You got a roof here? Oh, do I, said Drevel. He swatted Emily's arm as he went to the maintenance hallway. Come on! He still did not fully know where all the hallways and rooms led to. It was like an ever-changing labyrinth. However, the first door on the right led to the roof. He saw that the gang's Toravada had an elevator. That was more intuitive to him. They stepped through the door and exited onto a large platform that was surrounded by darkness. A hovering light above the center illuminated the immediate area. Light blue guardrails resided on the edges. I know this place, said Emily, staring out. She walked over to the guardrail. Look, Uncle Albert, it's the timeline void. Dr. Snowden joined her and adjusted his glasses. So it is. Huh. He cast a sidelong glance at Drevel. I guess that makes sense. If your Torvata can jump between timelines and it's a pocket dimension, then it just shifts around out here. Could be, said Drevel. I sometimes come up here to think, but I've never seen anything move. That's most likely due to the timelines looking the same, said Dr. Snowden. This is what we see when we time travel. The Torvata pops out here, then enters the timeline at a new set of coordinates. Drevel nodded. That makes sense. I wish my Torvata could move like yours inside the timeline. Emily created three chairs, then sat in one. Dr. Snowden and Drevel sat in the remaining two chairs. Do you ever get tired of doing summonses? asked Emily. Nah said Drevel. They're actually exciting. Each one is different, and you never know what you'll encounter. Take this one, for example. This is way beyond anything I expected. Dr. Snowden chuckled. <laughs> I can imagine. You find out there's another Torvata, other chosen and cosmic beings. Yeah, I don't feel so alone anymore, and now it seems Sazrissa will be joining me. This has got to be weird for her, too, said Emily. She learns of this Torvada, comes from the future in our personal timelines, but doesn't know who you or Seer are. This has been one constant surprise after another. Drevel clapped and pointed a finger up from each hand. It's a new era! Dr. Snowden and Emily laughed. You're so full of life, said Dr. Snowden. Drevel paused for a moment. When you get to my age, you enjoy the simple things in life much more. I was supposed to die, but instead I have long life and abilities. Every day is a gift. This conversation is an example of something I'll treasure forever, a chance to hang out with you two. We're nothing special, just travelers, said Emily. 
He eyed her. So you think. You have cosmic energy. Do you know how rare that makes you? I thought I was the only one in existence until today. I feel like we're family, even though we just met. And I also feel like I could hop on any adventure that you two go out on and fit in. Yeah, I get that feeling too. It may be a cosmic energy thing, said Dr. Snowden. I still find it hard to see you as over two hundred and fifty, Drevel chuckled. <laughs> and you two are so young, just starting off. I'll never get used to hearing I'm young. Mentally, maybe, but not physically, said Dr. Snowden. I'm sure Everin could fix that if you really wanted to. Emily grinned. I'm not sure the universe is ready for a young Uncle Albert. They laughed again. Drevel found it easy to hang with them. It stirred something in him. The sense of being a part of a team. Several times he had tried to get a partner, but the few he had grown close to had died. Each death had hit him hard, and he hated the grieving part. He looked down. Emily tilted her head. You all right? Drevel sighed. Yeah. I just... was thinking about the last time I had a group to talk with. Well, more like a partner. Several or just one? She asked. Several, said Drevel, frowning. I guess that's why I haven't tried to invite any others to join me. I have Seer which is nice, but it's fun to meet and travel with new people. Dr. Snowden gestured at him. Your Torvata appears to have made a decision regarding a companion. Yeah, that's what I figured. I thought I was doing fine with just CC and Seer, but I suspect there are more complex summonses that will require a more heavy-duty partner, so the Torvata picked another chosen. Drevel studied them. You're a tight group. Have you experienced deaths of those who traveled with you? Emily puffed her cheeks. Yeah, we have. And it sucked. As powerful as we are, we're not invincible. All we can do is rely on each other. Makes sense, said Drevel. You're both human. How did you run into Everin? Dr. Snowden gazed out. Long story. But in short, he and V rescued us from some aliens that took us to another galaxy and one year into the future. We've traveled with them ever since. That was a year or so ago. So you haven't been traveling for too long, then? Dr. Snowden bobbed his head. Roughly thirteen adventures or so. Some were summonses. Others just happened due to a timeline change or event. We have also gone on observation runs only, too. I like those. Yeah, and our last one started out with the timeline changing on us, said Emily. She studied Drevel. You said your Earth was ravaged by an alien race when the Torvada showed itself to you. Who were the aliens? Drevel grimaced. I later found out they were called Kriegans, an alien race that has shown up on some Earths. Not all version of Kriegans are bad, though, but the ones in my timeline were. He eased back into his chair. You know, most Earths that I've been to, the media, whatever form it takes, seems to believe that aliens will land and fight. I very rarely see that. What usually happens depends on the aliens' goals. If it's elimination, they either send a huge asteroid, bombard the planet, trigger a super volcano, block the sun, or cause a massive flare. If the goal is terraforming, they usually release a biological agent tailor-made to eliminate humans. That's what the Kriegans used on my Earth. Wow, said Dr. Snowden. The Kriegans in our timeline are friendly, but we have met a brutal timeline version before. I guess your Alcarin energy spared you. Drevel nodded. Even so, 
They did drop terraforming equipment and also began a sweep using killer drones to ensure all humans were dead. They found me. I ran and fully expected to die. Then it was there. He moved his hands out as if he was opening curtains. The Toravata's portal. It was like a golden beacon of life itself. I ran into it. Then the portal closed. That's when I met Seer, although she doesn't seem to remember that. Yeah, she said she came into awareness after you were transformed, said Emily. That must mean Seer was under the control of something else, or was literally something else. Drevel wagged a finger at her. I've thought about that a lot. Seer would love to know the answers as well. Now watch it be an actual Seerless Echo, said Dr. Snowden. That would explain a lot. This Cyrilus sounds powerful if she's the plane, which I'm not sure I fully understand what that is. Dr. Snowden stood. You have a research lab, so I bet you have a planner cartography lab. Yeah, but it only shows other timelines, said Drevel. Emily jumped up. Yeah, but with us here, I bet it will show a lot more. Drevel joined them as they headed toward the exit. What are we waiting for? It had been a long time since he had been around someone he could relax with and share details without concern of violating any protocol. Now he was going to get a glimpse of the bigger picture. This summons kept getting better and better. Sazrissa surveyed her living quarters. It was just like the one she had on every visit to the Toravada. Everin followed her and she figured that he had deduced that she wanted to talk in private. There were some topics to go over with him that she could not discuss with the others. The less they knew, the better. Her room had a soft blue aesthetic, and it had a comfortable bed and some dressers. She noted that the video images on several embedded wall screens had been filtered. Anything with a future Everin was not available. That did not surprise her. She sat on a plush couch with Everin next to her. Thanks for meeting with me, she said. Of course. I sense you have some questions for me. Yeah, and some observations. She swallowed hard. I knew you were the first form right away from the videos I've seen. As you know, we've met several times, and each time... It's a different version of you. What you probably don't know is that we meet in reverse. Everin rubbed his chin. I see. So one of my future forms meets you for the first time and knows everything about you, but you know nothing of them. Her eyes misted. Yeah. And I knew the moment would come when the reverse was true. You would have no idea who I was, but I would know everything about you. Well, mostly. It kills me inside to be here. I met each of your versions when I was near death at the end of my personal timeline each time. But now that I've met you, the first, the next meeting won't happen. And this is the last time I'll ever see you. Everin studied her, then raised a finger. Not necessarily. What do you mean? Because I know of this, my future versions do as well. They also know that if you survive this, then go to work with Drevel on his Torvata summonses. That is where you will be. This form, as well as my future ones, can then visit you there without violating personal timeline integrity. Her heart pounded. Although she had played that scenario out in her head, she had not been sure if Everin would agree to that. You're okay with that? she asked. Of course. I would assume my future forms would be too, unless there is something drastically wrong, such as you trying to kill me. She laughed, then moved over and hugged him tight. You mean so much to me? Everin rubbed her back. I am not so easy to get rid of. She leaned back and wiped her eyes. You have the same humor as always. 
Although my physical form and personality will change in future versions, I would hope that those future versions hold the same values as I do now. Oh, they do. They just express it differently, she said. I sensed your fluctuations when you saw Seer. Everin steepled his fingers. I suspect an echo of Cyrilus used Seer to guide Drevel. Cyrilus guided me as well. I was not aware there were other Torvadas outside the one I created for Leverin. Zezrissa noted his fluctuations when mentioning Cyrilus and Leverin. While this form might show outwardly as if everything was okay, she knew it pained him to think of them. She had read up on Leverin and knew that, at this point, this form had only met Leverin and Siverin. In time, other initial forms would be encountered, except for two of them. Everin gestured at her. You do not seem bothered to work with Drevel. I don't know him fully yet, but he was chosen, she said. I like his energy, and he has a Toravata. Besides, once we deal with the Everinites, it'll be nice to move on. Do you have any family here? Zezrissa frowned. Long ago. They're all dead now. I probably would be too if the Toavata had not chosen me. You actually met them. Well, your future form has. Everin nodded. I have a lot to look forward to. And now I do too, she said, smiling. I think you and Drevel will make a good team. And CC and Seer. Sazrissa chuckled. <laughs> I think so too. I'll have plenty of time to get to know them. But I'm going to spend as much time as I can with Dr. Snowden, Emily, and V. He eyed her. You know their fates. In broad strokes. Obviously, I can't say anything. Especially to them. Although Sazrissa had not read the direct fates of everyone that traveled with Everin, Dr. Snowden, Emily, and V had been mentioned by every form. Although Everin would have different companions in future forms, Dr. Snowden, Emily, and V were the original gang, and Everin never forgot them. It pained her some to meet them and not be able to say anything. All she could do was enjoy them in the time she had. Everin gestured at her. You also know what this cosmic entity is that has broken into our universe. Yes, said Sazrissa. I suspect the Everinite's rise is tied to that. Zazrissa shrugged. Probably. I don't know of this event, with you arriving and the others. The Torvata shielded me from certain things, and as I'm finding out, it did so a lot more than I expected. Everin rubbed his chin. I see. We will assist you in your cause. I appreciate that, said Sazrissa. Ultimately, I just want to clear your name. It's being used as a symbol of oppression, and I won't rest until the Everinites as an organization are no more. I know we can't change everything, but I think if the illegal digital cloning is stopped, the leadership removed, and the communication system disabled, it'll start the process of restoring your legacy. The Trinicans have the right approach to your ideals. They view you as a guide— not a powerful being to be blindly followed. I am glad they see me as such, said Everin. He examined her. Your abilities intrigue me. You have a water beam, but not something for food. Yeah, although it's not hard to get food usually, there are times like in the cave system when it would have really helped. Everin interacted with his ARI. I have studied your pocket dimension inside you. It is expandable. Oh, I know. Originally, it was just my feet and palms. Each version of me must have expanded it some. I can't say. Everin half smiled. There is no need to. But if I had this idea now to give you a food pellet option, then my future forms would know not to give you that option. She chuckled. I didn't say anything. 
it is quite okay. You will have more survivability options after we deal with the Everanites. This will assist you in future situations with Drevel. Are you excited to handle more summonses? I am, actually. The last century or so has been lonely, and the work has not been exciting or challenging. She frowned. There were times when I wondered why I continued to exist. The Everanites gave me something to focus on. Everin gestured out. And now you will go to many different Earths and resolve summonses. Yep. Each one will be a new adventure. And I will visit both of you from time to time. Her eyes misted as she leaned over and hugged him again. I'm so happy to be here with you. Everything always felt right in his presence. He was more than just someone she respected. He was a living god to her. She had seen where his future lay, and even in this form, his calm temperament, good nature, and desire to help others were on display. Although she had not expected to see him again, she was glad to have been proved wrong. V surveyed the digital landscape of Drevel and Sears Torvada. It was the same one he entered when on his, except there were different access points available. This indicated a shared underlying system that spanned a ship and a pocket dimension. That meant the landscape operated in a different reality. He had assumed his human form, and Seer kept hers as well, and they stood on a platform surrounded by golden spheres of varying sizes, Usually he was an orb, but he calculated that Seer wanted to communicate as they would do when they were outside. The Torvada existed in several layers. The energy layer was first. It was pure planar energy, mixed with cosmic, and provided all the power to do everything. Next was the dimensional layer, which allowed for dimensional mechanics. The next layer was the digital one, where complex systems were managed. The last layer was the physical form, which, as V had recently discovered, had multiple representations. Sears Torvada gave V a new insight into how it worked overall. He had been created alongside the Torvada, and it puzzled him that he did not have access to everything. It seemed some things were meant to be unveiled based on a certain date or coinciding with an event. In this case, the coinciding event was this particular summons. Have you met the Seerless that the others spoke of? asked Seer. I have, said V. She said I was beautiful. Seer smiled. I could see that. Do you have any visuals of that? V connected to an axis point in the shape of a sphere. It lit up, and he traversed the various video feeds he had stored. He found one that depicted the gang meeting Cyrilus long ago when discovering Everin's origin. He retrieved it, then played it, putting him and Seer into the projection. Seer stared at Cyrilus. I do look like her. Analysis. I believe you were modeled on her form. I existed before Drevel arrived, but I don't recall anything from that time. V studied her. Her echo most likely created your form. When it left, you came into existence and retained the body. A logical conclusion. I did not know what an echo was until meeting your group. We are the gang, said V, raising a hand. Seer chuckled and returned the high five. Query, you understood that, he asked. I did. It appears to be something that your gang enjoys. I understand why you do it. Sears' interaction program seemed more advanced than V's. He still did not comprehend why the Torvada limited his speech. Seer had been created by the Torvada, yet she had no issues with her communication style. Even Everin had been limited. I would like to do a systems diagnostic, said V. I can assist you said Seer. V changed the environment to the hollow room. I can see Drevel's simulations. And I can see the ones from your Torvata, said Seer. 
It seems our hollow rooms have merged. V paused one of Drevel's simulations. It appears he enjoys holographic companionship. Seer smiled. Yes, he does. Query, does he not have a physical partner? He does sometimes. He had one that went on a few summonses with him, but she died. Since then, he keeps things to the earths he visits and relaxes in the hollow room. V nodded. Has he shown interest in you? Not that way, said Seer. He says I'm the best girlfriend that's not a girlfriend. A clever play on words, said V. It is perhaps wise not to enter into a relationship as you work with him. Seer glanced at V. Yes, that was my conclusion as well. V focused on the research lab. It showed a series of items researched there by Drevel, with Sears' help. Although he was knowledgeable and she was efficient, most of the items were below what would be expected if Everin designed objects. Query, can you see my Torvata's designs? asked V. I can, said Seer. The ideas shown and the techniques displayed indicate a vastly superior approach to design and creation. You recently implemented density control. Acknowledged. My body mode is powerful, but it can be knocked down or away. By altering my density, I can prevent that. She faced V. An ingenious Everin design. He is far beyond any known intelligence. I have noticed he holds back a lot. V tilted his head. That is on purpose. He is a force for good. As you are, said Seer. You are as well, said V. We were both created along with our respective Torvadas, although yours was direct and mine indirect. Seer studied him. You're most unique. Thank you. V scanned the conference room and noted that Drevel sometimes had many people there. One meeting covered a sanctuary earth. The people in the room were going over some rules Drevel had drafted. A quick scan of the rules showed them to be fair. V made a note to analyze sanctuary earths. Other meetings covered topics ranging from plans to stop someone or a group to retrieving an item. It was obvious that Drevel took his role seriously. Although he had a comical nature, he could be serious when needed. The data point that V searched for was the people's reaction to Drevel. They admired him with their hopeful eyes, their speech styles, body positions, and movements and facial cues indicated they viewed Drevel as a hero or savior. Drevel is well-liked, said V. Yes, he is, said Seer. At least by those he helps. To Denkara and other groups that hurt others, he is a villain. V tilted his head. Query, has anyone breached the Torvada? It's not possible, said Seer. Another shared Torvada trait. V concentrated on the medical lab. There were many instances of Drevel healing people, although he used standardized healing nanobots as well. However, there were also some interactions that were more erotic in nature. His partners were mostly human, but some were not. He did not have a preference when it came to gender. The maintenance room's access was similar to what V experienced on his Torvada. There were many areas that were sealed off. The ones he had access to on Seer's Torvada were the same ones he had access to on his. The purpose of these rooms remained unclear. Even when the layout of the Torvada was known, the maintenance area only showed a few rooms. Yet more had appeared after construction. Analysis. It appears we are in sync in terms of what we can access he said. It would seem so, said Seer. Query, may I see some of the summonses you and Drevel go on? Of course. V was intrigued by how Seer interacted with Drevel and the summonses. V had already considered some upgrades for her. 
Perhaps Everin could review them when he had time. Based on her reactions to experiencing new things, along with this and previous discussions, V determined Seer would be a fun person to have when on other Earths. Chapter 8 Dr. Snowden stared at the ceiling as he slowly woke up. It took him a moment to realize that, although he was in his room, he was still on Drevel and Sears to Arvada. It boggled his mind that his room could exist in two different places and appear on demand. He had spent the rest of the previous night exploring the planner cartography lab with Drevel and Emily. Drevel had been full of energy since the Torvada had allowed for more information to be seen. Dr. Snowden always enjoyed when others learned just how big reality was and what it consisted of from a cosmological perspective. What stood out was that Drevel had choked up some upon learning that he was not alone, but was a part of a vast, cosmic family. He had already considered the Torvada as the ultimate reality, but Dr. Snowden could see the moment when Drevel understood it was only a small part of it. When Drevel had learned what Everin truly was, it had taken a moment for him to soak it in. Dr. Snowden thought it was unusual for the Torvada to allow that level of information. He got cleaned up, then exited his room. The living quarter's open area was what he expected. However, when he went out the main entrance and arrived in the half-circle hub, it was evident this was another Torvada. He went to the first hallway and down some until he found a room similar to the conference one he was familiar with. Everyone was already there, so Dr. Snowden grabbed a cup of coffee and took a seat next to Drevel and Seer. Emily, Sazrissa, and V were on the other side, and Everin was at the head of the table, as expected. I am glad everyone is up and appears well rested, said Everin. The summonses from each Torvada are similar, and the one we got is to assist Sazrissa's cause, while the one Drevel and Seer got was to aid Sazrissa and bring her back here. I think we can do both. As such, Drevel has deferred to me to lead this effort to complete both summons. Drevel pointed at him. Glad to be just a member of the team for once. Analysis, you are now a part of the gang. Sazrissa chuckled. Yep. That never changes. She nodded at Seer. You're included in that, as is C.C. Thank you, said Seer. C.C. pumped a cloth strip into the air. Everin interacted with the table console, then gestured at the planet that appeared. This is Tempus, one of the Chelenton Empire's core worlds. It also has the largest population of Trinicans and serves as their unofficial headquarters. In order to learn more information on the Everinites, Sazrissa has suggested we visit them. They have a lot more knowledge than I do, and on Tempus, the Everinite reach is weak. They won't be trying to do anything to draw local law enforcement's attention, said Sazrissa. The projection zoomed into an advanced city. That's Kairos. The capital city, she said. While this is a core world, there are many factions there. The Everonites are tolerated, but not well liked. We should be relatively safe there and can maybe even visit one of their temples. Dr. Snowden studied the various city images that appeared. The city was advanced, more than others that he had seen before. There were only a handful of skyscraper like buildings. The city was spread out with lakes and forests between various areas. The design focused on a balance between nature and a megalopolis. A large river ran nearby. That's an interesting looking city. It's really sprawled out, said Emily. I'll say, said Drevel. Even the advanced ones I find on other Earths aren't quite as big. Sazrissa grinned. It has a lot of advanced systems. Matter replicators are everywhere, Transports can take you any place you want to go, and they have top-notch facilities of all types, from healing to waste management. Emily narrowed her eyes. Any darker sides to the city? The further you go below. Yeah, 
said Sazrissa. That's common on most worlds, due to it being harder to track in those areas. If anything, just be careful of law enforcement. They're cyborg, mostly, with a sprinkling of humans and androids. They're also relentless and tough, and control their own robots. They're all linked together, and that's one reason why there's so little crime. Dr. Snowden adjusted his glasses. Are the humans blue-skinned like the Everanites? Sazrissa shook her head. They come in all shades. The Everanites chose blue for a specific reason, but I can't say why. Query, is their history hidden? Asked V. No, it's just... Well, I'm sure the Trinikins can explain it if it's brought up. Dr. Snowden figured Sazerissa knew the real reason, and if it pertained to Everin, she would not be able to say why. That must be maddening. To know so much, yet not be able to say anything. It could be something as simple as that Everin had worn a blue outfit in the event that had spawned the Everinites. Sazerissa knows one of the Trinican guides, said Everin. We can visit him, then meet with the elders. Sazrissa interacted with the table console, then pointed at a group of men and women. They are the oldest members and act as an advisory board, mainly, as the Trinikins don't really have a centralized authority. There is an elder, and although he is considered the founder, he only advises. That's an interesting approach, said Dr. Snowden. How do they determine what can and can't be done? There are guidelines that all Trinikins follow. Most also defer to the Elder out of tradition, and due to the belief system of the Trinikins, that works. Drevel raised a finger. So they believe in Everin. What are the guidelines or message? We will find out when we get there, said Everin. I do not believe we will be attacked there, but assume that we might. In that regard... Be alert and ready to fight if need be. Hopefully that is not required. Emily laughed. I don't think anyone's going to mess with this group. Perhaps not. But it does not hurt to be prepared. I know, said Emily. Query. Do I need to stay behind? Everin studied V. You can come in whatever mode you wish. Acknowledged. If there are no other questions... Let us go to the command center. Dr. Snowden observed Sasrissa as she hopped up. She had been all smiles, and it hit him that she had seen many meetings with different Everins. To her, this was just another one. Dr. Snowden wished he could talk to her about the future Everins. Dr. Snowden joined the others in the command area. Everin took his usual seat, while Sasrissa and Emily sat on the right side, Dr. Snowden joined Drevel in the left seating area, and V and Seer had the front console. Dr. Snowden's imagination ran wild as he wondered what the Trinikins knew. Although they would probably not mention specifics, there might be more information on future Everins. Emily sensed the excitement in the room. Sazrissa's energy was all over the place. She had been a bright beacon of joy at working with Everin again. Drevel was also excited, and even Dr. Snowden's energy fluctuated. Meeting a group that worshipped Everin would most likely reveal information concerning the event that had created them. Emily was curious as to what the Trinikins' core beliefs were and what guidelines they followed. It would say a lot about the future Everin that was present at that time. She wanted to know if Everin's values and teachings were still consistent with what she knew, or if they were different. Drevel and Sears Torvada opened a rectangular portal. The Torvada everyone was on hovered, then slowly moved out. Once outside, they ascended into low orbit, where a portal was opened. Drevel drew his head back when they flew through and exited over Tempest. That's awesome! You get used to it, said Sazerissa. Yeah, but opening a portal to anywhere is so powerful, said Drevel. Everin interacted with his chair console. What credentials would work here? Sazrissa bobbed her head. We could impersonate a private transport, 
As long as we have Chellington credentials, we should be okay. Do you have the format for them? Sazrissa interacted with her palm. They're in the Torvata's systems now. Okay, then we will create one. But we need to enter it into an authentication system. V, scan the nearby satellite so we can insert it, said Everin. Acknowledged. Emily was used to just sneaking in, but she figured that with an advanced planet, it was probably better to be registered instead of accidentally discovered. In addition to that, having the Torvada visible would prevent another ship from landing on it. The Torvada could park somewhere else, but it was easier to be legitimate. It was simply too dangerous to have an invulnerable and invisible object in the landing bay. Analysis. Credentials entered. Very well, said Everin. Take us down. Seer can do that, said V, looking at her. Everin gestured at her. If you wish. Emily liked that V was kind to Seer. It was just how he was, and his kindness included Seer as a part of the gang. Seer was all smiles as she interacted with the front podium. She probably could pilot the Torvada without the podium, but it allowed everyone to see what was being done. Emily examined the various ships that flew by. They had a variety of shapes, but the thin, triangular ones intrigued her. They had circles on the bottom side, and the back had a few as well. Their lighting suggested they were thrusters, but she did not see anything coming out of them. It was their speed and maneuverability that caught her eye. They moved unnaturally for a craft of that size, at least from her experience. A screen popped up on the front wall. Emily scrutinized the orange-skinned human with a black hat of some type. The short sleeve shirt had the texture of a slick material. The man had silver eyes, and there was a metallic strip behind the ears that looped behind the head. This is Kairos, Spaceport Authority. Your credentials have been flagged, said the man. How so? asked Everin. Although the credentials check out, your crew compliment tripped a manual review. The man dipped his head, then chuckled. Everin, a common name. His eyes narrowed. Cesarissa Mortaka. The man focused on her. Seems the Everinites want you. Is that a concern? asked Cesarissa. The man smirked. Not here it isn't but it was enough to trigger the manual review. However, I don't see an issue. What's your destination? The Tierra Kaljang Temple. The Trinikins. We don't like them either, said the man. He tapped in the air. Your landing coordinates have been sent. Enjoy Kairos. The screen vanished. That's a common sentiment in Kairos, said Sazrissa. Dr. Snowden glanced at Everin. You're quite popular. Yes. However, I do not desire that, said Everin. Emily understood his desire to be low-key. He made ripples wherever he went, and the Everinites and Trinikins were examples of what could happen as a result of his presence or actions. She studied the flight route that the Toravada took. The sky was packed with ships zooming here and there, and the path took all that into account. She enjoyed looking at the city as it got closer. The sprawling nature was harder to tell due to the sheer number of structures, lakes, and forests. The place they were going to resembled multiple train stations stacked on top of each other. Instead of a place where the rails would be, there were various types of clamps and ship support structures. Thankfully, the temple was topside, which she was gathering was a prime choice of real estate. After twenty minutes, the Torvada landed in a square area sectioned off by holographic lines. A metallic slab with an angled bottom had slid out enough that the Torvada could land on it. Everin stood. Let us go. Emily's curiosity blazed inside her. After visiting places where aliens were the norm, it would be nice to see humans in that role. There was also the advanced technology to view. To top it all off, she would get to experience an organization that had followed Everin's ideas for centuries. She joined the others on the Torvada's ramp. 
The V had chosen body mode, and Sears' orb sat inside a projected form. The gang had landed one level down instead of topside. The platform they were on joined with a larger one that went as far as the eye could see. Ahead of them was a massive ramp that led up with various signs and screens. She studied the green arrow that popped into her ARI. Did the Torvada provide that? Usually we see those after scanning, asked Emily. That's the navigation communications channel. The Torvada just linked to it, said Sazrissa. Navigation is done really well here, said Drevel. Literal arrows to follow. I'm not going to argue, said Dr. Snowden. Emily stepped through the shielding and followed the others up the ramp. She tried not to stare, but the variety of humans captivated her. There was no single skin color. Every shade she could imagine was present. The only common aesthetic she saw was the metallic segments on various body parts. It intrigued her that everyone had a Picobot projection system on them. There were a few aliens, but they were humanoid for the most part. She had expected to maybe see some Kriegans, but she did not. Robots and androids were out in force as well, and the robots came in a variety of shapes. Drones flew everywhere, and they had their own separate set of pathways to follow near the ceiling. Looks like we can open our helmets here, said Dr. Snowden. Works for me, said Drevel. Emily checked the atmosphere readings, then opened her helmet. A variety of food odors washed over her. Side tunnels off the ramp led to eating areas, and she suspected that the matter replicators made piping hot food, which smelled great. When they reached Topside, Emily soaked in the environment. There were no vehicles or ships in the streets. The buildings ranged in height from four to five stories. They were sleek, and some had large display screens. Others had windows, and some had balconies. In the distance, she could see a forest. However, it was the street design that impressed her. The streets were made for walking and hovering. The one in front of them was wide, and poles jutted out on the sides, creating an informal sidewalk. Each pole ended with a bulb that had a variety of lights on it. The circular hovering pads everyone used reminded her of ones she had seen in AD 10105. She watched a woman reach a building entrance, then step off and extend her arm. The pad shrank, then flew and landed on her forearm. She swatted Dr. Snowden's arm. Look, they got those pad things. I saw it, he said. We got flying platforms, though. Everin studied her. Do you wish to use those hovering platforms here? Emily shrugged. I kind of want to walk. Soak it all in. I'm with her, said Drevel. Hovering and flying is for the birds. Emily eyed him. He laughed. Besides, we all have means to go airborne if we needed to. I concur, said Everin. Emily loved moments like this where the main issue had not been tackled yet, so the team was more relaxed. Walking with her friends, new and old, in an advanced city with the sun shining was fine with her, no one else in the street gave them a second look. The gang was free to be themselves. Emily snuck up to Everin and interlocked with his left arm. Sazrissa got the other side. Watch out, ladies man coming through, said Drevel, extending his arms out in front. Everin eyed him as the group laughed. Emily wished more trips were like this. The walk to the Trinikin's temple invigorated Drevel. He had only been with the group for a day, and already felt like a part of the gang. Everything was easy with them, and those were the best types of relationships. His Torvada's chosen status probably helped there. Sazrissa appeared happy, and he wondered what working with her would be like. Her easygoing nature mixed with seriousness would be a good match for him. She seemed to have accepted that she would be doing summonses with him without any worry, Maybe she knew more than he did on that. Emily was a chatterbox as she walked with Everin. Drevel sensed her cosmic energy was calm, and her infectious smile and joking showed she was enjoying the moment. The same could be said of Dr. Snowden. V's body mode did not indicate moods or emotions. But his lights glowed brighter, and he participated in the discussions. 
Seer was also chattier than usual. The temple was topside, so the walk there allowed Drevel to get some insights into Kairos's culture. He was used to seeing Earth from the perspective of the year 2025, although sometimes he would get an Earth that was advanced. This one was similar, and the hover pads and layout did not surprise him. What he focused on was the people. Their skin colors were all over the place, and the variety of external augments and probably internal ones made each person unique. There was no market that he could see, and with matter replicators everywhere, that was to be expected. There were probably real food vendors below the city that used the replicators just to get the ingredients. One big feature he noticed was that everyone had Picabot systems. He was not sure what benefits they had compared to Nanobot systems, but it was something he would like to understand. There had also been several queries issued by people wanting to connect with him. He suspected that was some form of neural augment connection protocol. There were also citizens with a thin, external Picabot layer that allowed for any type of clothing to be projected. After arriving at the temple, Drevel surveyed the exterior. There were no walls surrounding the area, and a large cylindrical building resided in the middle of a park-like area. Blue diamonds hovered and encircled the area at various heights. He would have thought the blue and silver crystalline material of the building would make it highly reflective, but that was not the case. The entrance was a massive opening at the bottom. As the group approached, Drevel studied what must be the Trinikins. They wore two-piece silver suits with a light blue tunic, a black belt, Boots and collar provided a color contrast. There was a mix of men and women, and some whose gender he was unsure of, and there were also aliens and androids present. It was a diverse group. They passed a man who bowed his head. May everything be as it should be. Everin returned the bow, and the same for you. Be safe, my friend, said the man before moving away. That was interesting, said Dr. Snowden. Sazrissa smiled. That's their typical greeting. I'm sure you know where they get that from. Drevel wrinkled his brow. Not really. Emily chuckled. <laughs> it's something we say at the end of each summons or adventure. She dipped her head toward Everin. Usually he says it. Ah, so they got it from Everin. Well, a future one. In the past. Makes sense. The group chuckled and continued on. The temple interior was massive. To the left and right of a main pathway were upright rectangular capsules. He caught a glimpse of someone leaving one. Inside the capsule was a seat with some wires extending out of the wall. Wonder what that is, said Dr. Snowden, gesturing at the capsule. No idea, said Drevel. Everin scanned the capsule. It is a brain machine interface. I assume its purpose is to allow someone to enter a digital environment and to create a tethered digital consciousness, or TDC, as Sazrissa called it. Yep, that's common here, said Sazrissa. It's linked to a virtual planet. Really? asked Dr. Snowden. So they can contact anyone, anywhere. Sazrissa nodded. It's secure as well, and when you're in there, there's a lot you can do. This temple is a safe place to enter from. What would be an unsafe place? asked Drevel. Any place where a cloning device can be snuck in to create a CDC, said Sazrissa. Dr. Snowden pointed at her. A cloned digital consciousness. Yep. And at that point, whoever captures the CDC can do whatever they want. Emily frowned. Like the Everinites. Yeah. And it's illegal, but it still happens, said Sazrissa. As long as you are connected by a secure station, you're okay. Everin faced the group. We should avoid visiting the virtual planet and becoming a TDC while we are here as a precautionary matter. Yeah, don't need to convince me. That sounds like a nightmare, said Dr. Snowden. It's okay if you're in a safe place, like this, said Sasrissa. I'll take your word for it. After reaching the end of the central walkway, they paused. 
Drevel examined the open area, which looked like a large lounge. People sat and stared at each other. He suspected they were using some form of wireless communication, similar to what he had seen before. A man in a two-piece robe appeared before them. He resembled the people from before who he thought were Trinikins. The man's hair was slicked back into a long, braided strand. Circular, metallic augments sat above the man's ears, and his eyes reminded Drevel of an android's. His purple skin was also interesting. Hello, travelers, said the man, bowing slightly. I am Temesh Slunka, a guide of the Trinican Order. Do you seek guidance today? He focused on Sazrissa. It's been a while since I've seen you. It's good to see you again, she said. Everin tilted his head. We do have some questions. My name is Everin, and with me are Dr. Albert Snowden, Emily Snowden, V, Seer, CC, and Drevel Zage, and you already know Sazrissa Mortaka, it seems. Ah, Everin is a common name, but a good one, said Tamesh. He eyed Sazrissa. The Everinites are looking for you. Sazrissa shrugged. So I've heard. I'm quite popular. That's not a concern here, as you know, said Tamesh. His eyes scanned the others. You all are not from Kairos. We are not, said Everin. We wish to learn the Everinites' history and practices. Tamesh sighed. There is much to discuss, then. What is your interest, if I may ask? We are curious about them, as well as your organization. Everin gestured at Sazrissa. Although we are travelers, she suggested we come here to learn this information. We also wanted to meet your group, the Trinikins. Tamesh studied him. I see. Perhaps we can speak in a more private area. Follow me. As they walked, Seer motioned at Tamesh. You're a digital consciousness. What type are you? I'm an ODC, said Tamesh. This peekabot swarm constitutes my physical form in this reality. He waved a finger between V and Seer. I'm sure you two, as AIs, detected that right away. We did, said Seer. V nodded. So your physical form died and you live on as an ODC? said Emily. Tamesh smiled. Yes, my flesh form perished many decades ago. Now I serve the temple as a guide and take on a body as needed. Emily drew her head back. Oh, does that bother you? No, I, I just... Something new. I just realized that an ODC is like an AI with a different creation source. Tamesh eyed her. That's common knowledge, which makes me think your group is from very far away. We are, said Everin. Drevel followed the others as Tamesh led them off to the right. Tamesh being an ODC that could inhabit a Pikabot swarm was not something Drevel had expected. Obviously, V and Seer had been aware immediately, if only because they were digital in their own right. It made Drevel wonder how often this was done, but Tamesh made it seem like it was commonplace. Given what Drevel had heard of potential illegal CDCs, that could lead to some interesting situations. As the group passed through an arch, Emily pointed at a cube hovering in a beam of light. That looks familiar. Tamesh led them over to the row of various items that hovered. These are ancient relics that we protect. They're out in the open, said Drevel. Tamesh raised a finger. Any attempt to remove it without proper authentication would activate our defenses. His eyes widened when the cube glowed and displayed various readings on the top face. That's unusual. What is that cube? asked Dr. Snowden. It is said to detect any exotic energy and display the type, said Tamesh. He slowly examined the group. It's activating in your presence. Everin motioned at him with a hand down. There is no need for alarm. 
Yes, we possess exotic energy. The cube is familiar to us because we have seen it before in the past. Emily snapped her fingers. Oh, the cube we gave Andia and Rakar. I believe so. How could you know of this cube? It's tens of thousands of years old, said Tamesh. I think it's best you talk to our elder. Everin raised his head. If you believe that is best. Tamesh took off with the group in tow. Drevel could see the excitement on Tamesh's face. Drevel was not familiar with the elder, but he was glad that they got an audience with the highest ranking member of the Trinican Order. Chapter 9 Sasrissa sensed Tamish's excitement, even if he was a Picabot swarm. Although she had interacted with the Trinicans before, she had never met the Elder. Most of her interactions were mainly for learning purposes, and she knew they frowned on her activities in regard to the Everanites. They were true to their beliefs, and did not believe in violence except as a last resort. The cube had surprised her, yet another item that the Torvada had kept from her. Between that and Drevel, Seer, and another Torvada, Sazrissa wondered how much more was hidden from her. It bothered her some, but she understood that it was probably done in order to maintain personal timeline integrity. Walking with Everin down the street reminded her of the other Everins she had journeyed with. It was a sensation of pure joy to be with him and she saw how much Dr. Snowden, Emily, and V loved Everin. That was the effect he had on others, at least those who were not malicious. She was glad to have yet another chance to experience that. Drevel was full of life. She liked him and suspected they would work well together. The Torvada thought so, and she trusted the Torvada with her life. Seer also appeared to be someone Sazrissa could work with, if anything, Seer might appreciate someone more toned down relative to Drevel. Although it would be sad to see Everin and the others leave after the Everinites were dealt with, she still had a new chapter in her life awaiting her. This time, she would not be the only one with cosmic energy. The group paused before a gray, outlined door that had no handle. Are you ready? asked Tamesh. I believe we all are, said Everin. Tamesh laid a hand on the center of the door. Sazrissa smiled when the others stared at the tunnel that formed ahead of them. The room they were entering was one solid block of picobots. It would reform the whole area into whatever the Trinican Elder preferred. The technology was not uncommon in other buildings. What was that? asked Dr. Snowden. Solid room filled with picobots said Sazrissa. They split up to form whatever is needed. Some call it programmable matter. Dr. Snowden peeked in. It looks like a bunch of clouds on the ground. Tamesh motioned for the group to enter. That is how the Elder prefers it. Sazrissa followed the others in. Although the light blue floor and clouds made it seem like they were in the air, she knew they were not. A floating male head hovered in the back of the room on a puffy cloud. Glowing white eyes offered a contrast to the tan skin. The bald head had blue dots and bars on the side, and she liked the face's friendly and wise look. You've done well, Tamesh, said the head. Tamesh bowed, then exited. Welcome. I am Hakesh Rinkor, the Trinican Elder. I already know your names. Please, sit. Sazrissa studied the seats that appeared on two other clouds. The room gave off a mystical vibe, and she wondered why Hakesh only chose to show his head. Perhaps it was to indicate that he was a digital consciousness, and that was how he viewed himself. The gang sat. It is good to meet you, said Everin. Hakesh nodded. And the same goes for me. 
Everyone focused on a cube emerging from the left side wall. Do not be alarmed. I was notified that it had readings on this group. I wanted to see them myself, said Hakesh. Proceed, said Everin. The cube floated before each member. As it did, Hakesh studied the display output on the top face. The cube returned to the wall. Hakesh faced Everin. You must be Everin, according to these readings. But I don't recognize this form. I suspect you met my future one, said Everin. I see. Then, in order to maintain your personal timeline integrity, I should refrain from speaking of that, Everin. It would be appreciated. Sasriso was not surprised at Hakesh's knowledge of timeline integrity, both personal and universal. As a digital consciousness, free of physical concerns, he would have had a long time to absorb and understand many things. Hakesh smiled. You all have cosmic energy, according to the cube. Except for Seer. He stared at Drevel. Even your clothing has it. He likes to be called C.C. for cosmic cloth, said Drevel. C.C. extended a strip and waved. Intriguing. How did you get a hold of the cube? asked Emily. It was given as a gift by Everin to verify that someone who claimed to be him actually was. In this case, it has verified that. The Everinites have the stones that only light up in the presence of him. Sasrissa grimaced. They stole them from the Trinicans. Akash studied her. Yes, they did. You're wanted by them. I know the Trinicans don't like my direct response to the Everinites, but someone has to stand up to them. I understand, my child. However, violence should always be used as a last resort. Drevel chuckled. <laughs> Try telling that to the Everinites. They tried to kill her. The Everanites are misguided, said Hakesh. Yes, they are a formidable organization now. But the fact that they violate the Everan way does not mean we need to. Query, what is the Everan way? Hakesh glanced at Everan. It is a set of guidelines to live one's life by. They are simple, yet powerful. Query. The Everanites do not follow this. Akash sighed. They have twisted its meaning and added their own guidelines. What they follow is not Everin's way. Dr. Snowden adjusted his glasses. So, what are the tenets? If I say them, would that not influence your future? said Hakesh, looking at Everin. Yes, but as this is a stable timeline, I will repeat what they are at the appropriate time. Understood. The first is respect others and help them if they are in need. The second is seek happiness and hold on to it when you find it. The third is violence should only be used as a last resort, not as a way of life. The fourth is be true to yourself. Only then can you truly grow. And the last one is, 
defy those who would cause harm. Sasrissa had noticed that Hakesh had focused on her when he had said the third guideline. Although she did not like violence either, the Everonites used it as a method of obtaining their goals, and she would always stand in opposition to that. That sounds like something he would say, said Dr. Snowden, crooking a thumb at Everon. Some are vague, so I guess you could interpret them differently. Sasrissa smirked. The Everonites have... They feel it's their duty to help others by brainwashing them with propaganda. Their happiness is converting what they call the misguided, so they aggressively pursue that. They also portray themselves as defenders of Everin's way and claim that anyone who stands against them is causing harm. So they use violence. And sadly, they believe they are true to themselves. Wow said Emily. They really took the intent of the guidelines and twisted it. Hakesh frowned. Yes. The Everonites' interpretation is darker than the original intent. That was the cause of the split between our group and theirs. We opened temples to help others find themselves and seek happiness, we are also trained in self-defense, and our temples serve as havens as needed. Drevel wrinkled his brow. Are there Trinikins that fight against the Everonites? Some, said Hakesh. There is a small group that interprets the Everon way to mean they must defy the Everonites and help the brainwashed, who they see as in need. While we bear them no ill will, their presence can be distracting. Sazrissa gestured at Everin. The Trinican Defiers, or TD, as they call themselves. I see, said Everin. You know them? asked Hakesh, glancing at Sazrissa. I've worked with them in the past. Although we have similar goals, we have different methods. Hakash stared at her. In what way? They publicly fight the Everonites on every front. I appreciate their protest, then retaliate brutally approach. But all it does is give the Everonites focus. For example, there was a transport that carried some CDCs. The TD placed a ship in its path. And when the Everonites used force to remove the TD, they fought back. Although the transport was disabled, the Everonites eventually won the fight, then just transferred the contents to another transport with a much larger security force. The TD is not opposed to killing, and I try to avoid that. As for me, I work solo and in the shadows. Dr. Snowden raised a finger. Ah, they were transporting illegal CDCs, right? Yeah, said Sazrissa. Dr. Snowden gestured at Hakesh. I'm guessing you're an ODC, original digital consciousness, like Tamesh. I am, said Hakesh. My physical form died a long time ago. Before I left my physical shell, I underwent transference here and decided to continue helping others and guiding the Trinicans any way I could. I can take on physical form temporarily via the Picobots, and they can create a very good replication of an organic body, although it is fragile. Temesh is an example of that. I also have a cyborg body if I need one for a longer period of time, and a nanobot one for medium usage. Sazrissa mentioned body types to us, but it sounded like a complex topic, asked Emily. Hakesh pulled up a projection that showed three body types. It can be. The Picobot body is fragile. 
It requires a lot of energy to maintain, and they're typically used near a power source, like this temple. Nanobot bodies are sturdier and use less energy. They work well with mobile power sources. Cyborg bodies are much tougher and can carry a lot of power. They're usually used with a mix of nanobot and picobot systems. Got it, said Emily. So, these digital consciousnesses, said Drevel. You mentioned transference. What exactly does that look like? I can show you, said Hakesh. Dr. Snowden was still coming to grips with the fact that he was listening to someone who had died but was alive digitally and not an AI. Tamesh was also in the same state. Dr. Snowden could see the value in that, but there was also a potential darker side. Akash's head floated off to the side. I will start at the beginning and use my own experience to show you. Dr. Snowden scrutinized the realistic room that appeared where Hakesh's head had been. The hologram showed a medical area of some type, and an old man lay on the slab. The data labels indicated the man was Hakesh. A large, rectangular device on wheels stood at the end of the slab where Hakesh's head was, and wires were attached to various points on the shaved scalp. This is the setup for the transference to an ODC, said Hakesh. Anyone that undergoes this has usually had a picobot system in them for a while that knows the body and its history in great detail. The transference device is wired into my head, and the picobots are flushed out to a storage container where they are processed into an ODC. Once created, an ODC cannot be cloned. Dr. Snowden's eyes widened when the transference device glowed with a variety of lights. The wires had turned a light blue, and after a moment, Hakesh's body showed no vital signs, but the transference device showed that the operation had been successful. So you died during this process? asked Drevel. After the transference... My physical form did, yes, said Hakesh. Everin studied the hologram. It is less dying, and more of a transition to a new type of existence. Yes, observe, said Hakesh. Dr. Snowden's mind was blown when he saw a swarm of Picobots create a younger version of Hakesh. That is impressive, said Seer. Dr. Snowden wondered if she was now thinking of the possibility of something like that. It would be a powerful addition to Drevel, Sazrissa, and CC. This is a test to ensure the process worked, said Hakesh. The picobots that were flushed from my system are destroyed when the digital consciousness is built. However... Once the ODC is ready, one of the first processes that is tested is the control and formation of a picobot swarm to create a body. As you can see, I created a younger version of myself. Analysis. That is quite efficient. I'll say, said Emily. You could essentially live forever, assuming your ODC wasn't destroyed. So, how does the cloning device work to create a CDC? Sazrissa raised a finger. Well, this type of transference is common, and usually occurs at the physical body's end of life. Even with all our amazing technology, the body eventually deteriorates to the point where there are more mechanical parts than organic. As for the cloning device, it essentially erects a scanning field that the flushed picobots pass through without being harmed. Once done, the clone is constructed without the security precautions that prevent cloning. Bear in mind, the ODC is still created, 
but now there is also a clone of it, the CDC. Then whoever possesses the CDC can duplicate it or do whatever they want with it. Like what? asked Dr. Snowden. Cesarissa glanced at Hakesh. May I access the Picabot system here? Please do. Cesarissa interacted with her palm, and the environment changed. It showed an elderly woman on a slab similar to the one Hakesh had been on. In addition to the transference device was an odd spherical one that sat on top of a thin rod. This is Susan Gowell, said Cesarissa. She was 406 when she died, and her transference was normal as expected. The spherical device is a cloning device. This was done against her will. I obtained this footage from an Evernight data archive I raided. The scene changed to show a younger version of Susan chained to a bed. This simulation is not integrated with the virtual world. It's a standalone, so anyone can tap into it and do whatever they want. When they're done, the CDC's memory of the event is wiped, and the simulation is reset. And Susan is fully conscious when all this is happening? asked Emily. Sazrissa sighed. During the event, yes. Her ODC was held in stasis, while her CDC experienced everything as if it was real. The worst is when they don't reset the CDC's experiences, then copy over the memories to the ODC. That's horrible, said Emily, grimacing. Did you save Susan? asked Everin. I did. CDCs are expensive to maintain and create, so there's usually only one done, but they're used in a variety of simulations. Susan only had one, so I rescued her ODC and restored it to the virtual planet. Then she destroyed her CDC. Hakash faced Sazrissa. What you did was right. Yeah, but I have to fight my way into a data storage facility, said Sazrissa. That's definitely not the Trinican way. Everin eyed her. Why would the Everinites want CDCs? They use it as a form of punishment, a means to reinforce their views, and for intelligence gathering from enemies. Analysis. The Everinites use CDCs as a means of control. Sazrissa frowned. Yeah. The Everonites are one of the biggest violators when it comes to digital cloning. Drevel gestured at Hakesh. Are you aware they're doing this? I am. But I don't know the extent of it, or even where it's done, said Hakesh. Sazrissa growled. The Everonites have a massive facility with illegal CDCs, but I don't know where it is. Taking that down would be a big blow to them. Everin raised a finger. Then we shall find it and disable it. And then move the CDCs out and get them to the proper authorities to deal with. That would be one step closer to having the Everinites declared a non-allowable entity in the Chelatan Empire. Akash swept his gaze across the group. That is a bold move. The Everonites will surely have it under heavy security. Sazrissa sighed. I'm sure they will. But if we can do all that, then disable the Everonite communication network, the Everonite leadership will be vulnerable and can be taken down. Then maybe the Everonites will seek out the truth. Hakash nodded. We will be there for them should it come to that even without leadership or their propaganda, there will still be many that believe in that way of life. It is hard to fight an idea. Wise words, said Everin. However, it seems I am the source of the idea, and perhaps if I talk, that will help. You'll have your work cut out for you there, said Sazrissa, Everonites already view Frenev as your voice, so they'll probably still look to him as a guide, regardless of whether he's deposed or not. Understandable, 
said Everin. He gestured at Hakesh. Is there an Everinite center here? Hakesh pulled up a holographic map. There are several. But they are small. The biggest one has Arbiter Horizon. She's the highest ranking Everinite on tempos. I would like to meet her, said Everin. Before you do, I know the other Trinican guides would love to meet you. I would like to offer a feast in your name with a small group of guides. Everin half smiled. I have no problem with that, unless Dr. Snowden does. Everyone focused on him. How is it I'm always the one causing issues? asked Dr. Snowden with an amused look. The group laughed. Then it's settled, said Hakesh. Preparations are underway. We can plan for a few hours from now if that works for you. We'll be there. My guideline is to never miss a party when invited, said Drevel. Hakesh scrutinized him. An interesting outlook. Dr. Snowden had enjoyed learning how the Everanites functioned and what they did. The split between the Trinicans and the Everanites was clear. Hakesh was wise, and a feast and a chance to meet other guides like Tamesh sounded enticing. Dr. Snowden appreciated these slower types of events, but he knew that as they continued on, things would get more hectic. That was just a reality of traveling with Everin. Chapter 10 Emily had enjoyed the feast. It was now 4 o'clock p.m., and although she had thought she would be tired, the event had invigorated her. As expected, Everin had been the center of attention, and he had been swarmed by the Trinican guides. She had hung back with the others, but they too had had their fair share of questions. Cosmic energy had been a big topic, and the fact that the gang had it astounded the Trinicans. Emily suspected that everyone would still be there if Everin had not suggested that there was an Everinite temple to visit. She had not eaten or drunk much of anything there, because she wanted to be ready to fight if need be when they got to the Everinites. Drevel and Sazrissa had similarly not partaken in the food and drink, but Dr. Snowden had no such limitations. It amazed her that half the guides were ODCs with a mix of body types. She had asked if they felt that they had lost anything after their physical body was gone, but they had indicated that, outside of learning to navigate new forms, everything had seemed the same. Some of the guides were TDCs, and their physical bodies were elsewhere, and some had shown up in person. It was an interesting group. She had also learned that some ODCs lived in virtual worlds hosted by Dyson swarms orbiting the local star. Humanity had attained immortality, just not in the way she normally thought of it. She wondered where Lord Vigon, Lord Noskov, and other immortals were, and although she wanted to ask about them, she understood that knowing their future could create issues, something Everin cautioned her to avoid. Digital cloning bothered her. It made her shudder to think of what a CDC might have to go through. The group stood outside the Trinican Temple. Tamesh had called a transport that would take them to the Everinite Temple. It surprised Emily that Arbiter Horizon agreed to meet with them. Apparently, Tamesh had some pull with her. Emily studied the circular platform that landed before them in a yellow bordered square on the ground. The platform had individual seats on the edges and a ten-foot rod in the center. She followed everyone and took a seat. A light blue shielding appeared on all sides and the top, and the platform lifted. She had thought it might be a bumpy ride, but it had been smooth for the most part. Although the group had their own means of transportation, this form of travel was registered and interacted with the various traffic systems. Dr. Snowden rubbed his stomach. Okay, spicy meat and whatever that creamy fruit was have done a number on me. Analysis. Which number? Emily chuckled. He meant he's full. 
I see, said V. You are not expecting any issues at the Everanite Temple. Dr. Snowden circled a finger in the air. With this group, they'd have to be nuts to try anything. Besides, if they did, they're in a place where they aren't generally welcome, at least according to the guides I spoke with at the feast. Sazrissa laid a hand on Dr. Snowden's shoulder. Don't worry. The guides are probably right. They know this area well. Emily hoped there would be no issue at the Everanite Temple. There most likely would not be. But she would be ready if there was. Being prepared to fight did dampen her enthusiasm some, but she also understood the cost of being unprepared. She peered through the semi-transparent shields at the city below. It was an impressive mix of technology and nature. Parks were everywhere, and small bodies of water reflected the sun. Although the streets were wide, there were no ground vehicles that she could see. The skies were busy, and there were restrictions on what could fly at various heights. Yellow squares marked on the ground shot up a light. She had seen that when their platform had landed to pick them up, and surmised that they represented a vertical area where something could change heights or take off. A beeping sound drew her gaze forward. The Everanite Temple had been highlighted, and the platform was flying toward a spot that would allow them to descend into a yellow zone. She imagined the coordination of what could take off or land was complex. The Everanite Temple made her skin crawl. While most buildings fit into the environment and had a similar aesthetic, the Everanite Building had gone with a more imposing look. The temple itself was a white, rectangular building that sat in the center of a walled compound. There was an E in a circle emblazoned on each side up high. Turret towers resided at each corner, and the four entrances, each in the center of a side, had thick gateways with a small contingent of heavily armored guards. The teardrop-shaped robots with segmented appendages patrolled the open courtyard. Looks friendly, said Dr. Snowden. It's a lightly guarded compound, and more of a military outpost than a temple, said Sazrissa. Drevel pointed down. They're having military drills out in the side yards. Yeah, totally normal for a place of worship. Analysis. I do not think that is normal. He was kidding, as he always does, said Seer. Drevel winked at V. Acknowledged. Everin raised a finger. Drevel and Sazrissa have a point. We should approach with caution. The platform landed outside the southern gate. Emily disembarked with the others. The gate was daunting. It was rectangular in shape, and the border was thick metal. She did not see a sliding gate, but figured they enacted some type of shielding as necessary. The four guards out front wore the same armor as the heavy soldier she had seen when retrieving Sazrissa. Four turrets tracked the group as they approached. One of the guards walked out. Arbiter Horzen is expecting you. However, Administrator Shenra is on her way. Please wait. Very well, said Everin. Drevel pointed at the turrets. You all expecting an attack? The guard faced him. In a land of the unbelievers, we help those in need. We drag those in need to the light, which is sometimes frowned upon by others, especially here. Are you unbelievers? Nah, we believe in Everin, said Drevel. He's got an awesome ship, too. The guard harumphed and returned to his post. There is no need to antagonize them, said Everin. I know, but these guys give me a bad feeling, said Drevel. Emily nodded. Same here. First I've heard of the light, but guess that's their view of Everin's way. We'll find out, said Dr. Snowden, motioning ahead. A woman in a white robe approached. Her light blue skin was offset by her silver eyes and long white hair. Others stepped to the side and bowed to her as she passed. 
It was evident this woman held a position of power and was respected. Two robots walked behind her. The woman stopped before the group. I'm Administrator Shenra. Tamesh has informed me that you all are interested in learning about our organization. That is correct, said Everin. Shenra studied him. Arbiter Horzen is interested in meeting you. As for Sazerissa Moore Taka, she is a wanted terrorist. However, as this is Kairos, we will allow her on the grounds, but not inside the temple. You and your robot companion can meet with Arbiter Horazan. May the others view the other yards, asked Everin. Shenra's eyes narrowed. That's acceptable. But where Sazrissa goes, I go. Sazrissa shrugged. Fine. We can check out the yard on the right. I'll go with you, said Dr. Snowden. Everin gestured at Drevel, Emily, and Seer. Perhaps they can visit one of the other training yards. Shenra examined them, then pointed to the left side of the temple. They can go to the initiate training yards, join us at the disciple yard, or wait out here. Emily swatted Drevel's arm. We'll check out the initiates. You might learn something, said Shenra. She paused for a moment, then faced Everin. It has been arranged. Please follow me. Emily did not like that the group was being split up. Despite the circumstances, the team would cover as much ground as possible in the shortest time. It would have been safer if they had all stuck together, but she trusted that everyone could handle themselves if they needed a quick exit. The group followed Shenra to the steps leading to the temple. Shenra motioned for Everin and V to go inside. Then she took off to the right. Well... Guess we'll see you in a bit, said Dr. Snowden, trailing off with Sazerissa. Emily faced Everin. You sure about all this? I am. Be alert and stay in communication, he said. He and V took off up the stairs. Guess it's us three, said Drevel. And CC, said Seer. Emily smiled. Guess so. Come on. They walked over to the training yards on the far left of the compound. Once there, they found some stone benches to sit on. Emily studied the open yard, where fifty or so initiates in loose white pants practiced a variety of katas with an instructor. The lack of uniformity in skin color suggested these were not Everonites yet. She did not know what the rank structure was, but at some point they would have blue skin. The youth of the initiates was evident. They looked like teenagers to her. The only adults were two instructors in two-piece, light-armored suits and four heavy-armor guards on the right side of the yard. Two robots patrolled the area, and she saw two more in the air. She was not sure how they were able to fly, but they reminded her of what an octopus would look like swimming forward. That was a lot of security, but perhaps they viewed her and Drevel as a threat. Guess we just watch the show, said Drevel. Emily shrugged. I guess. I was sort of hoping to be with Everin when he talked to the Arbiter. I am sure V will record the interaction, said Seer. Yeah. Still, I still feel uneasy splitting up. No worries, said Drevel. Between me, you, Seer, and CC will be okay if something happens. CC split off Drevel's left arm and raised a cloth strand in the air. Emily laughed as she high-fived CC. Drevel grinned when CC merged back. Seems he really likes you. As a good friend once said, what's not to like? asked Emily. She liked Drevel and CC. They were a fun combination. After the feast from earlier, it was nice to sit back and relax, although she really wanted to be there for the Arbiter meeting. If anything, V could relay it without the Everonites knowing. 
They all could have just waited outside with that approach. But having the team nearby provided a quicker response if things got bad. Dr. Snowden did not think splitting up was wise, but he trusted Everin's game plan. The idea was to get the group inside the compound, and if need be, it would not be difficult to get everyone together if something went down. As they were in Kairos, it would be foolish for the Everinites to try anything, but Dr. Snowden still remained wary. Shenra glanced at Sazrissa as they walked. Quite bold of you to show yourself here. Sazrissa shrugged. I could have waited outside if it bothered you. Apparently, I'm not that wanted if I'm allowed here. Well, that's due to the generous nature of Arbiter Horizon, said Shenra. I would never allow it if it were my decision. And it isn't. Is it? asked Sazrissa. Dr. Snowden sensed the intense dislike between the two. Shenra had disgust written all over her face, and Sazrissa had a defiant look on hers. Well, let's just watch these disciples train while Everin meets with Arbiter Horizan. Then we'll be gone, he said. Shenra glanced at him. That would be best. The walk to the disciple training yard did not take long, and Dr. Snowden was glad to get there and take a seat with Sazrissa on a stone bench. Shenra stood off to the side. The disciples all had light blue skin and wore simple robes as they sparred with each other in two-person groups. Several trainers supervised the disciples. Several crusaders, as labeled in his ARI, stood at attention near the temple's outer wall, and two robots patrolled the ground with another two in the air. He had not known they could fly, but they made his skin crawl. Dr. Snowden observed a supervisor stepping in and hitting one of the disciples. Apparently, the disciple had done some move wrong. Violence appeared to be the norm here, a far cry from what Dr. Snowden had seen at the Trinikin Temple. Shenra stared at Sazrissa. Why do you hate us so? I don't hate the people. I hate the perversion of what Everin stands for, and what's done in his name, said Sazrissa. What perversion? Sazrissa snorted. <laughs> the neural implants that feed Frenev propaganda. He doesn't speak for Everin, who would never agree to the subjugation and military campaigns of late fought in his name. There's also the Everinites' massive investment in illegal digital cloning, and how would you know what Everin would agree to? asked Shenra. Because I know him. I've traveled with him. Shenra glanced at Dr. Snowden. He nodded. I have too. And do you share her views? asked Shenra. I don't know your organization as well as Sazrissa does, but she holds a special place with Everin, so I listen to what she says, said Dr. Snowden. Shenra scoffed. <laughs> you avoided the question. If Sazrissa doesn't like what's been done, then I accept her judgment. And from what little I've seen, she's been right so far, said Dr. Snowden. Shenra harumphed. You're both misguided. The Everonites are advancing a society where everyone is equal. Dr. Snowden's blood boiled. Okay. What if Everin came back and said to listen to him, not Frenev? Would you do as Everin said? Everin would speak to Frenev first, and they would have a unified front, because Everin would be saying the same things he said to Frenev, said Shenra. Uh-huh. Let's say for the sake of argument that they do meet, and Frenev declares it is Everin, but then Everin says things in opposition to Frenev, who do you follow? Shenra furrowed her brow. Everin wouldn't do that to Frenev. What if Everin says Frenev is the enemy? Everin wouldn't do that, said Shenra. Dr. Snowden smirked. And you said I avoided the question. Every answer you've given involves Frenev in some capacity. Without him, it seems Everin has no legitimacy. 
That makes it sound like you're more loyal to Frenev than Everin. Shenra scowled. Enough of this. You said you don't know our organization that well, and it shows. Sazrissa chuckled. No, I'd say he has a fairly good picture of what's going on now. The Everknights worship Frenev in all but name. You'd be wise to remember where you are. Oh, I'm not worried, said Sazrissa. Shenra harumphed and moved away. Wow, they really are brainwashed, said Dr. Snowden. Sazrissa smiled at him. Yeah, and I enjoyed your show. Dr. Snowden grinned. Well, her logic was weak. Those of blind faith don't like to be questioned, from my experience, and if anything, they double down. And yes, I am aware the same could be applied to my faith in Everin, but he's a special case. It's still difficult to believe that humanity is this advanced, and yet they still fall prey to things like this. Humanity has always had a blind spot for that, from what I've read said Sazrissa. Sometimes with technology, it can be so advanced and move so fast that people just want to live a simpler life and accept whatever gives that to them. I understand that, but I don't think they rush to sign up for whatever cult is in town. They laughed. Dr. Snowden liked hanging with Sazrissa, even if it was in an Everanite compound. She was level-headed, calm, and rational. It was no surprise to him that the Toravada had chosen her. I know I'm not supposed to talk about the future, but you know of it, like Lord Vigon, he said. Sazrissa studied him. I do. Why do you mention it? Dr. Snowden sighed. I get the feeling that Emily and I are not with these future Everins. You must know our fate. I can't really say. Personal timeline integrity and all, she said. She laid a hand on his shoulder. I will say that I am honored to have this time with you. You make it sound like we're dead or something, he said, eyeing her. Sazrissa eyed him back. They laughed again. I won't bother you with that, said Dr. Snowden. On another note, how are you feeling about working with Drevel? It'll be fine. He seems like a good person, and the Torvato wouldn't group us up if we weren't compatible. Besides, he's a lot of fun. And of course, he's a chosen. Dr. Snowden observed the yard. Assuming nothing bad happens, it sounds like you two, with C.C. and Seer, will have a lot of new adventures ahead of you. I'm looking forward to it, said Sazrissa. She motioned at Shenra. Even if we make a change here, most of it will have to come from those seeking change. I can't really help there. I just sort of exist. I've been here for a long time and I have to think I could do so much more. I get it. He saw fire in her eyes. She wanted to affect change, and after this event was done, she would need to find something to do that could make use of her abilities. While he was sure there would be work, it was not as satisfying as knowing the Torvada had flagged something as important via a summons than working on it. He studied Shenra in the distance, with her dagger eyes. There was pure hate emanating from her. He suspected that if she had the chance, she would be attacking him and Sazrissa. Hopefully they could leave soon. He had hoped to listen in on Everin and V's conversation with Arbiter Horizan, but they had turned communication off for the moment. Dr. Snowden figured that was by design and he would wait for the inevitable meeting afterward to discuss the situation. Chapter 11 V analyzed the Everanites standing at attention on both sides of the hallway. Per the data he had absorbed from the Trinicans, the Everanites were crusaders. 
They were the same classification as the heavy armor guard back at the cave entrance when they had gone to retrieve Sazrissa. Crusaders were those who had proved their loyalty, and to become one required a minimum of 25 years of service. They were well trained in a variety of combat techniques and usually had several military campaigns under them. V had found some interesting notes from Hakesh on them. One suggested that a crusader was worth five disciples. Perhaps that was why there were only a handful of crusaders present. At the end of the hallway was a large elliptical room. V had surveyed the interior when he and Everin entered. A stage sat in the back, with two doorways behind it leading off to areas unknown. The open area before it had a slick, metallic floor. Large windows on the sides were high up and had a variety of designs etched on them. The ceiling had various holographic projectors. There were six crusaders present in the room. However, it was the three Everonites on the stage that stood out. Two wore gold-plated heavy armor with hands behind their backs. Per the Trinican records, these were paladins. They were crusaders who had distinguished themselves after forty years of service. A scan of their armor showed it to be of higher quality than the crusaders and also capable of stronger energy shield output. Between them was a woman in a white, two-piece suit with a silver tunic. A dark orange E was emblazoned on it. Her light blue skin was similar to other Everonites, and her white hair was pulled back and up. V did not think she had a friendly face. He and Everin stood before the woman. I am Arbiter Horizon, she said. She studied them. Temesh requested that I entertain your request to visit this temple. You are Everin and V, and with you are Dr. Albert Snowden, Emily Snowden, Drevel Zage, C.C. Seer, and Sazrissa Mortaka, the terrorist. Everin nodded. We only wanted to visit, but we appreciate you meeting with us. She raised a finger. Your visit has piqued my curiosity. Why would you want to do so with a terrorist in your group? I understand she has some history, but we were assured that was not an issue if we visited, said Everin. It's not, at least in Kairos, but it does cast a shadow on your presence, said Horizon. I'm curious. What did you hope to learn by visiting? I have talked with the Trinicans and understand their perspective. I wanted to know the Everonite's perspective. As a side note, I have noticed you are a wildborn. V noted Horizon's subtle movements. She had been surprised at Everin's analysis. The paladins had also turned their heads slightly as if they were digesting what they had just heard. I don't know what a wildborn is, said Horizon. I understand, said Everin. It is someone with wildborn energy in them. This is mostly associated with humanity and gives them special abilities. You are a wild-born linker, to be precise, and can link to objects. This means your ability is telekinetic in nature. Horizon drew her head back. How could you know that? Everin's eyes glowed. I can see auras on every living being and, from that, understand what they are. Horizon stood straight. I see. Nonetheless... I don't know what information you would learn by visiting, but if you're looking at the differences between us and the Trinicans, it's simple. Everin saved humanity long ago, and since that event we have followed his guidelines. Prime Arbiter Frenev has a direct link to Everin, and thus our guidelines have been verified. The Trinicans' version has not. A man appeared as a hologram next to Horizon. V analyzed the man. He wore a white robe with a blue belt. His light blue skin and white hair were common to the Everonites V had seen so far. Elegant silver embroidery covered the sleeves and collar, 
which extended up past the head. Horizon bowed. Prime Arbiter Frenev, I was not expecting you. It's okay, said Frenev. When you told me that Zazarissa Mortaka was in our compound, I became curious about the group she traveled with. He faced Everin and V. You are both bold to come here after the cave incident, then arrive with a terrorist in your midst. Everin and V bowed slightly. It is good to meet you, said Everin. We were assured it would not be an issue. We only wanted to visit and learn about the Everinites from themselves. Frenev placed his hands behind his back and paced. Interesting. Tell me, do you believe in what Sazerissa does? Although I do not wish to introduce myself this way, I do. My legacy has been corrupted. Silence fell. Frenev roared. Your legacy! Oh, your name is Everin, and you think you're him. I do not think. I simply am, said Everin. Sazrissa suggested it would be good for me to see both groups that have followed me. Horizon sighed. Another delusioned one. We get a few of your types a year, those who proclaim they're Everin, and therefore we owe them something. She's right, said Frenev. So what do we owe you? I do not require anything, said Everin. I am merely assessing the landscape. From what I have seen, I do not agree with how my legacy is being used. Frenev smirked. Right. I think I've heard enough to know what this is. He glanced at Horizon. A known terrorist is in the compound, and we have another imposter who thinks they're ever in. Take this trash out. He raised a finger. And his friends. There is no need for violence, said Everin. We will leave peacefully. Oh, no, you won't, said Frenev. Zazarissa's corpse is ours. And your group? Well, you picked the wrong person to associate yourself with. You also attacked us when you went after Zazarissa, despite your grand delusion. I will offer you a quick death. Everin's eyes glowed as he slowly raised his hand, ending with his palm forward. I do not believe so. Frenev nodded at Horizon. Then his projection faded. We do not need to do this. Violence should only be used as a last resort, said Everin. Begging? Is that what you are reduced to? asked Horizon. She tapped at her palm. Exterminate our visitors. Defensive mode engaged, said V. His shielding pulsed. Horzen raised a hand toward him. He sensed that she was trying to lift him, so he activated his density control. As her attempt grew stronger, he ratcheted up his density to compensate. He would not be tossed away again. How? she asked. She glanced at the paladins. They charged toward V. As they moved, they pulled out hilts from which extended thin metal rods. An orange energy shield encapsulated each rod, creating an energy sword. The other crusaders in the room raised their ranged weapons. Everin spawned his shield on his left forearm. The Everinites are attacking. Get out of the compound, he said over comms. The others would be fighting, but V trusted their skills and ability to handle themselves. He took a step forward. One downside of increasing his density was that he moved much slower. The Crusaders opened fire on him, but his shielding held. As he stomped toward Horizon, she backpedaled. Everin reflected the energy beams directed at him, but they did not disable the Crusader's shielding. The Paladins had arrived and flanked him. They swung at the same time but Everin rolled to the side, then fired a grappling beam at one of the paladins. With some effort, he pulled the paladin in, then kicked him back into the other one. V, get Horizon, 
said Everin. Acknowledged. Everin spawned his staff as he leapt over the paladins and rushed the first crusader, who had pulled out a blue energy sword. Everin blocked the crusader's jab, then ducked behind him and hit a weak spot. The crusader cried out as he crumpled to the floor. While two attackers focused on V, the other three charged Everin. He raised his shield and dashed forward while grappling the crusader on the furthest right. Two of the crusaders were clotheslined and tumbled over. Everin reeled in the one he had attached and swung him into the paladins, who had gotten back up. V had made progress to Horizon when two crusaders rushed him. They beat on him, to no avail. V paused to pull off the helmets of each attacker. He used his segmented arm that popped out of his shoulder to stun them both. Everin joined V. Horizon has fled to the Disciple Yard. Let us go. V lowered his density and dashed after him. The paladins and crusaders were all down, although the paladins and one of the crusaders would be back up shortly. Horizon seemed scared when she could not affect Everin or V. Although her wild-born ability might have worked on him with less density, it would not work on someone like Everin. V hoped the others were doing okay. Sazrissa and Dr. Snowden would be dealing with Administrator Shenra and the Disciples, and now, potentially, Arbiter Horizon. It was time to even the odds. Drevel had enjoyed watching the Initiates. It was evident they were raw, but had physical strength. He had only seen fit people everywhere he had been. That was common amongst advanced societies, especially those with Pikabots. Fat was just something that could be removed internally with ease, and muscle, bones, and the like could be strengthened. Biological engineering would be a breeze here. Emily had been fun to chat with. She was in a good mood despite where they were. He shared her desire to meet with Arbiter Horizon, and Emily had said they would have a video of the meeting to view afterward. He also noticed that Seer conversed differently with Emily than him. While Seer was sometimes snarky toward him, she was curious and friendly with Emily. It could be an experience thing, but it made him wonder if his personality irked Seer at times. Emily's youthfulness intrigued Drevel. She was in her early twenties, yet she was experienced in many matters. Having cosmic energy would help, but it was obvious she had seen and been through a lot. She had discussed her time on a prison planet she had been stranded on. Her resiliency was evident. After watching the initiates for a while, Drevel, Emily, and Seer had joined Dr. Snowden and Sazrissa on the right side of the temple. The disciples were older, and their pairing off displayed advanced knowledge of hand-to-hand -hand combat. As in the initiate yard, crusaders, per the Trinican data that V had shared, stood along the far right wall while robots patrolled the ground and the air. Dr. Snowden had relaxed, but Sazrissa was round tight. It might be due to Administrator Shenra scowling in the distance and boring a gaze through Sazrissa. Emily and Seer had sat with Dr. Snowden. Emily linked arms with him and discussed the initiate yard. Drevel walked over to Sazrissa, who stood off to the side, like watching paint dry, huh? It's not bad, said Sazrissa. I've been to these temples before, long ago. This is nothing new, although the heightened security is. How was the initiate's yard? Drevel shrugged, as expected. He eyed her. So this is common for you to travel with Everin? She bobbed her head. Everin's values don't change, even if his form does. When I'm with you on your Torvata, I may see his other forms again. Our Torvata, said Drevel. You were chosen, just like I was, although I'd say you've had a heck of a lot more exposure to the cosmic side of things. She studied him. I appreciate that. Everin's icon highlighted in Drevel's ARI. The Everinites are attacking. Get out of the compound. Dr. Snowden and Emily stood. Then they spawned their energy shields while pulling out their PSDs. Okay, I wasn't expecting that, said Drevel as he drew his two energy pistols. I will provide an aerial view, said Seer as her form shimmered away and her orb took to the sky. 
Sazrissa raised her arm forward and projected an energy shield when Shenra shot a beam at her. I'll provide aerial cover, said Drevel. Cece lifted Drevel off the ground. Between his view and Sears, he had a good overview of what they were dealing with. The disciples had formed behind their instructors and charged the group. Crusaders advanced, with weapons aimed, while the ground robots rushed in. The aerial robots hovered and tilted forward. Emily and Sazrissa had flanked Dr. Snowden, and their initial volley of mist and stun beams had stunted the disciples' charge. Drevel handled the aerial robots, then hit the ground ones. That left the Crusaders, who stormed through the chaos. Drevel's energy pistols got a good workout as he kept the robots and disciples at bay. He spotted six more Crusaders, a paladin, per the data label in his ARI, and ten troopers rush out the side of the temple. Several aerial and ground robots emerged alongside the other attackers. Seer marked them, which meant the others would see all the new opponents. Shenra had engaged Sazrissa, and Shenra moved fast as she tried to stab Sazrissa with energy daggers. Sazrissa had dodged the strikes and used her energy shield from her right palm to push Shenra back. Sazrissa's next move surprised Drevel. She used her left palm to fire a grappling beam at Shenra's right leg, then yanked. Shenra tumbled. Sazrissa reeled her in. Then Sazrissa placed her fingertips on her chest and unloaded a massive stun charge. Shenra collapsed. Drevel was impressed. Sazrissa's takedown was one smooth action. It was obvious she was a very skilled fighter, and she knew her tools well. He fired on the handful of aerial robots, then took aim at the ground ones. Dr. Snowden hit all three robots with pinpoint accuracy. Drevel was amazed at Dr. Snowden's ability to hit the robots. They were hard to hit from the ground due to all the chaos and mist, yet Dr. Snowden had done so with no issues. Emily had whirled into battle against a paladin and two crusaders, while Sazrissa got the other four crusaders. Drevel descended. Cece flew over to assist Emily, while Drevel aided Sazrissa. He formed his fist weapons and jumped into the fray. A crusader slashed at him, but he dodged and counterattacked with a hit to the crusader's weak spot, which was a mesh point in the shielding. Another crusader tackled him and took him to the ground. Sazrissa grappled the tackler, then yanked him into another attacker. Drevel hopped up, rushed over to the down man and stunned him. That left one crusader who had bashed Sazrissa away. Drevel ran and slid between the attacker's legs, then punched up. The crusader yelped before falling over. Drevel focused on Emily and CC. He had wrapped the paladin's head, allowing Emily to get a clean strike in. The paladin collapsed. The other two crusaders flanked Emily, but CC engulfed their legs and pulled them together. Emily spun her bladed staff and disarmed the two men. Then she hit both in their weak spot as they flailed around. CC disengaged, and the men fell. Drevel studied the fight area. All the attackers had been disabled, but it had taken a toll. Dr. Snowden sat on the stone bench and rubbed his upper right arm. Sasrissa had received a hard hit to the face, and although her helmet had protected her, her nose bled. Emily was okay, and Cece had slipped back on Drevel. Seer had landed and assumed her humanoid projection. He went over to Dr. Snowden. You got hit. Sorta. Blocked an energy blast, but it shoved me back over the stone bench, and I landed weird, said Dr. Snowden. Drevel extended a hand. May I? Sure. Drevel touched Dr. Snowden's arm and concentrated. Dr. Snowden moved his elbow in circles when Drevel retracted his hand. Wow, uh, much better. Thanks. Of course, said Drevel. Sazrissa, Emily, and Seer joined them. Do I get the healing touch too? asked Sazrissa. Sure, said Drevel. He lightly touched her nose and focused. After a moment, he pulled his finger away. Liking that, she said, probing her face. Look, said Emily, pointing at a woman exiting the temple. The woman raised her hands, and several unconscious disciples hovered, then were flung at the group. What the heck? asked Dr. Snowden, raising his shield. 
Emily jumped in front of him and blocked the first disciple that was tossed. Sasrissa ran forward, dodging the bodies while Drevel and Seer took to the air. The woman collapsed when a series of stun shots hit her. Everyone focused on Everin and V exiting the temple. They all met up. We need to leave, said Everin. He gestured at the woman. That was Arbiter Horizon, a wildborn who has telekinetic abilities. He studied the yard. It seems you all have already dealt with the situation here. Sure, Dad, said Emily. For the disciples, I'm sure this will be one training lesson they won't soon forget. Drevel laughed. He loved Emily's personality. Everin gestured toward the temple entrance. Let us go. Drevel followed the others as they left. The fight had been unexpected, and what should have been a tour had turned into something much more chaotic. Why the Everinites had decided to attack remained a mystery, but he suspected he and the others would learn more once back at the Toravada. He liked how quickly everyone had come together. If he had needed to fight everything by himself, he would have fled. Seer had no combat abilities, and he would have used CC to block shots while getting flanked. As strong as he knew himself to be, he had limits. Thankfully, he had been with the gang. Chapter 12 Sasrissa examined the front courtyard of the Everonite Temple as the group walked by. It was quiet, and there was no sign of activity. She figured that Kairos law enforcement would arrive soon. They did not allow fighting of the type that the gang had just gone through, so there would be questions. The fact that it had been at an Everonite temple would only incite law enforcement, as they did not like Everonites to begin with. The group exited the temple grounds. We should wait for law enforcement and show them what happened, said Sazrissa. Otherwise, the Everonites can spin this. Very well, said Everin. Emily stared off in the distance. How long do you think it will take them to get here? Ten minutes or so, said Sasrissa. Our fight was probably spotted via aerial or satellite. Dr. Snowden used his PSD to create a metallic bench, then sat. Then I'll just rest here. Everyone but Everin and V took a seat. You think they'll understand what happened? asked Drevel, glancing at Sasrissa. Absolutely, said Sasrissa. She gestured at Everin. As for footage, you can show them the moment you were attacked. Emily's eyes narrowed. Speaking of which, why did they attack? Analysis. Arbiter Horizon and Prime Arbiter Frenev believed Everin to be fake, and this was an opportunity to capture Sazarissa. Indeed, said Everin. Obviously, I could not allow that. Prime Arbiter Frenev appears to be worshipped. Dr. Snowden snorted. Yeah, no kidding. Talked to Administer Shenra, and she just avoided anything that didn't have that guy in it. They don't worship Everin. It's Frenev, who supposedly speaks for Everin. Dravel grinned. Then all we need to do is show them that Frenev doesn't speak for Everin. Says Rissa sighed. Unfortunately, it's not that easy. Some will still believe him, and with propaganda piping into them, they'll accept whatever is told to them. Then we stop that, said Emily. Says Rissa frowned. Even with that, there will still be those who believe in Frenev. Dr. Snowden adjusted his glasses. Then it seems to me that we have to get him on record detailing his scam. Hard to double down when the guy you worship says he's using you. That may be difficult, said Everin, raising a finger. Frenev has not gotten to where he is by making mistakes. Any communication that undercuts the Everinites will be hard to get from him, and I will not coerce it out of him. Sazrissa smiled at him. That was what she would have expected. Everin would expose Frenev, but not in a way that violated Everin's approach to problems. It was difficult to fight an idea, and even with reinforcements via the neural implants, there would still be believers. 
They had built their lives on blind faith, and that would not change for some. A squad of flying, armored men escorting a transport ship approached. The ship descended in the temple's front courtyard, while four men landed in front of the group. Sazrissa knew the Kairos law enforcement was stacked with cyborgs who wore heavy armor. They had limited Picabot systems, mainly used in self-defense, and each of them carried a standard-issue energy assault rifle and an energy blade, along with an expandable energy shield. Although there were androids in the force, most of Kairos's security force consisted of those with original bodies or those who had migrated to a stronger body upon the death of their former one. I'm Ward Principal Deimos, said one of the men, stepping forward. We detected an engagement inside Temple Grounds. The Everanites attacked you. They did, said Everin. He extended his hand, palm up, and a projection shot up. This is what initiated it. Sazrissa studied the hologram that played. It showed Frenev declaring Everin an imposter and giving the order to take down Sazrissa. That was not a surprise to her. Frenev only cared about himself, and like Administrator Shenra, Arbiter Horizon would never change her mind, even in the presence of Everin. Deimos emitted a beam from his eye over the hologram. Footage archived. The temple is being shut down, and those who assaulted you are to be apprehended. The three other men moved into the courtyard. What will happen to the Everanites long term? asked Everin. They will be judged for their participation. Their license to operate in Kairos will most likely be revoked, said Deimos. Everin nodded. Our intent was not to cause them harm. Deimos gestured at the temple. The Everanites have been testing the limits of Kairos law. I understand, said Everin. Is there anything else you need from us? You are free to go. But if we have further questions, we'll contact you, said Deimos. He bowed slightly, then went to the courtyard. Well, that was quick, said Drevel. Sasrissa smirked. Helps when you have the type of surveillance that law enforcement has, and the Everanites were already under heavy scrutiny. This was their last event. There is a lot to understand here, said Everin. I need to see the communication infrastructure used by the Everanites, including the specialized neural implants architecture. However, I think it would be beneficial to witness the event where they became wild-born, that will give us an idea of what we are dealing with. They're awakening, said Sazrissa. Dr. Snowden bobbed his head. I'd like to see that, too. Analysis. I have called for transport. Very good, said Everin. Emily glanced at him. Was it weird not to be acknowledged as yourself? Their ignorance would not allow them to see the truth, said Everin. I now understand how far that goes. Sazrissa chuckled. Yeah, I've dealt with it for over a century, so I'm used to it. However, I've found that if someone grows up without the Everanite influence, they rarely join them. That's harder and harder to do as the Everanites spread into every facet of a society and, over time, come to control it. Drevel snorted. They're like a virus. An apt analogy, said Everin. Although I do not like interfering in ideological wars, I am displeased that my legacy is being used to cause harm. Analysis. We will change your legacy. I hope so, said Everin. A flying platform arrived, and the gang boarded. Sasrissa was glad to have their help. Although she had sabotaged implant transports, destroyed buildings, and freed digital clones, it felt like she was not making a dent in anything. If the Everanite's communication system was downed, the neural implants understood, the Everanite leadership removed, along with a new message supplied by Everin and the Everanite's illegal digital cloning exposed, things might be better. That would clear her conscience and she suspected it would do the same for Everin as well. Emily relaxed into her seat in the Torvada's left seating area. 
Drevel sat next to her, while Dr. Snowden and Cesriso were on the other side. Everett was in his command chair, and V and Seer were at the front console. It felt good to be back, and although she had just fought, she was already unwinding. The next step was to learn more about the Everanites' chosen, as Cesrissa called them. The gang had already met Arbiter Horizan, and Everin and V had met Prime Arbiter Frenev. Cesrissa said there were twenty or so Arbiters who had been affected, and that they had greatly expanded the Everanite influence. Emily was not sure what could cause that many people to become wild-born. Everin gestured at Cesrissa. Do you have the time index and coordinates of when this awakening occurred? I only tracked it down to when they left from a spaceport and landed at another one. It happened somewhere along the way, she said. Very well, said Everin. V, put us in scan profile one and stealth mode. Acknowledged. Sasrissa, input the time index and coordinates for where they took off, and we will follow them. Sasrissa complied. The Torvada ascended, and after twenty minutes it reached low orbit. The Torvada opened a portal and flew through, then jumped back in time. Analysis. It is 5.20 p.m., October 31st, 26386 A.D. We are orbiting Trinicus Ga. Sasrissa pointed at a dot rising from the planet that the Torvada had highlighted. That's their ship. Perform scan and deploy a quantum beacon, said Everin. Acknowledged. The Torvada flew forward and scanned, then slipped in close and shot an octagonal device at the back end. The device shimmered out of view. That's new, said Dr. Snowden. We've tracked like this before, said Emily. It's a magnetized container with a chameleon effect. Remember we tracked Bilazine this way? Oh, yeah, that's right. Bilazine, asked Drevel. Dr. Snowden grimaced. A rogue time traveler who kept resetting the timeline from a specific point. We put a quantum beacon on his ship to find that point. Fascinating, said Drevel. Quantum beacons are essentially tracking devices at the cosmic level. You got it. Emily appreciated seeing a three-dimensional view of the ship pop up near the front podium. Red dots indicated life signs, of which there were twenty-one, mostly clustered in the center. None had exotic energy. After a moment, the ship entered condensed space. Emily studied the regional map as it showed the ship moving rapidly toward its destination. She loved that the Torvada could track like this, the Torvada opened a portal and flew in. This is nuts, said Drevel. He stared outside at the shimmering blue tunnel. I didn't know two ships could share the same condensed space tunnel. Normally they cannot, but the Torvada is unique, said Everin. Drevel laughed. <laughs> yeah, a little. They kept at least half a light year away from the Everinite ship. The Torvada had matched speeds and was able to scan the ship as if it was sitting outside. That was probably due to the nature of a condensed space tunnel. Their arrival at the end point will take several days, so it may take a while before the awakening event occurs, said Everin. Well, it's dinner time anyways, said Emily. She hopped up and glanced at Dr. Snowden. Taco night? Like you need to ask he said, grinning. Sazrissa tilted her head. I'm up for it. Taco night is a cherished tradition. Sounds like a delicious one to me, said Drevel. Everyone assembled in the conference room. Emily noted that Sazrissa referred to it as a tradition. It made it sound like future Everin and the gangs also engaged in taco night, Although she wanted to believe that maybe she and Dr. Snowden were present for those, a nagging doubt suggested they were not. Why they would ever leave Everin remained a mystery. Emily and Dr. Snowden had laid out a spread of hard and soft taco shells, a variety of meats, shredded and melted cheese, guacamole, and various other trimmings. 
Once everyone sat, they dug in and created a variety of tacos. She loved the atmosphere as everyone was in a good mood. V and Seer did not eat, but they observed everyone eating and participated in discussion. Seer seemed like she was getting more relaxed around the others as she teased Sazrissa and Dr. Snowden. They were good sports, which made Emily wonder how often Seer was a part of events where she socialized with others. Maybe it happened more often than Emily knew. Drevel was the life of the party as always. He made everything interesting, and Emily could see how traveling with him would be fun no matter what was going on. Even CC had gone in with some of Drevel's antics. CC made a taco for Drevel, but arranged the toppings to look like a face sticking a tongue out, making the gang laugh. Sasrissa appeared overjoyed. She fit in with ease, and it made Emily wonder about the other gangs she celebrated with. Emily suspected if she were in Sazrissa's shoes, she would probably be excited to be with Everin and meet other gangs. Everin was cool as always. Even his cosmic energy appeared more stable than usual. While he was teased by the others, he dished some out too. He had dropped some meat on his suit, and Sazrissa had drawn a smiley face out of the stain, Although the suit removed the stain, it was an example of his cozy relationship with Sazrissa. Dr. Snowden was all smiles as he talked excitedly and ate, sometimes at the same time. Emily was glad to see him happy. Traveling with Everin had risks, and Dr. Snowden had been involved in more than his fair share of incidents. She indicated for him to pass some shells. It was time to savor the moment with a second round of tacos. Chapter 13 Sasrissa stared out past the roof's shielded guardrail and reflected on how much she had enjoyed taco night. She had heard it had originated with the first gang that Everin had traveled with, and now she had gotten to experience it with them. Her first one, long ago, had been exciting, and it had surprised her how simple yet delicious it was. She frowned as she thought of the other gangs. She had been close to them, and she knew all of their destinies. A part of her wished she did not know Everin's future, but when he had met her for the first time, he had said she had an exciting journey ahead of her. She fully understood that now, and what she figured would be her last meeting with Everin and the gang turned out not to be. She wondered which versions would visit her after going to Drevel and Sears Torvada. Drevel exited the elevator and approached her. You're up here too, huh? Great minds and all that. She smiled at him. Yep. What brings you up here? Everin is in the research lab, and V and Sear are in the command center. Dr. Snowden and Emily are talking in the planner cartography lab, so figured I'd hop up here and relax some. Sasrissa motioned to her left. I'm actually glad you came. We haven't had a chance to really talk. Drevel joined her on the side and leaned on the guardrail, looking out. Yeah, things move fast here. I guess having a Torvada like this leads to that. I take it your summonses are slower in general. Oh, yeah, he said. CC and I travel to an Earth and then investigate or figure out what we need to do if the summons is vague. Seer helps, of course. Being able to fly is a big help, but it takes time to unravel things. We can't time travel, but if we could, that would resolve most summonses quickly. Sazrissa eyed him. I wonder why your Torvata can't make portals in time. He gestured outward. Well, it can, but only on initial entry, like this one. Once there, it's locked to that moment. However, by default, it opens to a time period roughly equal to the Earth I came from. It would be 2025 there, so it's 2025 on every other one I go to. Sazrissa could see herself enjoying the types of summonses she would be doing. They would require her to be on her toes, and even with the advantages she had and the Torvada portal points, 
She suspected the summonses would still be challenging. So how does it work with Seer? She asked. Drevel smiled. Seer's presence is critical. She provides tactical support, and her aerial reconnaissance is invaluable. She also deals with any tech concerns. Some summons would be impossible without her, and we've become close friends over the last two centuries. That is a long time to work with someone. It is, he said. She knows everything about me. She's my anchor. Their relationship had endured the test of time, and Sassrisso wondered if she would have that same bond with both of them. It would be a big departure from working solo, but she was ready for that change. Traveling with Everin and his many forms and gangs had been a reminder of what it was like to work on a team, and this new assignment would be something she enjoyed. How long do you have between summonses to rest? asked Sazrissa. It varies, said Drevel. Never less than a week, though, and sometimes it stretches into months. Sazrissa studied him. And what do you usually do between them? If it's personal, you don't need to tell me. Drevel laughed. <laughs> Not personal at all. I'm free to visit any earth I want, or I can hang in the Toravada, or do both. Most of the time I go to one of the sanctuary earths I created and check up on them. Ah, what if you get a summons while you're on another earth? Oh, let me tell you, Seer won't stop pinging me until I address it. Sasrissa nodded. What if you don't want to do the summons? Then I just tell Seer I don't want to. And that's that, said Drevel. However, I'm thankful for all the Toravada has given me, so I rarely refuse one unless I'm not feeling well or deep in the middle of something. Got it. How many of these sanctuary earths are out there now? Drevel bobbed his head. Fourteen. Each one has the same technology level, and Seer keeps them updated. Sazarissa smiled. Those Earths must really appreciate what you did. Oh, they do. And the bonus is that there are no nearby alien civilizations, so they can expand that way. What's the largest group you've evacuated? Drevel furrowed his brow. Well, let's see. Would have to be a group I evacuated to SE4. Well, Sanctuary Earth 4. I know it's not a creative name, but it's easy to remember. I transported 8,000 people or so. A meteor was coming, one that was 10 miles across. It had already affected the Earth and was approaching fast. I was on a large island, and everyone that could make it to the portal survived. Wow. The foyer area held that many people, asked Sazrissa. Seer opened two portals, said Drevel. One was on the earth I was on, and the other portal was in the staging area and led to SE4. The people went through in a big U. Where were you? I was trying to save as many people as I could before the meteor hit, he said. Sazrissa could see that he had put his life on the line, given how fast a meteor of that size could break through the atmosphere. Its impact would be civilization-ending, yet Drevel had managed to save some remnant of that earth. He raised a finger. The sanctuary earths don't need to worry about something hitting the planet, though. They have advanced systems in orbit and in the system that can detect and neutralize incoming objects way before they get to Earth. I guess the survivors would be comforted by that, she said. They were, and when I visit, they make sure to let everyone know I'm there. Sazrissa could see how they viewed him as a hero on the sanctuary Earths. What he did was heroic and having the means to help people like that sounded like something she would enjoy. What situations would call for an evacuation? Obviously, meteors is one, she said. Drevel tapped his temple. Play it by ear. 
I avoid making an exclusive list of reasons and just take it on a case-by-case basis. For instance, if those 8,000 were killers who had eradicated the rest of the world prior to the meteor, I'd be less inclined to introduce them to a sanctuary earth. She smiled. It sounds, then, like the main criterion is if they'll impact the sanctuary earths. Yeah, I guess you could say that. However, sometimes it's just not possible to save everyone. I get that, she said. She tilted her head at him. I think we're going to have an interesting future. Drevel swatted her arm. Count on it, partner. She enjoyed talking with him and could see that they would most likely form a strong bond. If things worked out, she could spend time between summonses visiting this version of Everin and the gang on their Earth. Maybe she was being rewarded for helping multiple Everins in this time period. She was okay with that. Dr. Snowden relaxed in the planner cartography lab. It was his home within a home. He had spent many a night getting lost in exploring galaxies and other stellar phenomena. It boggled his mind that there was so much out there, and the Torvada had a lot of data on different races, technology, and cultures. Thankfully, the lab had search functionality. Emily waltzed in. Hey, Uncle Albert. Someone's in a good mood, he said. She created a seat opposite him and sat. Good meal. Good friends. Good mood. They all go together. He chuckled. <laughs> they sure do. What are you up to? Just hanging out. Relaxing. I'm stuffed, said Emily. She eyed him. Something's bothering you. How can you tell? You got that brooding look thing going on, said Emily. Dr. Snowden eased back into his chair. Well, a few things are, actually, Spill. Dr. Snowden scrunched his face. All right. Sazrissa's presence confirms that there are future forms of our Everin. Right. That means our Everin dies, he said. I just have difficulty wrapping my head around it. It's not an if. It's now a guaranteed when. Emily frowned. Yeah, that sucks. Dr. Snowden adjusted his glasses. I've always thought of him as immortal. But I realize I ascribed that to his current form, the one we know. Yes, he may have a second third and later forms, and they will still be ever in, but they won't be the first form. She raised her head. I get it, but I try not to think of it. Just live in the moment. Yeah. The other thing that bothers me is that, based on everything I've heard up to this point, I don't think we're traveling with the future forms. That means we either die or are dropped off and never see ever in again. I find the former a stronger possibility than the latter. Emily bobbed her head. Those are good points. I suspect that if we do go, it will be with all of us together, and not just ever in and we get dropped off. These are my thoughts, too, said Dr. Snowden. Don't get me wrong. I'm glad to have the chance to meet Sazrissa, but she dragged up some uncomfortable possibilities regarding our future, and she's probably aware of that, said Emily. Dr. Snowden nodded. I'm sure she is. I really like her. She's calm, level-headed and smart, and can fight if need be. I do like her abilities, too. I mean, a pocket dimension inside you? You would stuff pizza slices in there on the go if you had that ability, said Emily. They laughed. Whatever happens, at least we are together, said Dr. Snowden. His voice cracked. Dan would be proud of what you've become. 
Emily's eyes misted. In a soft voice, she said, Thanks. Dr. Snowden trembled when she walked over and hugged him. Although she was not his daughter, he had a strong bond with her. He missed his big brother, and there was no doubt Dan would have glowed if he saw how Emily had turned out. She was Dr. Snowden's anchor, and he could not imagine life without her. The thought that she might die at some point made him nauseous. Maybe he was overthinking things. She sat back down in her chair. Imagine if Dad had been an ODC. He would have probably said, Well, hell. They laughed again. Dr. Snowden wiped his eyes. I would have loved to have Dan along with us on all these adventures. Sarah would probably have left after the first one, though. I'm glad I got to meet a parallel version of her, said Emily. Yeah, and Dan, too. Even James. Emily grinned. James is funny no matter which version he is. Speaking of other versions, I wonder if Drevel will check ours out on other Earths going forward. Dr. Snowden raised a finger. That's a good point, and that would be interesting. Maybe we'll meet them. Wouldn't that be crazy? Yeah. Dr. Snowden mused about what it would be like to meet multiple versions of himself and Emily. Drevel, Sazrissa, and Seer would have that opportunity. Dr. Snowden recalled Everin saying other versions were copies during the first meeting with Everin, but he had said that the other versions would consider Dr. Snowden and Emily the copies. It had altered Dr. Snowden's perspective of his place in the cosmos. I doubt there are other Daltons and Lord Vigons, or really any ancient vampires on many Earths, since Everin was a factor there, he said. Probably, said Emily. We would have existed regardless, so we'd be around. Given how many parallel Earths are out there, maybe there's one with a country called Snowdenia, and we're royalty. She shot him an amused look. Now you're dreaming. But maybe there is. I wish the Torvada had some type of parallel Earth TV. It would be fun to see what's being aired in different timelines. Dr. Snowden rubbed his chin. Multidimensional TV. Maybe Drevel and Sears Torvada has that. It's worth checking out. Since the Torvada could open a portal to any Earth, he wondered if it could connect with satellites on Earths that had them. The fact that the Torvada had a portal point at every meridian and parallel intersection meant it could even pick up local broadcasting. Emily went to the matter replicator and got a drink. Want anything? Root beer would be nice, he said. She got him his drink, then sat. You know, I was thinking. Everin is so cautious about interfering with things. Look at what happens from an event. These Everinites are nuts. Yeah, said Dr. Snowden. The Trinikins seems like they get it. The Everinites, not so much. It's going to be hard to fight an idea, and even if we do succeed in stopping the Everinites, they grew up believing all that nonsense and are not going to all of a sudden change. They may choose to support something else, and I suspect they'll just direct their blind allegiance to whatever that is. Emily smirked. Time for them to become Snowdenites. They chuckled. I was actually checking out the Everanites' empire when you came in. Care to peruse with me? he asked. Let's do this, she said. Dr. Snowden was glad to have moments like this with her. Between adventures, she had a busy life, and he was lucky if he caught her at home. There had been one week where she had had activities every night and then gone on some outing with her friends over the weekend. The only time he had seen her was in the morning for a brief chat, and even then, that had been rushed. A part of the reasons he liked going on adventures was that he knew he would have some focused time with her. 
just like now. Chapter 14 Drevel yawned as his eyes slowly opened. As expected, the neural effect that allowed for a good night's rest was present. He had enjoyed the chat with Zazrissa the night before, and he knew she would fit right in with the summonses that he, CC, and Seer attended to. He hopped out of bed and got cleaned up, then went to the conference room. His eyes widened when he saw that everyone was already there. It was 9.30 a.m., so maybe that was a standard time for them to be up. He grabbed a quick bacon and egg bowl with avocado, then took his seat. I take it we found something? he asked. Indeed, said Everin. The Torvada encountered a blast of pure, wild-born energy that knocked the Everinite ship out of condensed space. We exited as well to investigate. Their ship floated for a bit, and all the passengers were unconscious, but they all were now wild-born. Dr. Snowden sipped his coffee. So what caused the blast? After the event, we recorded the exact location and time index, then traveled back to right before it to observe this, said Everin, interacting with his ARI. Drevel studied the holographic projection that popped over the table. A small hole appeared, and a purple strand zapped out like a lightning bolt. It seemingly struck at nothing, but he knew it had pierced the condensed space tunnel and hit the Everinite ship, which appeared adrift a moment later. All the passengers were labeled as wild-born. That's pretty crazy, said Emily. The hole the wild-born strand came from shows a cosmic energy residue. Everin sighed. Unfortunately, yes. The tear is too small for us to send a quantum beacon through and only exists for a moment. This suggests that whatever the cosmic presence is in our timeline, it is having an effect that causes the wild energy subverse strands to slip through timeline tears. So this might not be an isolated incident, said Dr. Snowden. He glanced at Sazrissa. I bet you already know what the cosmic presence is. Sazrissa looked down. I can't say. I was teasing, he said. Still, this event might be one of many we need to look at. One at a time, said Everin. Drevel's eyes narrowed. Another cosmic presence? Everin gestured at him. In one of our earlier adventures, we were told there is a powerful rogue cosmic presence on the loose. In the adventure after that, we discovered an event where a multidimensional being was granted a large dose of cosmic energy. Then the being used it for revenge. After that, we learned of a cosmic artifact that came into existence when something with immense cosmic energy punched a hole in our universe, and now we know that something with cosmic energy is allowing for events like what we witnessed. Doesn't sound like a benevolent presence, said Drevel. Analysis. That is our conclusion as well. Seer tilted her head. I assume we aren't pursuing the entity that might be causing these tears. You are correct, said Everin. The focus is on the Everinite's awakening. The Torvada has done some deep scans already, so we know their signatures and abilities. Observe. Drevel examined the grid of passengers with colored barcodes under their name. To the right of each portrait was a list of abilities— while he could usually determine what someone was, sometimes he had to have the Torvada verify. Since this one could fly, that opened a whole lot of doors. There was no way his Torvada could even get to where they were. Look at Freneves, said Emily. He can cause others to hear things in their heads. Thought implantation, said Dr. Snowden. I can see why people think he's the voice of Everin. Frenev could say anything. Sazrissa pointed at Arbiter Horizan, and we encountered her already. Arbiter Lotux, said Drevel, motioning at another image. 
super strength. That would be tough to deal with. Not if they can't move, said Emily. CC flew off Drevel and simulated wrapping someone's head, then slipped back on Drevel. Or lost their sight, as CC demonstrated, said Drevel. Dr. Snowden snorted. Like a rogues gallery. So these twenty-one wildborns are the Everanite leadership. We just need to focus on Frenev, said Sazrissa. If he goes down, then the others will as well. Arbiters are only as powerful as Freneve's link to them is. Without it, they can't claim anything to their followers. Drevel had encountered many wildborns before, and there had been a few times when there were a lot of them clustered together like on the ship. The Arbiter's wildborn origin was unnatural. It made him wonder about the other times he had seen wildborn groups and their origins. He rubbed his chin. If the Everanites are as brainwashed as we think they are, maybe they don't care if Frenev conned them. Perhaps they follow their local Arbiter or whatever. Without Frenev, the Arbiters would be lost, said Sazrissa. They truly believe Frenev is the voice of Everin, so if the Arbiters are lost, most likely their followers are too, although I guess there could be some who still hold on. Drevel studied the other wildborns. Although Frenev was important, Drevel had a feeling that dethroning the Everanite leadership would take more than just taking down Frenev. The gang now had every member of the known leadership and their abilities documented. So what now? asked Emily. Everin gestured at Sazrissa. Perhaps we should meet with the Trinican Defiers, or TD, as you call them. Sazrissa nodded. That would be ideal. They'd have more tactical information to share. A fair warning. TD is a tough group, and they don't hang out in places where they'll be recognized, but I can get us an audience with them. So they're like mercenaries or something? asked Dr. Snowden. Well, they like to fight, said Sazrissa. Don't get them wrong. Yes, they may be tough but their hearts are in the right place. They're like an active rebel group. If you have the coordinates, we can go there, said Everin. Sasrissa interacted with a hollow menu. Coordinates laid in. V. Take us to the morning of the day after we left to come here, and then to those coordinates. Acknowledged. Everything outside the Toravada faded away, then eased back in. The Torvada opened a portal and flew through. Analysis. We have arrived at 9.45 a.m., November 1st, 26.491 A.D. Drevel studied the Earth-like moon before them. One of the more immediate aspects that was noticeable was the lack of ships, satellites, or space stations within a light year. The nearby planet was a gas giant of some type. They were also roughly twenty light-years away from Earth. The Torvada descended through the moon's atmosphere. The moon was like a little oasis, and he was surprised that it had not been claimed. When he had seen Earth's surrounding space, there were empires for hundreds of light-years in every direction. Given how big space was, though, it was possible some moons and planets had not been explored or visited. This moon was an example of that. They were not in the Chelatan Empire anymore. This was the domain of the Kerngullion Federation. Per the Planner Cartography Lab, it was a mix of alien races, but had a small human planetary system in it. This made Drevel think that the TD might not be all human. It would also explain why the Everanites were not out here. Their incursion would most likely be an act of war to most aliens. After a fifteen-minute descent, the Torvada had locked onto a mountain that looked like someone had sliced off the top, inserted a metallic layer with open bays, then set the top back down. Some activity had been registered and smaller ships going down to the jungle below. Sazrissa interacted with a hollow menu, sending the safe code now. After a moment... A window popped up, 
showing that the code had been accepted and one of the bays had been highlighted for the Toravada to land in. They like their secrecy, said Emily. Sazrisa glanced at her. They're killed on sight by the Everanites in some places. You can never be too careful in that regard. Drevel noticed the change in Sazrisa. She was more serious, and this TD made her cautious. It made him wonder how much TD knew of the gang's previous visit to the temple or the attack by Arbiter Horizon. Drevel studied the defenses as the Torvada slowly moved into the docking bay. Heavy turrets resided on the outside, and smaller ones inside. If it came down to it, the TD would probably sacrifice the docking bays. The tracks on the edges of the open space intrigued him. It indicated that the bays could be closed, and he was sure they had some camouflage tech on top of that. Any ship flying past would not know the base was there. When the Torvada landed, he scrutinized the array of robots and androids that surrounded the ship. The few men and women appeared as cyborgs, and there were even a few who registered as a Picabot swarm. They all had a mix of weapons, but he figured that was just them being cautious. Hopefully, Sazrisa's reputation was good here. Let us go, said Everin, standing. Dr. Snowden was not sure what to make of the ragtag group of armed fighters outside the Toravada. He had followed the others out, and they all stood outside the Toravada shielding. One of the cyborg women approached. She had on an advanced two-piece suit and carried an energy assault rifle. She had heavy metallic parts, such as her boots, shoulder pauldrons, and forearms. Her red skin was smooth and her golden eyes gave off a nice contrast. This is Histar Galland, and she runs this cell. Sasrissa introduced the gang. Histar greeted everyone, then focused on Sasrissa. It's been a long time since we've seen you, but your work inspires us. It almost came to an end recently. We heard, said Histar. She glanced at Everin for a moment, then back at Sazrissa. Let's go to our meeting room and we can catch up. Dr. Snowden trudged after the others, but he was interested in seeing how life progressed in a place like this. It excited him that he got to visit habitable moons and, even then, bases inside a mountain that overlooked a beautiful jungle. It made him wonder what xenobiology was at play and what type of unique conditions the moon might have had. Even the guards who escorted them were fascinating. His ARI lit up while identifying the robots and androids. He wondered why they had decided to join TD. It intrigued him to think that a robot had held a grudge against the Everanites, then sought out the TD. The group left the docking bay and entered a large tunnel. Dr. Snowden determined that the tunnel's size was so that transports could move things to and from the docking bays. They walked onto an elevated platform on the side, and the rumbling vehicles driving past caught his eye. They resembled flat sheets with three balls under them in the shape of a triangle. Most of the cargo being carried was in sealed containers. Some had robots resting on top. After a 15-minute jaunt, they arrived at a large, open, round room. In the center was a raised platform with a variety of podiums. Seating in various shapes and sizes littered the room. Dr. Snowden examined the projectors along the ceiling. They would allow for holographic visitors if needed, even in a faraway base that might be considered primitive relative to some place like Kairos, the technology was advanced. He joined the others and sat in some seats close to the center while Sazrissa and Histar stood in the center area. So what brings you out here? asked Histar. While I'd love to think you have a mission to group up on, I suspect it's something else. Sazrissa smiled and gestured at Everin. Well, for starters, that's Everin. The real one. The Trinikins at the Tierra Kelajang Temple, along with Hakash, verified it. 
we had heard, but... Histar focused on him, then Sasrissa, then back at Everin. Histar knelt. I'm honored to be in your presence. Know that we try to uphold your guidelines, which are the way to a better life. It is good to meet you, said Everin. Please rise. Histar did so. There is so much I wish to ask you. It appears, then, that we have information to exchange. Sasrissa interacted with her palm, and a hologram appeared, showing a grid of the Everanite leadership. This is from the awakening event we scanned. It lists out their abilities. Histar glanced at Everin. The Torvata. Right. You went back in time. Indeed. This will be very helpful. It fills out some of the people we couldn't find, said Histar. She stared at Frenev's photo. So he can implant thoughts. That's how he controls the Arbiters. Sasrissa sighed. Yeah, and through them the Everanite Empire. Histar tilted her head at Everin. While I'm happy that you've returned... Does the reason have to do with the Everinites? It would appear so, said Everin. He gestured at Drevel and Seer. Sasrissa is to go with them to their Torvata, and we are here to assist her in her goal before she leaves. Histar's eyes widened. You're going to take down the Everinites? Everin nodded. That is the current plan, but there is much more information needed before proceeding. We know of their illegal digital cloning and their leadership abilities. What is unknown to us is how their communication system is set up. We get that? Then we can party, said Drevel. Emily swatted his arm. He means we can then form a plan to take it down. His star studied her. We would greatly appreciate that. We've had setbacks as of late and lost two cells in the last month. The Everanites have been more active than usual lately, and now I know why. They need to be stopped, said Dr. Snowden. I agree, said Histar. She examined the others. Are you all like Everin? Cosmic energy? Analysis. Everyone except Seer has cosmic energy, but Seer is a Torvata AI. Histar gulped. I... I wasn't aware I stood in proximity to such power. You may just refer to us as the gang, said Seer. I'm honored to do so, said Histar. She regained her composure. Communication systems, let's see. She interacted with her forearm device. A holographic projection shot up of a regional galactic map. Dr. Snowden studied the five bright green dots and seven smaller red ones. They were scattered over a vast swath of the area. The green dots are the communication relay systems, said Histar. They maintain a condensed space bubble and communicate over long distances that way. They also send out communications to nearby systems. The red dots are the Everanite's core worlds. Each one has an orbital ring and the system therein is heavily defended. She tapped at a big red dot. This is Dardas Prime, where Prime Arbiter Frenev resides, and we know based on your image that he has quite a few of those wild-born leaders nearby. Dr. Snowden rubbed his chin. So what form does the communication relay system take on? The projection changed to show a space station, Dr. Snowden thought it resembled a diamond in shape. His star pointed at the display. These stations are large and are automated for the most part. They are heavily defended, and anything that comes within two light years of it will get destroyed. Even if you were to reach it, they have potent defenses on board. They can protect against relativistic missiles? asked Drevel. They can, said his star. They project a multi-layered kinetic shell. Emily narrowed her eyes. But if we take down all five, the Everanites wouldn't be able to send out anything, right? His star nodded. 
They would still have local communications, but the daily communication with Frenev and leadership would be gone. Hmm. Maybe before that happens, we can send a final message, said Dr. Snowden. One that can't be responded to and must be dealt with locally. The only message that would truly have an impact is the verification that Everin is here and that Frenev is fraudulent, said Histar. Sasrissa glanced at Everin. You could also add clarification to your guidelines. Indeed, he said. However, as I mentioned before, it will be difficult to get Frenev to say anything, and it needs to be him admitting the truth. I will think on this. He gestured at the projection. Where are the CDCs being stored? As it is illegal, I would assume they are hidden. Histar interacted with her forearm device. There's a lot of information on that. Let me get something together, then we can meet in a bit to go over it. Very well, said Everin. He glanced at the group. Let us relax for now, and we can regroup when Histar is ready. Histar waved a hand in the air. Feel free to explore the facility. Our base is yours. Dr. Snowden's heartbeat ramped up. Digital cloning made his skin crawl, and so many CDCs being put away for nefarious reasons was wrong. The fact that there was so much information that it needed organizing before presentation meant this would not be a simple task. Ideally, the takedown of the illegal CDC trade would put a major dent into the Everonites' business, but also tarnish their reputation. He suspected that even with that hit, there were probably smaller storage sites elsewhere. It could never be easy. Emily had spent the last two hours checking out the base with the gang. It was advanced, as expected and every person they had come across went out of their way to acknowledge her and the others. The overall mood seemed upbeat, and she suspected that was due to everyone learning that the real Everin had arrived with plans to take down the Everinites. Dr. Snowden had been chatty whenever they stopped to ask questions. Emily was glad to see him in an inquisitive state. Drevel cracked jokes like always and kept things light, Sasrissa served as an informational guide on the technology, while V and Seer absorbed everything. Everin was calm and strolled with his hands behind his back. Everin raised a hand. Histar has contacted me. She is ready to present information on the Everinites' illegal CDC trade. Let us go. Emily followed the others back to the briefing room. Stopping the illegal CDC trade would be the gang's next step. The communication system would probably need a complex plan, but the CDC operation could be complicated as well. Everyone gathered around the raised platform in the center of the room. I hope you enjoyed your brief tour of our base, said Histar. Loved it, said Dr. Snowden. We all did, said Everin. Histar smiled. I'm glad to hear it. Now on to the Everonites' illegal CDC trade. She interacted with her forearm device and brought up a hologram of a planet over the raised platform. This is Karstinitor. The projection zoomed into a city. They stored the CDCs in a massive facility embedded deep in Jankata, one of the larger cities on the planet. Although Karstinitor is one of the core Everonite worlds, it is still one of the worlds the Chelatan Empire controls. Make no mistake, though, the Everonites have a large presence there. How'd they hide a massive facility? asked Drevel. When you say deep, I'm guessing you mean it's underground somewhere. His star pointed at the updated projection. It is, and sadly in one of the most feared underground districts. You can see how big it is. It spans several city levels. The Everonites pay the Amashwala, a brutal cyborg mercenary group, or A.W. as we call them, to guard it on their turf. The A.W. are known as the overlords of the illegal CDC trade. Emily studied the cross-section view of Jangata. The city had a large underground portion, 
and it fascinated her to see the various districts that were mostly by level. There were some neutral vertical areas that she suspected were for everyone to use. That way the underground could be used without having to go through others' turf. The CDC storage facility was huge and stuck out. If you're planning on taking down their facility there, it's going to be hard. There is one level that allows for entry by others, but there are no openings on the other levels. A shaft runs from the surface to the facility and is how they move CDCs in and out, said Histar. Drevel rubbed his chin. So they're physically moving them. They must not trust shooting these CDCs across the wire. Analysis. Physically doing so removes opportunities for AIs like me and Seer to intercept. Histar motioned at V and Seer. Yes, that's not uncommon on less protected facilities. The AW takes no chances, and we have their transport schedule. Ships fly in, unload, then a lift goes down. Cesaris's eyes narrowed. Are you suggesting that's our best way in? I am, said Histar. She changed the projection. This is the level where personnel can enter from. There is a series of five walls, one after another, that surround the facility. A Picabot swarm exists between each wall and acts as an alert system. You won't be getting in that way undetected. On the other levels, the facility is just a massive, shielded chunk of metal. Seer pointed at the final inner yard. What if we could fly over the walls? Histar frowned. Then you would need to deal with the multitude of turrets on the facility's walls. They can fire unobstructed at you. There's also a small army of drones that patrol, and they have powerful weapons to neutralize threats. She pointed at some odd-shaped doorways at various points on the facility front wall. If you get past that, you have the AW's battle droids, which can be deployed from there. A frontal assault would be too much, said Emily. I assume that even if we defeated all that, the facility would enter into some defensive mode. You're right, it would. In addition to that, reinforcements would arrive, and you would be stuck between a place you can't enter and a wave of deadly assailants. Everin studied the projection. Then we will not consider that approach. Taking the transport tunnel down seems the best way to get in. What can we expect there in terms of security? Emily examined the new hologram that appeared of a four-foot alien. It had a worm-like body with four thin legs keeping it upright. It had three arms with two on the side and the third hanging from the back just below the head area. The alien's face had a mouth, but it was the cluster of black eyes above it that made her almost gag. Slits along the body appeared to be how the alien breathed. Another image to the side of the first showed the alien with some type of gray light armor and pistols, daggers, and gadgets all over the suit. Every part of the body was covered. The head area had a variety of antenna and portholes. This is Demosco said Histar. Famed bounty hunter, said Sazrissa. I know him. Histar nodded. He is our contact in Jankata, and he can guide you to a weak point in the shaft's walls. That will get you inside. But I don't know how you would get down. We got that covered, said Dr. Snowden with a grin. I hope so, said Histar. If you can reach the bottom, the lift locks into place as it unloads its cargo into a bay, but there is no physical access to it unless you are inside the lift's container. Even if you find a way into the bay, it has a Picabot swarm there and deadly robots and AW members guard it. There is no path to the main room from the bay to where the CDCs are stored either. The containers are sent down via a specialized chute. Drevel tilted his head. So, uh, how do we get to the main room, then? His star sighed. I'm not sure. Can you pull up the facility layout? asked Everin. 
His star did so. Everin examined it, then pointed at a series of rooms stacked on top of each other that led to the main room. We can go through these floors to the main room. The rooms are considered non-critical, and there is no shielding in the floor or ceiling. As we drop to each one, we can create a new opening on the other side of the room. This will allow us to secure the area without fear of them attacking straight from the top. Once we are in the main room, we will begin the process of extracting the CDCs into a dimensional cube. Once done, we retreat the way we came. An interesting plan, said Histar. How are you going through the floors, or rather... How will you even get to the first room? It's on the same level as the bay, and there is no access point. Everin pointed at Dr. Snowden, Emily, and V. They possess nanobots that can open holes. When we reach the bottom of the shaft, we can bore a side tunnel above the first room, then create a hole for us to drop in. For a traversal, Drevel and Sasrissa can fly, and the rest of us have grappling beams. I like it, said Emily. What do we do once we're topside again? Histar gestured at her. The CDCs could be brought to Chelatin leadership. Up to this point, they can sweep it under the rug via politics and look the other way, but they'd have no choice but to intervene if it's highly publicized. She scrunched her face. There might be another option, though. There's a virtual world on Karstiniter... If the CDCs in the facility were able to connect to that, they'd go into a buffer, and there would be no way to ignore that. That would probably be the best place to unload them. Sasrissa nodded. I don't think it would be enough to declare the Everanites a non-allowable entity, but it would be a big step closer to it. Then it shall be done, said Everin. His star's eyes lit up. Whatever we can do to help, you'll have it. We serve at your pleasure. It is appreciated. However, there is no need to implicate your group in this. You have helped us enough. Histar bowed slightly. If you do need us, you know how to contact us. Emily liked the plan. The gang would sneak into the transportation shaft, drop down, create a side tunnel, drop into the facility and through a few floors, then get the CDCs out. It sounded simple as she stood there with the group, but she knew there were always complications. The Amash Wallow would probably be a lot tougher than expected as well. She was ready for whatever came her way. Chapter 15 Drevel had enjoyed the visit to the TD's base. After the debriefing, Histar had spent some time with Everin. That was no surprise to Drevel. She was meeting someone that she had based her life on, and to get direct answers to questions she might have must have been a once-in-a-lifetime event. From everything Drevel had seen to this point, Everin had that type of impact whenever anyone interacted with him. After boarding the Toravada again, everyone had taken lunch, Drevel did not eat much, since the upcoming mission would probably involve fighting, not something he wanted to do on a full stomach. Afterward, he assembled in the command area with the others, and observed V take the Toravada into Karstinidor's orbit. The command area had Dr. Snowden and Sazarissa seated on the right side, while Emily and Drevel sat on the other side. V and Seer were at the front console, and Everin was in his usual chair, the mood was one of anxiety, and Drevel sensed everyone's cosmic energy was in flux, except for Everin, who was always calm. The massive orbital ring was hard to miss. It was tethered to the planet, but the labels indicated that it had a loose connection meant for carrying cargo and passengers. He was not sure of the engineering needed for that, but it pointed to a very advanced civilization. On the main ring were a variety of designs. Almost every segment had some type of solar panel array. Other segments had docking ports where ships were held in place. Some segments were solid, with only a few windows on them. The Torvada detected millions of inhabitants, 
so it was quite populated. Specialized trains ran along the outside. Drevel wished he could visit the ring and experience it, but there was a facility to liberate. The Torvata broke cloud cover on its descent. Although the gang had the facility's layout, it was heavily guarded as Histar had mentioned. They would have to land almost two miles away and then go underground after going down a deep travel shaft. Even then, they would need to traverse a bustling black market area while trying to avoid detection. Demosco, the TD's contact, would meet and guide them to a place where they could burrow into the facility's transportation tunnel. The Torvada approached Chancata. Unlike on Kairos, the Torvada was in stealth mode and scan profile one. Drevel studied the city as they got closer. The vertical shaft entry points appeared as massive holes spread across the surface and between a metallic maze of buildings. There did not seem to be a pattern to the placement of the entrances, and they were bustling with activity as ships entered and left. One of the entry points highlighted, and the Torvada flew into it. Drevel gazed at the variety of craft that flew next to them. They would have no idea the Torvada was there, but V masterfully piloted behind another ship that was six times larger. Drevel smiled as he soaked in as much of this experience as he could. The gang's summonses were very different from the ones he had, and his definitely did not include flying down the shaft of an advanced city. Landing platforms were embedded all throughout, and there was a gap between the sides and traveling lane that no ship flew in. That was probably for safety reasons. This place is full of life, said Drevel. Reminds me of myself. Seer eyed him. It does, he said. He pointed out. Look at everything going on. Sazrissa glanced at him. This is typical for most advanced cities. Just know that the further we go, the harder it is for order to be maintained. Once we land, all bets are off where we're going to. We will take that into consideration, said Everin. Hopefully, Damasco can guide us to where we need to be without issue. After twenty minutes, the Torvada reached level 134 and hovered, then flew carefully into a small docking bay. Sazrissa glanced at V. Put us in scan profile, too. The docking authority here needs to see the ship, but they won't ask for credentials. That should all be handled by Damasco. Acknowledged. The Torvada decloaked and landed on a circle drawn on the ground. Drevel only saw two other ships, and they had seen better days. The docking area could only support six ships. Sazrissa stood. I'll go out first and contact Damasco, then we can talk before heading out. Very well, said Everin. Drevel admired Sazrissa's fearlessness. This world was what she knew, and her experiences would serve her well when she went to work with him and Seer. Drevel stared outside as Sazrissa stood in front of the Toravada. A moment later, Damasco appeared from the shadows. They did not shake hands, but did a mutual nod at each other. Apparently, he had a respect for her. They turned and walked to the side. Everyone went to the ramp entrance. Sazrissa had rejoined the group while Demosco stood in front of them. The tourists, said Demosco in a deep, digitized voice. Sazrissa already gave me the rundown on who you are and what you plan to do. He gestured at Everin. So you're him? The one the humans fall all over themselves for. It was not my intent for them to do so, said Everin. Yeah, try telling them that, said Demosco. Damn, Everinites are a pain to deal with. Nonetheless, you're planning to steal their CDCs. Histar said you wanted me to lead you to the outside of their transportation shaft at a specific point. I'm not sure how that's helpful. But say you do get in and get to the CDCs. How are you going to get them out? Everin raised a finger. 
We have a temporary storage device for that. Demosco's eyes narrowed. You do realize that the facility is mostly storage. You can't really walk out with that. It is a small storage device. Demosco chuckled. <laughs> I sure hope so. All right, I'll be outside. When you're ready, we can go. Oh, before that, put on some cloaks or robes or something. You all are wanted by the Everonites, and there's hunters down there. No need to get them involved in this. He turned and then walked out. Dr. Snowden tilted his head. He has a point. I guess we'll need some type of visual coverage. You are correct, said Everin. I will get the dimensional storage cube while the rest of you replicate some full circle black hooded cloaks. There is a replicator pattern for that. Then we can go. Why can't we just use projections like we always do? Asked Emily. Damasco smirked. That can be seen through, unless it's a Pikabot physical projection. Ah. CC formed into a cloak of the type Everin mentioned, then wrapped Drevel. I'm set, he said. Damasco pointed at CC. An example of a physical projection. Excellent, said Everin. Everyone dispersed. Drevel followed the others to the lab. He was curious to see the gang with cloaks. After everyone had replicated theirs, he did a quick scan of them. The cloaks had a perception filter on them that would make it hard to make out details. He joined the others outside. Damasco faced the group. Looking better. Where's Everin? He's getting something to store the CD season, said Emily. Curious to see what that is. Everin came out and held up a small cube. This will hold the CDCs. He placed it on his belt and pulled his cloak on, then slipped his hood over his head. Damasco stared at the cube. That little thing? Really? It is more than it appears, said Everin. I'll take your word for it. Emily grinned. You look snazzy in your cloak. I don't think I've ever seen you with a hood on. Analysis. He used to have a cloak with a hood. When we get back, I want to see that, said Emily. Everin half smiled. We can do that. For now, keep your helmets closed and pull your hoods up. He gestured forward. We are ready to go. Demosco took a final look at the group, then pivoted and marched on. Sasrissa had been to the lower levels of Jankata before. It was a haven of criminal syndicates, freelance mercs, bounty hunters, and often the worst dregs of society. Things like food and drink were readily available everywhere and living areas were plentiful. However, there was a segment of society that did not want to follow the rules established by the government and they found ways of entertainment that were often illegal. Fight clubs, sexual slavery, and other unsavory venues were not uncommon. She had watched the Chelatin Empire try to get lower-level dwellers to advance and support the Empire, but that mentality was anathema to them. They loved where they were and the misery they could inflict. It was the culture they had created and embraced. There had been some proposals to remove those who did not contribute to society in any meaningful way, but that was a hot topic since some decision makers liked to go down and live an exotic life, then come back. If they got too wild, bounty hunters like Demosco were called to bring them in. Demosco was an example of the Wurngrit species and how they integrated with humans. His bounty hunting skills were highly valued by those with power, since he was one of the few that had no problem bringing in those that escaped to the lower levels to hide. Wurngrits had a small planetary system, but they provided a lot of assistance to the Chelenton Empire in the event of sporadic conflicts, so their position was secured. The group hustled down a well-lit side street. Robots kept the place clean, 
and the level design was typical of a lower level. Streets were not much more than the gaps between buildings that went from the floor to the bottom of the next level. This doesn't seem too bad, said Dr. Snowden. Demosco peered behind. There's many places for an ambush, places to hide, and places you don't come back from. Ah, I was referring to the street and its cleanliness. Most are like that with automated robot and peekabot swarm cleaners. It's the denizens you need to be alert for, and also where you are in relation to them. That was sound advice, and something Sazrissa took to heart. V flew ahead and Seer behind, so the group had a good view of their surroundings. She knew how quickly the situation could change based on who was present and what the layout was. The Everinites putting out a bounty on Everin and the gang did not surprise her. She already had one, but after the events at Kairos, the others would too. There would be many opportunists wanting to try their shot at capturing the gang if their presence was detected. Demosco navigated the streets like a professional and kept to the smaller side ones. Although it would have been quicker to just take a few main streets to get there, that would also unnecessarily increase the group's exposure. After an hour, they reached a dim alleyway. Demosco ushered them in and pointed at a steel wall. Here we are. It's a dead end, but that is the transportation shaft's outer wall. I don't know what your plan is, but if it's to go through that, then you've got some work ahead of you. Not to mention, even if you do get through, you have a huge shaft where if you fall, you'll die. He did a final look at the group. With that said, my service is done. Good luck. Sasrissen nodded at him. We appreciate you guiding us here. No need to thank me, said Demosco. I feel like I just walked you to the beginning of a suicidal plan. We'll be okay, said Sasrissa. Demosco snorted, then took off. Everin gestured at the group. Dr. Snowden, use your nanobots to cover a part of this alleyway to obscure us from onlookers. Emily and V, your nanobots can use the wall pattern to create a tunnel. Once it is long enough that we can enter, we'll need a thin layer to seal the entrance. Is everyone clear on the plan? They nodded at him. Let us begin. Dr. Snowden moved toward the alleyway entrance and scanned the walls, then held his PSD forward. Nanobot command! Wall cover! Nanobots shot out of his PSD and formed a thin wall that sealed the alleyway. Emily and V pointed their PSDs at the transportation tunnel and formed a ravenous wall of nanobots in a rectangular shape. The nanobots surged onto the wall and began to munch away a tunnel opening large enough for the group to walk through single file. Sasrissa was impressed with the unique approach used to gain entry to the Everinite's illegal CDC facility. She and Drevel were not even needed to do it. However, she suspected that once they were inside and getting the CDCs, there would be fighting. But she was ready. When they got in and were going through floors, she could probably use her acid. But it would take time. Having a nanobot swarm handy was more beneficial than her streaming acid ability. Once the tunnel was deep enough, the group moved in with Dr. Snowden at the end. He had retracted his alleyway wall, then scanned the tunnel entrance. After ensuring everyone was inside, he had his nanobot swarm use the metal that had been displaced from the tunnel to create a thin wall over the entrance. Anyone looking down the alleyway would never know there was an opening there. Everin had tossed two illumination orbs so that everyone could see. Sasrisso wondered if the Everinites would be able to detect them. There was no inner wall shielding and she understood that the Everinites probably assumed the facility security at the bottom of the shaft would be enough. Sasrissa reflected on how good it was to be doing this with a team. Despite the situation, it did not bother her to be in a cramped tunnel with the gang. It reminded her of working with other Everins, who were just as creative in their approaches. 
She had seen the nanobots in PSDs before, and understood why later Everins would put such a focus on tools that could go through walls. After thirty minutes, they were close to the transportation tunnel interior. Everin raised a hand. V. Create a hole large enough for you and Seer to go through in order to scan the shaft. I am hearing lift activity, and they are moving fast. Acknowledged. After the hole was formed, V and Seer flew out. V went to the bottom and Seer to the top. Sasrissa found it interesting that they had not been told which direction to go. They just went in the most efficient way. Their view showed two rails on each side, which would allow for two lifts to operate side by side. The only light that could be seen was from the transports. One was going up and Seer was able to fly under it. Another was docked below and allowed V to get a good scan of it. When the transport burst up, V flew to the side. It seems we will need to create an entry point below, but not in the shaft, said Everin. V, create a side tunnel at the bottom that is deep enough for all of us. Once done, we can use our grapple beams to repel down and file in the side tunnel, then continue on. Also, we can lay our cloaks here for this part, but we may need them later. Everyone took off their cloaks. Sasrissa jumped after V had bored into the sidewall and a transport had slammed down next to him. Based on his scans, the transports connected to a chute of some type and unloaded the CDC containers that way. The top and sides of the transport never opened. It was like a cargo container that was only accessible from the bottom. It made her wonder how they packed it topside. They probably flipped it or something. Once V signaled that the side tunnel was complete, Everin attached his grappling beam to the ceiling of the tunnel they were in. The transport moves fast, but there appears to be a small window when it is topside. Drevel, you can use CC to fly down. Sazrissa, you have your rocket boots. Dr. Snowden, Emily, use your grappling beams to descend rapidly. We will go after Seer alerts us that the transport on our side is up top. Everyone understand. They indicated they did. Okay. Dr. Snowden, open the rest of this tunnel to the interior. Dr. Snowden complied. Sasrissa sensed the team's anxiety. Although this should be a routine drop, the transport was moving fast, so any errors meant instant death. Seer sent her alert. Go, said Everin. Dr. Snowden and Emily attached their grappling beams to the tunnel's ceiling, then moved into the shaft and descended. Drevel flew out after them. Sasrissa activated her boots and stepped off the edge. Her heartbeat shot up, but looking down she saw V via her ARI. She entered into a controlled descent, but peeked up to verify that Everin was also grappling down. The group dropped fast, and when they hit the bottom of the shaft, Seer sent another alert that the transport was coming down. V pulled Dr. Snowden and Emily in, while Drevel rushed in after them. Sasrissa landed and was grappled in by Everin right as the transport slammed down. Her mouth went dry. The transport must have had a lighter load because it arrived much faster than expected. A moment later, Seer joined them. Good. We all made it, said Everin. I will make sure to shut down the transports once we are inside. On to the next step. Chapter 16 Dr. Snowden's heart still raced from the rapid plunge. Although he knew he would get down before the transport would, the mere thought it could squish him still made him uneasy. Drevel and C.C. had flown down fast, a testament to C.C.'s power, and Sazrissa had fallen like a rock, only turning on her rocket boots near the bottom in a controlled descent. Emily had arrived earlier, but she had essentially fallen until slowing down at the end. Thankfully, Everin stayed above everyone, willing to risk himself if the transport arrived earlier than expected. Ironically, the transport did move faster due to a lighter load. The next step was up, and would involve the gang going through four floors. Everin motioned at the ground. There are eight motionless individuals in the room below us. They seem to be resting. 
V. Create a hole for us. Once open, we will drop in. But be ready to fight. Acknowledged, said V. Dr. Snowden admired the team's fearlessness. Their avatars in his interior helmet showed them to be focused. There could potentially be a fight in the first room, and he was not sure what the other rooms would be like. After V created the hole with his nanobots from his PSD, Dr. Snowden jumped down with the others. The room was odd and had four tilted slabs on each side. Each one had what Dr. Snowden figured was an AW member, and to their sides were smaller slabs with weapons and armor. They were definitely cyborgs. While they were human for the most part, half their bodies had augmented parts visible. He would have thought they'd be internal, but perhaps it was AW culture to show what they had to make a statement. Everin scanned the area. It appears they are resting. Wires attached to the slabs popped off, and a hissing sound filled the air. Not anymore, said Emily. The AW members sat up in confusion, then went for their nearby weapons. The gang stunned them all. V. Create the next hole, but away from the one we came in from. Acknowledged. A loud, repeating, blaring sound rang out. And there goes our surprise said Drevel. Sassrison nodded. We still have the advantage. Dr. Snowden hoped so as they went to the next room. It had a ring that encircled a tilted slab, and above it were a variety of strange devices that were probably made for surgery. The place was immaculately clean, and lights blinked on nearby terminals and along the ceiling. This must be where they do augmentations, said Drevel. Sazrissa scrutinized the scene. This isn't uncommon, although this setup is more advanced than others I have seen. Everin pointed at a spot on the floor away from the hole they had used to drop in from. Let us go. V opened a hole, and the gang dropped down. Dr. Snowden determined they were in a storage room of some type. When he had landed, a part of a cabinet that stretched to the ceiling had been decimated, a grainy substance had spilled everywhere, and he suspected the place was used to store food. It made sense to have those types of physical items if matter replicators or power went down. He was not sure what type of edible it was, but it reminded him of cereal. The next level down they entered was the last one before the main room. Dr. Snowden gazed at the racks filled with ranged and melee weapons, there were other specialized containers spread throughout, but it was obvious this was an armory of some type. There was an AW member present, and Everin had shot a stun beam that only highlighted the guard's shielding. Emily had closed in and used her stun baton to knock the man out. I think our ranged options are limited, said Drevel. Emily shrugged. No problem for me. Dr. Snowden's eyes narrowed. Until we're swarmed... I did notice that the shielding fluctuated some when Everin shot his stun beam, so maybe ranged can be an option, but it just takes longer to break through. You are correct, said Everin. I would adjust your stun settings to the highest level. It may take three to five seconds to break their shielding, and you can also use your sticky globules to slow them down. Will do. Everin walked over to the other side of the room. Below us is a high walkway in the main room. We will need to go from there to the floor. I do not know what defenses to expect, so be ready. V opened the hole and the gang popped down. Dr. Snowden peered down at the large rectangular structure. It was like someone had placed a building in a gym. Black mesh covered the exterior, and a light blue glow emanated from every side. In the center of each side was an interface of some type. The walkway they were on followed the room's sides and had steps down to other layers. Turrets sat near the ceiling, and a swarm of orbs patrolled the air. Um, how are we handling this? asked Dr. Snowden. Everin pointed at the turrets. Sasrissa can use her acid beam to disable those. His eyes narrowed. As for the orbs... They appear to have some type of offensive capability. 
Drevel will engage them in the air. The rest of us will defend below where we have more room to maneuver. Going, said Sazrissa. She jumped off the walkway and flew to the first turret. It fired at her, but her projected shield from her left palm blocked its assault. She pointed at the turret and sprayed it with acid. It fritzed, then deactivated. My turn, said Drevel. CC carried him off the walkway, and he unloaded a volley on multiple orbs. They zoomed over to him and began to fire energy beams. Everin dropped down with Dr. Snowden and Emily in tow. Some orbs split up to attack them. Dr. Snowden reflected several beams, but a few had hit him. Although they had not broken his suit, he could feel their heat. It was like touching a hot stove. Between him, Emily, and Everin, they formed a wall of reflection, and orbs were dropping everywhere. It helped that Drevel was a marksman as his rapid-fire technique with his dual pistols devastated them. Cece also blocked shots. They were a powerful duo. Sazrissa flew around the edge of the room with ease and melted the turrets. Dr. Snowden had wondered when her acid beam would be used, and this was a perfect example of when to use it. After a few minutes, they assembled near the CDC storage structure. Everin scanned it. We will need to disable this structure shielding. V, the generators are below. Acknowledged, said V. He shot his nanobots on the ground. After they opened a hole, he flew in with his nanobots after him. A moment later, the storage structure shielding dissipated. He came back up. Everin placed his UIC on one of the interfaces. V used one arm to connect to the dimensional cube and another to a port on the side of the interface. Everin interacted with his ARI. I need to configure this with V's help, but the transfer should begin soon. Several lightly armored guards rushed into the room. We'll handle this, said Sazrissa. She and Drevel took to the air. Dr. Snowden and Emily moved out and placed their energy shields in a way that would protect Everin and V. Seer flew above and provided an aerial view. Dr. Snowden fired a stun beam at one of the guards, but like the others, their shielding only highlighted when hit. As a test, Dr. Snowden concentrated his fire for five seconds, which shut down the guard's shielding. He went down quick. Other guards fired energy beams, but Emily reflected them. Drevel rained down a hailstorm of energy and stun beams. His energy beams only took two seconds to disable the shielding, which he then followed up with a stun. Sasrissa entered close quarters combat with the two that got close to Dr. Snowden and Emily. Sasrissa moved effortlessly between them and was able to neutralize both when she got in close. Not too bad so far, said Drevel. Dr. Snowden jumped when a loud whirring sound filled the air. He turned to see that the structure, along with Everin and V, had submerged, and a shield was over the top. Ah, uh, Everin? asked Dr. Snowden. V and I are okay. It appears we are in a shielded location. However, we have started the transfer. V will look for a way to remove this shielding and bring us back up. We'll hold the area, said Sazrissa. Dr. Snowden gulped. This place was heavily protected and had tricks of its own. The light response so far in terms of assailants unnerved him. He knew there would be a heavier response. What that was, he did not know. But with Drevel, Sazrissa, Emily, and Seer, it might not be too bad. Sazrissa flew toward one of the three entrances to the room. They were north, south, and east of the group, respectively. She sensed movement headed their way, and with the group moved back, they would be able to defend in all directions. There could also be enemies dropping down from the path the gang took. We got incoming, she said. Dr. Snowden and Emily formed a barrier with their energy shields on the east side of the room. Seer flew into one of the entrances while Drevel hovered with both pistols out above Dr. Snowden and Emily. A heavily armored cyborg entered from the western entrance. His massive, hip-mounted weapon registered as powerful, and behind him were more AW members. The man fired a heavy beam at Dr. Snowden and Emily. 
sending them both sprawling back. Sasrissa hovered over the man and sprayed acid on his weapon. He dropped it, aimed his left arm at her, and fired from his forearm-mounted device. She projected a shield to block the shot, then landed behind him and placed her hand on his back. A stun surge caused him to crumple. She spun to take on the other AW members, but between Drevel, Dr. Snowden, and Emily's mist and stun blasts, the attackers went down quick. There are others coming from the north and south entrances, said Seer. Sasrissa pointed at the southern entrance. Dr. Snowden, Emily, can you seal those with your nanobots? Think so, said Dr. Snowden. He rushed over to the entrance and interacted with his PSD. Together with Emily, he created a thick wall using the surrounding ones for material. Get the other side if you can, said Sasrissa. As they sprinted across the room, two heavies, supported by a group of regular AW members, surged in from that entrance. Sasrissa went to attack them, but her attention was drawn to the two men in form-fitting silver suits with loose white tunics. They wore blue belts, and their blue heads had visible augments. One man was much bigger than the other. Per the library of images, the larger man was Arbiter Lotux, and his specialty was super strength. Arbiter Scranlin could manipulate the environment near him. Their wild-born energy levels indicated they were very powerful. Drevel assisted Dr. Snowden and Emily while staying within range of Sasrissa. Seer dodged blasts while maintaining an aerial view for everyone. Sasrissa dropped in front of the two men. The large man bored a gaze through her. If you cease your fighting now... We'll accept your surrender. Not happening, said Sasrissa. Scranlin sneered. You publicly say you aren't a terrorist. Yet here we are. Sasrissa scowled. This is a storage facility with illegal CDCs. Let me say that again. Illegal. If you truly followed Everin, do you think he would sanction this? That's not for you to decide, said Lotux. There's a bigger picture, but I wouldn't expect you to understand, nor would I entrust you with that information. He pointed at her, then the others. You've made your choice, not just for you, but them as well. So be it, said Sazrissa. Scranlin extended a hand toward Drevel. Metal tendrils erupted from the floor and grabbed him, then pulled him to the ground. Sasrissa shot a stun beam at Scranlin, but Lodox moved in front and absorbed the blast. He charged her. She flew up and doused him with water, then fired another stun blast. Lodox growled. Did you think you could stun one of Everin's chosen? Cece flew off Drevel and wrapped Lodex. Sasrissa flew over him and tackled Scranlin, who had been concentrating. Drevel broke free with the assistance of Dr. Snowden and Emily, who had defeated the AW members. They had sealed up the other entrance, so they only had the Arbiters to deal with. Lodex grabbed Cece and began to tear him in half. No, said Drevel. He dashed in and used his fist weapons to make Lodox drop CC, who flew back onto Drevel. Lodox struck Drevel's arm. Snap! Drevel howled as he was pulled back by CC. Scranlin created a large tendril to grab Sasrissa and pull her off him. He then flung her at Dr. Snowden and Emily. They dodged Sasrissa as she flew past them. Dr. Snowden fired a stun blast at Scranlin, but he blocked it with a thin sheet of metal that he raised. He pointed at Dr. Snowden. A cage of metal bars popped up and locked him down. Emily dashed around the thin wall and took aim at Scranlin. Lodix burst over and hit her on the chest. Crack! Emily went sprawling and gasped as she struggled to breathe. Drevel rushed over to her and scanned her. He struggled to place both hands on her chest, but was able to do so. She glowed for a moment, then took a deep breath. Drevel yelled before passing out. Sasrissa's breathing went erratic. Lodix was unstoppable, and Scranlin's ability made it hard to get near him. She fired a grappling beam at him, 
then reeled herself in. Lodux grabbed the beam and waited for her to arrive. She disabled her beam and used the momentum to launch over Lodux. As she flew past Scranlan, she hit him with a stun blast. He cried out and fell to the ground, then pointed at her. Emily appeared behind him and clubbed his arm with her staff, then stunned him multiple times. Dr. Snowden's metal cage fell when Scranlan went unconscious. Lodox leapt toward Dr. Snowden and grabbed him by the neck, then lifted him off the ground. Stop! Sazrissa and Emily assembled in front of Lotux with shields out. Cece had pulled Drovel's unconscious body behind them. If you value this terrorist's life, you'll surrender. If not, your death is on his hands. Dr. Snowden whimpered as he struggled to break Lotux's grip. Sazrissa cursed herself. Lodix knew they would never accept a team member's death, and he had gone after Dr. Snowden on purpose. Emily looked like she was ready to burst into flames, but cooler heads were needed here. If you do surrender, I can guarantee no one dies. You'll still be punished, but you get to live, said Lodox. Emily glanced at Cesarissa. Sasrissa frowned and lowered her head. There was no way out. If she fought and Dr. Snowden died, she could never forgive herself. She disabled her shield. What are you doing? asked Emily. I can't put your uncle in jeopardy. Lodox will kill him. His past shows that he would. Emily seethed as she pulled in her energy shield, then retracted her stun baton into her PSD. That's more like it, said Lodox. A recovery unit is on its way to secure you. You're doing the right thing. Nanobot command. Clear area, said Dr. Snowden. A swarm of nanobots flew out and began to attack Lodox. He laughed. Nanobots against a personal Picobot defense system? You're lucky our teammates have more common sense than you, otherwise you'd be dead. Dr. Snowden's lip began to bleed. He spat on the ground, and his cosmic nanobots surged out. Lodix screamed as he dropped Dr. Snowden and swatted in the air. Emily fired a grappling beam at him and reeled him in. Dr. Snowden's cosmic nanobots went swirling back into him. Sazrissa adopted a defensive stance. Lodix growled. Fine. Death it is, then. The shielding over the submerged storage structure dissipated before it rose. V flew behind Sazrissa. Everin leapt between the gang and Lodex. There will be no deaths today. Ah, the imposter. Frenev will congratulate me on your death. Everin raised his palm forward as his eyes glowed. I do not believe so. Sazrissa got goosebumps. She had seen him do this in many situations, and it never lost its impact. She felt V attach something to her belt. Analysis. The dimensional cube is on your belt, he said over comms. Everin's avatar spoke, although his physical body did not. Sazrissa, take the others out the way we came in. V and I will lead Lotux away. We're not leaving you, said Emily. It is a tactical decision, said Everin. Lotux charged him, but he sent Lotux sprawling with a punch. I can contain him and keep his attention. I need all of you to get that dimensional cube out of here, then get to safety. Meet back up at the Toravada. On the way out, make sure you seal the holes we created. I will contact you when we are out. Emily went over and hugged Everin, as did Dr. Snowden. Sasrissa did so as well. Lodox stood. Ah, how touching. Emily and Dr. Snowden fired a grappling beam at the ceiling over the walkway they had entered from. CC carried Drevel while Sasrissa and Seer flew after them. Sasrissa was not sure how CC knew what to do, but apparently he did. 
Get back here, said Lodux. Everin shot a grappling beam at Lodux, pulled him in, then clotheslined him. Go, said Everin over comms. It took everything in Sazrissa to fly away. Her natural instinct was to fight next to Everin, and she saw that in Dr. Snowden and Emily as well. However, Everin's logic was sound. He had the power to handle Lodux, which was an impressive feat in itself. Everin knew the Everinites would prioritize him over everything else. Buying time for the team to escape was exactly what she would expect Everin to do, and she would ensure they got the Dimensional Cube away. Chapter 17 Emily did not like abandoning Everin, but she understood the logic. It bothered her that Lodux had crushed her chest. It reminded her of when a Time Warden commander had almost killed her. Drevel had sacrificed what healing he had to heal her at the cost of staying conscious. Cece carried him with great care, and she saw the deep bond between the two. Seer had flown ahead and shown that their path was clear to the side tunnel that led to the transportation shaft. The team wasted no time in getting there, and as they went, Emily and Dr. Snowden sealed the holes. Thankfully, the men that they had initially stunned in the first room were gone. Maybe they were on their way to the main room. The group stood at the edge of the transportation docking pad at the bottom of the shaft, We'll need to time this right, said Sasrissa. Next time the lift docks, we'll go as soon as it goes back up. I'll highlight the upper tunnel entrance so you know where to fire your grappling beams, said Seer. She flew out. Dr. Snowden gestured toward the shaft. We can just use the lift to take us up, then fire at the tunnel once we're at that level. That works, too, said Emily. She grimaced. I hate leaving Everin and V behind. Dr. Snowden sighed. Me, too. But he knows what he's doing, and I trust that. On a side note, we should fill in this tunnel, too. I'll do it, said Emily. You three get up top, and I'll go last. Everyone was frayed and seeing Drevel motionless made Emily frown. He had sacrificed himself to heal her and put himself at risk. It was a selfless act, and done without a moment's hesitation. Although she had come to expect that from Everin, V, and Dr. Snowden, it was a welcome sight to see it in others. She would do her best to ensure they got out okay. The lift docked and whirred. Get ready, said Sazrissa. When the lift began to ascend a few moments later, Dr. Snowden rushed out and fired his grappling beam. As he was pulled up, Sazrissa and CC with Drevel flew out. Emily got to work using her nanobots to fill the tunnel. By the time she had gotten to where there was just enough space for her to stand without being in the shaft, the lift had returned. Once it went back up, she used her grappling beam to connect. The upper tunnel was easy to see thanks to Seer, and Emily had no problem disabling her grappling beam to fire at the entrance when it was almost within sight. She reeled herself in, and Sasrissa caught her. Dr. Snowden slumped against the wall, so Emily joined him. Drevel was laid out, and Sasrissa sat a bit ahead of them. What a mess, said Emily. But we did get the CDCs, said Sasrissa, holding up the dimensional cube. Dr. Snowden examined it. They really had some heavy hitters guarding it. Where did the arbiters even come from that fast? Sasrissa stared at the wall. I suspect Frenev moved them there. My desire to rescue the CDCs is well known by them so they probably suspected we might try something. There are most likely arbiters at all high-profile spots they think I might hit. Lodex was tough, said Emily, and Scranlan. That was definitely a unique ability. If they had sent more arbiters, 
I fear it may have been a much tougher fight, said Sasrissa. Dr. Snowden opened his helmet. Well, I'm glad that part's over, at least. Hopefully, Everin and V are doing okay. I'm sure they are, said Emily. She glanced at Drevel. Maybe we should wait here until he wakes up. My thoughts exactly, said Sasrissa. If you can open a hole for me, I can scout out the path back to the Torvata, said Seer. Emily hopped up, then walked over to the wall opposite the transportation shaft. She extended her PSD and used her nanobots to create a hole big enough for Seer. There you go, said Emily. Thank you, said Seer as she flew out. Emily sealed the hole back up, then joined the others. She used her PSD to drink some water. Adrenaline surged through her, and although they were safe for the moment, they still had to get to the Torvada. She was sure that the Everonites would be on the lookout for them. After thirty minutes, Drevel began to stir. Hey, said Emily, squeezing Drevel's arm. He took a deep breath and stared at the ceiling. Well, that wasn't fun. She smiled. Despite the situation, he seemed upbeat. I take it we're somewhere safe? He asked. Yeah, we're in the tunnel to the shaft that we bored out, said Sazrissa. Drevel sat up and grimaced. That Lodox bastard broke my arm. But it's healed. He studied Emily. I'm glad you're okay. She hugged him. Thanks. He patted her back, then scrunched his face. Where's Everin? V and Seer. Everin and V fought Lodox while we escaped, and Everin said they'd meet us at the Torvada. Seer is checking our path back to the Torvada to make sure there are no surprises. Got it. After thirty more minutes, Seer reported in. The Torvata is missing. Emily's mouth went dry. That was the last thing she wanted to hear. Any signs of where it might have gone? None, said Seer. It appears the attendant of this lot is missing, and the Everonites have placed a Picabot swarm and some guards in the area. So, uh, how do we find it? asked Dr. Snowden. Sasrissa grimaced. Well, there's always the information broker, but she always has a high price. Emily doubted it was Santis, the only other information broker she had met, unless he lived for more than 23,000 years. What would she want? asked Drevel. Usually don't know until you meet her, said Sasrissa. Dr. Snowden shrugged. If the price is too high, we find another way. Maybe T.D. would know something. Let's check with the broker first. Then if that fails, check with T.D., said Sasrissa. Hopefully, Everin and V. will have contacted us by then. We should probably put on our cloaks. Emily liked the plan, but she had not heard from Everin or V. yet, which bothered her. It had been an hour, and she had been sure they would contact the group by then. She slipped on her black cloak along with the others, then picked up Everin's. Seer, come on back, said Drevel as he stood. On my way, she said. Emily followed the others to the wall back into the lower level of the city. She created a hole and verified it was clear, then dissolved the wall with her nanobots. Once everyone was through, she sealed it up. So where is this broker? asked Dr. Snowden. Sasrissa interacted with her palm interface. I've sent everyone the map. It's eighteen levels down from here. That level is one of the rougher ones, and despite its clean streets, there's a lot of bad groups there. We'll need to stick close together. Don't be surprised if you see corpses out on the street. That just means they haven't been collected yet. Emily did not like the sound of the place, but if that was where they needed to go, 
than they would. As they walked to a city lift, she could feel the stares from others. She did not know if they were aware of the assault or not. Her pulse quickened when two Everonite guards walked down the street. She dipped her head as the group passed them. The gang fit in better than she had expected. After a thirty-minute hike, with only a few Everonite patrols, they reached the lift. She was glad to get on it. The levels they had passed intrigued her. It was easy to see tougher and tougher people loitering the lower they went. She recognized an A.W. member on one level. Perhaps the A.W. was checking the lifts, but with the cloaks and perception filters, the group passed by without recognition. It still felt odd not to have Everin, V, or the Toravada. She felt vulnerable, and the only people she could trust were those she was with. She shuddered at the thought of being stranded deep in a city level 26,000 years in the future with no hope of getting out. The group was in a good mood, but that was probably because there was a plan. Sazrissa had been a big help, and she was a natural leader. Drevel had already shown how useful he was, as had Seer, who had docked on Drevel's shoulder. Emily had thought Dr. Snowden would be a wreck, but he was calm. She figured that was because he believed in Everin and V, was confident they'd get the Toravada back, and trusted in the team. That was something she could agree with him on. V flew above the fight between Everin and Lodux. Sazrissa, Drevel, Emily, Dr. Snowden, and Seer had already fled through the first hole and sealed it up. V picked up Lodix, trying to alert the A.W. as to what was going on, but Everin kept interrupting him. V wished he had his robot body to assist, as his stun beams did nothing against Lodox. The sticky globules did cause temporary blindness, but Lodox just swept the globules away with ease. As V analyzed how effective his nanobots would be, Everin contacted him. Find a path out of here, said Everin. Acknowledged. V went to a wall and used his nanobots to chew through. He had a layout of the facility and determined the fastest way out. If Lodix had not been a wild-born conduit that could sense the difference between Everin's and V's cosmic energy, misdirection via holograms could be used. However, Everin could move faster than Lodix, so as long as there was a known path, he would be able to escape. Another issue to be aware of was the Picabot swarms that would identify V as he created the path. That meant he would need to deal with whatever security was there, or at least avoid it and mark it for Everin. There was not much V could do against turrets, and although he could connect to a system to try to disable it, it would expose him. He went through a wall into a security office. A surprised guard fell out of his chair. V stunned him. The next hole led to a hallway. He selected a matter replication storage room 11 levels lower as a destination. That would lead Lodex down with no easy way to exit the room. A quick check showed that some AW members had joined the fight against Everin, but he held his own. Thankfully, any communication between him and Everin could not be monitored, but any with the team could. V figured the group had gotten away, but he would not be able to verify until they were out of the facility. After creating several holes that led him closer to the final room, he came upon a training room. Several AW members were running through it. V determined they were going to assist Lodox, but they had stopped and opened fire. The Picabot system had highlighted V. He dodged their fire and shot stun beams, which only highlighted their shielding. One of the members fired a net, which initially snared V. He used his nanobots to chew through it, then flew back out the hole he had come from. The AW members charged out of the room. V waited a moment, then came back in and opened a hole into another large room that was used for food storage. The last few remaining hallways and places he created holes to were empty, although one of the rooms had turrets. As accurate as he suspected they were, they could not hit him. He breached the ceiling of the bright, large matter replication storage room and scanned it. 
Massive cylindrical structures sat below in the middle of the room, with a myriad of wires that reached toward the ceiling, ground, and side walls. Everything from waste to scrap was disassembled and sent here based on where the wires came from. If Lodix came through here, it would be a long drop down and, with no easy way to exit, a good temporary trap. Analysis. I have created a path to a matter replication storage room far from the entrance. I am creating another series of holes to the entrance, then we'll come back. Excellent, said Everin. Let me know when you are near. Acknowledged. As V went to work on creating a new set of holes that led outside, he watched the view from Everin. Lodix breathed hard. It's apparent you have some skill. But you know as well as I do, you can't win this. We'll find your team sooner or later, and you're not going anywhere. I would not be so sure of that, said Everin. Why do you defy Frenev? If you're truly Everin, you should be working with him. Everin raised his head. I have already talked with him, and he believes, as you do, that I am not Everin. A mistake that will soon be corrected. Your delusion is greater than I thought, said Lodux as he charged and swung at Everin. He swatted the hit away and stepped back. You have stones that highlight in the presence of Everin. Once I am near them and they light up, my identification will be undeniable. Lodox laughed as he kicked out. I want to be there when they don't, just to see the look on your face. Everin leapt over Lodox and kicked him away into the wall. Lodox growled as he stood. Why did you pick Everin, of all people, to impersonate? It is Frenev that is impersonating me, said Everin. I am curious if you will listen to me if the stones do light up. They won't. And even if they did, your lack of cooperation with Frenev shows you're not Everin in spirit. Everin moved to the side as Lodux leapt. He landed and spun around. The real Everin would understand Frenev's cautiousness, then go talk to him to rectify things, not assault a facility. What is occurring here is illegal, and I do not agree with the abuse of CDCs, said Everin. Illegal only in the eyes of a fraudulent government. Besides, these are clones, not real people. Why do you care? Everin blocked several strikes, then did a 360 leg sweep, sending Lodix to the ground. I care because I can see that these CDCs are sentient beings, cloned or not. The Everinites' abuse of them is an abomination to me. Lodox huffed as he glared at Everin, then slowly stood. V could see that Lodox's allegiance to Frenev was absolute. It would take irrefutable evidence to show that Everin was who he said he was, and even then, V calculated that Lodox would still side with Frenev. It would then be a battle for the minds of the rank and file. V had reached a large courtyard after twenty minutes. A.W. members were coming from outside the facility, and they had not detected his hole yet. He would need to hurry. He flew back through the holes he had created. Several had A.W. members searching the area, and although some had detected him, he had used his momentum to get clear to the next hole. Hopefully they did not try to seal them. When he reached the initial hole after another twenty minutes, he contacted Everin. The path is ready. Everin shot a grappling beam at Lodox, then slung him to the opposite side of the room. It is time for me to go. Lodox jumped up. You aren't going anywhere. Everin exited and met up with V. Let us go. Acknowledged. There are some obstacles on the way, but I have marked them. We will deal with them, but we need to keep Lodox on our path, said Everin. They took off. V was able to keep up with Everin's fast movement. They paused at the second hole until Lodox spotted them. Then they continued on. 
On their way to the storage room, several AW members had tried to stop them. They went down when Everin reflected their energy beams back at them. Everin had gotten close to one of the guards and stunned them. V observed Everin's cosmic energy was in flux. This usually indicated he was not happy. The turrets that fired on them were also dealt with by reflected fire. Lodox was nowhere near as fast as Everin, so Lodox was always one or two levels away. When they reached the hole to the matter replication storage room, Everin jumped in. He shot his grappling beam up and hung off to the side of the hole. Project me going into the hole when Lodox arrives, said Everin. Acknowledged. V moved into position and created a hologram that covered him and showed Everin peering down. It was frozen for the moment, but would activate as soon as Lodox appeared. The nearby presence of Everin would verify any exotic energy detection for Lodox. Lodox burst into the room and caught his breath. You can't hide. V made the hologram look like it jumped into the hole as he flew down. Then he moved to the side. Lodox growled and made a running leap into the hole. His eyes widened as he passed Everin and V on the way down. No, he said. Everin climbed out of the hole and gestured at another hole nearby. Let us leave this place. V verified that Lodox had crashed into one of the storage tanks and bounced off to the side. He appeared hurt, and there was no immediate way for him to climb up. While he could get to stairs on the side and exit the room, he was effectively out of range. All that was left was to escape. V wanted to know the status of the others, but that would need to wait until he and Everin cleared the facility. Chapter 18 Sasrissa did not like the looks the gang got when they exited the lift. Well-armed people staring at the gang was never good news. However, she was confident that if anything started, the team could handle it. She also did not care for the current situation. Not having the Torvada available was worrisome. The docking bay was dimly lit, which was a far cry from the upper levels. Broken robots littered the ground, and they had been stripped of parts. That was one way to avoid matter replication audit trails. There were also more aliens present. She was used to seeing humans of various colors and augment displays, but down here, humans made up roughly half of the population. Weapons were on full display, and a majority of denizens looked like they were ready to go to war. Not something you expect when you step off a lift. The group moved onto a major road. Sasrissa had updated everyone's ARI with the location of the broker. It was in a bar but that was the extent of the information available. She knew the path well, and it emboldened her to see the others walk without fear. The variety of shops always intrigued her. They existed despite their being public matter replication stations. The main reason was that stations had auditing, and using shops prevented transactions from being traced. The smell of fried meats and spicy seasonings made her stomach grumble, Although she usually ate replicated food, it was good to eat what she called real food when she had the chance. Storefronts were carved five feet or so into large buildings. Animated holographic images indicated what the places were. The streets were packed, and a strange mix of music filled the air. She watched as Drevel bobbed his head. He would probably love to check out the music in more detail if he had time. Dr. Snowden did not keep his head down as they walked. He continually gazed at everything in earnest. He had the heart of a scholar. Emily was the opposite, and not only was her head lowered, she constantly fidgeted with her PSD as if ready to fight. That was understandable, given the situation. After 45 minutes, they reached a corner bar. Its front was curved and the entryway was protected by two turrets overhead and three large robots standing guard. If that was not enough security, there were suspect individuals at tactical positions watching the area. It was obvious the broker did not take chances. 
We are out, said Everin overcomes. Everin, said Emily. I hope you and V are okay. Analysis. We are, says Rissa, sensed everyone's cosmic energy spike. Torvata was taken, said Dr. Snowden. I see. What is known so far? asked Everin. It's good to hear your voices, said Sazrissa. We don't know much about where the Toravata is, but the broker we're meeting might. Where are you at now? On our way to your location, said Everin. I am troubled that the Toravata was taken, but when you are done with the broker, we can meet outside. Sounds like a plan to me, said Dr. Snowden. Everin and V's avatars faded from Sazrissa's ARI. Glad they're safe, said Dr. Snowden. He eyed the bar ahead. Looks like a fun place. Be good to meet up with Everin and V, assuming we survive whatever awaits us with the broker. We're okay, said Sazrissa. She lowered her hood and opened her helmet, then walked toward the entrance. If we weren't. We would have been stopped by now. Emily surveyed the environment. Definitely got some people out here that can shoot from cover. Let's hope they don't, said Drevel. The group paused before the robots. We're here to see Zasarti, said Sazrissa. One of the robots scanned her. Sazrissa Mortaka, known terrorist, multiple infractions of the law. The robot paused. Zasarti will see you. I know the process. I've met with her before. The robots stood to the side. The bar they walked into was what she had expected. It was loud, and in one corner was a fight. There were gambling hollow machines, and thick smoke filled the air. It smelled like someone had poured piss and sugar on the floor. She gagged. A stage on the far left side had a thin humanoid talking fast in a high-pitched voice. Next to it was a large, blob-like alien, growling and snarling, while a drum beat and a synthesized, flute-like sound accompanied his song. It was definitely one of the weirder things she had heard, but she liked it. The place had many different types of people. Some wore their battle armor, while others had on casual wear— Aliens of all stripes were present. A purple-skinned humanoid alien with a thin body rode a human in a booth. None of the other bar patrons batted an eye. She chuckled when Dr. Snowden's eyes widened. The group walked past the main area and into a side hallway. At the end was a small, featureless room, which they entered. When it sealed up, it vibrated as it descended. The bar was just one entry point to wherever they were going. Sasrissa had been there before, but had come from a different place. She had only been to this one once. I take it we're going to lower levels, said Dr. Snowden. Yep, said Sasrissa. Don't worry. This is just part of the process. We're being scanned and monitored while here. Seer flew off Drevel's shoulder. She morphed to her humanoid form. Welcome back, said Emily, smiling. Thank you, said Seer. There is a security AI trying to probe me, but I have stopped it. Sasrissen nodded. That's not unexpected given where we're going. Drevel laughed. Not that type of probing, said Seer, eyeing him. I didn't say anything. Sasrissa enjoyed their playful banter. She wondered what it would be like when it was just the three of them. Seer would probably be relieved, as much as an AI could, to have a different perspective to interact with. She liked that the gang was in a light-hearted mood, despite the situation. That was not uncommon with the other versions that she knew. After ten minutes, the unit stopped, and a door opened. The group exited. It was time to get some information. Drevel rubbed his temples. He had had a headache earlier when he had woken up from unconsciousness, but he was fine now. Normally, he could heal someone and it would take a bit out of him, but Emily's injuries had been lethal. 
If she had been a normal human, she would have died on the spot. That was a testament to Lodex's raw strength, but also Emily's cosmic nature and nanobots. Drevel could do a one-shot heal that knocked him out. It was risky, since it made him vulnerable, but he trusted Emily would protect him. Drevel surveyed the small octagonal room that the group entered. It had a chair in the center, with doors on each side. A young woman who appeared to be in her early twenties sat in the chair with her legs crossed and her hands steepled. Her long, white hair, golden skin, and bright blue eyes were an interesting combination. She wore a one-piece form-fitting suit with various circuitry-like lines running everywhere. Sazarissa Moartaka, said the woman, standing. Zasarti, it's been a while, said Sazarissa. She moved forward to stand before Zasarti with the others in tow. Zasarti circled the group. She ran her fingers across everyone's back, then stood in front and faced them. I already know who you all are. I like what I see, said Zasarti. You all want to know where the Torvata is, I presume? How could you possibly know that? asked Emily. Zasarti sat in her chair and smiled. Demosco, of course. He is my TD connection. Apparently the Everonites liked the Torvata. So where is it? asked Drevel. Zasarti raised a finger. Patience. I'm cutting a lot of the pleasantries out due to Sazrissa. But before any information is exchanged, a deal must be struck. <laughs> she giggled. Drevel liked Zasarti's quirky nature. He had dealt with brokers of various types before, and the personality came with the job. Zasarti was no exception. Sazrissa sighed. I know your prices are high. What do you want? Oh, I don't know. Zasarti pointed at Dr. Snowden. It's been a while since I've had companionship. Maybe he can provide that for a night. What? asked Dr. Snowden. Drevel laughed. That's not happening, said Sazrissa. Well, then... What do you offer? asked Zasarti, leaning back in her chair. Drevel approached her. I sense you have a disease. He tilted his head. Brain. Zasarti stood. Now it's my turn to be confused. How could you possibly know that? I'm a healer, he said. Zasarti studied him. I have an aggressive brain disease that the Peekabot system I had installed can barely contain. Why don't you become a digital consciousness? asked Dr. Snowden. I like when the pretty one speaks, said Zasarti, smiling at him. Dr. Snowden cleared his throat. Zasarti sighed. I've had my brain for over two thousand years. I'm not giving it up. Despite all this advanced technology surrounding us, however, even organic matter has its limits. By all rights, you should be dead, said Drevel. The good news is I can heal you. The bad news is you don't get to play with Dr. Snowden, Emily chuckled. Dr. Snowden shook his head. I accept your offer, said Zasarti. How do we do this? Drevel moved behind her chair and placed his hands on both sides of her head. Relax. He closed his eyes and focused. He could now see the disease fighting a war in her brain. The aggressive Picabot defensive system repaired any damage caused, but the disease was also mutating. There was a net loss of Picabots after every engagement. At some point, they would not save her. Alcarin tendrils entered her head. As each one touched a diseased part of her brain, it removed the disease, then replenished the area. After a few passes, she was cured. Zasarti moaned. Oh, headache. Is it done? It is, said Drevel. Zasarti jumped up and ran over to the wall, where a beam scanned her. 
It's really gone. Drevel did a flourish. Of course it is. Now, the Torvata. Of course, said Zasarti as she hugged him. The Torvata is in the ring. It's been moved to a research bay the Everonites have up there. I have received the coordinates, said Seer. Great. Drevel tucked his chin. Um, I think you can stop hugging me. You sure? asked Zasarti. He chuckled as he stepped back. Yeah, <laughs> your loss, she said. One last thing before you go. Everin, I'd like to meet him and see why he intrigues people. Let's make a deal then. Maybe you could tell us where to upload the CDCs we took, said Sasrissa. Zasarti grinned. A deal you shall have. As you may or may not know, the only way to enter the virtual world is via one of the capsules with a direct connection or through one of the maintenance stations. The maintenance areas are only available to the virtual world techs, and that's where they scrub unwanted digital consciousnesses or add new ones. Even then, those areas are automated and controlled by special AIs and the robots they control. She raised a finger. I can get you all clearance to get in there and unload your CDCs, but be warned. The defense there is no joke. They'll kill you fast if they get a hold of you. Nonetheless, there's a maintenance area in the opposite direction of the research bay. I'll mark it and assume you'll hold up your end of the deal on meeting Everin. Oh, and I've given Seer the credentials she'll need to board the orbital ring lift. Thanks said Sasrissa. Don't thank me just yet. You have a dangerous road ahead of you, said Zasarti. Drevel relaxed as he saw the research bay location where the Torvato was held. It was 15 miles from where they would exit from the orbital lift. The maintenance area was 30 miles in the other direction. It made sense for the group to split up, since either place would probably set off alarms. They would be meeting up with Everin and V soon, and then they could figure out the plan. The end goal would be the CDCs being uploaded, and that would be one of Sazris's goals completed. They would also have the Toravada back, something he really missed. Drevel cracked up as Zasardi swirled her finger on Dr. Snowden's chest. Drevel was glad Dr. Snowden was being a good sport, although Zasardi was very upfront. With her experience from such a long life, she probably did not care too much for social norms. She had come through with the information. But then again, it still needed to be verified. For now, he was willing to extend some trust. Dr. Snowden studied the lodging room that Sazrissa had led them to. It had two side rooms on the left with three beds each. Each room had a large bathroom, and a matter replicator station was embedded in the main living quarters area on the front wall. Opposite the entrance were two doorways to a balcony. They were on the third floor, and the silence surprised him. There must be some type of sound-dampening feature. The visit with Zasardi had been interesting. He was not sure why she had shown such a strong interest in him. She had also shown it in the others. When everyone had met up with Everin and V outside the bar, Zasardi had come up. She was like a moth to a flame when she saw Everin. That was not too surprising. It was 9.30 p.m., and Dr. Snowden's eyes sagged. Although they had secured the CDCs, there was still more to be done. After the heavy fighting and harrowing escape, he was ready for a nice, long sleep. Decent room, said Emily. Everin nodded. As V, Seer, and I do not need to sleep, the rest of you can do so when you are ready. Drevel yawned. CC and I will take you up on that. He went into the first room on the left. Me too, said Emily. She trudged into the second room. Everin sat on the couch while V and Seer hovered nearby. I plan to go through the data Zasarti gave us. I would like V and Seer to assist in the analysis. Of course, said Seer. Acknowledged. Dr. Snowden gestured at one of the balcony doors. Well, I'm tired, but I want to check out the view. 
it is good to see your curiosity is not dampened by recent events, said Everin. Dr. Snowden smiled and pointed at him. I'll join you outside, said Sasrissa. He did a flourish. After you. After going to the balcony, he surveyed the area below. The courtyard was heavily defended, and per Sasrissa, this was a safe place for the night. Zasardi had hooked them up, and it was an example of how well connected she was. Dr. Snowden would not complain. The place was also anathema to Everinites due to the level essentially being off-limits to them. Past the courtyard was a plaza with multiple light posts. A mist covered the area, and it surprised him not to hear much of anything. There was a definite lack of animals. He had expected there might be rats, cats, or even something truly alien that was pet size, but there were none. Maybe the Peekabot swarms kept that away. He gestured out. This is so interesting. Despite everything going on, I mean, look at that. In the far future, in an advanced city, and deep underground, how many get a chance to see that? Not many. Even for those in the Chelentan Empire, said Sazrissa. She glanced at him. You're in an upbeat mood. I guess I am. Just glad Everin and V are back. We got the CDCs without anyone dying or being seriously hurt, and we'll have our next steps defined tomorrow. Sasrissa smiled. I like the sound of all of that. I love working with Everin and all of you, so I'm happy with any time I get. Dr. Snowden studied her. You look like you're at home here. I've been here a few times. When you're labeled as a terrorist by one of the most powerful factions in the Chelatan Empire, you learn where you can and can't go. I can't even imagine, said Dr. Snowden. Sasrissa sighed. It's not been easy. I look forward to offloading these CDCs and to destroying the Everanite organization. Then it's time for a change of scenery. Dr. Snowden could see how being in the same area for over two centuries and only seeing minimal impact could be disconcerting. If her goals were achieved, then she could leave with peace of mind. He was glad to assist her, and she seemed happy to work with the team again. He gestured out. Why was Zasarti interested in me? Sasrissa laughed. Given all the technology available, you have a balding head and wear glasses. You also don't have a Picabot enhanced and augmented body. In her mind, you chose those things, since they could easily be dealt with. You're an original to her, and something different and new. She finds that exciting. Oh. So, what would happen if I stayed the night with her? He asked. I mean, obviously, she favored some type of physical interaction. I'm just curious. Sasrissa grinned. Let's just say she is very exotic. You sure you're just curious? Dr. Snowden gulped. Oh, yeah. A Kess would kick my butt if I messed around on her, and I would never do that. I don't think you would, although here... Having multiple partners is the norm, she said, glancing at him. Like all Everin's companions, you have a high standard, and I think you're great. His eyes narrowed. You know, I've been called great throughout our adventures. The great Dr. Snowden. Everin is referenced as noble and Emily heroic. Even V is described as valiant sometimes, I know you can't really divulge information on our future, but any thoughts on that? She frowned. I can't say. Whatever the event was where they earned the adjective for their names, Dr. Snowden would not know until it occurred. He could not fathom what it would be, but whatever it was, it was big enough that it would somehow propagate all through time and space. Well... Hopefully it's not something crazy, he said. Sasrissa's eyes misted as she gazed out. 
Dr. Snowden's stomach churned. Her silence did not seem like earning the adjective for their names was a good thing. I hope I didn't offend you, he said. You're fine, she said, clearing her throat. Dr. Snowden leaned on the guardrail and watched people walk by outside the courtyard. They were going about their business, and he wondered what their thoughts were. They would never know that space and time travelers gazed down on them. It was like that for everyone the gang encountered. What do you think will happen to the CDCs when they enter the virtual world? He asked. Sasrissa grimaced. For starters, they won't be isolated or reset anymore. They'll exist as normal citizens and can even take on physical bodies if they want. They'll be free. Yeah, but they're really going to be angry with the Everanites. I'm sure they will, said Sasrissa. The Everanites are already losing the public relations fight on many worlds, which is why they concentrate on worlds where they feel they can consolidate power. Their growth may be slow, but it does increase. Dr. Snowden shuddered. They're like a disease. They've made Everin out to be some psycho with their approach. Unfortunately so. We're going to fix that. Just you and me. What? He asked with wide eyes. She laughed. Oh, I see. Tease the lesser cosmic being. She laid a hand on his shoulder. I was kidding. But never think you're less. You mean a lot to many people. Dr. Snowden appreciated her words. She was kind, empathetic, but also able to fight if need be. It was no wonder the Toravada had chosen her. He motioned over the railing. As adjudicator, did you ever come down here? Oh, yeah. Many times, said Sasrissa. Actually had a case not too far from here. Some genetics lab went up in flames and some of the experiments escaped. I was the closest adjudicator and on another case, but took time to get a security unit and investigate. Wow. Sounds like you've been all over. She nodded. I was adjudicator for a long time and enjoyed most of it. I didn't enjoy the political side of it, though. Dr. Snowden smirked. Seems humanity can never give that up. Thankfully, I still have many Judicator friends, but they don't support my crusade against the Everinites. Still, they don't arrest me either, so there's that. I take it, then, you didn't have many friends after you left the Judicators. Sasrissa frowned. It's been lonely. The TD were the closest thing to an ally, but even they kept their distance. I did make some friends with those who I might have arrested before. That was an interesting experience. I bet. Dr. Snowden could see how she would be lonely. She knew what Everin stood for and had watched the Everinites twist it. Standing up for what was right made her walk a lonely path. When criminals are the only ones you can turn to for friendship when you're trying to fight injustice, society has a problem. He was thankful that she had provided insight into some of his questions. Although he was tired and had a lot more questions to ask, he decided to not continue talking when she had yawned a few times. A good rest awaited him, and tomorrow they would write an injustice. Chapter 19 It took a moment for Emily to gather her bearings. She slept decently, but had woken up once or twice and tossed and turned some. It reminded her of sleeping at home versus on the Toravada. She peeked over at Sazrissa, who was still asleep. Dr. Snowden and Drevel would be in the other room, and Everin, V, and Seer were still probably out in the main room. Emily yawned as she slid her legs off to the side. She had slept in her underwear, and her survival suit lay next to her, she realized how odd it might look to others, but if something happened, she could hop into her suit in no time. It was something she had practiced, 
If the gang had slept somewhere rough, she would have just kept the suit on. She grabbed her suit and went to the bathroom. It was large, and near the back were two white capsules that went from the ground to the ceiling. She entered and saw they were connected, but split into two parts. The area she was in had a place for her suit and belongings. The other was a room with tiny holes on the ceiling and floor. A green button hovered inches off one of the side walls. She laid her suit down and stripped off her underwear, then entered the second area. The green button dissipated after being pressed. A pigabot swarm flew out from the ceiling holes and began to clean her. They pulled her hair slightly and went between strands, creating a massaging effect that she appreciated. When the pigabot swarm collected something off her, it went out one of the bottom holes. It was like she was standing under a waterfall of cleaning machines. As a test, she opened her mouth, and the pigabots swarmed in. She wondered if her cosmic nanobots would react, but they were calm as her teeth were cleaned. Her ears tingled when they were scrubbed. She wiggled her toes and chuckled as a tickling sensation swept over her. The after-effect was noticeable once the swarm was done. The green button had reappeared, and she felt clean. The cleaning process reminded her of the green mist used on the Crotovore ship on a previous adventure long ago. The Pigabots were thorough, and when she went to pick up her suit, she realized it had been cleaned along with her undergarments. She donned both and exited. Sasrissa stood and yawned. Hey, said Emily. Sasrissa smiled. Looks like you are ready for the day. Emily grinned. Liking those Pikabot swarm showers? Think I'll indulge myself, said Sasrissa as she passed Emily. Emily went to the main room. Everin sat motionless in a chair next to V and Seer. They were probably in some type of digital landscape, working. Dr. Snowden and Drevel were seated at a long table near the balcony doors. They had already grabbed breakfast. Dr. Snowden gestured at the matter replicator on the front wall of the room. V put in our patterns. Emily walked over to it and got a breakfast bowl and some orange juice, then joined them at the table. Dr. Snowden had a sausage burrito, and Drevel had what looked like eggs and some type of meat in a bowl. What's that? she asked, motioning at Drevel's bowl. Scrambled eggs, cheese, tomatoes, and chorizo he said. Best thing ever in the morning. Well, for food, that is. She chuckled. Spicy sausage in the morning. Bold move. Healer, remember? Fair point. She dug into her bowl. After twenty minutes, Sazrissa joined them with her breakfast. Everin stood and walked over, then took a seat. Seer and V hovered and flew over. I hope everyone had a good rest said Everin. Drevel raised a finger, and if you didn't, I can heal any sore muscles. Indeed. I can go over what Seer, V, and I analyzed together now or after you all are finished eating. No time like the present, said Dr. Snowden. Very well. Everin tossed a projection orb over the table, then interacted with his ARI. The orb projected an isometric cutout view of a part of the orbital ring and one of its connectors to the planet. A red dot indicated their current location, while two other green dots were on the ring as well. Everin pointed at the two green dots. Zisardi gave us detailed information on the locations of a virtual planet maintenance station and the Toravata. Several routes highlighted in blue. She also provided routes we can use, along with credentials to get us to the orbital ring and access the maintenance area. Emily studied a blue line. I take it the blue line from our current position to before it goes to the connector is where we board something? You are correct, said Everin. There is a lift that will take us to the ring. It is an hour-long trip. He tapped in the air at the intersection of the orbital ring and the connector, once we are there, the maintenance station is to the right, and the Torvada is to the left. Each is a considerable distance from where we would exit. 
Dr. Snowden adjusted his glasses. Wouldn't they have another transport mechanism, like a train or something, to get to the areas? They do, said Sazrissa. The issue I'm seeing is that if we go to the maintenance station first and upload the CDCs, it may cause a ring-wide lockdown. If we get the Torvata first, it may also cause a security issue. Either one could have us swarmed up there, and that is not a good place to fight. Then we do both at the same time, said Drevel. Whoever gets the Torvata comes and picks up the others after the CDCs are uploaded. Analysis. The Torvada has a heavier security presence, said V. Seer nodded. The maintenance station will also require V or me to be present to initiate the transfer and monitor it. Drevel smiled. The plan is obvious to me. Everyone stared at him. Me, Emily, and Seer will upload the CDCs. Everin, Sazrissa, V, and Dr. Snowden get the Torvata. Drevel pointed at Emily and Seer. Once we're done uploading, we'll leave. Then a rendezvous at the nearest airlock where, hopefully, a Torvada awaits us. Even if an alarm is raised, both groups will be by their objective. Everin rubbed his chin. That could work. You chose Emily in case there was fighting, and her PSD has nanobots to go through walls as needed. Seer would provide the technical expertise needed for uploading the CDCs. Zasardi has given us the outfit design used by maintenance personnel, so cloaks will not be needed. However, even if you both are valid personnel, the uploading of the CDCs may trigger an alarm. Drevel wagged a finger at Everin. I'd probably expect it, but we can do it. Then we just need to hold our ground for a while or hide away. Getting to the Torvata will be a tough fight, said Sasrissa. Dr. Snowden grinned. Unless V can sneak in, he'll just need a distraction. If it is shielded or clamped, we will need to undo that, said Everin. Drevel clapped, then pointed up with a finger from each hand. I love it when a plan comes together. The group chuckled. Emily scrunched her face. Concerning the lift to the ring... How will they know it's us when we get there? I assume we'll still be using our cloaks to cover us. Analysis. Zisardi has given our profiles false names. We only need to show our faces for a brief moment when near the lift. We can do so when there is no line of sight from any Everanite presence. Oh, well, that works, she said. She liked the plan. It made good use of everyone's skills and it showed Drevel's tactical nature. Given his age and how many summonses he had done, that was not too surprising. She hoped she, Drevel, and Seer would not run into any issues, but there was always something. There were a variety of things that could go wrong. They could be downed by a superior force. Another disaster would be if they got locked into a shielded area. Even if they escaped, they might get trapped or even flushed out to space. There were patterns she could use from her PSD to lessen the chances of a disaster, and she planned to check them out before they got to the ring and separated. Prime Arbiter Frenev scowled as he studied the holographic display of data in regard to the Everanites' CDC facility. The imposter Everin and his team had somehow been able to extract all the CDCs and escape. That was not physically possible, Yet it had happened. Even more alarming was that the buffer had been pulled too. That meant any recent interaction sessions with the CDCs were there. Thankfully, he had his own personal stash of CDCs to indulge his darkest desires. The Amashwala had already provided footage and some details of the breach. V had opened holes all through the facility. Then he and Everin escaped that way. The rest of his team had apparently come through the transportation shaft. Burrowing through unshielded walls, floors, and ceilings was not something the A.W. had expected. Nor had he. Where Everin and his team were and what they planned to do with the CDCs remained unknown. Freneva awaited an update from Arbiters Scranlin and Lodux. 
Frenev had watched the fight, and as powerful as Lodux had been. In the end, it was his lack of awareness that had made him drop down a hole out of reach of Everin and V. Even during the fight with Everin's team, Lodux had been kept at bay. Trouble followed Sasrissa Mortaka everywhere, and she had somehow convinced her new associates of her cause. Drevel had a powerful cloak that moved on its own. How he had healed Emily from what should have been a death blow was not evident. Dr. Snowden also shot and moved faster than a normal human. Then there was the Everin Impostor. His speed and strength were obvious. He was more than a match for Lodux. That would be a problem, as he was physically the strongest arbiter the Everinites had. Scranlan had performed admirably, but he had been sidelined. Frenev sat back in his seat. Ever since Sasrissa had gained these new allies, the Everinites had suffered setback after setback. Even more puzzling was that there were no records of her newfound friends anywhere. It was like they had appeared out of thin air. He had thought maybe the TD were involved, or the Trinikins, but his informants had relayed that they were not. That was not too surprising given their inability to do anything of consequence. The only bright spot was that they had captured a ship that Sazrissa and her cohorts used. It had unusual shielding, but the ship could be moved. It now sat in a research bay in the ring, and he hoped the researchers would find out something as to where it had come from. One thing that bothered him was that the ship resembled the Toravada. He remembered the real Everin having a similar ship. Visually, they appeared similar, but Frenev was not versed in the intricacies of how Everin's Toravada worked. However, the real Everin appeared different from the imposter. Changing appearances was always possible, but Frenev highly doubted the real Everin would come back in a different form and not talk to him. A light beeped on his desk. Frenev tapped it, and a holographic image of Arbiter Lotux appeared. Lotux bowed. Prime Arbiter, Frenev. You were right that the CDC facility might be attacked. Arbiter Lotux, I've read through your report and watched the videos. I... I failed, said Lotux. Yes... Yes, you did. Frenev's eyes narrowed. What are your thoughts on this imposter and his team? Lotux raised his head. The imposter moves faster than me, and he's stronger than I am. He also has a device that shot out a variety of beams, including a grappling beam or something. Frenev steepled his fingers yet he defeated you by luring you into a hole over a big room. I was blinded by rage. He played with me as if I was a toy. Your defeat is not all on you. Arbiter Scranlin was with you. Lodox smirked. He went down quick. I appreciate his abilities, but as powerful as they are, he's not really a fighter. I saw that. I've sent him to the research bay where the captured ship is. He will work with Arbiter Tankrill there. However, the focus now is on finding those CDCs. How should I proceed? Frenev paused. I suspect Sazarissa and her cohorts aim to release the CDCs into the virtual world. As such, they would go for one of the maintenance stations on the ring. While there are some planet side... Those are merely relays. If they are going for their ship, then it makes sense they'd go for the nearest station as well. I want you to go there. Lodox scrunched his face. Why are the maintenance stations in the ring? The planet could offer better security. Those stations generate a lot of heat, and space is a good place to get rid of that, said Frenev. Plus, there is less regulation on the ring. We don't have full control of this planet. Yet. Okay. Frenev studied Lodox. Something else is bothering you. Lodox sighed. I was chosen by Everin to be the most physical. The only other being that would be stronger than me would be... 
Everin. You think the imposter might actually be him? If he is, why didn't he talk to you? Frenev's eyes narrowed. We talked when he was at the temple. Nothing I saw convinced me he is Everin. And as you know, Everin talks through me. Lodox cleared his throat. You're right. I didn't know you had talked already. Frenev sensed some hesitation from Lodox. This imposter was making arbiters unsure, which was not a good sign. With the stealing of the CDCs and Everin's fighting ability, it was clear that he and his team needed to be eliminated. This had quickly gone from a mild curiosity to something extremely dangerous. If this imposter was deemed to be Everin, it would take away Frenev's power. He could not allow that to happen. Not only would he lose power, but others might come after him if they truly knew that his ability was not really Everin's voice, but his own. Frenev watched Lodux sign off, but the feeling that things were changing pervaded Frenev, and it made his heart pound faster. Everin and his team had to disappear by any means necessary. Chapter 20 Sasrissa stared outside the lift the gang rode to the orbital ring. She had done this a few times, but it never got old watching the planet get smaller the higher they went. The connector between the ground and the orbital ring was flexible, and although it swayed, it was housed in another structure that could flex but was rigid for the most part. They were on a personal lift, essentially a room with couches lined up on the edges in a square pattern with corner tables, a matter replicator station, a bathroom, and a side area with two beds in it. Sassrisso was used to the cheaper lifts, which were more like a series of chairs in rows. Zisardi had spared no expense for them. Getting onto the lift had been easy. Zisardi's faked credentials had worked as expected, and all that was required was for the gang to lower their helmets and cloaks for a moment for a quick scan. Sassrissa had been worried that the Everinites would be watching the entry area and who was registered to go on it. She had been given the fake and odd name of Susan. Dr. Snowden stood motionless with a hand on the transparent material that separated them from the air that rushed by. He was entranced by what he saw, and she suspected it was his first time. She understood that although Everin's companions eventually saw a lot, there was so much more out there that there were still firsts, such as now. Emily had been a ball of energy as she pointed at things, V followed her pointing and they discussed what they saw. Their tight bond was evident. Drevel stood next to Dr. Snowden and took in the view. It might be Drevel's first time, too. He was uncharacteristically quiet, a far cry from when she had first met him. Seer was in her hologram form and silently observed everything. Everin was calm as always. With his hands behind his back, he checked on the group from time to time. That was a mode she was familiar with. Despite the upcoming fight, he seemed assured of the outcome, another aspect of him she was used to. This is so beautiful, said Dr. Snowden. I can't even just wow. Drevel grinned as he slapped him on the back. Me too. We're no longer virgins. Lift ones, that is. Dr. Snowden eyed him. Then they laughed. Seer eyed Drevel. Sassrissa liked that Drevel was so easygoing. It did not surprise her that his quiet moment on the ride up was short-lived. Emily pointed at a large ship in the distance. That's so crazy to see it just hanging there. Analysis. It is using a mix of anti-gravity technology and thrusters. I know, I'm just saying... It's so cool. Acknowledged. Sassrissa joined Everin. It's not your first time on one of these. I know. You are correct, he said. I enjoy these types of breaks. Thankfully, Zisardi kept her word. Oh yeah, she would. She was glad to meet you.
Everin cast a sidelong glance. Why did she want to meet me? Sasrissa chuckled. To get a measure of the person that so many follow. I get that. To her, you were a mythical being. Yet now she knows better. I see. I hope there is not a nefarious purpose I am unaware of. I don't think there is, said Sasrissa. Zasarti likes things quiet. That is good to hear. Sasrissa also enjoyed these quiet moments. It felt natural to be standing next to Everin, and she had come to know the others as extended family. She had missed that feeling for a long time. There were times she had considered giving up, but she was glad she had not. After an hour, the ring's entry point came into view. It always amazed her how fast the lift could ascend without all the issues associated with turbulence. From her understanding, they used shielding that kept its shape, and the shield projectors had freedom to shift as necessary. The result was a smooth ride. The lift passed through a light blue shield into a vertical shaft. After another five minutes, it had ascended to a tunnel that led to an unloading area. Once the lift arrived, the surrounding shielding dissipated, and the doors opened. That was amazing, said Dr. Snowden. Yeah, no kidding, said Drevel. Emily swatted his arm. You just want to go again? He laughed. <laughs> Maybe. Everin pointed to an arched doorway that led to a large, open, busy area. Drevel, Emily, and Seer, your path is clear. If you need assistance, let us know. You may be too far away at that point, said Emily. Any worry they might eavesdrop on our communications? Only if they have a jammer, said Sazrissa. They wouldn't use that up here. Besides, they may be able to detect that there's a secure channel, but they're not breaking the Torvada's encryption. Drevel glanced at Seer. You ready? I am, she said as she docked on Drevel's shoulder. CC merged into Drevel and appeared as a maintenance technician's outfit. Emily handed Everin her cloak, then altered her appearance to match Drevel's. We'll see you all on the Torvata soon, said Drevel. He, Emily, and Seer took off. Just us, said Dr. Snowden. Indeed, said Everin. He motioned at another arched doorway further away. Let us go. Cesaris's heart raced. There was nowhere to hide on the ring, so either they were successful, or they all were captured or died. Even if Everin and V died, she knew they would reform. She did not have that luxury. Still, it would seem odd for the Torvada to have her go work with Drevel, only for her to die before then. The Torvada was roughly fifteen miles away, but thankfully... There was an internal transportation system that would take them most of the way. The unit they got was essentially a cube, and once one became available, they entered and were off. She surveyed the beautiful landscape of the ring as they whizzed along. The side they had boarded had an opacity setting that allowed them to see everything as they passed. The ring was advanced and was considered a technical marvel by many. The slick floors... Walls filled with hollow screens, countless matter replicators, and easy transportation system made the place very accommodating. The white and dark blue color palette was also pleasing. One of the more intriguing aspects was the Picabot swarms built in everywhere. This allowed those from the planet to visit and interact as a digital consciousness with the ring. However, there was a long wait list for scheduled visits via the Picabot swarms. From a security perspective, that made sense. The unit went between ring segments, and for a brief moment they were in open space. The view always took her breath away, and judging by Dr. Snowden's agape mouth, he was also beholden. Everin was calm as expected, while V hovered in silence. Sasrissa suspected they were thinking things through, or communicating on their personal connection. After a twenty-minute ride, they reached their exit point and exited. I wish we had time to explore the ring more, said Dr. Snowden. That was simply fascinating. 
Perhaps we will when this is done, said Everin. Sassrissa squeezed Dr. Snowden's arm. Let's plan on a visit later. He smiled at her. She appreciated his curiosity. He had loads of it, and it came through naturally, even when they were doing a rescue mission. They left the landing platform and entered a large concourse. Square pillars divided the room into a grid, and there was seating attached to them. Some of them had matter replicator stations on the side, while yet others had hollow screens. Cubicles covered the corners and were where people hooked up to enter the virtual world. Wow! Busy place, said Dr. Snowden. That is good for us, said Everin. The research bay is not far from here. The entrance was shielded, but the walls were not. That meant they could go in that way, but once in, they had to reach the Toravada as fast as possible. It was most likely covered in a shield as well, so that would need to be dealt with. After leaving the concourse, they walked through smaller pathways until they came to a side hallway. Down there is where we need to go, said Everin. Per Zasardi's layout, the entrance to the room is shielded. We will enter from the side. The Peekabot system will expose us, but we can determine where the Torvada is in the bay, then reach it as fast as possible. Works for me, said Dr. Snowden. Sassrissa sensed their cosmic energies fluctuating. There were a lot of unknowns to deal with, and hopefully it would not be as rough as the CDC facility had been. They took off down the side hallway and reached a circular area that had passageways. Opposite them was the shielded entrance with Everinite guards out front. Sassrissa noticed people giving it a wide berth. She followed the others down a pathway next to the entrance. They paused after getting out of line of sight. V. Open a hole, said Everin. Acknowledged, said V. He extended his PSD and a swarm of nanobots flew out. They began to work on opening a hole. Dr. Snowden activated his energy shield when Everin did. After the hole was created, they stepped through into a room that was flashing a soft orange. V. Find the Torvada said Everin. V faded from view as he flew away. Well, I guess they know we're here, said Dr. Snowden. Everin raised his shield and reflected an energy beam back at the entrance guards who had opened fire. Sassrissa kept close as Everin advanced. Dr. Snowden shot stun beams at two drones that flew over. Analysis. I have found the Torvada. It is covered in a shield. I am working on disabling it. We are on our way, said Everin. As they sprinted toward V's location, Arbiter Scranlin and Arbiter Tankrill stepped into their path. Tankrill was one of the few women Arbiters that Sasrissa had seen during the Toravada's scan of their awakening, when they had received wild-born abilities. Frenev was right. As usual, said Tankrill. Scranlan glared at Sazrissa. And we meet again, Sazrissa harumphed. We do not have time for your foolishness, said Everin. He fired a stun beam at Tankrill with no effect. That's nice, she said, just like we don't have time for yours. Per the data they had, Tankrill could project shields on herself and others. That would be a problem. Everin had tested the shielding strength, and stun beams would not cut it. Sassrissa flew over and shot her grappling beam at Tankrill, then lifted her into the air. Oh no you don't, said Scranlan, extending a hand. Steel tendrils erupted from the ground and grabbed Sassrissa's legs, then slammed her into the ground. Tankrill fell. Sassrissa took a moment to catch her breath. Although she tried to move, more tendrils had appeared and had strapped her to the floor. Dr. Snowden fired a stun beam at Scranlan, but it only highlighted his shielding. We need to stop Tankrill! Tankrill stood. Good luck with that. She shot a laser beam at Dr. Snowden. He reflected it back, but like the stun beam, it had no impact. Help Sazrissa, said Everin. Dr. Snowden rushed over and spawned a knife to cut the tendrils off her. 
he fought the ones that attempted to ensnare him. Everin jumped out of a swarm of tendrils that tried to grab him. As he did, he shot a grappling beam at Tankrill. When Everin landed, he slung her to the other side of the bay. Two tendrils grabbed Everin's legs. He spawned a blade and sliced them off, then charged Scranlan. Scranlan backpedaled. He smiled when Tankrill came back. You are not winning this time. Four walls burst from the ground and caged Everin, then merged into a pointed top. Everin sliced open the side and peered out. Your focus on me has led to your defeat. I think we have this under control, <laughs> said Tankrill, laughing. Analysis. I do not believe so, said V, speaking through the Torvada's external speakers. The Torvada exited stealth mode and landed on Tankrill until she stopped moving. The Torvada extended a metallic arm with a blaster endpoint, then fired a stun beam at Scranlan, who collapsed. Dr. Snowden helped Sasrissa stand as Everin cut his way out of his cage. V, you have impeccable timing, said Dr. Snowden. He rubbed his left arm. Damn tendril, whip me. Nonetheless, looks like Tankrill is just unconscious. I guess her shielding does have some limits. Acknowledged. Sasrissa limped with Dr. Snowden's help onto the Toravada. The tendrils had tried to squeeze her into unconsciousness, and one of them had cut into her leg. Being back on the Toravada felt good. Drevel had enjoyed the lift ride up. It still amazed him how different the gang's summonses were from his. It was like night and day. He, Emily, and Seer were going to upload the CDCs, and Emily acted like this was just an everyday thing. She was fearless. That much he knew. And his healing of her had formed a strong bond between them. Seer had been unusually quiet on their trip up the ring. He suspected she was taking everything in. It was not every day she saw this type of group. Normally, she would be flying and scanning, but the Peekabot swarms would detect her. He was not sure what security protocols they had, but they did not need any scrutiny before they got to the Virtual World Maintenance Station. The path they took to a unit had been uneventful. The concourse they had crossed was brightly lit and packed with humans, aliens, and robots. It made him wonder what everyone was doing up there. Per the layout, there were a lot of meeting rooms on the way. The easy access for ships to dock probably meant the area would always be busy. They reached their unit and settled in as it took off. It was thirty miles to their exit. This is so cool, said Emily. Seer flew off Drevel's shoulder and projected her human form. I like it. Have you seen anything like this before? I have not, but I have seen space stations. Drevel smirked. Yeah, and usually we willingly go. Emily wrinkled her brow. He is referring to one Earth where we got trapped on a shuttle and taken to a space station, said Seer. Yeah, but that has nothing on all this, said Drevel. Emily sighed. I wish we were visiting under better circumstances. Yeah, Emily pulled out her PSD and projected a hollow screen. The station isn't too far from where we exit. Once we're there, how long will it take to upload the CDCs? Ten minutes, said Seer. Everin said it might trigger an alarm. You think it will? Seer nodded. I will attempt to stagger the uploads so it's not all at once. I won't know what I can or can't do until I am interfacing with that system. Well, at least we have our disguises. I kind of liked the cloaks, said Emily. I wonder if we're supposed to carry any tools or anything. We don't. All tools are secured on site, so we'll need to get them. Emily bobbed her head. Makes sense. One less item to worry about, and no worries that someone forgot something. I hope you know how to navigate the area once there. Seer gestured at the dimensional cube in Emily's hands. I do. Once we enter through a scanned area, there are several interfaces we can interact with. Zasardi has given us the layout, and depending on certain factors when we arrive, 
will take the most isolated interface. That's what I like to hear, said Drevel. He liked their plan. Hopefully they could slip in, upload the CDCs, and then get out without worry. However, if an alarm did go off, they would have to deal with not only the station's robot defense force, but also potentially ring security. He checked out the places they passed. They were bustling, and the people there had no idea what was going to happen. After fifteen minutes, their unit came to a crawl, then stopped. They exited. Time to see if our cover works, said Drevel. Emily swatted his arm. Yep. Let's do this. The platform was busy, and it provided additional cover, which Drevel liked. Although he was not one for crowds, it worked for them this time. Per the map and the blue line in his ARI, the maintenance station was only a ten-minute walk. He surveyed the maintenance station's entrance when they arrived. The station extended outside the ring, and only a part of it was inside. The entrance was a large rectangular doorway, and small turrets sat on the sides and above. A light mist highlighted the area, and he realized that was the Picabot swarm. However, it was the android that caught his eye. Although it appeared as a human male, he sensed the buzz associated with androids. The android wore a similar suit to what he had, but it also had several weapons on his belt, along with a rod of some type on its back. Next to the android were five robots. They had human-like legs, and their hips were just a circular platform. Out of that rose a robotic-looking spine that attached to a domed head where a series of red ports ringed the top part. They had four arms, with two of them ending in a blaster of some type. They were fast and strong, and were probably the first line of defense. His heartbeat rose as he, Emily, and Seer approached the entrance. The android and robots faced them. This was make-or-break time. As the team passed through, he relaxed. Zasardi had come through. The room they entered was odd-looking in that it had structures similar to the CDC storage tank the Everenites had, but in twenty rows that stretched away from them. Past that was a series of horizontal rows that extended to the back of the room. Each structure, regardless of its orientation, was divided into segments, each with its own interface and input. Seer led them to the side, where a panel slid back, revealing a series of carts. We will need one for the interface. Got it. Drevel grabbed a cart and pushed it after Seer took off again. The cart had a variety of tools on top and a smorgasbord of wires extended out. Some of them reminded him of jumper cables. The walk down the side had given him a good idea of how large the station was. It made sense given that this was essentially a buffer area to the virtual world. After ten minutes, they reached the last row. Seer moved down to the third segment in, then flew down a bit and hovered off to the side. A panel slid open, exposing various connection ports. I can connect here. Drevel looked at the cart. So, how do we do this? We connect the cart's wires to the buffer input port on this structure, I will connect to the cart and the dimensional cube, then I can begin the transfer. That's it? asked Emily. We will be vulnerable for ten minutes, said Seer. Drevel puffed his cheeks. All right. I'm thinking one of us should monitor the entrance. It should be you, then, said Emily. I can use my nanobot cover to make it look like we're a structure jutting out from the one we're connected to, if need be. Works for me, said Drevel. He watched as Emily hooked up the cart to the structure under Seer's guidance. Seer connected to the cart. I have initiated the transfer. That's my sign to go, said Drevel. He walked back to the entrance. Thankfully, Seer had injected a dashboard of her transfer status. He saw why it would take ten minutes. The percent transferred was done in batches with some time between each. There must be a threshold she was observing. Drevel's blood chilled when he saw Lodux arguing with the android. Oh shit, Lodux. Here? asked Emily over comms. Yeah, seems the android isn't letting him in, he said. I'm gonna listen in. 
Lotux growled. I don't care if I'm not authenticated. There's terrorists in there. There are not, said the android in a calm voice. Only authorized personnel are inside. Then you've been hacked. The android stared at Lotox. No, that's not possible. I can sense them, said Lotox. How so? Lotox sighed. They have exotic energy that I can detect. You are mistaken. Exotic energy in organics does not exist. Lotox scowled. You're wrong and wasting my time. I'm going in, and there isn't anything you can do to stop me. He began to walk in. One of the robots stood in his way with two outstretched arms. Lotux grabbed the robot and tossed it at the others. You are in violation, said the android. Security is on its way. Hold your position. I've had enough of you, said Lotux. He punched the android, causing it to shatter. The other robots opened fire on Lotux, and he went to work on disabling them. Turrets fired on him, to no effect. Oh, we got a problem, said Drevel. Lotux is fighting his way in, and he can sense us. What do we do? asked Emily. Drevel furrowed his brow. I wouldn't suggest a fight with him. Since he can sense us, we can play search and find with him while Seer continues the transfer. He won't think a cart hooked up to a panel is anything out of the ordinary and will focus on us. Search and find? You mean hide and seek? Same thing. With both of us, we could have him running in circles. At least we're faster than him. Okay, I'll update Everin and the others. Drevel grimaced. This was a dangerous play. The last time Lodix had hit Emily, it was a fatal blow, and healing her had knocked Drevel out. He was not eager to repeat that, and Everin was too far away to help. I know you're here, said Lodux in the distance. Drevel took off. The one thing the station had going for it was that it was like a maze inside. Emily's mouth went dry when she heard Lodox had entered the station. She rubbed her chest, a painful reminder of what could happen if he connected with her. Thankfully, she was much faster than he was. The main thing was to keep Lodox distracted until the transfer was done. Thanks to the interconnectedness of the gang's communication network, she knew where Drevel was and could communicate without giving away her position. Lodox had entered and went to his right, per Drevel's view. He was already on the move and had Lodox chasing him. Emily figured she would provide a second front to alleviate any pressure on Drevel. She ran hard to the opposite end of a row and shot a stun beam at Lodox. I knew there were two of you said Lodox. I bet you're not so eager for a rematch, little girl. You got lucky, said Emily. Lotux charged. Uh-huh, let's find out if luck has anything to do with this. Emily waited until he was close. Then she popped into the next row over and dashed down it. Lotux rounded the corner and chased her. CC flew in and wrapped Lodox's legs, causing him to crash to the ground. Drevel slipped in and used his fist weapons to hit Lodox on the back of the head. Then CC reattached to Drevel and they flew away. Stop and fight me, said Lodox, standing up. Emily's blood chilled. Drevel's hit would disable most, but to Lodox it was a mere nuisance. His power was undeniable and only someone at Everin's level could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him. The fact that cosmic nanobots did not work on Lodox was a good indicator of his strength. How much longer do we need to distract him? she asked. Five minutes, said Seer. Emily grimaced and shot a sticky globule at Lodox's face. He growled as he tore the mass off, then wiped his hands on his sides. You're distracting me. Someone else must be uploading the CDCs. Uh-oh, said Emily. Yeah, said Drevel. Lodox went to the front and stared down the first row. He's doing a row-by-row -row check, said Emily. Well, thanks to how this place is set up, 
He'll need to walk down each row and check the gaps in the next row. Thankfully, this place has the structures vertical in the front half of the room, horizontal in the other, said Drevel. Emily's eyes narrowed. It would take time for Lodux to find Seer since she was in the back, but it sounded like he might be able to find her in four minutes. Emily went to where Seer was. I'm going to place a nanobot cover around you and the cart. It will look like an extension of the structure, she said. That will help, said Seer. Looks like ring security is here now too, said Drevel. Emily sighed. We don't want to get mixed in with them either. The Peekabot Swarm has most likely already given them our position, said Drevel. Besides, we're authenticated, remember? If we see them, just tell them Lodox is attacking. Okay, said Emily. She watched a squad of heavily armored officers rush into the station from Drevel's perspective. One of them ushered Drevel out after he told them Lodox was present. The authentication held in that the officers must have viewed Drevel as a technician. Although she wanted to go as well, she did not want to leave Seer behind. I'll hang here with Seer. Hopefully, Lodox will engage with the security force first and give us some time, she said. All right, said Drevel. I'm cloaked in a dark spot at the moment. There's a lot more security coming. Emily relaxed. Although she did not know where Lodox was exactly, help was on the way. They might not be able to slow down Lodox, but they would buy time. After five minutes, Seer said, The CTCs have been transferred. I'm moving the buffer now. It should only take 30 seconds. Emily grimaced. That's good, but I've just sensed Lodox. He's nearby. Take your nanobots from the cover and create a hole under him if he comes this way, said Seer. Emily pulled her nanobots back into her PSD. That's a great idea. May not need to use it if you complete the buffer transfer before he arrives. As if on cue, Lodox appeared at the end of the row. There you are. Ah, so this is where you're uploading the CDCs. Emily fired at the ground and created a long hole between her and Lodox. Lodox sneered. I see you're scared of me, as all terrorists should be. He moved over to the next row. Emily could sense that he was rushing down it and would pop up at the other end. I'm done, said Seer. She disengaged from the cart. Emily grabbed the dimensional cube. Lodix appeared at the other end and charged forward. A woman materialized from the Picabot swarm in front of him. Lodix paused. What is this? You. Ever a night, said the woman. She attacked him. A man appeared behind Lodix and grabbed him. You did this. Emily's eyes widened. It took her a second to realize these were the CDCs that the Everin Knights had captured. Now that they were in the virtual world, they could create Picobot bodies, similar to Tamesh and Hakesh of the Trinikins, and they were using any available Picobot swarm to do it without regard to any waiting list. Get off of me, said Lodox, punching the woman. Emily tilted her head. The punch had gone through, and the Picobot swarm just moved out of the way on the chest. More and more people began to appear. Emily used her grappling beam to go over the hole. Then she rushed to the entrance, where Drevel waited. Uh, looks like an angry party is wanting a piece of Lotux. Also hearing that other Everanite facilities are under attack now, he said. I didn't expect that, but I forgot the whole materializing a body thing, said Emily. She saw an Everanite unit that had come to support Lotux under assault. Ring security was trying to defuse everything, but the sheer number of people appearing was only limited by how much of the Picabot swarm was available. An explosion erupted from inside the station. Lodox is moving toward us, and I don't think he cares about Rose, said Drevel. Analysis. We are on our way, said V over comms. Seer has given us your location, and I have mapped a path to the nearest docking bay, Emily studied the five-mile trip. It was further away from the lift they had taken, but she was ready to get to the Torvata. Let's do this, she said. As they took off, she peeked back. Lodox had broken out and was being mobbed. He had no issue 
busting through Peekabot bodies, but they did slow him down. He also had to deal with ring security robots trying to subdue him. This would be a big political event for the Everanites, and Lodux's sheer determination was driving it. The trip to the docking bay intrigued her. The CDCs were taking bodies anywhere there was a Peekabot swarm to do so. Thankfully, it created a lot of confusion, so Ring Security would not wonder why she, Drevel, and Seer raced by. Although the situation bothered her, she saw several children had appeared. She had no idea why the Everanites would do that to them. On the way, they ran into Arbiter Chols. Emily figured she was on her way from the docking bay to assist Lodux. Per the data labels, her ability was that she could shoot energy blasts, similar to Draxus, a wild-born conduit from a previous adventure. Chols had fired a few at Emily and Drevel, but Emily had reflected the shots, and Cece had wrapped Chols' head, then dragged her down. Once he had flown back off, the materialized people pounced on her. When they reached the bay, Emily was all smiles. Everin, Sasrissa, V in body mode, and Dr. Snowden waited outside the Toravada. Emily and Drevel wasted no time in boarding the Toravada after a quick reunion with the others. They assembled in the command center. V, take us out, said Everin. Acknowledged. Emily slumped in her chair. That was interesting. Old Lotux, huh? asked Dr. Snowden. She waved a finger between her and Drevel. We didn't try to fight him. However, once Seer completed the transfer of the CDCs and the buffer, the CDCs began materializing everywhere. We saw that on the local news system, said Sasrissa. The Everanites on this planet are under attack Everywhere there's a Peekabot swarm to create a body. Drevel smirked. Well, we didn't plan on all that. Emily chuckled. It helped when Lodux charged me and Seer. I could have grappled away, and Seer would have just flown away, but the Everanites have more to focus on than us at the moment. Indeed, said Everin. Let us all take a break. Then we can meet in the conference room after dinner to plan our next steps. Works for me, said Emily. I'm just glad the gang is back together. Yeah, said Drevel, pointing a finger up from each hand. Emily smiled as she watched the Toravada exit the docking bay. They had uploaded the CDCs and fulfilled one of Sazrissa's goals. The next step was to take down the Everanites themselves. While this had been a good first step, she suspected the next one would be much harder. Whatever it took... Everin's name would be cleared, and the Everanites would be dismantled. Chapter 21 Frenev grimaced as he walked with his hands behind his back to a meeting. He had called the Arbiters at the Everanite headquarters together to discuss the next steps after the ring fiasco. The videos and updates from Arbiters Lotux, Tankrill and Scranlan had been infuriating. Arbiter Chols had also been killed by an angry mob of materialized CDCs. Sasrissa and her terrorist friends were causing too much chaos. He already had to talk with planet leaders where the Everanites had a presence. Just one incident like this had caused them to fear repercussions from the Chelatan Empire, which was now investigating. The Everanites did not need that level of scrutiny. He had formulated the group's next steps, and the arbiters he was meeting with were a sort of council. Although they all reported to him, they were usually a good sounding board, and they carried out whatever plan he put into motion. He hoped this meeting would never come, but Everin and his friends could no longer be ignored. Frenev entered the meeting chamber and took his seat at the head of a massive U-shaped table. Ten arbiters were in attendance, and their unique abilities made them powerful. He was secure in the knowledge that any assault on the headquarters would end in defeat with just this group. One arbiter was fast, another could teleport, and yet another could make others run in fear. He took a moment to compose himself, then raised his head. After a pause, he said, This will be a short meeting. 
But here's the situation. Our CDC storage facility, protected by the Amash Wallow, was breached, and the CDCs were stolen. An Everin imposter, along with his team and the terrorist Sazarissa Mortaka, took them to the ring and uploaded them into a virtual world maintenance station. As you might guess, the CDCs materialized in Peekabot bodies and are making claims, in addition to assaulting Everonites everywhere on Karstinator. What's the next step? asked Arbiter Ginsley. Frenev sighed. I'm ordering an evacuation of Karstinator. I want all Everonite resources off that planet as fast as possible. Arbiter Rodengaz narrowed her eyes. We've invested a lot there. Shouldn't we fight the charges leveled at us? Unfortunately, no, said Frenev. Some of the CDCs were of those who wielded power before on Karstinator. They've already connected with the current government and powerful friends, and they're now discussing how to remove us. I'd rather we leave on our own terms than under a messy legal and political battle that we won't win. The public sentiment is against us, and now it will be even more so. The evacuation will take some time, Frenev growled, I know. But it needs to be done. Our problems aren't limited to just Karstinator. The Chelenton Empire is sending judicators to investigate. They're going to find our illegal activity from their perspective. That will impact our presence on other worlds. Arbiter Hildo Grata frowned. What happens if the Chelentons designates us as a threat? Or even worse, a non-allowable entity? We'd have to disband or face incarceration. I'm not sure yet, said Frenev. We've been working on our second location, Takariv, and while that planet is large, it's not built up yet. However, it's outside the Chelatin Empire. As a precaution, I'm having our headquarters moved there. He hated that it was a sign of admitting defeat, but as powerful as the Everonites were, they were severely outnumbered and would lose in a fight with the Chelatin Empire. We'll lose access to recruiting grounds, said Ginsley. Frenev scowled. It's that... Or prepare for a war we'll lose. What does Everin say about this? Who do you think suggested the move? The room fell silent. Rodengaz rubbed her chin. What's being done for Sazrissa Mortaka and the Everin imposter and his team? They've done their damage, said Frenev. I've put out some bounties on them and sent several assassin squads out. Lotox usually handles that. Frenev grimaced. He's failed twice. In addition to that, Arbiters Scranlan and Tankrill were also sidelined. Arbiter Trolls was killed. I've already ordered all Arbiters off Karstinator. That's hard to imagine, said Hildo Grata. Frenev didn't want to reveal too many details. Lodox's shaken belief was not something Frenev wanted to encourage. He had already told the Arbiters on the planet to downplay the incident to other Arbiters since he knew they talked. It is what it is. I've prepared a list of items that need to be worked on. You all can figure out how to accomplish it. Ginsley, you have lead on getting these implemented. For the rest of you, I expect you to work hard. Our future is at stake. Ginsley raised his head. It will be done. Frenev leaned forward. There will be some rough times ahead. 
our character will be called into question, and our facilities and organization will be attacked. We can weather this and still remain strong. Everyone nodded at him. Keep me updated, he said, standing. After a final look, he exited the chambers. It aided him that they had to flee, but there was no other choice. There would be many of the rank and file that would be stranded, but the communication network would still be operational so they could get their daily propaganda. Even that could be at risk if Sazarissa and her terrorist friends decided to attack it. A worst-case scenario was that the leadership and structure retreated to Takariv with no effective way to reach the millions of rank-and-file members still in the Chelatan Empire. He doubted many would want to move, but they would become persecuted if the Everonites were considered a non-allowable entity. He was beginning to believe that he dealt with another incarnation of Everin. That would be the only way Sasrissa could be doing this. She had been operating by herself and on the verge of capture until Everin had appeared. Even if it was him, Frenev could not allow him to exist. Too much power was at stake, and he was not giving that up. Dr. Snowden yawned as he stared at the ceiling. His PSD alarm beeped at him. A good nap had been just what he had needed. The morning had started with them on the lower levels of Chancata, but now the gang had the Torvada back. He had to set an alarm because he knew he would sleep way past dinner time and miss the meeting. His stomach churned a bit, but probably because he was hungry. It was 5.30 p.m., and Everin had called for a 6 o'clock p.m. meeting. That left 30 minutes to have dinner and chat with the others. Being able to eat without worry of the Torvada missing would be a good feeling. He always got nervous when the Torvada was gone. It was his safe haven. He got cleaned up, then went to the conference room. Emily was already there and was chowing down on some chicken fried steak. Drevel munched on nachos with bacon. Seer sat next to him. Sasrissa had a plate of vegetables with a meat cube of some type. Dr. Snowden went to the matter replicator and got himself beef stew, then joined the others. He wanted something that was easy on the stomach. No burger? asked Emily. He shrugged. Stomach is a little upset. This usually calms it down some. Drevel munched on a chip. I hear you. Lot of action today. Dr. Snowden took a bite of his stew, then glanced at Drevel and Emily. I heard you two were playing hide-and-seek with Lotux. Sure was, said Emily, smiling. Seer raised her head. I mostly just did the transfer while they played. Drevel and Emily laughed. We got Scranlan and Tankrill, and that shielding thing is no joke, said Dr. Snowden. Sasrissen nodded. Tankrill and Lotux together would be unstoppable. Thankfully, we had a Toravata. Dr. Snowden looked around. Speaking of which, where are Everin and V? They were in the research lab last I checked, said Sasrissa. Ah. He continued downing his stew. It went down easy, and he was already beginning to feel better. After ten minutes, Everin and V entered the room and took their seats. Everin studied the table. We have five minutes before the meeting but can wait longer if you wish to finish dinner. Emily eyed him. We can do both. Everyone else nodded. Very well, said Everin. With the illegal CDCs taken from the Everinites and now deployed to the virtual world on Karstinator, we have completed one of Sazrissa's goals. The next step will be to take down the Everinite leadership by disabling the Everinites' communication network but only after we broadcast Frenev confessing to his crimes. To that end, I think we need to talk with Highstar of the TD again. Might be helpful to scan one of the communication centers, too, said Sasrissa. I wouldn't suggest that with any ship, but with the Toravada, it should be able to get inside the shielding. How so? asked Drevel. Dr. Snowden smiled. Travel to the exact spot where we need to be. 
but in the past, then jump forward to the present. Wow, that's really good, said Drevel. We could get some deep information. Analysis. If all the communication stations are the same, we would only need to do one. Seer glanced at him. Efficient. We can do that, said Everin. I wanted to talk with Highstar in regard to the communication aspects outside the stations. I know the Everinites use an encrypted channel that their special implants can use. I would like to send something prior to our disabling the stations, so we will need to understand how to do that. Sesrissa faced him. We'll still need to get Frenev to confess. Then there's the issue with the Arbiters. They aren't going to take any of this sitting down. Why not use the wild-born energy, Sapper? Everyone focused on her. Oh. You haven't gotten that yet. It seems we do, said Everin. A trip to see Jelton is in order. Emily's face lit up. Oh, I like this part of the plan. Dr. Snowden chuckled. You would. I've only heard of Jelton, so this will be new to me, said Sasrissa. You haven't met him with the other Everins? asked Emily. Sasrissa paused. I can't say. I shouldn't have said anything. Dr. Snowden's eyes narrowed. If Sasrissa had not met the Rift Guardians, then that might mean future Everins did not contact them when Sasrissa was present. It could also be that this discussion was the reason why. Another possibility was that she had met them, but used misdirection. It must be difficult to talk when everything you said could be taken out of context. It is okay, said Everin. We will get a wild-born energy sapper from the Rift Guardians. That should make the Arbiters normal again. Drevel raised a chip and wiggled it. That's fine and all, but how are you going to get old Frenev to confess? He will capture me. The room went silent. What? asked Emily. Everin half smiled. I will talk to Frenev in person and get him to confess. His testimony will be what is sent via the Everinite network before it is disabled. He glanced at Sazrissa. That should be enough to get the Everinites declared a non-allowable entity, and it will ideally have non-leadership Everinites choosing a different path to walk. It would also be an opportunity to verify my original guidelines, with maybe an extra one or two. While I like the outcome, it's the capturing thing that bothers me, said Sasrissa. You know he'll only tell you anything if he's sure you're not leaving the room. Emily grimaced. I bet the room will probably be protected from any outgoing transmission, too. It will most likely be, said Everin. That is why, when a signal is given, you all melt through the building in the Torvada. I will relay my conversation with Frenev somehow. Then the communication centers can be disabled. Emily played with her ponytail. How will you send a signal if transmissions are being blocked? As I can talk with energy beings, I can remain in communication with the Torvada. They cannot block that. Got it, said Emily. You know there will be arbiters nearby, too, said Dr. Snowden. That is expected, said Everin. The idea is for them to come in and fight. Then we sap them. Drevel grinned big. I love the boldness of this plan. There's a lot of things that could go the other way, but this plan involves human nature. Frenev will spill it all because he's an egomaniac. That is the idea, said Everin. We will visit Histar of the TD first, then scan a communication center, then visit Jelton. Once we have everything in place, we will enact the final part, where I surrender to Frenev and everyone else stands by in the Torvada outside wherever I end up speaking to him. Dr. Snowden puffed his cheek. Lot of research but I prefer this over fighting dimensional monsters. Everin raised a finger. The final fight to sap the arbiters of their wild-born energy will not be easy. Lotux will need to go down first. 
than the others. Some, like Tankrill, will require unique tactics due to their abilities. We will go over our plan in more detail when we reach that point. Dr. Snowden did not like the idea of Everin being captured, but getting someone to boast, especially a narcissist, was a good one. Everin would need to play the part of a captured enemy and downplay his abilities. Dr. Snowden grinned as he imagined Freneve's face when the Torvado would arrive. Even if there were Arbiters, they too would get a surprise. Chapter 22 Sassrissa smiled as she stepped off the Torvada with the others in the TD's docking bay. It was 7.30 p.m. Earth time, roughly an hour after dinner. She liked Everin's plan, but as Drevel had mentioned, there were a lot of potential failure points. The goal, then, would be to gather as much information as possible to reduce the chance of something going wrong. This visit to Histar and the TD would further that goal. Histar approached them with a big grin on her red face. Sassrissa suspected she had learned of the illegal CDCs being freed and the conundrum that the Everonites now found themselves in. Everon greeted Histar. It is good to see you again. Always a pleasure here, she said. You actually liberated the CDCs. Everon gestured at the gang. We all did and it was not easy. Yeah, arbiters are no joke, said Dr. Snowden. Especially Lodox, said Emily. Histar frowned. He's responsible for several TD deaths. He caught one of our units when they tried to infiltrate a storage compound, and he did not let any of them live. Just stepped on their heads. I am sorry to hear that, said Everin. Do you have any information on how the Everinites are handling this? We know the broad strokes, said Drevel. Histar nodded. I do. She waved forward. Let's discuss. Follow me. Sassrissa chuckled as other TD in the bay raised their arms and cheered when the group passed. If anyone had been uncertain of Everin's authenticity, that had passed. The release of the CDCs had given the gang credibility. After fifteen minutes, they entered the meeting room and took their seats around the raised platform. His star sat opposite the others. Shall we begin? she asked. Please do, said Everin. His star pulled up several holograms showing chaos in various places. The Everinites are reeling on Karstinitor. They've ordered an evacuation, but the Everonites who can't leave are being hunted by vengeful, materialized CDCs. There were some influential CDCs released, and they have begun consolidating their power base. Our informants have said the Everonites are planning to move to a planet outside the Chelatan Empire in anticipation of being labeled a non-allowable entity. Wow, we really set them back said Dr. Snowden, and we are thankful. Actually, the CDCs you freed are more so. They know it was your group that rescued them. The Trinicans have seen a huge increase in visitors as of late. Emily faced Everin. You may have made yourself more popular. Let us hope not. Everin dipped his head toward his star. With the CDCs now free, we move on to the next part of our plan. We discussed it some at a general level before, but now we are diving into specifics. It requires detailed knowledge of how Everinite communication centers function in relation to the neural implant all Everinites have. As you may recall, the high-level idea is that I will surrender myself and get a transmission of Frenev confessing to his crimes. Then the others will come and deal with the Arbiters. After that, we will send Frenev's confession to all Everonites, then shut down the communication centers. I love the plan, except for the surrendering part, said Histar. They could kill you before any confession. Everin half smiled. I rely on Frenev's weakness as a narcissist. 
Histar bobbed her head. Yeah, I can see that. He'll want you to know he's won. Then rub it in your face. He's petty like that and doubles down when proved wrong on something. She interacted with the table console. Sasrissa studied the diamond-shaped communication center on the left and the cutout of a human head with an implant on the right. She was aware that the Everonites had a special connection with their implants, but was not sure of the specifics. Histar pointed at the projection. The neural implants that all Everonites have includes a hardware component that assists in encryption. We haven't been able to crack it, but suspect there is a biological aspect to it. Their implant is paired to the communication centers, meaning nothing can override that connection. If the centers go down, they will have to use public channels to get information. However, the only ways to send a message from a communication center are to physically go to one and do it, or send it from the Everonite headquarters. I don't see how you could get to either easily. We could use time travel to get to a communication center, said Emily. She moved her finger back and forth. Pop back in time to its current position, then jump forward. That would put us inside the shielding. His star's eyes widened. That's a unique approach. Then again, you have the Toavata. You would still need to board, and they've got a lot of automated defense systems. It's also said they have a variety of specialized robots there, but... If you get past all that, you'd be in a position to send whatever you want, although I suspect they'd just blow the station if it got to that point. Everin rubbed his chin. Although the destruction of the five stations would cut off communication, the final transmission needs to be sent. I think it may be easier to send the message from the Everonite headquarters after we defeat the Everonites, get Freneve's confession, and sap all the Arbiters. We can then transmit. He faced his star. What is known of how the Everonites send communications? Not much, other than that Frenev is the only one who can send them. It's said there is a biological scan required in a special room, said his star. She frowned. We don't know where that room is, though. Drevel chuckled. I bet a few deep scans can find it. Afterward, maybe we destroy the communications center's condensed space portions. That will leave the stations intact, just isolated, and they don't blow up. Then the Chelatan Empire can deal with them, and the security AIs can leave if they wish. I like that, said Seer. Sasrissa saw Drevel's soft spot for AIs. The security ones on the communication centers probably would not like to be blown up. She had heard of systems AIs moving to virtual planets or even taking on a peekabop body to live somewhere. This way, they would have a chance. But they would need to be shown that Frenev would not be contacting them anymore. We can destroy Frenev's special room afterward, she said. Everin nodded. That will essentially disable the communication network at least for the secured communication that he could send to all Everonites. I believe we have a plan. So which step do we do first? Asked Dr. Snowden. We can scan the Everonite headquarters first, said Everin. After that, we will visit Jelton and get the Wildborn Energy Sapper. Once that is done, we will create a situation where I am captured and you all flee to the Toravata. Dr. Snowden gestured at Sazrissa. You know, as we are going to be play-acting, we could frame it as Sazrissa leaving you behind. She eyed him. Although you know I would never abandon Everin, that might just work. They already know my reputation. We could drop in and attack their headquarters in a spot with heavy defense. Then Everin separates, and we leave with the Toravata. Everin is then captured, and he could play up the betrayal card. It would feed right into Frenev's narcissism, showing that his way is better, and he now has something to point to as being proof, at least in his head, that I'm a terrorist. Everin studied her. That could work. You will need to sell your betrayal. 
I can do it, said Cesarissa. The scan will help us determine a spot to play it out. Maybe I could help sell it too, said Emily. She crooked a thumb at Everin. He doesn't show emotion that well, but I could be outraged. Drevel's eyes narrowed. You think Frenev would escort you both to talk in private to confess? Emily shrugged. That or he puts us in a cell someplace. It could be dangerous, said Everin. She laughed. When is anything we do not? Besides, I can play it out so that he wants me to see he's better. Make it so he believes that I have some effect on you to listen to him. We should practice some scenarios. Works for me. Dr. Snowden sighed. Don't forget, we still have that fight to sap the Arbiters. That's not going to be a walk in the park. Perhaps not. But we know their abilities. We can prepare for that, said Everin. Drevel clapped, causing Histar to jump. Love this plan. It has a mix of subterfuge and fighting. Lot of unknowns, but a high payoff. Histar glanced at him. It's a risky plan. But if it's pulled off, the Everonites will become a non-allowable entity. The TD can then enact some plans to assist those who are now lost. Of course, it would help if it was us who broadcast some wise words from you. Then it will be done, said Everin. However, I hope I do not need to come back in two hundred years. Histar smiled. That's not the Trinican way. We guide, not dominate. Then my legacy will be in good hands. He motioned at the others. Let us scan the Everinite headquarters. Sassrus's heart glowed. Everin was tender with Histar, and although Sassrissa did not know how this would all play out in the end, she trusted the TD far more than the Everinites. If Everin lent credence to the Trinicans in general, they would be seen as the keepers of his legacy. The fallout for the average Everinite would be interesting to see. Drevel sat up in his chair as the Everinite's headquarters came into view. It was 9 o'clock p.m., and although he would normally be getting tired, he was wired. The plan laid out was an excellent, tactical one, although it had its risks. A part of it relied on Frenev's narcissism, but Everin would need to goad him. Drevel would get to see what was said afterward. The command area in the Torvado was chatty, and even Seer was active. The meeting with Histar appeared to have made everyone more comfortable with the next steps. The headquarters scan was important, and he suspected Emily's excitement was related to the next step, where they went to her boyfriend's place. It would be interesting to meet another cosmic being outside the ones he had already met. He focused back on the headquarters. It had a bubble shield over the area, so Everin had gone to get something called a planner beam generator. The idea was for it to open a hole in the shielding for the Toravata to fly through. This seemed like a natural operation to the others, but the idea of a weapon like that intrigued him. When Everin was in position a few minutes later, a beam created a perfect circular hole, and the Toravata flew through. Everin returned to his seat as the Toravata began scanning. Drevel wondered what the Everinite response would be. They would just see a beam open a hole in their shields and nothing else. Several drones had gone to investigate, but they would not detect the Toravata. If there had been a Picobot swarm, it could have detected the Toravata as it moved through, but no Picobots had been alerted. A large, four-story, round, smoky white building sat in the center, with arms that reached out to the shielding's edge. It reminded him of a starfish. This created big courtyards between each arm, but a thick wall encircled the whole place. Each courtyard had an entry point that had a portion inside and outside the wall. It reminded him of a staple that stood on its edges. The arms also had stretches of windows which were lit up from the reflection from the shield. It was a nice aesthetic, but there was no doubt that the design was done with defense in mind. An underground facility had been detected, and it had tunnels that went past the shielding. He suspected those were escape routes. 
What surprised him was that the shielding extended down enough to cover the tunnels, so going in that way would be a dead end for most. He examined one of the courtyard entrances as the Torvata passed by. A Picabot swarm had been detected inside the entry point interior, and there were several heavy robots that stood guard. They wielded an impressive arsenal. Spherical drones with forearms patrolled the air. They were the size of dogs and appeared to have built-in blasters on them. Everanite personnel populated the busy area, and despite the heavy security, it resembled a normal workday he would see in any city. There were tables set up near the main building with employees sitting outside and having a good time. Although it was getting dark, the Everanites had no problem with that. Lot of security, as expected, said Dr. Snowden. Emily pointed at one of the courtyards. Yeah, and that one seems to have a lot more traffic. I bet that's the main entrance, although it's hard to tell. Everin nodded. We will definitely land in one of the courtyards. There will be no need to go inside, but once we are, the Torvata can track us. One advantage we have is that we can strike first and disable heavier targets, such as the big robots on standby. There are also pop-up turrets embedded near the roof of the main building. When they appear, they can be neutralized, leaving us to handle whatever force arrives to fight us. We can do this, said Sasrissa. I'll feel a lot better once we're past the Frenev confession part. I'm still worried that he'll catch on and not say anything. Everin raised a finger. Even if he does not, we will still seize control of the communication room. His confession is ideal, but I can also send a message of my own. As it is coming from a trusted communication source, that may be enough. Dr. Snowden chuckled. Let's hope Frenev is chatty, then. I concur. The Torvato will continue to scan. Feel free to enjoy the rest of the night as you wish, and let us plan for going to Jelton's in the morning. Emily hopped up. No problem there. I'm going to get a late workout in. Sasrissa stood. I'll join you. Yeah, I'll be in the planner cartography lab, said Dr. Snowden, rising. I'm just going to chill here for a bit, said Drevel. He pointed at Emily and Sasrissa. Might swing by later to dazzle you ladies with some moves. Emily swatted his arm as she left. Yeah, right. We'll be there. Drevel noted the silence after it was just Everin, V, Seer, and himself. He could see why everyone had left. The scanning part was tedious, but he suspected Everin wanted to monitor for patterns. I guess it's just us, said Drevel. Indeed, said Everin. Drevel furrowed his brow. I've enjoyed traveling with you and the others, and your presence has been appreciated. I realize this is very different from the types of summonses you do. Drevel chuckled. <laughs> yeah, I'd agree with that. This Torvata form is powerful, and being able to take it out in the field, that's just crazy. Everin half smiled. It can be for sure. Drevel eased back into his chair. I remember the first time I learned of other timelines. It was such an eye-opening experience. Oh, and I got to meet Seer. She eyed him. He grinned. But now finding out that I'm part of a bigger picture, it's awesome. I love it. Everin gestured at Seer. I am surprised to learn that the Torvada created you. I, too, have seen more of the big picture. I am glad to have been created, said Seer. Someone needed to keep Drevel in line. Oh, I see how it is, said Drevel. Analysis. It is similar to how I keep Everin in line. Drevel laughed. The feeling of camaraderie with the likes of Everin and V and the others was something Drevel had been missing. While he considered Seer his best friend, it was different with a full team. To casually kick back and joke with other cosmic beings went beyond anything he had expected. It put into perspective his role in the cosmos. 
If it was up to him, he would travel again with the gang. However, with Sazrissa joining him, it seemed like the Torvada had an ulterior motive. What that was remained a mystery, one he could not wait to unravel at some point. For now, he would soak in as much as he could. Chapter 23 Emily's heartbeat accelerated as the Torvada approached the Rift Guardian's headquarters in a dimension at the end of another timeline. She had visited recently and still could not get enough of seeing Jelton. When she had come home last time, she had heard Dr. Snowden had enlisted Dalton Kingston on a small case. Although she wished she had gone, she had been living it up with Jelton, and now she was back again. It was 10 o'clock a.m., and she had slept well. The scanning had gone on all night, and per the quick meeting in the conference room where everyone had breakfast, they had scanned the surrounding area as well. Everin had selected a spot for their fake fight later, and a lot of thought had been put into how to prepare for it. It was hard to contain her excitement. She had caught Drevel, Seer and Sasrissa looking over inquisitively, but Emily was okay with that. It was not often that the gang visited Jelton during a summons, but she would gladly accept it whenever it happened. The familiar large rock floating in space with a massive green crystal above it loomed ahead. It gave off a green glow to everything, and Emily found it to be beautiful against the pitch black that surrounded them. Although this was the headquarters for the Rift Guardians, they had many colonies and outposts in the dimension, and as of late, a colony in the main timeline their dimension existed in. The Torvada landed. Dr. Snowden raised a finger. Don't get in Emily's way! Emily hopped up and gave him a look, then blazed out of the room. She smiled big when she saw Jelton and Galden Cull, Supreme Leader of the Rift Guardians. After a quick kiss and hug for Jelton, she hugged Galden, then shook hands with Brayach Cutherstone, Jelton's second in command. He had gray skin, like all Riven, and wore a similar black mesh suit with dimly lit blue pads on top, giving off a cracked pattern. That was typical of most Rift Guardians. She had gotten to know Brayach on previous visits. The rest of the gang caught up to Emily. She wrinkled her brow when she sensed Sazrissa's cosmic energy fluctuate. Seeing the Rift Guardians must have triggered something in her. Despite that, her outward appearance was one of calm, but if Emily had detected the spike, she was sure the others had as well. Back so soon? asked Galden, shaking everyone's hands. Unfortunately so, said Everin. Emily had observed Sasris's energy fluctuate the most when she had shaken Galden's hand. There was a connection between the two, but Emily did not know what it was or how deep it went. Jelton greeted everyone. You're always welcome here. Brayach Cutherstone, my second in command, is with us and is clear to know all that I do. I see you have new friends as well. From another universe again. Drevel tilted his head. Again? Everin half smiled. Sazrissa Mortaka is from our timeline and has met my future forms. Drevel's age, seer, and Drevel's sentient cloth, CC, travel through parallel timelines to other Earths and, yes, they have been to your timeline. Fascinating, said Jelton. He studied Drevel and seer, that's how I met the gang, getting stuck on a parallel earth. Seer pointed at Drevel. He usually gets stuck there, too. The group laughed. Jelton nodded. Know that any friend of Everin's is a friend of the Rift Guardians. I sense the cosmic energy in both of you. His gaze lingered on Sazerissa for a moment. Then he eyed Drevel. You have an additional energy I'm not familiar with. Alcarin energy, said Drevel, allows me to heal myself and others. Very useful. Jelton rubbed his chin. 
You and Sazrissa have a lot more cosmic energy than me, Dr. Snowden, and Emily. Sazrissa smiled. Drevel and I were both chosen by the Torvata. Well, he was chosen by his. Another Torvata? asked Galden. That's new. Seer raised her hand and projected an image of the portal to it. It is a pocket dimension that can open to parallel Earths. It also created me. Jelton examined her. You're a Torvata AI. I am. Galden glanced at Brayhatch. Fantastic is the norm most of the time. It would seem so, he said. Jelton looked at Sazrissa. And you've met future Everins. I have, she said. Obviously, I can't say much. Galden raised his head. I hope the Rift Guardians were around to assist them. I can't say, she said. However, I do know of the Rift Guardians, and yes, I've heard of or met you all in your future, my past. Galden chuckled. <laughs> Time travel. We're part of a loop and didn't even know it. He glanced at Everin. So, to what do we owe this honor? Everin raised a finger. We need to create a wild-born energy sapper, similar to the cosmic one used on Wardax. Wild-born? asked Jelton. What type of threat are you facing? Apparently there's a cult of Everin that call themselves the Everinites, and their leaders are wildborns. They got that energy from something, and we plan to take it away, said Dr. Snowden. Galden rubbed his chin. I see. To the Prison Planet Processing Center, then. Prison Planet? asked Drevel. Jelton slapped him on the back. It's not as bad as it sounds, my friend. Indeed, said Everin. Let us go. Emily looped her arm through Jelton's as they walked to the Torvata. Everything felt right in the presence of Jelton, Galden, and Brayach, and it made everything seem like it would be okay. Drevel had been studying the Rift Guardians, but Sazrissa acted like she knew something more than she was saying, something that she had done most of her time with the gang. Her references to them implied that future Everins did not visit often. What could cause that remained a mystery, one Emily knew she would probably never know. Everyone assembled in the Torvata. Emily liked these brief moments when friends from the past met the current gang, Jelton, Galden, and Brayach already got along with Drevel and Sazrissa, but Emily had never doubted that they would. It annoyed Jelton that they could not assist Everin more. The Rift Guardians viewed Everin as a god in a powerful, mortal shell. She had also learned that, as with the Everinites, some phrases were being adopted, including the Snowden family creed of learn, adapt, evolve. The Torvada landed at the processing plant on the prison planet after a bit. Everyone exited and made their way inside. V carried the individual parts of a replica of the cosmic energy sapper used from a previous adventure. It was essentially a container that would be used to contain wild-born energy, which was surrounded by a nanoswarm and a golden spherical orb to house it all. The nanoswarm would stretch out of a tiny hole on the orb's surface, and anything it touched would get drained of the exotic energy the sapper was configured for. Emily was glad that Everin had kept the cosmic energy sapper instead of destroying it. Given what they had faced in the past, it would be good to have on hand. It made sense to her to make one for every type, or maybe a generic one for any exotic energy, but Everin preferred to create it only if needed. His reasoning had been that in the wrong hands, it could be dangerous. She shuddered to think of someone like Frenev with the ability to take away exotic energies. Drevel pointed out, I saw there were sectioned off areas, bounded by what looked like force fields. Are those the prison cells? Indeed they are, my friend, said Jelton. We feel it gives the prisoner room to roam 
and they can earn access to other things based on behavior, such as interaction with others or more options on the matter replicators. I like that, said Drevel. It's a very generous treatment. Do prisoners ever change, then leave? Gowden wagged a finger. Around 15% as of late, and they really have to earn it. Even then, they are released somewhere where they won't cause a lot of harm, and they know we check in on them. Brayach smiled. We have a specialized unit that does just that. Interesting, said Drevel. They reached the processing plant. Emily loved watching Drevel. Cesarissa and Seer react to everything they were seeing and hearing. Drevel was like a kid in a candy store as he soaked it all in. Cesarissa acted as if she already knew where to go. Seer also spent some time scanning everything. Emily wondered what she thought of meeting Jelton, Galden, and Brayach. After twenty minutes, the group reached the back of a large research lab. Emily remembered visiting the place when they had needed to make the cosmic energy sapper. She suspected this would be the same process, but with a wild-born energy configuration. A technician had already lined up couches that encircled the raised, shielded circular platform. That made it easy for the rest of the team to watch the process. Jelton pointed at a side room. We've anticipated you might need more siphoning crystals. So we made them and placed them in storage. Dr. Snowden adjusted his glasses. Oh, that brings up a question. Why not make multiple sappers? Maybe make them smaller. You believe they might be destroyed or knocked away like the cosmic sapper used against Wardax, said Everin. He studied the ground for a moment, then faced Jelton. That sounds like a wise strategy. Perhaps we can make five of these. The energy container will be smaller, but the siphoning crystal for each should still work. The wildborn we are after do not have the same power level as Wardax. Jelton motioned at the matter replicator. You can make more energy containers there. Analysis. They are special ones that only the Toravada can produce. Everin gestured at V. Create five and bring them here. Acknowledged. Brayhatch. Assist him, said Jelton. Of course, he said, following V out of the room. Everin followed Jelton into the side room and, a moment later, exited with five green crystals with tendrils. They placed them on the table. Everin stayed inside the platform while Jelton took a seat along with everyone else on the surrounding couches. Emily made sure to sit next to Jelton in case she wanted to snuggle. Dr. Snowden sat with Sazrissa on one couch, and Drevel was with Galden. Seer stood near the platform and gazed in. Multiple approaches for sapping. Divide and conquer. A strategy I like, said Galden. He nodded at Dr. Snowden. Good idea. Let's just say we have experience with the sapper being batted away, he said. Galden furrowed his brow. I never saw what you did with the cosmic energy sapper. I assume you have a visual feed? Oh yeah, said Emily. We can watch some of it while the wildborn sappers are being built. So we just sit back and watch the show? Well, I guess there'll be two shows, asked Drevel. Dr. Snowden chuckled. Yep, the sapper thing will take a while, unless doing the wild-born energy configuration takes longer. But as you mentioned, we can watch what happened with Wardax and the cosmic sapper as well. I hope we got popcorn, said Drevel. Jelton glanced over at him. We have a matter replicator if you are hungry or thirsty. I was kidding, but I may take you up on that. Sasrissa examined the environment. I've been here before. Look the same? asked Galden. For the most part. Galden laughed, shaking the couch. It must be maddening to know the future, but have to watch everything you say. She smiled. Definitely. Emily intertwined her arm with Jelton's and leaned into him. She loved this casual atmosphere. 
Dr. Snowden had already set his PSD on a nearby table between the couches and projected the team's encounter with Wardax. He was animated as he went over it. She did not care to remember it, but this was a relatively quiet moment. The upcoming steps would be hard, and a lot of things could go wrong. For now, she would relish this rare event. Sasrissa took a break after three hours. Everin, V, and Seer moved as if they were one when attaching a siphoning crystal to an energy container. They also manipulated the swarm a bit to assist. It took very precise movements to do it all, which was nothing for the three involved. Sasrissa was now on a balcony high up in the processing plant. She had wanted some fresh air, and the view over the landscape allowed her to see the distant force fields of prison cells. She always liked the way the Rift Guardians handled the prisoners, but also understood not many had a planet to spare for that. Her heartbeat accelerated when Galden joined her. I always liked this view, he said. It's a good one, she said. Wanted to get out for a bit too, I guess. Yeah. Galden chuckled. You're not missing much. Emily and Jelton have wandered off, and Dr. Snowden and Drevel are obsessed with trying out different flavors of popcorn. Apparently, Drevel knows some flavors Dr. Snowden has never heard of. So they're investigating that. Brayatch is absorbing everything. He's still new to all this, and Everin, V, and Seer are still busy on the platform. Sasrissa laughed. It seemed like such a normal thing for Dr. Snowden and Drevel to compare flavored popcorn. She loved Drevel's indulgence in anything that appeared fun or had someone else's curiosity. Dr. Snowden wanting to investigate something like flavored popcorn was also up his alley. It was odd to see Brayach as a new person and second in command for an Everin visit. She knew him well. Galden examined her. I've noticed that you seem uneasy here at times. She sighed. I can't really say why. You've been here before, so I'm guessing your experience then was very different than now. I'm just... It's different. Galden looked out. I understand. I assume you came here often with Everin. Well, a future one. Several times said Sasrissa. It's hard to see something in the past when you know the future. She faced him. Imagine you learned of a great event in your history. Then you time-traveled to right before, when everyone is excited to be there. So something changes in that event, and the future is rougher, he said. Sasrissa gazed out. There's a point in time where I first meet Everin. But by then, he's been through several forms and seemingly knows me very well. She pointed at Galden. As you meet me in the future, you'll know me more and I'll know you less. Galden rubbed his chin. Intriguing. So at this point, you know me quite well. I do, she said. She could not let on how deep their relationship went, but like Everin, she was happy to see Galden in any time frame. There would be a time where it would be the reverse, and he would know he could not say anything. And you're seeing it at a time when everyone is relatively happy, said Galden. I assume the future Everins have a different group with them. She looked down. Yeah. Although she wished she could tell him of the future, it was not her place to do so. Maintaining timeline integrity also covered personal timelines. He would remember this talk and reference it in future meetings, but she would not know at the time what he referred to. When we next meet, you'll dance around and do backflips, she said. Galden stared at her. She cracked up while he exhaled. Well, I'm glad you're not serious, he said. Things can change she said, smiling. He eyed her. While you're uneasy here in general, I'm glad you're at ease with me. It's like we're old friends. 
She swallowed hard as she laid a hand on his shoulder. You're one of the few who are genuinely good. I've seen what's out there, and very few measure up to you, and Brayach too. Oh, well, that's good to hear, said Galden. He examined her. I notice you didn't say Jelton's name. She cleared her throat. And him too. I get the feeling you don't get to know Jelton. Sassrissa grimaced. She had only heard stories of Jelton and watched video feeds. While she could claim to know of him, she did not truly know him like she did Galden and Brayach, especially Galden. He grinned. Another secret to keep, I take it. It's all right. I'm curious, though. These future Everens, are they very different from this one? Well, I can say they show more emotions, she said. Like Siverin. She nodded. A bit more than that, but they're all Everin. That is amazing to me, said Galden. You know that we revere Everin as a god. Everything around us is from his partner, and he graces us with his mortal shell. For that we are honored. And he has a special place in his thoughts for you and the Rift Guardians, said Sazerissa. Galden raised his head. I'm glad he thinks highly of us. It means a lot. There would be challenging times ahead for the Rift Guardians, and Galden and Brayach would be there to lead with strength. Everin had a soft spot for the Rift Guardians, and although the first form would never violate timeline integrity for his friends, that would not be uncommon for later versions. It could be due to resolving the main reason for coming to the plane in the first place, to find the Hawkscurus's ancestors and participate in their emergence while keeping the timeline that led to that event stable. Galden paused, then faced her. Looks like they're almost done per branch. Those sappers are incredibly powerful. The Cosmic One took down Wardax, and that fight ended in Lord Vigon's death. I suspect with five sappers, and smaller in size, we'll be able to spread out more when we face the Arbiters, said Sazrissa. The Rift Guardians are always available to assist. We could just storm the place. Sazrissa eyed him. Galden belly laughed. Yeah, as if Everin would allow that. I understand his reasoning. No need to introduce another element that might potentially destabilize a timeline. Our appearance could have unintended effects. I guess fighting outside the timeline is less of an issue. You got it, she said. I like talking with you, and it sounds like we'll meet more in the future. Count on it. She gazed back out over the guardrail. While he had the future to look forward to, all she could do was reminisce. There was so much to come, but she was happy that Everin would visit her after this event. She did wonder which version would come first. It excited her that she did not know the answer to that. Maybe even the Rift Guardians would be involved. She cast a sidelong glance at Galden. If she was lucky, she could even reunite with him. Chapter 24 Dr. Snowden had enjoyed spending time with Drevel. They had gone over all the curious food patterns he had. The process to create the wild-born energy sapper took a little over three hours, and after watching it for two, he had almost fallen asleep. Emily and Jelton had disappeared somewhere, and Sasrissa had gone after the third hour. Thankfully, Drevel had also been bored, so they had investigated his patterns at the Matter Replicator. Flavored popcorn was the main thing they had gone over. Drevel had shown a pattern for cinnamon-crusted orange popcorn, not something Dr. Snowden had ever seen. It was delicious, and Drevel had delighted in showing all sorts of other flavors. He had them sorted by which earth he had visited, and with thousands under his belt, it had been an interesting time. Brayach had been a tester of some of the flavors, and his amused faces were a source of comedy. To be fair, Dr. Snowden was not a fan of meatloaf-flavored popcorn either. 
Brayatch did seem to like the pepperjack popcorn cakes with spicy meat and cheese tidbits, though. Everin had called for everyone to assemble in the nearby conference room. Emily had a big smile on her face when she had returned with Jelton. Dr. Snowden sensed her calm, cosmic energy, and it was like she glowed. That was not too surprising, and he doubted they had just chatted. What did surprise Dr. Snowden was when Sazrissa and Galden returned. She had a glow similar to Emily's. It made Dr. Snowden wonder if there was something to their relationship, maybe from the future. The room was packed, and Dr. Snowden recalled there being a meeting after the cosmic energy sapper had been built. The crescent-shaped booths and the size of the place made it a good meeting area. Emily and Jelton had a booth, while Sasrissa and Galden sat in another. Dr. Snowden sat with Drevel and Seer. Everin stood up front, while V hovered next to him. I am glad to see everyone is enjoying their time here, said Everin, glancing at Emily. The wild-born energy sappers are complete, and we now have five of them to use against the Arbiters. I want to go over the next steps. V projected a hologram of the scanned Everinite headquarters from before. Everin pointed at a highlighted courtyard. We will use the planner generator beam to puncture the Everinite shielding, then land there. The Torvado will take out the turrets and heavy robots before we disembark. I expect there will be a steady stream of defensive assets. He pointed at Dr. Snowden. You will stay on board the Torvada and handle the stun beams. No argument from me, said Dr. Snowden. While I think I could contribute to the fight, that's more up the others, Allie. If you wish to join in that initial fight, Seer can be at the controls. Dr. Snowden chuckled. No, I'm good. Very well said Everin. Emily and I will separate from Drevel and Sasrissa. When I give the signal, Sasrissa will broadcast that she cannot be captured and take off to the Torvada. Drevel will need to pretend that her actions were not a part of the plan and go after her while also boarding the Torvada. That should just leave me and Emily alone. At that point, Dr. Snowden will take the Torvada away, and Emily and I will begin the next phase. It'll be hard to leave you behind, said Sazrissa. Everin half smiled. Yes, but they do not know of our bond. They believe you to be an immoral terrorist who will take advantage of any scenario, so you will play that up. He glanced at Drevel. You need to act as if you cannot believe what you are seeing. So he just needs to be himself, said Seer. Drevel eyed her. I got this. Indeed, said Everin. Once Emily and I surrender, we should be taken inside. I have no doubt that Fernev will talk to us, although I am unsure as to which room that will be in. Emily and I will practice some conversations to sway Fernev into believing that this was not a part of the plan. It's going to be good, said Emily with a smile. V changed the projection to show a large room in the middle of the headquarters. Everin pointed at it. This is where the Torvada will arrive when I send the signal for it to do so. It will melt through the building to get there. Once it does, that is where the Arbiters and Defense Forces should arrive. We can then sap the Arbiters, capture Freneb, take him to the secured communication room, then use him to send our conversation from earlier. Afterward, we will destroy the communication room. Brayatch wrinkled his brow. What if they're blocking transmissions? How will you signal the others when to come? Jelton gestured at Everin. He can communicate with the Torvada on a different level. They can't block that except through sedation, and that requires Palus and energy, which I don't think they have. That is correct, said Everin. If our plan does not go well, we will still escape. The main thing is to get Frenev to confess his true nature and goals. We'll get it out of him, said Emily. Let us hope so. Sasrissa's eyes narrowed. I think as an additional measure, 
We should shut down the condensed space portion of the communication centers. It can still send general broadcasts, and even though it won't be on the special channel, it might be inferred that it's still official. Analysis. We can use the planner beam generator in condensed space. An excellent option that minimizes collateral damage, said Seer. She glanced at Sazrissa. Your idea has merit, and I agree with it. Works for me, too, said Drevel. Brayach raised an eyebrow. Are all your battles like this? Galden cracked up. Only the ones we know about. Jelton has been in a few fights, and they're mind-bending. Could we not send in the Rava to take the place? Based on what I'm seeing, I think we could easily defeat these Everin Knights. Jelton crooked a thumb at Everin. He doesn't want to introduce a new element from another timeline. We know how that is as we avoid that too, although on a lower level. His plan minimizes potential casualties. Brayach studied Everin. Don't get me wrong. I like the plan. It does hinge on this Fernev person wanting to communicate his inner desires to you, though. Oh, he will, said Sazrissa. Fernev wants power, and it will be hard not to gloat and then try to recruit. She pointed at Emily. As a matter of fact, he'll try to turn you. Emily smirked. Yeah, good luck with that. I meant that he'll probably suggest you get back to the Torvada and me in order to free Everin, who he will imprison. Expect the family card to be played. Emily played with her ponytail. I could see that. Hopefully by then the Torvada will arrive and we can fight the Arbiters. Sazrissa nodded. Everin swept his gaze across the room. Is everyone clear on what needs to be done? Drevel raised a finger. One quick question. When we fight the Arbiters, we just need to essentially get the sapper on them. Right? Yes. And the sapping should not take long. The sapper will need to be protected while it does so. What happens if it gets destroyed? The wild-born energy will dissipate, but we then lose a sapper. Drevel bobbed his head. Got it. So it's like a big game of tag. Except when they're it, they lose their energy. Not a fun game for them. Galden guffawed. You have a way with words. That is correct, said Everin. I do not know how many Arbiters will arrive, but we do know their power. Plus, we have the Torvada to assist us in that fight. Jelton raised a finger. The silent member of the gang. I like that, said Drevel. I'd like to watch the outcome when everything is over. This is fascinating, said Brayach. I am sure Emily would appreciate visiting again afterward, said Everin. Emily eyed him. The group laughed. Okay, as it is close to 3.30 p.m., let us spend the rest of the day here. We can enact our plan tomorrow, said Everin. Everyone began to break up into groups. Dr. Snowden liked that they had a detailed plan, but there were a lot of assumptions. The Arbiter fight could go wrong in so many ways. He would have a tactical view of the fight with the Torvada, and it would be Drevel, Sasrissa, and V fighting the initial surge. While Everin and Emily would arrive to help later, it might be too late if a lot of Arbiters showed up before Everin and Emily arrived. Then there was the confession part. Frenev might execute them before any conversation. That part was a complete wild card to Dr. Snowden. Sasrissa was convinced that Frenev would open up, as did Everin. Dr. Snowden would trust their judgment, but it made him uneasy. He had the rest of the day to relax and enjoy time with the others. Emily had been a ball of energy already, and the thought of more time with Jelton put her into overdrive. She still had to practice her role with Everin. Drevel had been excited to learn more about the Rift Guardians. Seer was by his side, and Dr. Snowden suspected she too was curious. He was interested in how Sazrissa, Everin, Seer, and V would spend the rest of their days, but Sazrissa's would probably involve Galden. 
although it was the calm before the storm. Dr. Snowden would make the best of it. Drevel had enjoyed his time with the Rift Guardians. Galden and Jelton had been gracious hosts, and Drevel found their society to be impressive. Although constrained to their dimension and timeline, they had a profound impact. It was not a surprise that Jelton had cosmic energy, and Drevel appreciated their warrior-like culture. It reminded him of the many variations of Rome he had encountered. It was now ten o'clock a.m., and his mouth went dry as the Torvada punched a hole in the bubble shield protecting the Everonites' headquarters. The gang was enacting a dangerous plan, but he was ready. Cece moved restlessly. He could always sense Drevel's anxiousness. Seer had also been silent along with the others. Despite the casual breakfast earlier, everyone was focused on the next step. The Torvada hovered over the designated courtyard. Let us go to the ramp, said Everin. Be prepared to fight, and when I give the signal, Dr. Snowden will destroy the nearby heavy robots and the turrets that appear. Drevel took a deep breath and stood with the others, then followed them to the ramp. Everyone was already geared up to fight, and V would be joining them in his body mode. Dr. Snowden and Seer would remain on board and handle extending the shields as needed and controlling the stun rods that could emerge from the side. They stood on the ramp. Dr. Snowden. Now, said Everin. Drevel watched the heavy robot's shielding light up, but they could not sustain the pure firepower of the Torvada. Although its stun beams were similar to Dr. Snowden's and Emily's PSDs, the Torvada could fire several of them at once. If the gang was fired upon, they could retreat safely into the shielding. Several Everonite troopers in heavy armor surged out of the main building, along with a horde of lightly armored soldiers. Their gold and white armor sparkled under the sun, and Drevel picked out several paladins and crusaders. The Everonites were bringing in the heavies. Everin enabled his energy shield, spawned a staff, then waved forward. Let us go. Drevel stepped out after the others, then took to the air. His dual energy pistols shredded the small army of drones that had appeared. Thankfully, they were not too shielded. Some drones had come close, but CC swatted them away. Everin, Emily, Sasrissa and V had entered into a melee fracas with the guards and soldiers. Everin's speed and strength were on display as he disabled them with ease. Emily was a whirlwind with her stun baton and shield. Sasrissa was next to her, and she pointed everywhere while firing stun beams. V tossed any enemy that got close. Drevel was comfortable with how everything was going. That changed when two arbiters ran out. His ARI showed them to be Arbiters Gelsh and Nanzora. Gelsh was a teleporter, and Nanzora's hands formed long tendrils surrounded by a dark blue mist that she could use as whips. Nanzora whipped a tendril at Emily, who raised her shield and blocked it. Gelsh teleported behind Emily and kicked her knee, causing her to tumble. He then fired an energy beam that began to form a red glow on her suit. Everin dashed over and stunned Gelsh who tried to teleport away, then fell. Drevel raged as he took aim and hit Nanzora with two stun blasts. Nanzora crumpled. Everin helped Emily up as V stepped in front of her and took heavy fire. Drevel shuddered when a drone crashed into him. Although CC had caught it, the momentum of the drone allowed it to hit, then try to inject something. His suit was able to withstand the effort, though. The Torvada rained stun blasts down on a unit of crusaders that arrived, led by Arbiter Scranlin. While Gelsh and Nanzora had respectable powers, Drevel knew Scranlin was a level higher in terms of threat. Scranlin jumped behind a crusader that had raised an energy shield toward the Torvada. With an extended hand, Scranlin caused the ground to rise and capture V in a rock formation. Sasrissa flew behind Scranlin and tried to stun him, but another crusader had moved in front to block the attempt. Drevel tried to position himself for a good shot, 
but the men had adjusted to the Toravada and were creating a pocket for Scranlan to work from. Sesrisa cried out when one of the courtyard walls was used to form a thick, metallic tendril that gripped her. Drevel sensed her cosmic energy spike. Emily dashed toward the defenders, then slid between them. She sidekicked one away, then tapped Scranlan in the head with her baton. He collapsed. Everin rushed over to Sazrissa to free her, while V busted out of his rock cage and assisted Emily. Drevel dropped down and aided Everin in freeing Sazrissa. Scranlan had tried to squeeze her to death based on the marks he saw. She stumbled, but Everin and Drevel caught her. Take her near the Toravada, said Everin. It is almost time. Drevel cleared out a path as Sasrissa fought behind him. V provided an escort to her side and acted as a moving shield. There was now distance between them and Everin and Emily. Drevel's heartbeat accelerated when three more Arbiters arrived. Arbiter Hoalis could absorb energy, then release it. Arbiter Zaskata fired sonic waves, and Arbiter Obergen could create duplicates, and he already had three out. Go now, said Everin over comms. Drevel noted that while Everin's avatar spoke, his lips did not move on his physical body. That was the special bond with the Torvada in action. I won't be captured, yelled Sasrissa as she stared defiantly at the Arbiters. She ran into the Torvada with V chasing her. Drevel put on his acting hat and shouted, Everin, Sasrissa's taking the Torvada. Get her, said Everin, pointing at the Toravada. Drevel charged into the Toravada, which lifted off. Thankfully, the Everinites could not see in. His heart sagged as he watched Everin and Emily take on the Arbiters and an endless supply of enemies. Everin used sticky globules on Hoalis, nullifying his energy absorption ability. Emily was busy fighting Obergen's duplicates, and Zaskata was lining up to shout her sonic waves. Drevel wanted to assist them, and he knew they could defeat what was on the ground. But that was not the plan. Sesrissa laid a hand on his shoulder. Come on. We can watch from the command area. I know. It's hard to stand by. Drevel frowned as he followed her. His nose flared when he reached the command area and watched Everin and Emily raise their hands. All Drevel could do was stand by and prepare for his next step, which was to wait. That was easier said than done. Emily's adrenaline surged as she weaved between the Everinite defenders, knocking them away. When Sasrissa had fled with Drevel after her, Everin had signaled for Emily to regroup with him. The only issue was that there had been enemies in the way, but she now stood back to back with him. Everin had pulled his energy shield in and put his utility handle back on his belt. Now we stand down, he said over comms. Thankfully, no one but her could see his avatar, so she retracted her PSD and shut down her energy shield. The attackers formed a circle initially, but cleared a path as a familiar face came into view. Well, well, said Arbiter Lotux. Look! what the Gresham dragged in. A chill shot through Emily. She was not sure what aggression was, but it probably was similar to a cat. We are surrendering, said Everin. Of course you are, said Lotux. He glanced at Emily. Hitting you tends to kill you, unless your friend is around to heal you. Since you're both wanted alive, for now... I can't kill you. He punched Everin, sending him flying back. But you, you can take a hit. Emily adopted a defensive stance and spawned her shield. Lotox, stop this nonsense. Frenev wants to see them now, said Hoalis. Lotox scoffed. Everin had it coming. He smirked at Emily. Eager for another round, are you? Well, I'm not going to stand by while you try to kill us after we surrendered, she said. Lotux glowered at her. Hoalis stepped between them and pointed out, Lotux, get out of the way. 
Who appointed you prime arbiter? asked Lotux. You don't want to test me, said Hoalus. Everin rejoined them. Emily was not sure what was going on between Hoalus and Lotux, but there was hostility between the two. Hoalus could absorb energy, so Lotux's hit would only make Hoalus stronger, maybe even stronger than Lotux over time. Fine, said Lotux, stepping to the side. He cackled. Zazarissa left you both behind. As soon as she used you for her CDC situation, she bolted at the first sign of trouble. You both are fools. A path cleared to the main building as two guards placed restraints on Everin's and Emily's wrists. Kinetic restraints, said Everin. The more energy we exert to remove them, the stronger they get. Lotux clapped as he walked alongside them. You're still dumb for trusting Sazerissa. Emily seethed. She wanted to slap the nonsense out of Lotux, but she would play along. It angered her that he was getting in cheap shots, but his time would be coming. As they were escorted, several more Arbiters joined them. It was apparent the Everinites were not entertaining the thought of her or Everin escaping. Heavily armed guards had their weapons trained on her and Everin, and she knew that even if they could break free, it would be a very tough fight. She was not sure she would survive that. After fifteen minutes, they were seated in a room at a table. Their restraints snapped to the table. The room had gray dots on the walls, and various bright circular spots illuminated the area. Her PSD and Everin's utility handle and various gadgets had been taken away. She hated not having her PSD. After another five minutes, Freneve entered the room. He wore a white robe with elegant silver embroidery on the sleeves and collar, which went beyond his head. A blue belt rested on his hips, and several small pouches hung off the belt. Another blue-skinned man carrying a red stone followed him in. The man extended the stone toward Everin and Emily. Frenev smirked. See? Not Everin. Tell the others and secure this room once you leave. Of course, said the man, bowing. He exited. The door to the room sealed shut, and the room's illumination turned light blue. Frenev reached into his pocket and pulled out a similar stone to the one the other man had carried. The stone glowed with a golden color. Frenev scowled and placed it back in his pouch. That stone was meant to identify me, said Everin. You used a fake one to convince the other man that I was not Everin. Frenev smirked as he sat opposite them. Of course. No need to get everyone else excited. So you're him, although you look different, even sound different. Your ship is the same, and you travel with a different group. Why are you really here? To assist Sazrissa, said Everin. Why? She's a terrorist. According to who? Frenev glowered at Everin. Well, your friend Sazrissa stole your ship. Need I say more? I guess I will. He eyed Emily. She took your uncle away from you. Family. I don't know if that means anything to you, but it would to me. Emily frowned. She betrayed us. Of course she did, said Frenev. Ever in or not, it's obvious she made herself out to be the victim, and you both decided to help her. The cost of that action is now apparent. Everin studied Frenhev. Why do you pretend to speak for me? You represent nothing that I stand for. Frenhev eased back into his chair. People need someone to lead them. That person is me, and I'm the only person capable of it. It's that simple. In the ancient days, humanity used religions and gods to guide them, they were just looking for purpose in their lives and a vision to follow. I give them that purpose and direction. 
I'm a god to them. Emily snorted. You're no god. You use neural implants and your wild-born ability to brainwash people. Not only that, you took all those CDCs illegally for who knows what. Watch your tongue, said Frenev, leaning forward. You forget your position. Am I wrong? Frenev chuckled. <laughs> no, you're not. Everonites would flock to me regardless. I just made it go quicker. In time, they will be Frenevites. How they got there is not relevant. It must kill you that they still follow what they think is Everin. Frenev slammed his hand on the table. Everyone will follow me in time, and I'll take my rightful spot. Emily smirked. You're delusional, am I? I didn't build the Everonites to where they are now based on being delusional. Everin tilted his head. Perhaps not. However, you twisted my guidelines and some event my future form was involved in to establish yourself. You also became a wildborn due to a tear in space and time, not by being chosen. I would never choose someone to do the things you have done. Frenev stared at them. No one will listen to either of you. That much, I'll guarantee. He pointed at Emily. You have a lot of work ahead of you. I'm not working for you, said Emily. Frenev raised a finger. I think you will. Do you want your uncle back? Of course I do. Frenev laughed. You have fight in you. I like that. Here's the deal. You get the Torvata back and hand over Sazrissa. And Everin goes free. Any betrayal will cost him his life. Emily searched the ground for a moment, then looked up. How do I know you won't just kill Everin once I'm gone? I don't trust you. It's your best option. The other is I just kill you both and be done with it, then deal with Sazrissa. She will slip up at some point, and I'll be there when she does. But if you go after her, it goes a lot faster. I know, says Rissa. And she'll probably be sympathetic and reach out to you. You can play the you escaped card and claim that you don't know where Everin is. I already predicted says Rissa would run at the first sign of being captured. And here we are. Everin glanced at her. It is a reasonable deal. What? No! He'll kill you as soon as I leave, said Emily. Frenev wagged a finger at her. I could have done that already. But I haven't. He motioned at Everin. Listen to him. He understands the situation, and for what it's worth, his ideals are good. But they lack ambition and are vague. My ideals are better. Noted, said Everin. Emily sighed. Although she knew to play the part, Freneva aggravated her. It was easy to be angry at him. He was calmer than she had expected, and he had already given them the confession they needed in regard to the illegal CDCs and the neural implant brainwashing. Getting him to say why he was doing it was a bonus. Fine said Emily. She glared at Frenev. But if you hurt Everin while I'm gone, I'll hunt you down. Frenev clapped. And I had already predicted you would agree to my deal. It was just a matter of how long it would take. You got it all figured out. Frenev stood. And why wouldn't I? You forget who you speak to. Your cover story has already been set up. I just need to get some things going. He went to the door, which opened. Enjoy your last moments together for a long while. I'll be back. He exited, and the door sealed behind him. Emily sat back in her chair. Do not despair, said Everin over comms. We got everything we need, I know. I just really don't like that guy. Understandable. 
V. Are you there? asked Everin. I am, said V. Excellent. Proceed with entering the main chamber. Emily and I will be along shortly. We need to get our equipment first. Acknowledged. Everin touched Emily's arm. Are you ready? Emily grinned. Let's do this. Chapter 25 Drevel hated waiting, especially knowing that Everin and Emily were being questioned or potentially tortured. All he could do was wait with Sazrissa, Seer, Dr. Snowden, and V in the command center. Even CC was restless as he shuffled around. Based on what Drevel observed, the Everonites bought that Sazrissa had betrayed the gang. They really had a low opinion of her. He sensed the anxiousness in the others as their cosmic energy fluctuated. It had been hard not to rush out and put Arbiter Lotux in his place after he had hit Everin. What intrigued Drevel was seeing that there was some hostility between Lotux and Arbiter Hoalis. Maybe everything was not as cohesive as it appeared with the Everinites. Analysis. Everin has contacted me. He and Emily have gotten a confession out of Frenev. Everin is ready for us to begin our assault, said V. I'd love to hear the confession, but we better get ready, said Sasrissa. Only three of us going out, so we'll need three of the wild-born energy sappers, but it might make more sense for Dr. Snowden to get them to us when we need them. Dr. Snowden adjusted his glasses. I can do that. Just stand on the ramp with them. I think Seer would be better suited to control the Torvata in this fight. In what way? asked Seer. You're an AI and can process things a lot faster than me. With the array of tools the Torvata has to offer, you can make decisions quick. I think I can be more useful on the ramp, he said. Drevel pointed at him. Plus, you can use your grappling beam to pull people into the Torvata, then use the sapper on them. Sasrissa shook her head. The Torvata won't allow an enemy combatant in. However, we can use that. How? asked Dr. Snowden. You can shoot out, then pull an arbiter up to the shield. While they're held against it, you apply the sapper. Dr. Snowden rubbed his chin. That could work, but what if they yank me out? The Torvata's shields can be modulated to prevent you from being pulled out, similar to how they do in space. Seer tilted her head. I have verified that Sasrissa is correct in that the Torvata can determine who comes in and out. However, Dr. Snowden can pull people in if they are given access. If they are unconscious, I can do that. Dr. Snowden's eyes narrowed. So maybe we need to set up the hollow room to house these unconscious arbiters. Cells, maybe. I have set it up, said Seer. Okay, then you'll need to monitor my area and allow in those that are knocked out and without wild-born energy. Seer smiled at him. I got you. Drevel clapped Dr. Snowden on the back. You're going to be busy. When Seer has you, watch out. She eyed him. Most definitely, said Dr. Snowden. I trust her. All right. When any of you need the sapper, swing by and I can get you one. If we fight by the Torvata, then we can even hold the Arbiters against the shield while you do your thing, said Drevel. Dr. Snowden raised his head a bit. I think it's time we end the Everhenite charade. Drevel smiled as he swatted his and Seer's arms, then left with Sazrissa and V to the ramp. This would be a tough fight after a bit, but initially it should just be guards and soldiers. Crusaders could potentially be an issue as well as any paladins. He would handle any drones as normal or quick-moving targets, while V would serve as a mobile tank, with Sazrissa assisting. They would be a formidable force, not to mention how much stronger they would be when Everin and Emily arrived. The Torvada had been dodging drones the whole time. Although it was not detectable, 
All it would take was one drone to crash into the shields for detection. Now, the Torvado was headed toward the central structure and would melt through the roof. That would be sure to cause a distraction. Drevel braced himself when the Torvada hovered over the roof. Sasrissa laid a hand on his shoulder. No need for that. We won't feel anything when it goes through. He relaxed some as the Torvada effortlessly melted through, then dropped to just a foot off the ground of the large, round main chamber. The dust from the rubble on the sides had sent up clouds, and all Everonites in the room had moved to the sides. Seer had done a controlled descent to give anyone underneath time to move away. Based on the readings he saw, no one had melted roof droppings on them. One downside was that the dust highlighted the Torvada as guards opened fire. Drones flew in from side hallways and shot beams. Seer responded by having the Torvada extend stun rods out of the black side meshes and begin firing. That's our cue, said Sasrissa. Defensive mode engaged. V marched off the ramp and headed towards some guards who had blocked the Torvada's stun beams. Sasrissa flew out and rained stun blasts down on those that had ducked behind some pillars on the side. Drevel launched into the air and pulled out his dual pistols to unload on the swarm of airborne drones. Now that there was an opening in the roof, he had to account for that as well. A quick check showed that Dr. Snowden waited on the ramp with a container that had the sappers. He also had a hover slab to move people. Arbiters Hoalis, Gelsh, and Nanzora arrived with a squad of crusaders. They were physically bigger than the ones Drevel had first seen when rescuing Sasrissa from the cave, and every one of them had an energy shield out. They also had heavier white armor and energy blades that crackled with orange arcs. Nanzora went after Drevel immediately. She must have remembered who had downed her last time. Sasrissa paused, then spun and grabbed Gelsh when he teleported next to her. She unleashed a wave of stun through her fingertips, downing him. Dr. Snowden shot a grappling beam that reeled him in. Then, while close, he applied the wild-born energy sapper. After a purple glow lit up, then dimmed, Dr. Snowden put Gelsh onto the slab and took him inside the Torvada. Drevel dodged Nanzora's whip-like attacks, and she took cover behind the Crusaders, who used heavy pistols to fire at him. He went to the opposite side of the Torvada and stepped inside the shielding. When Nanzora chased him in and stuck out, her tendril hit the shield. Cece flew out and wrapped her head. Drevel rushed out and grabbed her by the waist, then dragged her over to Dr. Snowden. He applied a sapper and took her away. We need to keep this area clear, said Drevel. V was a machine as he held the line against so many. The energy beams did not break his shielding, and he was stunning and tossing anything that got near. Hoalis tried to attack V but was tossed away. Sasrissa's flight provided another angle to defend against, but Drevel knew that they were only seeing the first responders. It could get chaotic quick. Drevel arrived next to V and provided some much-needed ranged ability. CC swept across the battlefield, grabbing enemies by the legs and pulling them down. It caused confusion in the Everonite ranks, and Drevel capitalized on that. He was not sure of Everin and Emily's status, but he hoped they would arrive soon. Emily's heartbeat accelerated when V updated them that the others were fighting. She was ready to go. Frenev had not returned, and she was sure that the Torvada melting through and then starting a fight was a higher priority. Everin focused, then broke apart his restraints. Do you need assistance with yours? Emily broke hers. Nah, they may be kinetic ones, but these were made for normal strength people. Let us go then, said Everin, standing. He stood in front of the door and sized it up. Are you going to hack it with your UIC? She asked. He raised a finger. Emily figured he was planning something. She could sense a lot of activity behind the door. It was probably guards and soldiers rushing to fight the Torvada. Everin kicked the door, flattening a guard. He waved down a hallway. Our gear is nearby. She burst out of the room with her energy shield spawned. Although she did not have her PSD, she could sense it. 
It was like a tug in a certain direction. It reminded her of when she had been on the prison planet and her PSD had been lost. When she had gone to look for it, there had been a slight tug in its direction that had gotten stronger as she approached. Two guards sent a barrage of energy beams at Everin and Emily. They reflected the beams back, disabling the guards. Everin charged down the hallway with his energy shield leading the way. Emily protected the rear and easily reflected back the beams at anyone shooting at them. Although she did not have her PSD, she had trained to use her shield as a temporary weapon if needed. Thankfully, it was a part of the suit. The hallway they were in was well lit, with featureless floors, walls, and ceiling, and they were underground somewhere. Turrets dropping from above surprised her. One of them caused her to raise her shield, which allowed a guard down the hallway to hit her in her thigh with a beam. While her suit held, it felt like someone had poked her with a hot iron. She yelped as she fell back and tilted her shield to cover both angles. Everin leapt into the air and punched the turret, crumpling it. Then he zigzagged to the guard and kicked him away while breaking his weapon. Everin came back and helped her up. We are close, he said. She grimaced as she rubbed her upper thigh. It was a lot harder to fight without her PSD against ranged attackers, but now she would be aware that turrets could pop out from the ceiling. They reached a door with a side console. Everin applied his UIC, and they entered. Although items were in unmarked wall panels, Everin went to the one with their gear in it. Emily sensed his cosmic energy fluctuating. He was angry, even if his emotionless face suggested he did not care. His friends were fighting, and he was not there to assist them. That had been the plan, and they would meet up with the rest of the gang, but she also suspected Fernev had bothered him. Everin opened the wall panel using his UIC. She grinned as he tossed her PSD at her. Glad to have this back? Indeed, said Everin, grabbing his utility handle and belt gadgets. Let us help the others. She ran after him as he barreled through anything that got in his way. When they went around a corner, they stopped. Emily's ARI outlined Arbiter Kataxa, whose special ability was to phase. She had a troop of regular guards, but it was the two crusaders and a paladin that stood out. They all immediately opened fire as Kataxa phased down into the floor. Emily angled her shield and reflected beams, as did Everin. Her eyes widened when Kataxa tried to rise through the floor behind Emily. Emily gagged when Kataxa's torso went solid, then toppled, leaving blood everywhere. Apparently, Kataxa was not aware of what happened in the presence of a cosmic aura, even something as small as Emily's. After downing the guards, Everin scanned Kataxa. That was an unfortunate tactic on her part. Yeah, said Emily, frowning as she moved away. Nasty way to go. Everin nodded at her, and they took off. We're gonna need some help in here, said Cesrissa over comms. Lot of arbiters. We are almost there, said Everin. After dealing with lesser foes on the way to the main room, they stopped at a hallway before the main room. Arbiters Lilid and Boonkrom stood in their way. Lilid could manipulate air, and Boonkrom had the ability to sap heat. It was a strange mix of powers, but Emily could see how they could be used offensively. Lilid circled her fingers and pointed forward, causing a cyclone of air to fly toward Everin and Emily. They adopted defensive stances, then fired stun beams, which the burst of air scattered. Boonkrom jumped into the blast of air and sailed toward them. He smiled big when he crashed into Everin's shield, then grabbed Everin's wrist. What? said Boonkrom with widened eyes. Your abilities do not work on a cosmic being, said Everin as his eyes glowed. Emily got goosebumps when Everin showed once again how powerful he was. He was calm, despite everything going on. Everin lifted a startled Boonkrom off the ground, then tapped him in the head, causing him to collapse. Everin stared at Lilid, who took off. The remaining crusaders followed her. Emily grinned. That was Lilith being smart. 
If she wanted to extend that streak of good choices, she would just leave the building, but she had taken off to the main room. Hopefully that is the last distraction. The others need us, said Everin. Maybe they'll run like Lilith when we get there, said Emily. Everin raised a finger. Let us not get complacent. She swatted his arm as she passed him, said the guy that took on two arbiters and made them look weak. Indeed. They were entering into a big fight with a lot of other arbiters. The fact that Sazrissa, Drevel, V, Dr. Snowden, and the Torvada could hold against so many enemies with a variety of powers was impressive, but Emily knew that it was not sustainable. She was eager to join the fray. Dr. Snowden had not realized he was going to get a workout in. Applying sappers to downed arbiters that Drevel, Sazrissa, and V brought over was the easy part. However, getting the arbiters onto the slab, then to the hollow room, then into a secure cell, took some effort. Thankfully, it was not like there was an army of arbiters waiting to be put away. He breathed a sigh of relief when Everin and Emily arrived. They whirled into the fracas like a hurricane. Per their quick update, they had defeated Arbiters Kataxa and Booncrom, but Lilid had fled and was now in the main room. Dr. Snowden's heart skipped a beat. Prime Arbiter Frenev and eight Arbiters arrived with a horde of guards and soldiers. That was a lot of power, and he suspected that without Everin and Emily, it would be a quick defeat for the gang. Frenev pointed at Everin. Kill him and his friends. No survivors. Everin has decreed it. Lodox raised his hands and roared, No mercy. Dr. Snowden frowned when the Everinites cheered and surged into battle with vigor. They were so brainwashed that they did not recognize Everin in front of them. Dr. Snowden had only put away five arbiters, Hoalis, Gelsh, Nanzora, and two new ones he had not met before. One had the ability to turn to a liquid and was stunned immediately. The other formed rock skin, something V literally smashed to pieces. That left a total of sixteen arbiters to deal with, and with Lilid and the other eight that had just arrived, that meant there were seven others out there someplace. They were probably guarding key installations or temples. The array of abilities the arbiters possessed was alarming. Arbiter Lotux charged forward and body-slammed into Everin's shield, pushing him back. Everin shot a grappling beam at him, pulled him in, then knocked him away into the air. Dr. Snowden's mouth went dry. Lotux scared him. He was powerful enough to challenge Everin and had almost killed Emily. If Drevel had not been there at the CDC storage facility, this would be a very different situation. Dr. Snowden's eyes widened when Arbiter Garrick grew to almost thirty feet, even his armor scaled. Garrick assisted Lodux by kicking away Everin, who had raised his shield in time but was sent flying through the room. Emily danced forward, deflecting the flamethrower-like blasts that Arbiter Ilkranak aimed at her. She was fast enough to dodge and roll to the side, and after her third block, she fired a stun beam that incapacitated him. However, she barely had time to raise her shield up as Garrick tried to squish her with his big foot. Sasrissa flew in and fired stun beams at Garrick. His face showed annoyance as he attempted to swat her. She cried out as a column of metal shot up from the ground and engulfed her. Dr. Snowden gulped. He remembered Arbiter Scranlin's ability to control the environment, and this was not a good time to be held. He debated rushing out to help her, but Drevel was almost at her position. Arbiter Cork stood in Drevel's way, and when he attacked with his dual pistols, Cork dodged them by forming holes in himself that allowed the blasts to go through. Parts of his body simply moved away when Drevel tried to attack with his fist weapons, as if Cork was made of stretchable plastic. CC flew off Drevel and wrapped Cork. They tumbled off to the side. This allowed Drevel to use his fist weapons to dig into Garrick's foot, causing him to fall back while freeing Emily from being crushed. Dr. Snowden's blood boiled. It appeared to have taken everything in Emily not to be smashed. He stumbled, but Drevel caught her. Hit him! 
said Dr. Snowden to see her over comms. Of course, she said. The Torvada surged forward into Garrick. He crashed to the ground. It was like the Torvada had punched him in the mouth. The Torvada unloaded a stream of stun beams on Garrick, and Dr. Snowden extended his PSD through the shielding to assist. Between that and Drevel's stun shots, it was too much for Garrick. He shrank down to normal size. Everin assisted Sasrissa by downing Scranlan with a stun and a well-placed kick. It took her a moment to get her bearings. Dr. Snowden grimaced. Based on the pressure readings he had seen, Scranlan had tried to squeeze her to death again. Thankfully, she had held on, but she now struggled some to stand. Dr. Snowden took the opportunity to reel in Ilkrinik, Scranlan, and Garrick. He applied the sappers to each then got them onto slabs and rushed them into the hollow room. Their absence would help the fights. To make matters worse, Arbiter Lilid unleashed a conical steam of air blasts that sent Sazrissa and Drevel sprawling away. V marched toward her. Lilid focused on him, making her air blasts grow in intensity. Each step he took was slower than the last, but his density control allowed him to become heavy enough to avoid that. She cried out as V reached her and pushed down her arms, then stunned her. Dr. Snowden took the opportunity to pull her in. As Drevel stood, Arbiter Rodengaz was a blur as she surged through the battle to pummel Drevel. As fast as Drevel's reactions were, she was just as quick. She also had on special gloves that caused pain when they hit Drevel. Sesrissa went to assist Drevel, but Lodux caught her as he came back to the fracas, he punched her, but she had projected a shield. The hit sent her tumbling. Everin fired a grappling beam at her and was able to stop her from smashing into the wall. His eyes glowed as he burst toward Drevel. On the way, Everin knocked Lodux away again. When Everin arrived, he slapped down Rodengaz's punches, then hit her with a stun beam. Dr. Snowden waited for Everin and Drevel to clear before yanking Rodengaz in. Emily had faced off with Arbiter Hildograta. Hildograta raised a hand to her. Your worst fears are mine to command. I don't think so, she said, leg sweeping him with the staff she had spawned. She placed it above his chest. I don't have time for that. He yelled as she tapped his chest. She picked him up and ran over to Dr. Snowden, then laid him at the edge of the shielding. Dr. Snowden's heartbeat accelerated when Lodux went right for Emily. He was going to pancake her against the shields. Watch out, he said. Emily slid to the side as Lodux bounced off the shield and crashed. Dr. Snowden tossed her a sapper. She applied it to his lower leg. He tried to kick it off and reach it, but Emily used her staff to keep his hands away and his legs down. What is this? he shouted. Payback, said Emily. After a purple glow had surrounded him and faded, she lifted him off the ground with one arm, then face-bashed him into the shield. She stunned him for longer than normal as he slid to the ground. Dr. Snowden was glad to have her slab-loading assistance as Lodix was still a heavy person. She nodded at him and rushed back out to the fight. Dr. Snowden took a moment to survey the situation when he returned from putting Lodox away. Cork was still out there and C.C. was giving him all he could handle. Arbiter Ginsley was the only Arbiter left outside of Frenev, and V was already marching toward Ginsley. The amount of support troops had dwindled. The heavy crusaders had been tough initially, but they were limited due to friendly fire. Several paladins had also joined the fight, but Everin had dismantled those. Ginsley's ability was on display as he dodged every stun blast shot at him. His ability allowed him to see moments into the future. He wielded a powerful energy blade, and when he was close to V, he angled it to stab. Ginsley shrieked in surprise as two energy beams from Drevel knocked the blade away. Cece tossed Cork into Ginsley, knocking them both down. V took the opportunity to fire a pattern of stun beams that Ginsley could not escape. Cork had slid off to the side, but Drevel and Sazrissa both fired stunning him. Frenev fled down a side hallway. He's not getting away, said Sasrissa, chasing after him. Sasrissa, we should not split up, 
said Everin. She faced him. I can't let him escape. They stared at each other. Go. We will clean up here and deal with the remaining forces, he said. She rushed over and hugged him, then took off. Drevel and V carried Ginsley and Cork over while Everin and Emily dealt with the remaining guards that continued to filter into the room. This had been a rough fight. Cesrissa had renewed energy despite almost being crushed to death. Emily was hurt, but she had fought through it. Drevel had been knocked hard, and CC had returned to him. V stood strong as always, and Dr. Snowden admired how V was able to stand in the middle of combat and help direct the flow of it. Everin had been like a ninja as he had evaded most hits and assisted everyone, taking on multiple arbiters and dealing with the horde of guards that had fought. He had been calm through it all, even if he had been knocked away a couple of times. Dr. Snowden knew that without Drevel, Seer, and Sasrissa, this fight might have been too much for the original gang. Everin would have survived, but Dr. Snowden suspected he, Emily, and V would have been taken out. Scranlan would have wrapped up Emily for Garrick to squish. Dr. Snowden would have been trying to man the Toravada while assisting at the same time. He was glad that it was only a thought exercise. He much preferred the outcome of cleaning up the remaining forces and jailing the Arbiters while Frenev was on the run. Chapter 26 Rage filled Sazrissa as she ran after Frenev. She was not sure where he was going, but it would not surprise her if he had an exit plan. With his narcissism, it troubled her to think what he might do. Justice would not be denied, and she would bring it to him. She enjoyed listening to the others chat over comms. Emily was almost gleeful as she doled out punishment to the guards who stood and fought. She was getting in a workout and some one-liners. Cesrissa suspected her good mood was due to dealing with Lotux. Dr. Snowden sounded like he was tired. After having to lift and apply sappers to the arbiters and doing it as fast as possible, she could see how he exerted himself. He had cosmic energy, but even it had its limits. Drevel was a comedy factory as he joked with Emily and dealt with the guards. CC had surprised her in battle. He had taken on an arbiter solo and prevailed. It put into perspective how powerful he was. Although he could not talk, his actions showed his protective nature and ability to fight if needed. Seer and V were silent for the most part, but Sasrissa figured they were coordinating everything on the Torvada. Everin had been quiet as well, with an occasional comment, but that was normal for this version. It would change in future versions. A guard shot at her. She dodged and fired a grappling beam at his legs, then yanked. As the guard fell, she stunned him. She was still amazed at the guard's dedication to Frenev. Despite the major loss, the guard fought on as if he had nothing to lose. Frenev was not hard to track, as he was the only wildborn left to deal with. Although he had some distance on her, she would catch up to him at some point. The guards, drones, and automated security defenses were not difficult to deal with, but they did slow her down. She had been surprised by a series of turrets that had fired at her backside when she had been dealing with a drone in front of her. Thankfully, she had been able to extend her right palm to project a shield, then used her left palm to shoot a grappling beam at the drone and sling it into the turret's line of fire. Then she had disabled the turrets. Her annoyance grew when Frenev's wild-born signature got weaker. When she ran into what appeared to be a dead end, she studied how Frenev had somehow gone through a wall. It was not obvious that the wall could move, so she sprayed acid in an oval shape, then kicked it in. As she suspected, there was a hallway to step into. She growled when she reached a larger room with an elevator unit. It was already on its way down, and she was not going to wait. She used her acid spray to create another oval shape, then used her grappling beam to pull it out. It would take a moment for the acid to settle. Then she would be flying down after Frenev. Her acid worked fast, but it had limited usage. 
and this situation was perfect for it. She was not sure what defenses awaited her when she arrived, but she was ready for anything. The acid on the floor had slowed its dripping, so she projected a shield over her as she jumped through and activated her rocket boots. Although she was not claustrophobic, she could see how scary it would be to do what she was doing for someone who was. Her determination had no time for any of that, though. After ten minutes, she approached the top of the unit, which had started to move back up. There was nowhere for her to go, and it would smash into her if she continued on. She doused the roof with a heavy dose of acid as she flew back up. It took a few applications and five minutes, but she had cleared a hole through the roof and floor. She pulled her arms in and hovered as she went through the unit. A bit of acid had sprayed on her, but she wiped it off with a special cloth she carried just for that purpose. She gritted her teeth as she burst down the shaft. When she arrived at the bottom, she used her acid yet again to open a hole. Maybe this was a part of Frenev's stalling tactic, but she could sense him nearby. Whatever he was doing, he was not fleeing. She contacted Everin via comms. I'm about to face Frenev, so I've opened comms so you can listen in. Be safe, and let us know if you need us said Everin. For our part, we have cleared the area, and V and I have secured the communications room. V is interacting with the system now, and he says we may not need Frenev physically anymore. Good to know. After stepping through her newly created hole, she surveyed the environment. A waist-high wall with a shield up to the ceiling separated her from Frenev. He was on the other side, and the only way in was a gap in the wall on the right side of the room. However, it was shielded from the ground up. Frenev sat in a comfortable chair at a wraparound workstation. Various screens dotted the walls, and several cabinets were behind him. He sipped on some beverage from a glass while studying the workstation displays. He faced her. Oh, did you need something? Sasrissa scowled. What is this? Frenev grinned. Not something you planned for, is it? He waved at her dismissively. I figured that if you ever had the opportunity, you'd try to blow this place up because you're a terrorist, and that's what you do. I would never destroy something with people in it, she said, glowering. Everything I've destroyed has been without loss of life. Perhaps, but I still wouldn't put it past you. I applaud your zealot crusade. It's just misdirected. He eased back into his chair. Nonetheless, you'll get your wish. Sasrissa's eyes narrowed as Freneva interacted with the workstation. A light red glow pulsed, lighting up the room. He gestured at her. This is where your story ends. Your solution is to blow up your headquarters? There's people still up there. Frenev raised a finger. Oh, I didn't blow the facility. You did. Or so people will think. But why? You'd sacrifice your own members to frame me? If that's what it takes... Their sacrifice won't be forgotten, and this act will show everyone that recent actions were due to us trying to protect ourselves from you and your crew. No one will believe that. Besides, this place will be buried, you included. He eyed her. This side of the room can withstand that. Your side, not so much. He smiled big. I'll emerge from this victorious after having caught and defeated you. The Torvata will be crushed and implicated, and Everin will turn from a savior into a terrorist sympathizer, assuming he survives. So you think everyone will worship you now? Frenev smirked. Why not? I deserve it. 
I still don't understand how you roped Everin into your delusions, but it doesn't matter anymore. You're all going to die. Drevel had listened in on Sazerisa's discussion with Frenev. V had confirmed that a self-destruct had been triggered. The Everonites that had been fighting turned to flee, but there were still a lot of unconscious guards on the ground. Get these people to the Toravata, said Everin as he zipped around the area, picking up as many as he could. How much time do we have? asked Drevel. Five minutes. Less now. Drevel burst into action. He grabbed a guard and picked him up. The armor made him heavy, but Drevel operated on pure adrenaline. When he got to the hollow room, he observed that Seer had extended the circular hub with cells on the sides. She had even directed where everyone was to go. His stomach churned. We're not going to be able to get everyone. Dr. Snowden joined him. I know. I can't believe Frenev would sacrifice his own people like this. Emily placed a guard in a nearby cell. I'm going to search the surrounding area. We fought a few on our way to the main room. Drevel admired her willingness to risk the area blowing up on her to save people. There was still a lot of work to do in the main room, but he suspected that between him, Dr. Snowden, and Everin, they could do it. V was still in the secure communication room. Analysis. I have transmitted Frenev's communication with Everin and Emily. I have also transmitted his conversation with Sasrissa up to this point. Excellent. We could use your assistance in the main room, said Everin. Acknowledged. Drevel rushed back out to get another body. He studied one guard who had turned to flee, but paused. The guard took off his helmet and scrutinized the area in confusion. Drevel wondered if the guard was able to process all of the communication that fast, but it was a special neural implant, so maybe it was possible. The guard walked up to Drevel. How can I help? Drevel raised his brow. Um, just get these bodies onto the Toravada. The guard frowned. We... We were fighting Everin. It's in the past. Help us now. The guard nodded and went into action. Other guards joined in. The guards would have a lot to process once this was all over. All Everinites would... With the guards helping, the room was cleared after a few minutes. Everin allowed the guards to wait in the center of the hub in the hollow room. The group assembled in the command center. Seer, activate the shields and melt to Sazrissa. Acknowledged, she said, smiling at V, who joined her. Drevel took a moment to realize how crazy the situation was. The Torvada effortlessly went through the ground then angled toward Sazrissa's position. He envied what the Torvada could do in a ship form factor. Sazrissa, the Torvada is melting its way to you now, said Everin. I'm not going anywhere, she said over comms. Drevel stared intently at the timer that sat in a data window projected onto the Torvada's front. They were cutting it close, and per V and Sears' calculations, they would arrive to grab Sasrissa with a buffer of 15 seconds. Although he tried to remain calm, he was a bundle of nerves. He moved to the ramp with the others. After a minute, they reached Sasrissa's position and melted through the side of the room. Frenev's eyes widened when the shielding went down. What? Sasrissa fired a stun beam, causing Frenev to collapse. Then she shot a grappling beam at him while flying into the Toravada. Everin caught Frenev when he was dragged in. A loud explosion surrounded them as the area came tumbling down. I can't believe he did this. Was there enough time for the Everinites to flee? Asked Sazrissa. Unfortunately, not for all of them, said Everin. There will be loss of life. She frowned. I'm guessing they disabled the explosives connection once armed. You are correct. Once the self-destruct was initiated, the remote control access was disabled. There was not enough time to locate and disable them. Were you able to send the transmission at least? Everin squeezed her arm. We did. Do not blame yourself for this. Sasrissa sighed. I know. 
I just didn't expect he'd go to this extreme. I don't think any of us did, said Drevel. There is still much to do, said Everin. Drevel appreciated Everin's presence, and as always he was right. The Everinite casualty report would be rough to read. Drevel did wonder if the guards were an example of what was to be expected of the Everinites' behavior, or if they were an outlier. He followed Everin, who was carrying Frenev into the hollow room. The guards in the room stood at attention as Everin placed Frenev in a cell. Everin faced them. I understand you have had a chance to see my conversation with Frenev. Know that I bear you no ill will and can take you to the place of your choosing. One guard stepped forward. You're Everin. Your wish is our command. Frenev abused my legacy. He should face justice, said another guard. What do we do now? asked another. Everin studied them. I would suggest you meet with the Trinicans. I have met them, and they are true stewards of my philosophy. The guards got on bended knee. Your will shall be done, they chanted. Please rise, said Everin, extending a hand, palm up. You are free to live your life without the Everinite's changes to my guidelines. Drevel figured the guards had heard what Everin said, but they probably still viewed him as some sort of god. This must be one of the best moments of their lives, and the sheer happiness on their faces belied that just a bit ago they had been trying to take down the gang. Drevel had thought they would defend Frenev, but maybe only the truly hardcore would. Drevel left the room with Everin and the others. There was much to do cleanup-wise, and he was not sure how the Chelatan Empire would respond. Even if they declared the Everonites a non-allowable entity, the transition process in terms of assets and removal from society would be a daunting task. Chapter 27 It had been a week since the big fight, and Dr. Snowden and the rest of the gang were being honored by the Trinicans. It was 1 o'clock p.m., and the platform they sat on was raised. The ceremony looked like it was being held in a football stadium, although he knew they did not play that game or have any idea what that was. The area was packed with not just normal citizens, but also high-ranking politicians, Trinicans, and even former Everonites. Hollow screens hovered over each section and stood out, despite it being a clear day. Hakash from the Trinicans and Histar from the Trinican Defiers were leading the ceremony. Hakash had the box that detected Everin, while Histar had the stones. A dome-shaped shielding covered the platform area and provided some noise filtering. Based on what Dr. Snowden saw, the crowds would be loud, but he only heard a muted version of it. The effect was a much quieter experience where he could hear others talk without being drowned out, the previous week had been busy. The Everonites had been declared a non-allowable entity, and the Trinicans had stepped in to assist those leaving the cult. Not all Everonites did, though. Dr. Snowden had heard that the Arbiters who had not been caught and their hardcore supporters had fled to some world outside the Chelatan Empire. They no longer called themselves Everonites, or Frenevites, for that matter. Hopefully, this was not the founding of a new threat. The gang had been approached by several historical societies interested in learning more about Earth from Dr. Snowden, Emily, Seer, and Drevel's perspectives. Dr. Snowden had thought that might influence things, but Everin said it was okay. The historian's reactions cracked Dr. Snowden up when the Toravata streamed a portion of Columbus, Ohio to a Peekabot swarm room. The only line drawn was when the historians wanted blood samples. Everin responded with a hard no to that. Dr. Snowden swept his gaze among the others. Emily had been all smiles as she had joked with Drevel and Seer. Lodix had been taken down by Emily, and after the fight in the illegal CDC facility, she was close to Drevel. Seer also aligned with Emily's sense of humor, and together they teased him incessantly. Cesrissa had stayed close to Everin and V for most of the week, 
It was like she did not want either out of her sight. Dr. Snowden had done several talks with her, and she had been excited that Everin's legacy had been cleansed. She did have a hard time observing some Everinites, dealing with the idea that they had followed someone that Everin did not endorse. She had even talked with a few former Everinites that had hunted her. That must have been an interesting experience. Everything went silent as Hakash took to the center of the platform. These have been tumultuous times. But today, we celebrate the return of Everin, he said. The crowd roared. Not only has he returned, but he has also brought his friends, collectively known as the gang. We celebrate their presence as well. Hakash gestured at Histar. This event also serves as the official dissolution of the Trinican Defiers. They are now a part of the Trinicans again. And to those who were Everonites, we invite you to join us as brothers and sisters. However, the main reason I'm sure you're all here for is to see Everin. Hakash motioned at Everin. Everin walked to the center and gazed at the audience. Thank you. I will be brief. The Trinicans have my full support in guiding those who wish to follow my general philosophy. With that said, I would like to adjust the guidelines. He raised a finger. Respect others, and help them if they are in need, but only if they accept that help. A second finger was raised. Seek happiness, and hold on to it when you find it, but not at the expense of harming others. The raptured crowd hung on every word. Everin showed three fingers. Violence should only be used as a last resort, not as a justification for a way of life. He raised another finger. Be true to yourself. Only then can you truly grow. But if your growth causes pain and suffering to others, then you should evaluate your growth. He waved his hand with all fingers extended. And finally, defy those who would cause harm. All it takes for chaos to take hold is for those who could prevent it not to do so. Be vigilant, and while violence should be used as a last resort, self-defense is a valid reason to protect yourself and others from those who would use these guidelines as justification for an exercise of violence. He cleared his throat. And finally, a new guideline, although it is more of a clarification. If any new guidelines are added outside these six, then the new ones are not from me and should not be considered as part of my philosophy. However, even with my guidelines, be careful when following them, as they are meant to guide, not control. Dr. Snowden liked the new guideline, as well as the additional clauses added to the others. Although it seemed obvious that the original guidelines were enough, Frenev had twisted them into something monstrous, then tacked on his own. Hopefully, Everin's changes would prevent a new Everinite organization from springing up. Everin raised his head. As always, you are free to live your lives as you choose. Just do so in a constructive manner. While I was dismayed to see that my guidelines had been abused and twisted by an organization, it does show how easy it is to interpret something to suit a cause. Hopefully, my new additions will add clarification. If in doubt concerning an action, look at it from an objective perspective and see if it makes sense. May you live your lives in peace. The audience cheered when Everin went back to his seat. Dr. Snowden got goosebumps as he sat there soaking in the crowd, going wild. 
Even the former Everonites were standing and clapping. Histar took center stage after a minute. There are other topics to go over, but before we do, I think a lot of us would like for each of the rest of the gang to provide a guideline. We have Everon's six guidelines, and these will be the gangs, which can be used as a supplement. The crowd continued to show support. Dr. Snowden furrowed his brow. That was not what he had expected, and he had not prepared anything, much less something that would be used in the same context as Everin's guidelines. First up is the great Dr. Snowden, said Histar, motioning for him to come up. He puffed his cheeks, then took center stage. The crowd sat and went silent. Any moment can be a teaching one. Learn, adapt, and evolve, and you will find yourself prepared for what comes next, he said. It was a slight tweak to the Snowden family creed, and the audience loved it. Emily swatted his arm on her way up. Oh, making it hard for me, huh? He eyed her as he sat. His star had introduced Emily as heroic. That adjective kept popping up all through time and space. She laughed after reaching center stage. If someone knocks you down, stand back up and do whatever it takes not to let it happen again. Dr. Snowden liked her guideline and could see her reflecting on her dealing with Arbiter Lotux. His star introduced V as Valiant when he went up. Analysis. Surround yourself with friends and build a strong network. Be vigilant in maintaining those connections. Dr. Snowden high-fived V when he sat back down. Drevel was next. Life can be hard, but take time to find humor in it as well. Don't be afraid to laugh and enjoy life, even when giving a guideline. <laughs> he raised his hands and snapped, then alternated moving his shoulders. CC extended two cloth strips to the side and pretended to pump them in the air. The crowd laughed. Sassrisso went after Drevel had sat. It's hard to stand for something when facing impossible odds. But trust in yourself and use hope as fuel to sustain yourself through it all. Dr. Snowden understood how personal that was for her. She had taken on the whole Everonite cult by herself for many years with a burning desire to clear Everin's legacy. The crowd's enthusiastic response made her smile. She had been painted as a terrorist, but now everyone saw that she had just been trying to help Everin. It must have been vindicating for her. Seer was up next. When new opportunities show themselves, do not fear to explore them and learn as much as you can. You never know when you'll have the chance to do so again. Dr. Snowden grinned when the crowd came to life again. They knew that she was an AI created by the Torvada, although they did not know which one. They still gave her the same reverence as everyone else. He wondered what she was processing as she stood and waved around. This must definitely rank up there as one of the rarest experiences for her. Histar and Hakash took to the stage to introduce other speakers and topics. Dr. Snowden appreciated the moment for what it was. They were far in the future, on Earth, and at yet another ceremony. This was a rare event, and he had experienced several of them while traveling with Everin. The rest of the gang was in high spirits, and he looked forward to spending some time checking out local culture more without the Everinite threat. Sasrissa had spent a few hours the previous day with Hakash and Histar after the ceremony. They had a big job ahead of them, and the sheer number of former Everonites coming to the Trinikins was astounding. Chelatin politicians also talked with the gang, and they had laid out their plan for the removal of the Everonites from the Empire. It bothered her some that they were not chasing the ones that had fled out of the Empire, but there were bounties now for the Arbiters. 
The Torvada approached Lord Noskov's base for a cookout. That tradition after an adventure was something that all Everins did, regardless of version. The people who showed up changed, but Everin and the ancient vampires were a constant. She was not sure who all would be there, but she knew she had to keep any future talk to a minimum. It was 1 o'clock p.m., and lunch would probably be the usual grilled burgers and the like. These cookouts were a great melting pot of various people in Everin's world. Her heartbeat raced as the Toravada landed. She followed the others out to the ramp. Lord Vigon, Lord Noskov, Mikhail, Jake Melkins, and Robert Melkins, Jake's dad, stood off to the left. The ancient vampires and their black attire were a constant. To the right was Dalton Kingston's team, with Brad Washington, Rick Westmoreland, Todd Armani, Valerie Simmons, and Evot. Their team makeup would change in time. Aphrodite, the Greek goddess, also stood next to Dalton. It was strange to see Robert and Jake so young. Now that Robert was a part of the ancient vampires group, he would have the best care well into his years. Jake was already an outstanding young man, and that would continue into his late twenties. Lord Vigon knew the future like she did. He had traveled with future Everins before this time period, and at the cookouts he always winked at her when discussing things in group. The gang exited the Toravada and were surrounded by the others. Dalton stared at Drevel and Sazarissa. I sense cosmic energy in you two. Everin raised a finger. Indeed. Introductions are in order. With us are Drevel Zage, his sentient cosmic cloth, CC, Seer, a Toravada AI, and Sazrissa Mortaka. Drevel and Sazrissa are both Toravadas chosen. However, Drevel was chosen by another form of the Toravada, a pocket dimension that can connect to parallel Earths. That Torvada also created Seer, and CC was created when Drevel went through a similar transformation as you. That's a mouthful, said Todd. Definitely, said Dalton. Everyone chuckled. Lord Vigon extended a hand to Sazrissa. Always good to see you again. And before anyone asks, she knows the future as I do. Sazrissa smiled. I may have met a few Everins and several others here in the future. Whoa, that's cool, said Jake. I hope you see me there. I can't say. Jake chuckled. <laughs> I figured, like talking to Lord Vigon, worth a shot. Lord Noskov gestured around. It's informal here. We have grilled food and nothing planned other than just relaxing and interacting. We have some things to discuss with Everin, said Lord Vigon. Well, outside of that, said Lord Noskov. Lord Vigon winked at Sazrissa as he, Lord Noskov, and Everin went off to talk. Dr. Snowden had joined Robert, Mikhail, Valerie, and Jake at the grill. Seer had broken off with Brad, Evot, and V. Brad holding Evot's hand made Sazrissa remember that they had recently gotten together at this point. Emily hung back with Sazrissa and Drevel as Dalton, Aphrodite, Todd and Rick walked up. Rick laughed. <laughs> so this is a moment. Three Torvadas chosen in one place. It would seem so, said Drevel. Although I can travel across many Earths, I've never been to this one. It actually unlocked recently for me. Dalton eyed him. So your Torvada allows parallel Earth hopping. Yeah, I get summonses like Everin's Toravada does, said Drevel. He raised a finger. Interestingly enough, anything we do in my Torvada is available in Everin's, so it's like the Torvada exists at a higher level of reality somehow. Emily cracked up. I walked into a living quarters in his Torvada, and it showed me my room on our Torvada. How weird is that? That's so crazy, said Todd. Just when I think I've heard it all, I'll learn this. Good stuff, though. 
Dalton motioned at Sazarissa. Did you go through a similar transformation process as Drevel and I? Sazarissa smirked. Oh, yeah. And it wasn't pleasant. Like melting and then being rebuilt. Yeah. Same here. How did Everin take it? asked Dalton, crooking a thumb back at him. I didn't become chosen with this version. Dalton rubbed his chin. Ah, so you were chosen while traveling with the future Everin. How many versions of Everin do you know? asked Aphrodite. I can't say, other than that I meet them in reverse. When I first meet him, he knows me well, and when I met this version, he didn't know who I was. Intriguing said Dalton. The things you must know, even about this team, if future Everins attend cookouts. Sasrissa looked down. I may know some things, but like before, I can't say anything. It's okay. We understand timeline integrity, both universal and personal, said Dalton. What will you do now? Could always join us, said Todd. Sasrissa swatted Drevel's arm. His summons was to bring me to his and Seer's Torvada to join him in dealing with other summonses. So that's my next move. Emily motioned at her. We already tried to get her to join us. Trust me. I would if I could, said Sasrissa. I get it, said Dalton. It would be fun to work with another chosen. He faced Drevel. Can you discuss the parallel Earths you've seen? Oh, yeah, said Drevel. He eyed Aphrodite. My ARI is showing you as a Greek goddess. You only exist in lore on other Earths. There's only one Olympus, she said. But there could be another version of it out there, I suppose. Drevel nodded. It's really nice to meet you. Now, these other Earths. Sasrissa listened in as Drevel was in his zone discussing other Earths and sanctuary ones. After a bit, she excused herself and joined Brad, Evot, Seer, and V. Hello, said Evot, hugging Sasrissa. Sasrissa smiled. Evot always did that and was the happiest AI Sasrissa knew. Always good to see you. I understand you've met me in the future. Analysis. She would if she attended cookouts with future Everins and you were at them. Seer faced Evot. I have calculated that we will meet many times in the future now that we can come here. I'd love that, said Evot, clapping. Brad grinned. Although this is our first meeting from my perspective, I definitely hope to see you, Drevel. CC and Seer in the future. Dalton doesn't talk much about being a Torvada's chosen, so I definitely have some questions. Of course. Side note, we fought a lot of wildborns on this summons, said Sasrissa. Really? Yeah. They ran the gamut from super strength to controlling the environment. Very tough to fight against. Brad ran a hand over his head. Any chance I might be able to see the video? Sasrissa crooked a thumb at Everin. If he doesn't have a problem with it. Cool. As for questions, fire away. She loved Brad's curiosity, and while she answered questions, he slipped his arm around Evot's waist. It was hard not to notice Seer focusing on that action. Sasrissa wondered if Seer contemplated being in a relationship, especially now that there was an example of a human and AI one in front of her. After talking with them, Sasrissa joined Robert, Jake, Mikhail, Valerie, and Dr. Snowden by the grill. Robert offered her a plate with a burger, hot dog, and some slaw in a cup. Here you go. You're always so generous, said Sasrissa, accepting the food. Robert grinned. I'm glad I don't change then. You're good, said Sasrissa. Dr. Snowden swallowed his bite. So this must be old hat to you. Sasrissa shrugged. 
same event, different people, well, versions for some. Sasrissa is joining Drevel, Seer, and CC on their Torvata to do summonses, said Dr. Snowden. Valerie studied her. So that means you can come to this earth to visit? Yeah, I suspect we will, said Sasrissa. You're always welcome here, said Mikhail. He gestured at Dalton. And the earth ward, by extension. Sasrissa wrinkled her brow. I think we're supposed to get credentials on this visit. Ah, so in the future when you visit, you already have credentials. Yeah, and I don't recall when we got it, but it would have to be this visit. I know Drevel and Seer would love to tour Earth Ward headquarters. Valerie smiled. Then we'll make it happen. Sasrissa always liked her, in any time period. She was tough and smart and even hit on Sasrissa a few times. Robert and Jake were mainstays with the ancient vampires, and Mikhail was an anchor for them. Dr. Snowden always devoured his burgers from what she heard, and she was glad she got to see him do it at a cookout at least once. After some light discussion, she joined Everin, Lord Vigon, and Lord Noskov when Everin waved her over. Lord Vigon mentioned that you two have met several times already, said Everin. We have, said Sasrissa. Lord Vigon chuckled. We have history for sure. Lord Noskov shook his head. It's always strange to be around those who know the future but can't say anything. Every word or action has to be guarded. Indeed, said Everin. I know my future versions travel with Sasrissa, and at some point Lord Vigon must as well prior to this time period. That would be how he knows the future. He gestured at Sasrissa, and you by extension. Sasrissa was always impressed by Everin's deductive ability it was hard to hide anything from him, and although he could only guess, he was usually correct. It must be confusing at times to know where you're at in others' personal timelines, asked Lord Noskov. It is, said Sasrissa. I have to be on guard at all times. However, now I'll be on Drevel's Torvata, so we'll stop by every now and then. Lord Vigon squeezed her arm. You're always welcome here. Lord Noskov studied her. So this meeting is new to you. Yeah. And as of this point, any future Everin can visit me and will be in sync with this time period, said Sasrissa. A strange way to get here. Sasrissa smiled. Sure is. Although this was Lord Noskov's first time meeting her, she knew of him in her past. Lord Vigon was like a brother to her, and she understood his struggle not to say things. He had also had to keep the secret of the ancient vampire origins from the other lords for over twelve thousand years. He was good at keeping secrets. She smiled at Everin, who gave her a half-smile back. Her personal future was bright, and she could not wait to meet future versions again while she was working with Drevel. There would be little impact on other timelines, so she would be able to speak freely. She relaxed as she studied the others on the platform. Cookouts were a lot of fun, and she cracked up when Ivat tried to get Seer to dance. That exemplified the fun to be had. It pained Sasrissa to know that this would be the last time she saw some of the others, but she would enjoy this moment due to how rare it was. Chapter 28 Drevel mused on the cookout from the previous day as the gang walked through the underground Earth Ward headquarters parking lot. It was 11 o'clock a.m., and Dalton and team were to give a tour. The cookout had run all day long, and he felt like he had really gotten to know everyone there. Dalton's team was great, and Drevel understood how they were efficient. Brad had a powerful ability 
and it had been strange to interact with a wild-born that did not want to capture or kill Drevel. Valerie had flirted with him, and he had done so back. There was some chemistry there, and if he had more time he might have investigated that. She had teased a bite job, and if there was more time he might have explored that with her. Todd was cool and calm, a good temperament for a deputy inspector. Rick's history fascinated Drevel. To go from hunting non-humans to working with them was quite the journey. Evot was a ball of energy, and she had been quite the chatty AI. The ancient vampires intrigued Drevel. Vampires were a myth on most Earths he had seen, and the few that he had met were not Daedrolds, nor did they number in the thousands like on this Earth. This planet was special in how many non-humans it had. Lord Vigon had a strong relationship with Everin and Sasrissa, too. That had surprised Drevel, and he was eager to learn more about those relationships, especially in regard to timeline integrity. Lord Noskov had been a gracious host, while Mikhail had gone into some detail on the ancient vampires. Their history boggled Drevel's mind, as they had been involved in most world events in some capacity— he understood how rare it was to meet such a powerful group. Jake had a unique relationship with Everin, as evidenced by the teasing between the two. Everin had reunited Jake with Robert, and Jake was also the first human Everin had ever met. It did Drevel good to see that those who Everin had rescued were still around. This earth was similar to the sanctuary earths that Drevel set up, but this one was protected by Everin. Now Drevel was going to tour the Earth Ward headquarters. Sasrissa had mentioned that he, she, and Seer would get credentials so they could visit this Earth and use Earth Ward facilities and resources as needed. It seemed strange that they would allow that. But Everin had founded the Earth Ward and Dalton was considered its top inspector. Torvada's Chosen had special consideration. The Torvada had flown in and landed in an underground spaceport and he understood that was so that satellites would not be able to monitor it. He suspected they could track the coming and going, but there was some advanced tech that made the whole area look like a black dot on a map when scanned from above. The first thing he noticed after leaving the Torvada was the sheer amount of other exotic energies. Guards walked everywhere, and he sensed they were daedrolds. Valerie had pointed out that they were Raskarians, which was a different vampire type than her or the ancient vampires. A tan man in casual wear awaited the group when they reached an elevator. Dalton nodded at him. This is Terry Salinas, Earth War Director. He wanted to personally meet everyone before we go up. Terry smiled and shook everyone's hands. It's truly an honor to have you visit. We'll be on our best behavior, said Drevel, Oh, no worries here. It's not every day we have visitors of your caliber visiting us. He handed Drevel, Sasrissa, and Seer some credit card-sized badges. To that end, I've entered your credentials into our system. You have the same access as Dalton. These badges can be shown at any Earth Ward facility. They can also be projected, said Seer. That's right said Terry. Drevel smiled big. Awesome! Terry gestured at the elevator. Don't let me stop you from your tour. If any of you need anything, let me know. He glanced at Everin. I'd like to chat with you later when you're free. Of course, said Everin. Drevel was impressed that Terry had even appeared. Dalton and his team, and Everin and the gang had a lot of clout on this earth, the elevator was spacious, and everyone had spread out. Although Seer was usually reserved, she had a smile on her face. Maybe it was because Evot was chatty with her. After exiting the elevator, they entered a massive concourse. Drevel surveyed the hustle and bustle of employees, and he was almost overwhelmed by the various types of exotic energies. In the center was an area for people to sit and eat and along the edges were hallways leading off to wherever. Several escalators were placed near the sides. A second and third level could be seen with guardrails. Dalton motioned out. 
This is one of the general areas. There's four others spread throughout, but it's a place to meet and see people and also get something to eat or drink. All that's free as a perk. Sassrissa pointed at a side room where some people walked out with messy hair. What's going on there? Ah, the nap room. They have sleep pods in there. Each one has noise dampening and can be sealed. They have a massage feature too, said Rick. I've personally verified that. Valerie laughed. Yeah, and sometimes is late to meetings because of it. He shrugged. It is Dr. Snowden's second home, said Everin. Dr. Snowden chuckled. If we didn't have the Torvada in our backyard most of the time, I'd definitely want one of those sleep pods. You'd never leave it, said Emily, swatting his arm. He eyed her. Drevel could see the value of the rooms. Sleep was important, and a quick nap would rejuvenate people. They walked along the edges and escalators two levels up, then out onto a large veranda. Drevel appreciated the fresh air, and the view was gorgeous. Dalton pointed out, That's the Wildhaven Institute over there in the distance. It's like an all-ages college, essentially. Also, when a human learns of the non-human world, or becomes wizened, they have to attend a mandatory set of classes here. Seer tilted her head. The technological state of this earth makes it seem like it would be difficult to hide all this. Definitely, said Brad. I monitor what's being said out there from time to time, and with social media, there's a lot more potential exposure. Analysis The Earth Ward does its best to cover up, but there is a high probability that the non-human world will be public at some point. The Imperium, a group of ancient legends and gods from lore, controls the narrative for the Earth Ward, and they have done an excellent job to this point. You all have already met Aphrodite from the Imperium. I see, said Seer. The Earth Ward has a plan, said Everin. Sasrissa's eyes narrowed. That sounds like it might be an interesting time period. Todd ran a hand through his hair. I think it'll be chaotic. He waved a finger between him and Rick. We used to be slayers. Faith, militia, soldiers who hunted non-humans. Hell, Rick used to be executioner, a legendary slayer. The Faith Militia's numbers will swell. Drevel could see how delicate the balance was, and he agreed with V's assessment. This earth was advancing fast enough that it would be impossible to hide non-humans. Drevel's gut reaction was that there would be anarchy, as Todd implied, unless there was a rollout plan of some type. I like the layout of this town, said Seer. It is divided into four quadrants, each with a focus. Evot smiled. I like it too. It's organized. Drevel raised a finger. Are there other AIs out there? Analysis. Evot and I are the only approved self-aware AIs allowed to exist at this time. Although there are other AIs out there, they are specialized and not sentient. Interesting, said Drevel. With so many non-humans and of various types, I'm guessing the political aspects are pretty hectic. Oh, definitely, said Dalton. The Earth War does a good job of handling it. The big groups are a part of the founding core, so that helps. Aphrodite, Hermes, and Hercules joined the group. Dalton introduced them. It's so wild to meet the actual Greek pantheon and Imperium by extension, said Drevel. Already met Aphrodite. Good to see you again, she said, smiling. And now you get to meet us, said Hercules, shaking Drevel's hand. Hermes did the same, then gestured for everyone to follow him. It's lunchtime, and we have a feast. The rest of the Pantheon really wants to meet you. Well, all of you. Dalton grimaced. Is Zeus going to be there? No, not after your last case. Good. Drevel tilted his head. Oh, you can't just leave it at that. Hercules slapped Drevel on the back. I like you. 
come. A feast awaits us. Drevel could already see politics having some impact. It was odd for the head of the Greek pantheon not to be present, and Drevel was eager to hear why. There were a lot more areas to visit, and he was excited to see it all. Sassrissa and Seer were happy, which made him happy as well. Hopefully, after they went back to his Torvada, they could visit this earth and drop in on everyone from time to time. Dr. Snowden surveyed the main hub room in Drevel's Torvada. It had been three days since the Earth Ward headquarters visit, and Sassrissa, Drevel, and Seer ended up taking several more tours. Dr. Snowden accompanied them and... Even Dr. James Bryson, Dr. Snowden's best friend, had flown up to meet everyone. Aphrodite, Hermes, and Hercules had joined the gang, Dalton's team, and Lord Vigon, Lord Noskov, Jake, and Robert, to visit Drevel's Torvada. Dalton had remarked that Aphrodite, Hermes, and Hercules were becoming known as a power trio due to their closeness with Everin and Dalton. Dr. Snowden could see that, he considered Hermes an honorary member of the gang as he had helped out when Kaltoris had tried to take over Earth in a previous adventure. The main hub was a good place for everyone, and there was plenty of space to sit. Dr. Snowden eased back into his cushion and laced his hands. Drevel had started to go over the different Earths he had visited. Although Dr. Snowden had already heard all this, it was new to everyone else, and they had been raptured right from the start. Dr. Snowden had watched everyone over the next four hours. There had been a lot of questions, as expected, but several things had stood out to him. Hera, from the Greek pantheon, had given Hermes a stone to give to Drevel and Sazrissa. It had a little light that pointed in the direction of an Olympus portal anywhere on Earth. The Greek pantheon believed themselves to be the only ones in existence, and the stone was to see if that was true or not. Drevel and Sazrissa had agreed to help out. Dalton's team looked like they were surprised half the time. They had gone to a parallel Earth on their last case, and one of the strange things they discovered was that there were no dogs. Drevel had said that was not as uncommon as one might think, and he had been to Earths where other animal types were missing. Evot had been all smiles as she had connected to Drevel's Torvada. Dr. Snowden had thought that Seer allowed it, but she said she had not done anything. In a way, Evat was a Torvada's chosen too, since she had been a part of Dalton when he had gone through his transformation process, and she had been elevated from a virtual intelligence to an artificial one. Todd and Rick's facial cues had indicated they were blown away a lot of the time, but they had taken it all in stride. Not many humans would ever see something like this outside of Jake and Robert, Brad had also seemed intrigued by everything. Apparently, Seer had allowed Brad to connect to the Torvada and check things out, maybe because Evot had already connected, but it was a sign of trust. Emily joked with everyone, and it did Dr. Snowden good to see her like that. She had a rough past as of late, and it was at moments like this when she could truly unwind. He suspected she would have been happier with Jelton, Jennifer or Andia, although mainly Jelton, but then she would have spent more time with them than the others present. Emily got along well with Valerie and Hermes, even V participated in the discussions, and Dr. Snowden noted that he sat next to Emily most of the time. That was not too surprising given their bond, and everyone had cracked up when Evot had hopped into Emily's lap as a cat and danced with her paws in the air. Lord Vigon and Lord Noskov had spent most of their time observing everything. Dr. Snowden wondered if Lord Vigon knew of this Torvata, but judging from his reaction, Dr. Snowden did not think he did. Maybe Lord Vigon did know of it, but had never seen it, or it could be he was acting. It was hard to tell. Lord Noskov and Mikhail were in a similar state of awe as they soaked everything in. This was a very rare opportunity to see something like this. Lord Vigon was not as talkative as Dr. Snowden had come to expect. Something really bothered him, and his daydrolled energy was in flux. Although he smiled and talked, Dr. Snowden thought he sensed a deep sadness. 
but he was no day-drolled energy expert. Lord Vigon's energy tended to spike when he looked at Emily, V, Everin, and Dr. Snowden. Jake and Robert had had fun as they had chatted away and made observations on each earth shown. Sassrissa had frowned a few times when she had seen Robert. Maybe it was nothing, but Dr. Snowden had learned not to discount anything regardless of how small it was. After a hearty dinner, everyone had left except the original gang, Drevel, Cece, Sassrissa, and Seer. That was fun, said Drevel. We don't get too many visits like that. I enjoyed that, said Seer. Sassrissa smiled. Me too. We can always visit as well, or invite others when we swing by. Indeed, said Everin. I am glad that we met in order to have something like this. Emily swatted Drevel's arm. Yeah, same. Dr. Snowden adjusted his glasses. So after we leave, you four just start doing summonses? Not quite, said Drevel. Sassrissa will need to take some time to adjust to things here, and if we find better ways to do things, we will. Got it. If you all find time, make sure you swing by and visit us. Don't be strangers. Seer tilted her head. We can contact you via the Torvata when connected to your Earth. Dr. Snowden nodded. Sassrissa frowned. While I'm happy that we stopped the Everanites and got to see old and new friends, I'm sad our time is ending. Everin laid a hand on her shoulder. Know that you are at a point in your personal timeline where I and my future versions can visit you here. She hugged him tight. Their cosmic energies fluctuated. Sassrissa had a bond with not just one Everin, but several. This would have been her last time seeing Everin ever, but now that was not the case. Drevel poked Emily's arm. We might crash your parties so often you ask us to leave. Yeah, right, she said, hugging him. Her voice softened. You're always welcome. Drevel raised his head a bit. And it's appreciated. He shook Dr. Snowden's hand, then pulled him in for a back slap. I'm gonna miss you too. It's been one hell of a ride. That it has, said Dr. Snowden. His eyes misted. Like Emily said, you're always welcome with us. The moment hit him harder than he had expected. Drevel, Cece, Sassrissa, and Seer were a unique bunch, and now they were starting off on their own journey. They were chosen by the Torvada, which made them unique outside of Dalton, but what he really enjoyed was that they felt like a natural part of the gang and family by extension. He walked over and hugged a startled seer. You get a hug, too. Thank you, she said. Emily hugged her as well. Everyone laughed when Cece slipped off Drevel and high-fived everyone. V had influenced Cece in a good way. V made the group laugh again as he turned every which way to high-five everyone. Although it was a somewhat sad moment, Dr. Snowden appreciated the light-hearted touch, and that was one reason he liked traveling with Drevel and the others. They were easy to get along with, and he could be himself. Everin walked over to Drevel, and they forearm shook. You will see us again, and should you need assistance, please do not hesitate to reach out. We will, said Drevel. Cece slipped on to Everin for a moment, then flew back to Drevel. He really likes you, he said. It would seem so, said Everin. He walked over to Seer. Know that you are truly special, and one of a kind. I am honored to have met you. Seer frowned. I'm going to miss you. Everin embraced her. Dr. Snowden found it unusual for Everin to do that, but then again, he was right. Seer was truly unique. As the Torvada represented Cyrilus to Everin, and Seer had even taken on her form, Dr. Snowden suspected Everin viewed Seer as an extension of Cyrilus. Maybe Everin felt he was closer to Cyrilus through Seer. 
Everin, Faced, Drevel, C.C., Sasrissa, and Seer. May your new journey together be enlightening as your trip with us has been. They bowed their heads slightly when Everin did. Dr. Snowden followed Everin, Emily, and V out and stood before the portal. He peeked back at Drevel and the others, who gazed on. Cesarus's eyes were red, and tears streamed down her face. Although she was sad, Dr. Snowden could not help but feel that there was something else going on that bothered her. Her cosmic energy was going wild. Drevel tried to smile, but a frown popped in from time to time. Even Seer's face showed sadness. Dr. Snowden wished they could just all travel together. Not only would it be fun, but it would also enhance the gang's effectiveness overall. He took a final look at them and waved, then stepped through the portal. Emily felt emotionally drained as she stood near the guardrail on the Toravada's roof. They were flying back home, and it would be ten minutes until they landed. This had been one of the rougher summonses. Taking down an empire-wide cult was hard, and as skilled as Cesrissa was, she had been at it for over a hundred years without success. It had taken the gang and Drevel's group to step in and help her get it done. The amount of wild-born enemies had been unusual, but their power had been evident. Sasrissa's cosmic energy had been in overdrive as it had spiked everywhere when they had left. She would be able to visit any time, and the gang could stop in and see her. It was not a final goodbye, just a new chapter in their relationship. It was like Sasrissa was worried she would never see them again. Drevel had saved Emily, and she would never forget that. The sensation of her chest caving in was not something she would ever forget. If she did not have cosmic energy or nanobots, she would have died on the spot. Thankfully, Drevel could one-shot heal her, but at the cost of knocking himself out, not an ideal thing to do in the middle of the fight, and he had essentially sacrificed himself for her. C.C. had been a surprise. He had shown his prowess on the battlefield, and his tactics were effective. His flight ability intrigued Emily. She would love to be able to take to the air whenever, but she did not have C.C. Maybe she could take a look at Sazrissa's jet boots. Seer had been a pillar of the team and she provided more than just technical expertise. She was a Torvada AI, the only one known to exist. Her interaction with others was also very human-like. Emily loved Seer's sassiness, something probably picked up from years of working with Drevel. He probably teased her a lot, and she had adapted and dished out some of her own. Deep in thought over there, said Dr. Snowden. I was just thinking of Drevel and the others. Dr. Snowden looked out. Yeah, I was too. Sasrissa seemed really sad. Well, Drevel and Seer did too. I'm not sure if C.C. was. Actually, I'm not even sure how he would show it. Analysis. C.C. can form patterns on his cloth. Emily drew her head back. He can? He could have communicated with us that way? Everin raised a finger. I suspect C.C. views himself as a part of Drevel. Therefore, he lets Drevel speak for him. I could see that, said Emily. Everin faced Dr. Snowden. Something is bothering you. Dr. Snowden sighed. Well, yeah, there is... Every time Sazrissa mentioned a future, you, Emily, and I don't seem to be in the discussion. Why would that be? I know she says she can't say, but sometimes omission can lead to certain conclusions. Perhaps you establish a dance school and move on to that, said Everin. Dr. Snowden eyed him. Everin half smiled. I would not worry too much. A more plausible situation is you move on with Kess and Emily with Jelton, and when Sasrissa joined my future forms, it was at a time when you both were unavailable. Good point, said Dr. Snowden. 
Emily played with her ponytail. If it was that simple, you would think Sasrissa's energy wouldn't have spiked as crazy as it did when we left. Perhaps it is because she is uncertain of her future, and I presented a stabilizing factor to her, which was leaving. Huh, I guess so, she said. She was not fully sure that was it, but it was a valid conclusion. Sasrissa's reasoning and knowledge would probably never be known, so Emily would let it go. This was also a tougher adventure, said Everin. Sasrissa may have formed strong bonds with each of you that she did not plan on. Possible, said Emily. She rubbed her chest. I don't want to experience a chest cave-in again if I have to. Just glad Drevel could heal it, although at the cost of knocking himself out, said Dr. Snowden. He motioned at Everin. We weren't doing so good without you and V. Analysis. Arbiter Lotux was a wild-born conduit with a strong ability. Emily's eyes narrowed, and now he isn't. Acknowledged. I'm just glad the Everanites are dismantled, said Dr. Snowden. He wagged a finger. It really makes you wonder what that event was that your future form participated in. It is best we do not know, said Everin. I know timeline integrity and all, but it's apparent your future form does something heroic that spawns a centuries-old movement. Emily chuckled. Yeah, now that we know what happened at the end, experiencing the start will be interesting, assuming we are with your future form. Analysis. If we were, then we would have been recognized. Yeah, I know, but still fun to think about. Acknowledged. Emily suspected she and Dr. Snowden were not with whichever version of Everin was at the event that created the Everinites. Hopefully it was due to other things going on in their lives, as opposed to being dead. Drevel, Sazrissa, Seer, and CC are going to have some interesting summonses, I bet, said Dr. Snowden. I concur, said Everin. I also suspect that the type of summonses they get will be more challenging. Dr. Snowden rubbed his chin. You think Drevel, CC, and Seer hit a ceiling on the type of summonses they could do? Everin nodded. While those three are powerful, Sasrissa adds a significant boost to that group. Definitely. They can all fly, shoot, sneak, and then you toss in their Torvata's capabilities. That's a powerful combination. Indeed. Dr. Snowden gazed out. Another thing. This tear that gave the Everenites their ability. It's apparent now there's something powerful with cosmic energy wreaking havoc in our universe. We're going to run into it at some point. We will deal with it when we encounter whatever it is, said Everin. Dr. Snowden grimaced. I know, but it makes me think that it's an energy being, or has a ship or something powerful enough to cause tears. That's some serious power. Emily extended her hands to the side. We are some serious power, too. V high-fived her. We are, but it still is in the back of my mind said Dr. Snowden. Everin interacted with his ARI. On another topic, Seer gave me a program to run before we reached your house. Really? asked Dr. Snowden. He glanced at Emily, then back at Everin. What's it do? We shall find out. Emily smiled when a hologram of Drevel, Sasrissa, Seer, and CC appeared in the center of the roof. It still pained Emily to see them and not be able to communicate, but it sounded like they would in the future. Drevel smiled. This recording was made before you all left our Torvada. We just wanted to say it was an honor to travel with the gang. Sasrissa piped in. And we will see each other again. I'll make sure of it. There is only one thing left to do, said Seer. C.C. flew off Drevel and hung in the air like a screen. In unison, they all chanted, Everything is as it should be. C.C. posted the message on his surface.
The hologram ended. Oh, that was cool, said Emily. She swatted Everin's arm. They really know you. It would seem that way, said Everin. He raised a finger. And I agree with them. Everything is as it should be. For now. The End Epilogue Sasrissa had experienced a strange few weeks in Drevel's Torvada. A part of her had wanted to step through back to Everin's Earth and visit the gang. However, there had been a lot to learn about how Drevel handled his summonses. From Sanctuary Earths to the protocols he observed, she had to acclimate fast. There was already a summons awaiting them. Seer had been her constant companion and Sasrissa suspected Seer was glad to have someone who did not snark all the time. Drevel toned it down some, perhaps due to Sasrissa's presence. She enjoyed Drevel's unique personality, but could see how, after centuries, it might become taxing. Even CC had taken some time to rest on her shoulder like a cape. She had glanced at an empty cup of iced tea, and CC had gone and gotten her another one. He doted on her, but she was okay with that. She wondered if it was because he sensed her cosmic energy or because they had formed a shared bond when dealing with the Everinites. Drevel had been a good teacher as well. Although he tended to joke a lot, he was serious when it came to doing summonses and helping others. He had smiled the whole time she had been there, and she suspected that although he had CC and Seer, he looked forward to having another chosen to work with. There were several protocols that Drevel observed, Sasrissa appreciated that he wanted to redefine them with her input. That showed a willingness to compromise, something important in a relationship. She liked most of the protocols, and they aligned well with her general philosophy. Avoid killing when possible was high on the list. Others ranged from trying to avoid taking sides in conflict unless the summons asked for it, to not exploiting locals for personal gain. One protocol she had changed was attending music performances. While she was glad he enjoyed those, that was not the case for her. She did like them from time to time, but not as a requirement. Another important protocol dealt with blending in when possible. This ranged from what was worn or projected to not displaying abilities in public, unless it was an advanced society already. The protocols were just guidelines for the most part, and if someone or a group's lives depended on breaking protocol, then it would be done. Thankfully, Drevel was understanding, and Seer had pointed out how many times Drevel had broken his own rules. It made her smile when she asked Drevel if it was all worth it, and he said that he lived to help others. She had centuries of trying that, but had been hunted for it. This would be a nice change. She had gone over the various types of summonses and viewed them via the hollow room. One type that surprised her was the cosmic fragment retrieval ones. Although Drevel and Seer had had no idea where the fragments came before meeting Everin, they now knew there was an event that weakened the timelines via cosmic repeaters. That was the handiwork of the Mortani, cosmic plane refugees that Everin and the gang had dealt with. The aftermath still needed to be cleaned up. Others dealt with interacting with those who would have some impact in the future, especially in regard to crossing timelines. It amazed her how far reaching the Torvada's grasp was. The more action-oriented ones usually involved saving a group who would end up on a sanctuary earth. It surprised her to see some assassination summonses. They were for beings who caused chaos by jumping timelines and disrupting them. Apparently, the Torvada was not keen on letting those exist. Drevel had tried to banish them, but some escaped, and the Torvada would reissue the same summons. Sasrissa would do whatever the Torvada needed. She was in the portal room now, waiting for Drevel, Seer, and CC. Their first summons together was to retrieve a cosmic fragment that had split. Unfortunately, it was spread across an earth that had an advanced society based on ancient Rome. She had already picked out her projections so she could blend in, but it would take time to talk to people and track these pieces down. This was a new earth to Drevel, Seer, and CC, so there were several cataloging things that were to be done while there. 
Seer had done some already, and she retrieved atmosphere, metrics, and the general tone of the area they were starting in. It would take a long time to truly document a world, but enough could be tracked wherever they went. Her heart raced. There would be exploration, adventure, possible subterfuge, and even action. It was that mix that excited her and was a drastic departure from what she had done for so long when fighting the Everenites. Drevel, with CC on him and Seer, entered the portal room. You ready to go? asked Drevel. Sassrissa smiled. Ready as I'll ever be. Seer's projection dissipated and her orb docked on Sassrissa's shoulder. I'll dock on you since Drevel has CC. Oh, I see how it is said Drevel, laughing. It balances out, said Seer. I'm kidding, said Drevel. We'll probably be doing a lot of traveling, and I'm not sure what to expect. He grinned. That's half the fun. Sesrissa wrinkled her brow. If everything goes okay, do you plan to spend some time there to check things out? I definitely plan to, said Drevel. You? I'd like to. Barring anything crazy. Drevel angled his arms at 90 degrees while pointing up. Awesome! CC swatted Drevel's cheek. She laughed. You two crack me up. Give it a hundred years, said Seer. Drevel eyed her. This is our first outing as a group. I don't know about you, but I'm excited. I am too, said Seer. The portal opened. Sassrissa gazed at the lush field on the other side. It was sunny out, and per the location data, they were going into what would be southern Germany, although it was called Visburg on this earth. Her pulse quickened at the thought of a new adventure. Drevel did a flourish toward the door. You have the honors. Thanks, she said. She smiled as she looked around. This would be her new team and she was thankful she would not be alone anymore. The team might even grow. The future was bright, and she was eager to see how it all played out. She took a measured breath, then stepped through the portal. This has been The Cult of Everin, Book 14 of the Everin Chronicles, written by Adair Hart, narrated by Michael Wolfe. Copyright by Adair Hart. Production copyright by Adair Hart.